Cyber dentro do, do jogo Rainbow Six. Jogo pela FaZe Clan. Now, what is the idea for FaZe to try and mix things up? Oh, what a shot there from Cyber! Major Suécia, eu quebrei, meu, quebrei o recorde né, de kills que teve em campeonato de Major. No próximo campeonato que a gente jogou, que foi o Major Berlin, a gente, eu quebrei de novamente meu recorde, mas não fui campeão. Meu estilo de jogo é muito agressivo, então eu sou um jogador que pensa em muitas possibilidades ao momento. Tem o Vita King, né, que é o nosso IGL, ele é um jogador que é, direciona a gente onde ele precisa. Essa parte assim ele faz muito bem, então acho que ele meio que nasceu para essa parte de fazer essa parte de GL assim. Tem um Souza, né, que tá há muito tempo comigo, é um jogador que é muito calmo. Ele consegue pensar muito sobre o jogo também, ele consegue trazer muitos rounds importantes pra gente, que a gente tá perdendo. Ele é um jogador muito habilidoso nessa parte. O KDS é uma pessoa que fica. fica parado não faz muita coisa assim fora do, do comum. KDS is looking for him and the opening kill is for FaZe. Acho que essa parte sim é uma parte mais forte dele assim de ser um jogador também que pensa bastante dentro do jogo e sabe a hora de executar alguma coisa. O Range é um jogador que é muito bom também, ele tem uma parte de skill muito boa também, acho que todo jogador nosso time é muito bom em questão de skill. Handy from above is able to deny and that means there is no chance to have a good clutch this. Ele consegue fazer bastante round que a gente está perdendo ali de uma forma é, drástica. Acho que o Civilization, todos os jogadores querem ganhar, né? Acho que cada um quer se provar ali dentro do, do campeonato. E eu acho que todos os jogadores pensam assim que é o maior campeonato assim, para si, né? Que é, é, o, é o troféu mais antigo que tem no jogo, então acho que é o que todo mundo quer ganhar. O time, esse é o time entendendo não, que eu tenho que é mais unido dentro de jogo e fora. É um time muito agressivo quando precisa. Sabe que o nosso estilo de jogo é totalmente diferente do que eles jogam com. Então acho que a galera assim, tem um pouco de medo de jogar contra a gente nessa parte. My in-game name is Filipox. I'm from W7M and I'm the IGL for the team. I feel amazing playing in São Paulo. So I think it's going to be like the biggest tournament in my life. It's a six invitation, it's already a big tournament. And playing in São Paulo, uh, I've never played in my country before, so I think it's going to be insane. I'm not afraid of anyone, but I think we're going to have great matches. Our first game is going to be against M80. It's always a great game against them. Uh, the last time we played, uh, we lost. So I think we are going to get our revenge right now. We are here to win, but we are trying not to think that as much uh, because we already got a lot of pressure because everyone's saying uh, that we are the favorites for the, the tournament. Uh, so we are just doing our, our work uh, as we always do and not thinking as much as in the finals. Uh, we are just going game by game. E aí, M80, vocês estão ligados que da última vez vocês deram sorte, né? Vocês ganharam lá na, na Arábia, dessa vez não vai ser de, dessa maneira. E o Budega, pelo amor de Deus, né? Você sabe que você vai perder pra mim. I'm Doki, and I'm the entry fragger for G2 Esports. I'm feeling confident about the, the team. I think we've had a little bit of a bumpy road uh, leading up to the tournament, but uh, I think when the when the tournament starts and the games start, like that's where we perform the best, and I have faith and confidence in all my teammates and, and in myself. So uh, yeah, no no problems. I think we're going to do good. So this year we open up the tournament against NIP. They're a really experienced team, and I think they're one of the best teams in Brazil. So yeah, it's going to be you know. It's, Better kick it off with a good game than some boring game. So yeah, you guys have been here before and you've done well. You've achieved the the hammer, but ever since then, I haven't really seen you guys. So uh, I think it's time to take a step back and let the real champions show you how to play each.
358 days ago, the hammer had been lifted. 358 days ago marked the start of the journey of the new world champions. And today marks the beginning of the final stretch. Welcome to day one of the Six Invitational 2024, live from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm your host, Ginny, joined on the desk with Ali and Anne. Welcome to this lovely, warm climate. <laughs> It's been very warm, but it, I mean, it gets us hyped to start this, uh, you know, this tier one competition. SI, it's the main one of the entire year. And I'm just dying to get some tier one competition back on the road again. It's been a little while. Mm -hmm. Some teams haven't played since Atlanta. So very curious what they've been cooking up since. Absolutely. And what a place, you know, we're at SI, but it's hot. It's not cold. Yay! We're in Montreal. So <laughs> it's fantastic. We're, uh, we're really enjoying ourselves at the moment. I cannot wait to get stuck in some Siege. Absolutely. And a lot of Siege is promised over the next two weeks. So if you're wondering, exactly what it's going to be look like don't you worry you have a schedule ready because we're going to be starting off today with the group stage we have 20 teams across four groups competing in a round robin and unfortunately that also means that when we're looking at playoffs all these 16 teams remain so four teams are going to be going home they really are. We, I was having a chat last night, actually, with Tim about this. And we were saying, you know, we were trying to work out what the earliest point is in the week that we could actually start to see, Ooh. you know, which of these teams it is that's going. We couldn't figure it out. We thought it'd be like Friday. You're not or smart something. enough. <laughs> but, you know, because it's best of three, there's so many different permutations, yeah. right? And the groups are stacked. But you know what I'm really looking forward to? And is the live finals oh, with the yeah. Brazilian crowd in yeah. Brazil, considering the fact that we also have so many Brazilian teams here. One of them might end up in the finals, and we all know how that could look like. Yeah, with the Brazilian crowd, of course. Like, they're super passionate. Siege is a really big thing for them. It's really nice to finally have a, a big event with a crowd once again in Brazil. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. And because there's also five Brazilian teams, that means that if you did the maths earlier, four groups, one of them is going to have five, two Brazilian teams in there in total. So looking at these ones, particularly Ali, any group that you think I would never in my wildest year want to be there? I think the group that you got to look at, and it's been branded as the group of death, every tournament has a group of death. It's group C, yeah. right? Yeah. You look at it, it Ooh. is absolutely stacked top through bottom. You've got Bleed, M80, Liquid, VP, and W7M. That is the group with the two Brazilian teams in it, of course, Liquid and W7M. So it's guaranteed that we get one Brazilian team out of that group, because only one can leave. So much talent, so much potential, but you, you just take a look at the other groups. I mean, Group A for me, there's bankers in there as well. Absolutely, and that's what we're gonna be starting with today. Yeah, I mean, Group A, of course, you have the reigning world champions there. It's really important for the storylines for this event, I would say. Also for B, I mean, Wolves and Bliss, I think they've been in the same group <laughs> of every single event this year, so there are no strangers to each other. They're besties. But we have a lot of Siege coming up, so not only are we going to have a stream A, there is also going to be a B stream, which is going to be covering more best of threes. Today, we're going to be starting on the A stream with the absolute banger of G2 going up against NIP. On the B stream, however, if you want to see the classic NA versus EU debate, we have Wolves going up against Space Station Gaming. All in all, both of these channels will have a total of four BO3s a day. That's a whole lot of Siege, and that's a lot of action to be looking at, especially considering that we don't really know what to be expecting. We haven't seen competitive Siege since Atlanta. We've seen a couple of, you know, less than tier one tournaments, yeah. let's say. We've seen some tier two stuff, since some Southreach, and there's been other things popping off all over the world, but we haven't seen that tier one competition, that international competition, and that's where we get so much excitement in Siege. And that's why this first game is gonna be even more special with scratching that itch for that international competition, because we have G2 that won SI in 2023 up against NIP, who also have an SI title under their belt. However, forever looking for that former glory. For sure. I mean, of course, G2 with that most recent SI win, they're going to be looking confident in this matchup, you would imagine. These two teams haven't actually played against each other since the Mexico Major in 2021. So that's been a little while. These rosters have obviously also changed ever since that tournament has happened. But yeah, if you're looking at these organizations, they've had really good results in mm -hmm. Siege so far after ever since they've joined Siege as an organization. But yeah, they know what it's like to have to perform at a major event like this one. Yeah, it also feels like they're really evenly matched when we're looking at their performances in terms of LAN experience, when we're looking at the fact that both of them have lifted the hammer before. But it's going to remain a question of, is that what we're going to be seeing today? You've already touched upon the fact that we haven't really seen a lot of comp competitive siege in the last couple of months. So a lot could have changed. Maybe not much has changed. But something, however, that I want to touch upon is going to be the G2 roster. Because when they did lift that hammer back in 2023, which feels like a lifetime ago, Benja was very new 
to that roster. Benji, but, I think 30 days. Benji been on yeah. roster 30 days or something like that. Yeah. Um, so an incredible feat, really, for G2 in itself to come away with a hammer win because of that fact, because of having such a young pickup on the roster, young in terms of age and young in terms of time spent. Obviously, they've changed that roster a little bit now. They changed it pretty quickly after that SI win, to be honest with you, uh, with the removal of Blur and then picking up Uno. And since picking up Uno, things have gone pretty well, really. They've had some rocky times, but they've also had some success as well. Yeah, I think Atlanta was a pretty big success for them, right? That definitely showed that they were able to perform the way you would expect from uh, from G2. But then in more recent history, you mentioned it, those like less than tier one tournaments that we've had in these regions over the winter. Southbreed, that must have been yeah. a big disappointment for G2. They were the first team to be eliminated from that technical tier two competition, having lost against two teams that we consider academy teams from uh, Europe League teams. That's not the way you want to go down. And, and the way that it looked like as well, I mean, yeah, you can say, okay, you have SI coming up. That's a really big tournament. You want to save some strats. You don't want to give everything away. But you should be winning that game even on the very basics. So I hope that they have had some better preparation coming into this tournament. They have boot camps, so that might be yeah. a promising thing. I mean, that's something to look forward to indeed. And I think you're touching upon the fact that maybe they were hiding strats. I mean, we can play devil's advocate and we can try and debate this for a very long time. But it's going to be coming down to how they're going to be performing today. And something really when it comes to G2, Oli, is that mental warfare where they're like, we want to be the bad guys. But realistically, after having such a loss in a tournament like Southbridge, would you still consider them the bad guys coming into this? I think G2 do a fantastic job of being the bad guys at a LAN environment, right? Mm -hmm. Because they've got that banter. And you're mainly talking about Alamau here. It isn't necessarily we're talking about the whole G2 side. They're a very vocal team, don't get me wrong. You will hear some shouting. You will hear a lot of passion coming out of everybody on the bench. But... Alamau is the exception because he is the player that will very much try and get into people's heads. And I think that's where you've got to sort of look at things and think if Alamau is able to do that, then fantastic. But we've also seen him fail to do that, particularly mm -hmm. against Brazilian sides. He often comes up against quite a lot of opposition here. Yep. And it, it almost goes back to the, well, you sort of left us when you were like the hottest property around. You went over to Europe and stuff. Oh, traitor, so there's yeah. almost that little traitor vibe going on. But he does tend to go a little bit quiet sometimes. Again, those Brazilian sides. But that's the thing, right? It's his former region. That must play a huge part of it. But I'm actually surprised they've been quite quiet so far because <laughs> usually in preparation of a game, we'll hear them screaming to the enemy team. We'll hear them shouting like, I'm coming for you, that type yeah, of stuff. It's like, started it's yet. a mental warfare. But I mean, if you have that confidence, you'll be able to display it in that way as well. Surely it can help you in the mental warfare. I mean, it's like close to 10 a.m. local time, not really gamer hours. They've probably been up <laughs> oh, yeah. for a little bit. So they just need to warm up a little bit into this. But when we're looking at, G when we're looking at NIP, they're a team that also needs to warm up, but not necessarily on the day, Ollie. More into the tournament. It feels like those first couple of games that we see from them just puts them so close to elimination every single time. NIP rarely make things easy for themselves. No? And that's yep. the best way of putting it. You can look at anything you like. You can look at home results inside of the Brasileiro and inside of their own region, inside of Latam, or you can look elsewhere. You can look at things like Copenhagen. You can look at things like Atlanta. Mm -hmm. They never really make it easy for themselves. Mm -hmm. They didn't really make it easy for themselves when they lifted the hammer in 21. It was a lower bracket run. So you've got to have this sort of mentality about you of, they do tend to struggle with that. And it's a very similar core, right? We've got Muzi, Pino, and we've got Psycho. Sure, yep. we've got Wizard, and we've got some difference in the roster mm -hmm. there, but it's the same old NIP, in my opinion, where they do have that slower start. Yeah, and it's also the same old NIP, I guess, in regards of well, gameplay or the style that they bring out yeah. in tournaments as well, right? Because, I mean, Copenhagen probably was their best result this year so far, but then in Atlanta, they found out about themselves, we were too predictable. People yeah. were understanding what we were going to bring out. They're kind of, well, people like to say they're maybe stuck in a little bit of an older play style where they tend to sometimes play very slow, really delay a push or really hold things off. But if they haven't changed their play style coming out of Atlanta for a tournament like this, they might be very predictable for teams coming here. Yeah, and that's a scary thing as well to be looking at when you're NIP, you're like, oh, they they could, you know, predict us, they can get in our heads. But something as well that does, I feel, set them apart a little bit, Ali, is the fact that they have that psychologist with them to Atlanta. They're bringing it again today. So in terms of that mental warfare that we've touched upon a little bit from G2, they like to get in your face. They want to scream at you, they want to shout at you. They can just very much be calm, cool and collected. And that could then bring G2 onto the back foot. It's something we've seen teams do for quite a while now. It's, it's quite a common thing is yep. bringing a psychologist. It's 
can be as important as a coach, as an analyst, all those backroom staff that go into making sure that the team is prepped to know what they're doing in the actual server. You need someone for your head sometimes as well. Yeah. And bringing that psychologist along, hopefully it will give them that little little edge that they do. Or need a chiropractor. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> chiropractor. <laughs> a little hand masseuse or something yeah. like that. You know, I don't know. It's the things that you don't think about when you're playing the video game by yourself in your own room. It's so different as opposed to when you're playing on a LAN environment. There's going to be sound. You're sitting in a different desk, maybe using different peripherals of screen than you're used to using as well. Yeah. We've seen teams warm up with having crowd sounds in the background just to get used to the atmosphere of playing in front of a live audience. And it's just that part of having that either performance coach or psychologist with you that brings these fundamentals to your own mental comfort that people sometimes underestimate. Yeah, I mean, the, that's the thing, right? You need to get to the live audience first because <laughs> yeah. there is not... I mean, we're the live audience for now. We're going to get out of here once the game actually starts. But looking at the playstyle as well of NIP, you've already touched upon a little bit when it's a little bit slower, a little bit more difficult to adapt. Do you feel like that is going to be the entry point for G2 when they can go like, we can go in guns blazing and we can just absolutely give them a run for their money? You've got the option there for, as G2 to sort of employ, you know, the very trendy word at the moment, split theory. It's something that G2 do quite well. And NIP maybe haven't got as firm a grasp on that. And they do tend to lean into that older sort of play style. So it is going to be a little bit of a clash and a butting of heads in that sense in the two play styles that these two teams have. All right. Something to really look forward to. But we are unfortunately going to have to throw it a little bit to a break. And we'll be back with the map veto for this long awaited series. Defending champions, G2 up against NIP who are looking for their former glory. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back shortly.
so, so much for waiting. We're so back. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, but we are ready to get into game. G2 up against NIP. The first game that we're going to be looking at here at the 6th Invitational 2024. You know what? I'm going to do a really mean thing. I'm really sorry, guys, but I want a prediction. You want a prediction? I want a prediction. Oh. Like, go. Know, we've, we've, not all. Even, we've not even seen the maps. Are we making yeah. a prediction? Yeah. Maps it's are ridiculous. Maps are really no, it's just like a blind to... prediction. Yeah. If you have to, like, like let like the spirits of Siege guide you. I can't do it. You don't, you can't or you don't want to? No, but I like both of these teams. Obviously, yeah. I like G2 because it's, they're from Europe. Difficult. And I like NIP because I've, I've spent a lot of time casting Brazil. Like, And, and what you said as well, I that's think personal bias. A prediction is <laughs> really dependent on what kind of maps we're going to. Because I think G2 have a deeper map pool. So going into a map of the best of three map veto, they should have an advantage in that. They can kind of play around that, put NIP on maps that they're maybe not so comfortable on. So I guess regarding that, maybe I might lean towards G2. Ooh, so you're telling me if I give you guys the full map veto, you yes. would give me a prediction? Yes. Okay, deal made. Let's start deal. off with the bans in terms of what we're not going to be looking at when it comes to these. We're not going to be looking at Oregon Border Labs or Bank. Anything standing out to you here, Ollie, that you think, wow, that's crazy? I mean, there's no real surprise there for me inside no. of that map veto, considering both sides. We've got NIP coming out with the Oregon ban, coming out with the Labs ban. They're maps that they don't really like to play. NIP really like to avoid Labs. G2 on the flip side, they love it. And Border is a little bit more of an unpredictable one for G2. Clubhouse, though. Yeah, this is a very curious pick, I would say, from uh, from NIP, because we haven't seen them play this map since September. It is not really a low preference map for them, though, because they were willing to bring it out as a decider against SSG for their on-stage game in Atlanta. It's just, we haven't seen it from them. It comes down to very basic stuff. We have seen G2, of course, on this map. It's a bit of a lower preference that they have played in the South Breach on this, on this map. It's just, what are NIP going to bring out on it? Because we haven't seen it from them since September. When you're talking about the basic stuff, particularly on clubhouse we touched upon the fact that g2 on south beach was not necessarily that good at the basic stuff back then yeah. is that a worrisome sign for you ollie i think it always goes down into two things right you can always talk about basics and then hiding things fundamentals yeah. are something that shouldn't just disappear because you are saving strats for si it isn't something you know that general team play that general cohesion that's something that should be there and there's maybe a thought that you could say g2 perhaps didn't take south breach as seriously as they okay. could have done maybe didn't have enough time I'm in the lead up prepping up to it for whatever reason because guess what it is the off season like these guys have got lives so you maybe give them off you know give them a little bit of a you know get them off the hook with that really would you give him a prediction well give me a prediction i think we'll, i think i think we'll see three maps Okay. I'm happy yeah, to okay. give that prediction. All right. Well, we're going to see whether or not the cast are going to agree with that one because we are ready to head into the first game of Six Invitational 2024. G2 up against NIP, casted by our lovely M and Hap. Thank you very much, Shinny. And yes, we are here. We are back. We are live. Six Invitational has returned once again, but this time in the home of Brazil. That's Hap. I'm Fluke. It's going to be very exciting to see uh, how these Brazilian teams will do on their home turf for once. They didn't have to travel half the world. It was everybody else that had to come towards them. Come to Brazil. And as we get started, Clubhouse being the first map. We I mean, we looked at that. Let's and talk about this. Yeah, let's talk about this. Because I'm, I'm going to, analyst desk, if you're listening, I'm sorry. I'm going to open up our beautiful friendship with an argument. I think this is base. Because it's not that NIP have a lower preference on it. G2 do not play it at tier one. Yeah. Yeah, they played it in South Breach. They had a very poor showing of it at Gamers 8. And then they haven't played it at any of the majors, any of the big performances when it's a high preference map. They've left it open as what is usually their first ban preference at any of the majors they've been at. NIP have fallen for the bait. G2, what are you cooking up here? Well, that, that, that's the thing, because I looked at it and I was a bit like, huh, like, there must be a reason behind. There's no way they, they make a mistake on day one in the first map band phase and leave that open. So there has to be a reason there. G2, they must have kicked something up. And NIP, well, they, uh, they've they always felt a bit comfortable going there. Haven't really played the last six months. Yeah, but they overall have a really good record over the years. So it's going to be a, a good start. Okay, we also are very lucky to be blessed by many of the big brains around us, and it's the beauty of SI. You're surrounded by very cool, very clever people, and you've also got occasionally people like Fresh, who you can go and be like, Fresh, what's your story smart. here? What's your, huh? I say he's not smart. He's not, we have smart people he's and beautiful. we have Fresh. Goodbye, Tuberau. We'll talk about these bands probably 
in a second in the sort of spread of things onto club. But one of the sort of conversations that has apparently gone on behind the scenes around G2, especially when they sort of brought in Uno, was to get themselves re-leveled on defaults. Bring themselves back towards a default game of Siege because Siege is a game of twos, two halves, and two major play styles at this moment in time. You have the much talked about and aforementioned split theory, and then you also sort of have the old school style of Siege, the defaults, the takes, your your approaches from Virtus Pro style takes, yeah. and this is a game where you've got NIP that are very good at the classical side of things, and the opposite end of this. All right, so as we uh, get going, Craft face in the meantime, on the way. So, the, I mean, I, I'm living for the rumba. <laughs> I'm living for the rumba that we're, we're vibing around. But out. now it's business time. And here we go, G2 versus NIP opening us up on stream A now. If it's your first aside, there are two streams that are running parallel to each other because there's just so much siege happening. Yeah, we do have to say, though, you will hear Tim. In you Bible will hear from Tim. Now on. And occasionally, <laughs> you might hear us slip through, but you will hear Tim, Ace of Pyrite. Um, we're on the other side. We're, he's in a different continent, and yeah. we can still hear each other. Now, when we talk about, and I know I briefly alluded to it before, but I'll go a little bit more in depth. The two styles, uh, the slower one that NIP does is much more set up. They've actually struggled at the new idea of breaking yeah. things apart. You'll see them. It's not entirely a confidence thing, but they like to have the full control. This is where things might get shaken up. Look at how Alamau is trying to bite his way into this approach. They shake the tree and see what falls off the back. And when NIP gets shook, sometimes it can entirely take the wheels off an approach. No, for sure. And I think Clubhouse is one of those maps where defaults and fundamentals are really part of the play. So maybe the slower kind of game style from NIP is actually working out for them here. Usually they have to warm up and really get into a tournament. But having a map like this to start off on oh. might actually be quite beneficial. As Doki gets the very first kill onto Psycho, opens it up and takes down the IQ. This is entirely it. So split theory, the other end that you'll hear broken down, picked up and re-evaluated every single time. A very layman's approach is look for opportunities all across the map and see what you can take. G2 love it. They thrive in it. They try to be the sort of propagation of the motion of it in the meta as well. They want to be the first step. Doki cannot decide if he wants to be in front of or behind this mirror window or because of this. Hey, who did Doki kill in this position? It was an IQ. I was actually going to be mentioning that. He's trying to stop those drones from finding those cameras as well. And with the IQ gone now, the information game heavily in favor of G2. And that allows him to just pop up every now and then, take those fights and try knock, and knock. put themselves in the advantage right here. Now they're looking to open up on the hatch, but there it is. The claws are coming oh, out nice. and Avengers making sure that hatch stays shut. Gonna try and do it uh, via, uh, you know, the soft flooring next to it. It is possible with Xkyro, so you just need to be really precise. And that's not what he's trying to do. Yeah, he's he, trying he, to get the claw. He's getting the claw. He's baiting the claw there as Doki baits another player. That's twice! He is using that single camera on that stairs and biting in. An unfun fact, can't find the third as he's finally put down by cons, but 40 seconds left here. And this is when we highlight this slower approach, a bit of a panic shot. And the unfun fact is NIP, both majors they've been at, they've lost their opening game. They struggle to get into tournaments. They've struggled to get into the first round of this so far, and it's a much longer series. A best of three they'll be playing through. We have a lot of siege in this showdown ahead of us, but G2, they're making sure they're just as uncomfortable here on their home territory as they've been in NA and in EU. With the Deagle to finish it off there for Virtue, a bit of a style point early on, and I mean, this is something we know from G2. They like to play that mental game. They need to find that momentum and really bring that going. And, you know, if you have such a dominant first round, why not try and go for a bit of star points in the end there? Important to mention, though, the camera gameplay that we saw from G2 early, those Valkyrie cams, absolutely crucial. Taking down the IQ before they could actually take out any of those cameras, even more so, because then they can just keep bouncing on the information they get and basically always have a bit of a leg up. Uh, oh, there's no drones ahead of them either. And Benja finding this kill, by the way, it was such a shame because comes, he just walks in, he checks it, and at the moment he registers the player, flicks off, and then realizes, ah, oh, there was someone out there. That I mean, small the mistake. IQ going down yes. the first sort of bait yes. there against the Valkyrie that's playing aggressive, it doesn't spell great. 
Then you get the Habana swinging with 40 seconds left. Missing the X Kairos is the sign of, uh-oh, we're under a bit more pressure than we wanted to be at this. It's club. Yes, it's default. It can be slow. It works into the favor of those teams. However, taking into consideration the sort of nerves of coming into this major, taking into consideration how they've often started these majors, it hasn't always been their best, has been their first day. They, they like to boil, they like to cook, they like to be a sort of slow burn into the blaze by the end of it. And this is as fun as it can sort of be as a comparison, old style versus new style happening on the oldest style of map. The fact that this even got through, I mean, as I said, for my money, this is G2's to prove. There goes Uno, the proof is not out. A different kind of game uh, that we're seeing for the second round. Of course, we're no longer in the basement. It takes a lot of time to set yourself up for it. We're now finding ourselves upstairs. And I feel that if you're looking at the setup here, we have two architects coming in, and Nira and Azami, uh, two very prevalent uh, operators that we're still seeing to this day, uh, especially Mira, for example, really making it hard on the attacker, trying to slow it down as much as they can. Of course, Super Round has been banned. We promised we'd come back to it later. We did. I was just about to say I forgot to come back to it later. Look at Doki's trying to come what are you doing? Gons is able to punish him this time round. He was obviously very successful with that style of step up to the plate and knock it out of the park in the previous, but this time not quite getting the same momentum behind it. A five versus three. Loads of time here for NIP as they start to look into Logi. Look at Wizard underneath as well. The Capitao can try and cause some destruction and damage. Obviously, since the frag grenades have been oh. changed and pulled away there's new adaptations on pushes and that is a very clever one look at that right in the cubby rotation yeah. forced out by the smoke muzi pushes up the main brick stairs trying to get the angle and the swing on the player they don't know he's here there's so much noise there's the win on the fight though virtue doing all he can cons keeps the double up there's a low health onto the mirror a minute 10 again still loads of time here as benja bites back across the door have some important rotations though, but the fire now is going to be stopping Benja from stopping this plant from happening as Gonza is getting himself in behind the weight. Is there a rotation downstairs? Yes, there is Virtue with the C4. <gasps> the drop comes through. The diffuser is now on the bottom floor though. And that means if Benja can hold on to the main stairs with Pino being down in this 1v1 situation, G2 might still turn it around. Right, Flashbangs are coming through. Gonza knows around his position, but he's not able to connect the shots. Boy Wonder Benja was the driving force behind them winning their last SI and he here he is, opening up the round with some huge play against Cons, who's fighting in his first ever SI2. Over the sides! And it's Benja that gets the double and the lockout. But these are the kind of rounds you want to see from our lobby in this tournament that will have the highest amount of SI champion hammer holders going head to head. Seven out of the 10 players, was it, have raised this hammer Seven before. out of the 10. And with that, it is going to be a very heavy matchup to come through. And I was going to say, okay, Uno drops first. Happens. It was a bang to come through. Maybe he was trying to go for a spawn peak. Those things happen. Oh, look at that. Just the kill from Benja onto the highway there. True, quickly rotating back. But Doki going aggressive as soon as the wall was opened up. He's like, there's no drone. I can try. Missed his shots after that. G2 finds himself in a well, poor position. And I have to say, <laughs> The C4 being tossed up to try and find a diffuser. You lost the gunfight, but what happened? The person with the diffuser is now down on the ground floor. Down on the ground floor. What does Benji need they, to do? Hold the stairs. They got the down on the other player as well, obviously. They're sort of playing with the information there. Fantastic round from Benjamin. And as I said, if, you, um, you know, if you've gotten into Siege throughout the year, if you didn't watch SI last year, Benja was the MVP. Benja was the best player in a tournament where he'd only been with the team. It was about a month, a month and a half yeah. as a young prodigy coming into what is a very high pressure environment, what is a very high pressure team and sort of organization with a lot of heft behind it. And now you see him start to start to spark early on, and it makes it very exciting. Pino on the Ying. He might not know how close he is to a potential fight here into Strip, but it's Benja, actually, that well, gets caught out by Psycho. Once again, Psycho able to get the entry over the past well, two rounds. A little bit of damage done towards him, though, and they're still afraid of a potential run out to come through. Now, this is CCTV. This is uh, known as the worst side to defend nowadays. It used to be one of the best, but because 
it has been so, you know, tested and, and, and tried upon by any single team. Everybody knows how to attack it nowadays. If you think of a step-by-step -step plan on how to attack a site, this is the site that comes to your mind in what is probably one of the most default takes you'll ever see. It starts with opening up the ball, starts with then getting that garage, or if you're going from the opposite side of things, you're making sure that you get construction control. And that is maybe what we're seeing a little bit here from the sides of NIP. You see that uh, E1D in the meantime going off fast. Drones are setting up for uh, the uh, the bedroom side of things. But Doki is out there as well just to count that drone. So he's going to be trying to put his banner in the works out here. They're exploring the map, exploring the space, putting pressure as far out as I can. Uh, as I said, they will try to. Um, you, know, you, know, you count the amount of times you can shake NIP's approach. You see if you can make them feel uncomfortable. That's why they're going for these bikes, these peaks, these early plays, because NIP, if you let them set up, will demolish whatever you've got on the back line. You've got to make them uncomfortable here on the approach. They're going for the rotate down towards the bottom of Garage. Virtue, he might not just know every angle that's being shot at him right now. I mean, there's also like a hard breach, right? So they really just have to go for this. This is a jump down <laughs> again. A bit of an over aggressive play from G2 after they're a man I mean, down, losing it again. And yes, fire was coming down. Yeah, I don't think he had a choice. But it's like you still have so many panels to hide behind. It's yeah. like jumping down is basically a guaranteed death at that point. I think I think he was sort of like, I can die this way or I can die this way. But this way, I might get a kill. It's throwing yourself out a back window. There's Uno. Oh, if he had a state crouched, he might have been able to get himself out of there. A very, very quick take back, but look at the time. They have a big man advantage, but there's still two players to get rid of inside. Doki is the solus. If they get underneath, there's a lot of soft there. There's the first fight. It goes into the favor of Alamau. Two versus three, 15 seconds. The Echo Drone is quick swap to it. Wizard into the default plant spot with Doki getting one more. He's underneath, rotating his way up towards the top of red. They're going to swing this together, the two versus two. As they get back up, but now it's a two versus one. There's the swing from Doki! And G2, your reigning SI champions, a 3-0 on their opening game. And that's the second round in a row right now where it was a 5-3 advantage for NIP, which they weren't able to convert into a round win. G2 showing that resilience out there, the ability to come back by team play as well. So well done for them, 3-0 up. And again, you know, we were looking at Clubhouse and we're like, there's a reason why G2 left this open. They expected NIP to pick this if they were going for it. Actually, timeout to be called right now, as you see the coach, uh, you know, starting to talk as well. 45 seconds is what they have to try and get things together. And I can only assume that NIP is going to have a discussion right now. We really need to convert these 5v3s. I mean... We have a two-minute advantage. Uh, they need to have more of a discussion. This is their map pick. As I said, this was the sort of... Hey, oh, it's G2 going, oops, we've left Clubhouse open. Why, why have we done this? Why is Clubhouse open? Oops. Oopsie. Oops. Did not expect that to happen. And, you know, they have a game. And, yeah, NIP, it's not a, a sort of large preference map from them. It's not one of their top-end ones that they throw themselves into. They've had a little bit more success on it. They've picked it a couple times. They've not played it as much. Um, and they've not banned it as much, whereas, you know, it's sort of a first or, or a second ban preference. It's something that G2 will always remove. I almost got my predictions of maps entirely right. The only swap was Border. I assumed yeah. Border would be NIP's map because G2 would leave it in Banout Club. And lo and behold, here we are. The opposite. Now... It is a uh, tech pause that we uh, we are headed into after the tech. You, you actually see the uh, the officials working. Out of work. You know, just just quickly uh, doing out some swaps or some changes that need to be done to get everything going again. It sometimes amazes me how quickly they can like you know ch change all that stuff, figure out what the issue is. Sometimes you see like entire PC changes and like. That is good response to Psycho. I don't know if there was a drone on him that realized that, you know, something like that was going on, or... Did he know? Oh, he was already aimed towards the spot. They yeah. expected the play, but th this is the Attack sort of meat of it. As you said, you get yourself into a five versus three. You get your... It, it, and not being able to lock it down is bad. You get it into it when you have a minute yeah. on the clock, yeah. and you're attacking a sort of default. Whether you have hard breach or not, you can still formulate takes with trades. I agree, but I'm also going to say if they had hard breach, it would have been a different take, and it would have come in from 
uh, the balcony and from garage whilst having someone on highway, but now there was no hard breach. So what did they have to do? They had to enter from all different kinds of spots, which Alamau could just hold off from that one position and basically stall for a while. So yes, they should be able to transition it. However, because they didn't have hard breach, it was easier for G2 to hold <laughs> off on it. Do you know what they did have? What did they have? A Ying. Yes, Do you know what that Ying did? Not use Candelas. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the sort of sticky position. That's the warm-up time we talk about with NIP as a team is there's plays, there's ideas that if they have that lineup on day two or day three, you'll see them almost bring something a little bit different, a little bit yeah. sharper, which is maybe what's the buy the books run. The core of NIP are hammer holders. Three of them have been able to get it lofted above their heads a couple years ago, and then they didn't make the following SI. They did not get themselves back on the back-to-back. -back. Yeah. And now here they are, sort of stepping into the fight with two new players that have never touched that hammer before. It was it in cons. And where their entry statistic can be fantastic, uh, they don't really follow it up with a lot of meat a lot of the time. No. And then that's always that, that, that age-old conversation, right? Great if you get the entry, but you need to follow it through. You need to convert it into more and a round win. And that's kind of where you need to play that trading game. You need to... Oh, Benji's typing easy on the wall. I don't know if you saw that. Uh -oh. That's from G11 there. So it seems like they're already uh, figuring out that they've won this game. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Is this the famous, famous last word? This could be a famous last word. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's a confidence. You look at the spread of the team, but also you look at two of those rounds, big clutch bites. One of them by Benja, pretty much solely. Then he's the first body gone in the next round, but Doki and Alamal yeah. are able to sort of batten down the hatches and hold on. It's the power of G2's roster, but also it can be the floor of G2's roster. And it's not that NIP are a team that will be shaken by the mind game. If you haven't watched the documentary that was made around Atlanta and the team mm -hmm. playing through them, it's fantastic. Do give it a watch at some point. But G2 are one of those teams where they say, we are the best at mental warfare. We are the bad guys. And it doesn't always work. <laughs> no, sometimes it comes back to bite them a little bit. Yeah, there's and, nothing, you know, you know, superhero films are the most popular. People love it when the good guys beat the bad guys. Yeah. If you frame yourself as the bad guys, it can give the good guys more energy. Captain America will pick up that hammer and, and go to town, you know? Oh, Spoiler Brazil alert. In this case. Sorry. <laughs> Captain. Oh, Capitano. Capitano. Yeah. By the way, it is uh, top floor clear, working the way down right now. Doki still finds himself I mean, in, in the me. freezer. Yeah, he's holding on and there's a minute 30. Now, there is an IQ on the board again, and if he uses the solar scanner, they should be aware oh. of his position, but as Alamal finds the kill onto Pino, that might actually distract uh, the attention away. His virtue finds M uh, Musi as well through the hatch that was just opened up. And this just makes Doki's position more powerful. He's sitting, he's waiting. He might have actually been frozen to the spot at this point. Psycho's running around. They've got to try and fill the sort of gaps. You lose your ying, and I said they didn't use the candelas that last round. They can't use them. This round if you're going for this hatch drop if you're going for this pressure you can't do much of it look at how g2 with those two bodies reinforced church yeah. wall relocked it back up that is the sort of attention of we have the body advantage let's make things more awkward and uncomfortable for them to have to try and break through let's not give them an a route that's uh, indeed we don't need to use this anymore to get an advantage look at the keeper barriers as well though on the actual door frames which means you need crouching underneath if you want to get through or blow it up first now believe there's at least something coming not quite sure if they have explosives <laughs> ready and then uh, just waiting he's going to be striking any moment duh. right now it's just a question of time duh, as duh. wizard gets a little duh, bit of damage Virtue, Doki finds Wizard still up above as Alamau gets a C4 kill onto Psycho. Khan's now on the hunt, will find Doki, so no flawless round for G2. I mean, Cons has been that sort of force player for the team right now. He's one of only three to actually get kills across it. Goes for the drop, not many bullets in the Type 89. Enough to take the head off of a second player, but at this point it's just padding stats on the exit. G2 bounce for their fourth in a row after NIP's tack timeout. This is NIP's map. And if they don't find themselves, at least I would say two rounds. One if you're feeling yeah. fluffy on your defense. But G2, quite a good attacking team when they're on form. And we have to say, right, Clubhouse is more of a 50-50, especially CCTV still being around that often. I mean, 
that, that is one of the sides you really need to have. And they missed it in the first attempt. Bedroom is coming up next, which means that we might see another CCTV as the sixth round. Or bar, who knows? Yeah. They don't know what you do. They always try different kinds of stuff. And... I mean, again, aggression coming out from uh, G2 there in the right position. I love that rotate. Hatch open up. The door to door, the, the cor long corridor yeah. door towards the sort of stock rotate as well. If you're playing that bite, you could see the mirror was getting the read on who's above stock hatch. Yeah. And as we said, the longer the time goes on, the more invincible Doki becomes and feels because they're not looking anywhere else. But uh oh, we have to be on the site. They just didn't know he was there. And that, that's like, look at that sometimes back. you see these calls uh, coming out. Sorry, uh, despite their major appearance, NIP only played one European team since September last year, which they beat. Yep. Attackers are moving out to locate. Yeah, I mean, better than on, on cafe. I think that's the sort of thing about NIP is. Okay. Oh. Doki gets the opening there onto Wizard. Dokkabi is gone. And Wizard, if you look at their entry statistic from the year, one of the best rated entry players across anything. Can't quite get the balance of bodies, often loses life not long after. But getting that first bite is huge. Talking of huge, here's a big Frenchman with a shield. Yeah. This is new approach here. They're tired, I think, of playing this sort of push around. However, when you've lost the Dockerby calls, when you've lost the gun behind Monty, they're yeah. now down in a weird way. Two guns, they're down. That's it. Like you, you just have to, you know, walk extended and try and be a nuisance for someone else to actually find those kills. But also, usually, Monty is a bit of a crutch. Things are not going the way we want to. We need to be able to shepherd out these players more efficiently. And that should bring that Monty. And Psycho now leading the charge, but there is still players downstairs that NIP need to be aware of. That's also the change. This is fear. That roster on the right-hand side, you look at that and go, they are a bit terrified because they've also got the Nomad. Muzi, huge! Huge player, one of the smartest, quickest brains that we've seen in clutch situations, especially. Oh, and he's now on the, I've got to watch our backs. It's another gun taken out of the push and the pressure, more time taken away there. Impact tricking and juggling and playing against the break. The flash is over the top to stop the impact. But with all of this utility dumped here onto the first entrance, they just step back. The site is obviously pushed across. They're gonna trust the air jabs behind them. You're looking at a Solus again underneath soft floor. We've seen them play that game. Doki, he's gone for the rotate. They were able to get plays against it with C4s from underneath. NIP, the time is so, so filtered away from them. There's no more exothermics either. You know what that means? Jacuzzi stays closed. There's a single doorway they can be headed through right now. And that is where all their hopes and dreams will be relying on to try and find this round. Pino playing on highways, trying to find himself with a pick on someone that's on the site that's kind of dislocated themselves. But G2's not really moving. And Psycho walks into a crossfire right oh, now. No! The gone. And I believe that might be the diffuser dropped as well as Dopey oh. finds cons. Only Pino and Muzi left now to try and salvage this round. Make that only Muzi. He finds himself outside. He's holding the stairs rotation. Hasn't found any success so far. 30 seconds. Might just let that run out. Use this as another timeout. What had G2 prepared on Clubhouse? Why have G2 hidden this map from any international major tournament for as long as they have? I mean, they are sort of demonstrating a great performance here against NIP. This is the one team, as I said before, NIP hadn't fought against throughout the group stages, throughout the majors this year. The one team that, to be fair, they haven't played technically as an org versus an org. I think the last time these orgs met, which was obviously very different rosters, yeah. was back in Mexico. It was a long time ago since they've met indeed. Of course, yeah, different rosters. Very it's always, different. Always the, I think there was like the two team. players the same. Yeah. All right. 5-0. 5-0 here. And this is when I guess we'll sort of maybe talk about the format. Again, if it's your first SI, there's the split of groups. One team from each group will not be progressing into the next stage. The importance of winning your opening game could be the difference of going home or not. Because if you sort of paint it as a picture of, well, if we got one win on the first day and this team suffers against everybody else, one win could technically secure. You want more. Oh, that's true. You want more to progress. However, G2, current hammer holders, it was an entirely lower bracket run that got them yeah. their invitational win. And I don't think they want to redo the lower bracket oh, run. Oh, no, terrible. They, they would prefer to do it in the upper However, they did say, because 
they've obviously had two performances at the two majors this year. Yeah. The first major in Copenhagen, they came through in stage two and struggled. They still got to live stages, but they struggled. Yeah. At Atlanta, they had the early games to warm up, and then they were playing better. They were playing tighter. They they said themselves that, you know, being on the long road makes you more prepared for all the games ahead. They yeah. trust their longevity. They've changed it up, NIP, this time around. They're going to be using um, Heart Breachers. Again, the open kill will go to G2, however. But as they don't actually don't open it up, it have been electrified. Oh, no. Or was that? No, but they opened up the mirror window and used it like that. Yep. And, I mean, some people would say, that's a waste of a mirror window. No. But it's not, because you have the opportunity to take out. And then, yes, there is a little bit of a slip, but no one can walk through. And that walking through, that's the big danger of that wall being opened up. This is the sort of problem right now, is there's a disconnect between what NIP is doing. Obviously, they lose Psycho at this split. If you've got an Ash, I didn't quite have the full lock on where it happened, but I'm assuming they tried to get themselves in underneath to put pressure under that mirror window. Force them away from it. You can then sort of say, you're not going to play this. We get the breach open. They still went for the roll of the exothermic. They went towards the repel. I'm not sure if they were trying to get into position to watch and swing, but it was too quick for them. They weren't ready to maybe try and take a bite, take a bit of advantage, because if you see a mirror window on that wall, you know what's going to happen. LMAO's six senses just started tingling there. He's like, I am being watched. <laughs> Turns around and there's a drone just sitting oh. there. Bino drops in hot though. Wizard the logistics. Down on the back end, just outside the window itself. They can't quite get in a position to secure it. But Alamau now on the swing round right into Muzi's gunfire. Tricky situation to be in there for Alamau. He wanted to see if he could maybe get a punish on a sprinted player, but he held the angle a little bit longer. There's the end of Wizard, Benjamaster. Gets the finish on the player, three versus three. Just over a minute left here. You can hear Echo Drones no longer usable, but whirring behind. Uno still with the C4 and some control on towards Garage. Again, vertical play. It is a big component Ooh. of this. We know the default plant spots. And now, as you can see, that just trying to find their first lead in here. Pino is getting the close wall open. Muzi might go for the rotate as the Kiba barricade. Yep, there it is. Gets the construction back on the window. Now, Uno in a very important spot here with that mirror window. They just tried to take it out with the Excaros. Pino, quick jump in, quick back out again. But those Excaros have been taken care of. And as long as Virtue plays below, there's also no pressure coming in from the red stairs. So that is definitely something they're trying to do. But Virtue gets taken down. And now an advantage here for NIP. They're trying to take out uh, the actual staircase player here. C4 comes in. We'll actually get the kill before the gunfight comes through. Muzi up to the garage stairs as Pino will find the kill to red. Pino gets onto Uno. Muzi has gone down. It's a one versus one and Benja's been in this situation before. How did it end? With a Benja round. How did oh. it end? With a Benja round and a G2 half. Six in a row on NIP's opening map and things are looking very shaky for the home crowd team. For a second, it felt like they, you know, okay, realized... It felt like Muzi. It felt like Muzi had it covered <laughs> there. I mean, you know, the operator selection, heart breaches there. Shows you, okay, they want to go for a default. The mirror window out there really threw the spanner in the works, really made sure that, okay, well, I mean, we're going to try, but we can't really guarantee that this wall will be opened up. And thus, the mirror window pops, they shoot out the exothermic, and boom, wall stays shut. They have to go for plan B. And Muzi gets two great kills. Uh, again, right call from Alamo to try and go for a refrag in that situation. A lot of these burnouts that we see early I on mean, to be in the entries. There it was. As I said, you know, what Alamau was doing there was hoping, okay, they got that kill. Maybe they'll try and move on to the pickup. There, Benja with the long watch. And the longer watch swung around close, took the fight, put the pressure onto them. Fucking go, Benja! Bleep! Beep, 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 beep. Sorry, you, you put a Scotsman on a camera, you know what you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're starting off in the bedroom Six, here. Oh, there was a okay. little bit of a change of the roster here. Um, before we went through, there, there was a Ying, there was some Candelas, the Ash as well. It seems like they've gone for something where they're not going to pull the pace back a little, but try and drive some control in. We have a stretch across the map. That's probably the lead in. Realizing just where the NIP players are on the top floor, Muzi especially, and saying, well, instead of trying to put the pressure down to the site and against those hatches, which are going to be kited anyway, he's on the board, Thatcher isn't. We can maybe do this, cut away across, force the players down on a rotate, make things awkward for them, and then just get the kill onto one of the two stair sets. 
you know, trying to play this on the uh, vertical angle. Right. Seems like they're unaware. Spots out a player, gets the down onto Doki. Not quite to confirm <laughs> until the shotgun blast comes through. And now Benja's just looking up like, okay, there's Oops. someone there. That's, uh, that's a shame that we lost Doki out there. But I mean, luckily there's six more rounds. If this one goes south to, to still cover it off. And that's this round still in place. So Virtue finding Muzi is going to be uh, equaling the score pretty quickly here. Well, the first body gone, and I guess maybe I gave too much credit towards the idea of knowing where they were, but look at Benja. He's about to come down these main stairs, and Wizard goes down because of it. They didn't quite have the camera on the watch. There's the fight all the way. It's a hell of an angle. Double down, and Benja, I said he had a huge, huge performance at the previous SI. He's feeling a little bit supersonic. The two drop caught out and rocked. There's not much Benja can do at this point to battle against it. Alamau's about to be rounded upon on the back end of CC. He's watching for this though and wins out the fight against Pino on the second story. Benja's still holding onto the main stairs itself. Doubles down a two versus two. However, all of the structure of sight is still in place. They're going for the pickup sticks and rotate round. They know the diffuser is down in dirt. They need to try and find cons and maybe get like a second player on it. So what we could see is maybe one pushing in from blue, holding uh, the walk out there. And Alamout, as he drones himself, needs to get off quickly. He's both on one HP right now. A single that shot is sense. enough to kill either of them. The flashbang comes in and the rotate out as well from cons, <gasps> who drops eventually. And that means the diffuser can now be recovered by the side of G2 with Benja now being able to support on Psycho as well. Psycho needs to hold on here. A huge history player caught and blinded in the middle, gets Benja and pops round to see if he can try and get Alamout down. As you said, a sliver of health. 30 seconds, all the pings are coming through. The blind as well. They hit the rotate just in time and get themselves off towards the side of blue. Alamau, he's going to see if he can stick it behind the bomb chassis. He might not know about the rotate. There it is. The swing of the impact. He's not seen him slip through on towards blue. Oh, maybe he's just got the reed spraying against everything and hoping for the catch. There's the ping on the player. There's Alamau trying to get it on the back of the heart. He baits the plant, but it is Psycho! Huge experience. He's held these stages. He's held the trophy, and he's held Alamau at bay. And G2, one round. But there's still another five if they want to try and keep this map. The amount of time Psycho has been full flush there. <laughs> I don't know if you count. It was like three times. He managed to get like one kill as well onto Benja whilst being full flushed able to navigate around. And that's experience, by the way. That's just knowing the map yep. in your sleep with your eyes closed. Because he was flashed, he's able to rotate through from one room to the other and still find a fight on the player that's inside blue. It's like F1 races. It's, it's, it's like you have drive with they, their they, eyes closed. They can drive with their eyes closed. They know yeah. the turns. Psycho, Psycho knows the turns. He knows where he needs to go. And, you know, being in the one Second versus two there, being able to get that first lead-in fight onto Benja, keep himself moving as well. There's a, a, a do or die attitude because, well, what else can there be at this point? They get one. It was on the first pick site. There are shakier of sites. They've still got to get through the double down on electricity here. Both the bandit, both the Kaid, they want to play a very shut door game. And it, you know, it, it, on this map, I'm not going to say it's entirely predictable on how to shut it down, but it's very well rehearsed on every side. I mean, it's just to get one on one side and one on the other, so you yeah. can keep tricking. However, there's a small issue with the uh, emphasis on small. Uh, it's Doki on the Maverick. Yeah. Just open up and bypass. I think, A, love the burn on Stoki, but B, <laughs> this is the thing about Clubhouse is in all of its history across all of the metas, it's a multi-hard breach bring sort of map. You, you always have that pressure. Uh, Psycho, they've been in a consistent back and forth with that entry statistic. It's in the positive for them this time. They're still working on the sort of back end before, and there's the Maverick getting the burn through that wall. If you've not seen that before, you take the top and the bottom off, well, then it all becomes yeah. soft. You can just smash out the middle, which is what Alamau is coming over to do, but you don't want to get caught when you go for the drop as well, because soft walls can be shot through by both teams. You'll be yeah. thrilled to know. It, it is still a wall, it's just not a bulletproof. Ooh, do they know of the player on red? No, they don't know, but I do know about the player that's in uh, the inside of the camp. But it, that might actually be a bit of a bait coming through. Yeah, if he just swings this without the knowledge of the player onto red, I mean, we've seen a bit of punishment before. They've got the shield, they've got to rotate as well, and 
this is just to sort of hold them at bay. They could fall in down to the right-hand side. The drone at the bottom, the pressure on the shield. They're watching now for the rotate. The buck over the top, the spray through. The pressure's going to come up the stairs as well, but it's an awkward fight to take. They're sort of hoping they can just get that shut down. They duck as Pino's able to get Doki in the split. Virtue's swinging in the corner and gets the Kaid, but doesn't quite get the back Oh, It's back and forth, though. A little bit crazy. A two versus two, technically. Pino is in a very dangerous position, so they're not going to be able to get him picked up in time. But once again, with just around a minute left here, you've got a two versus two. And G2 definitely got the better of that because they had the initial loss as well. So they were down on numbers. They've managed to bring it back to a two and two. Of course, you'd like to have the advantage, but it's not always going to be possible. And what they need to do now is just try and isolate one of these players, try and take the fight together so they can push in right afterwards on that final one overwhelm them. We find ourselves in this interesting situation where you've got the two sort of IGL voices of G2. Obviously, Alamau taking the lead in the push and Uno going for that sort of cool-headed clarity versus the two new guns of NIP, the oh, two that have sort of come into their first SI here and getting themselves onto the pressure alongside these oh, champions. And they're going to see if they can try and keep the flag waving and keep the pressure onto club. There's the drop of Alamau on the back end. He gets caught out by the goon mine. There's Uno trying to put the pressure onto the windows at the same time. Cannot quite get the lockdown. It's suddenly a two versus one with not a huge amount of time here. It might just have been a little bit too much structure. The Legion, who is in a very good place in the meta, in their power and their abilities, causing all sorts of problems. NIP, second round. Now, they were actually aware of Wizard and his position. The drones were spotting him out. However, the Goo Mines being the problem there, because as soon as Alamai wanted to come in from the back, oh, Goo Mine gets alerted. Hey, someone is trying to push me from Logi. And Uno wasn't able to get the catch as soon as they moved past that mattress. And because of that, uh, able to turn it around for NIP. So the Goomine's really given away the last second information that was necessary there. This is where things get sticky. CCTV, I assume, will be going to, or bar stage. Both of them tricky sites to hold on to. Both of them tricky places to go. CC is where the coin has landed. But, you know, although we've seen it not be massively successful here, as you alluded to earlier, as a site, it dropped off in favor a huge amount because of how easy it became to attack, because of how easy it became to put pressure onto it. We're looking at a situation here where it's becoming scrappy outside the site, and then it's a two versus two towards it with a lot of the structure still standing. Will G2 try and lean in towards breaking the structure here and put some pressure onto something a bit more traditional? You're looking at that lineup on the left. You're thinking, there's a garage take, there's a rafters take, there's some control of potentially the stairs mm -hmm. in the back end. There's, you know, the, the one swap of the hard breach there, but there's, you assume tin openers in the pocket, at least two. Yeah, yeah there it is. I think they want to bring the Habana to be a bit more flexible so you can do it from range rather than having to be up against the wall especially oh, with a mirror window out doing? there what are you going We're for here cons i'm taking them out just an early opening might have actually wanted to go for a fight but I, he, was, he, opened it. he was looking to it it's like uh, i'm not gonna do it because he just backed off he was looking to it doki as i said this is the ash roll that we didn't quite see the death of before but you often get them popped in underneath with that being opened it changes the game a little and he's still just trying to get a comfortable watch here. You can see there's a, a bit of the shuffle around. The whole team is getting the rotate. This is that split theory take where you're, you're sort of probing for the weakness, probing for the holes. The Grim is now going towards that back line and the Gunner Benjo. Wizards swinging one side of a mirror window. Psycho's holding on to the other. Look at that as an aggressive hold on the angle. They're just sort of making everything uncomfortable to approach this wall. So we do see two players on rafters, we see two players around red and one being around cash. Actually just rotated off to be on a uh, flank near the bedroom. But it means like those positions of NRP are quite strong. You cannot just take a single player out because you need to be in a fight with the other person that's backing them up as well at the very same time. So this is where Uno can come in quite uh, handily using that fire. You yep. can isolate one of those players, force them to fall back or push them together with the opposite player as well, together Ooh. with the bees. <laughs> so there's a lot of zoning that we see right now on G2 that might actually allow them to take this fire as Wizard just burns to death. And that means there's only a single player up right now. The bees come in again. Now they will know about Moosey being on the Raptors as well. And he's being forced off as Pino drops by Alamau. Alamau gets Pino and as I said, this is a setup that you're going to take these Raptors on. And this is a Raptors take if I've seen them two bodies, but we have seen teams have a five versus three and lose it before. There's the scrap and the blind, the bite right on to the second story. Cons and Psycho. 
Only two bodies left remaining, and Psycho is feeling a little bit frisky here for the close-range firefight. Do they know about his position? They don't seem to have the immediate read, but now they sure do. The spray from the two stories, 56 seconds. He just wants to get the lead in, but Virtue has the back end cons with a C4 in pocket and a great SMG in front of him. He's looking to just to hold them off for as long as he can. Find a single fight as the beast scream off the back end of red. Uno gets it, Virtue gets it, and G2. A little bit of a shake at the second, but they did a huge amount of work, enough to secure themselves the playback through and secure themselves the first map in this series as best of three, and it was NIP's pick. It was a very comfortable win for G2, and of course, some of the rounds were closer than, you know, they might have seemed if you look at the scoreline now, because we had two 5v3 situations in favor of NIP. But G2 is showing that tenacity, showing the ability to work back and get together uh, to bring those, you know, rounds where you're on a small disadvantage back into their own favor. And as a result, they find themselves with that map one victory, the one that we were thinking of. Why are you picking this, G2? Why? You must yeah, have yeah. been cooking something up. And that's that sort of split as well, because you look at where we're going next. We're going to Skyscraper. NIP can play a Skyscraper. For some people's books, G2 play the best Skyscraper. When will we get there? After a quick break, we'll be back.
G2 have secured a dominant win on the first map, on the first game here at Six Invitational 2024 in Sao Paulo. Let's dig in a little bit deeper because coming into this, Ali, we were thinking, all right, club, haven't seen it for a while from NIP. Maybe they got an ace up their sleeve. They might just be blowing us out of the water. But it felt like what we've seen before at other international majors when that first game at the international land and they just quite can't get that mark right. It's this very slow start, isn't yep. it? You know, you look at that from NIP and you think, ooh, I would have liked a little bit more. I think if you're going to bring a map that you haven't played in a very long time to the table, you're going to want a little bit better than a 7-2. For sure. It was a very dominant start from G2. We're seeing the players' stats on the screen right now as well. These individual performances, I mean, we can talk about, for example, 10 and 3. Yeah, that's that's really, really impressive <laughs> as well. But one thing I would like to mention as well, if you throw it back to last year's aside, the one that G2 won, yeah. they'll get a great start on that first game against Koi, I think it was. I think it was 13 and 4 or something on Villa. He was a really big asset for, their, for his team this time around as well. Certainly in the first couple of defensive rounds, I think that's where G2 really yeah. got off to a flying start. Sure, they're starting off on defense. We know that deep down this is likely going to be quite a defender sided SI. The, mm -hmm. the numbers suggest that that's what we're going to be looking to. Puts more pressure on the attack. Doesn't mean it's impossible but it means that you've got to be very focused on those attacking rounds. Doki on the opening kill in particular for me in the first couple of rounds was fantastic. Yeah and that focus on these on these defensive rounds as well from G2 was absolutely phenomenal. We were looking at the way that they were just cornering NIP time and time again and the drones were not really giving them what they wanted to. I think that they got really hamstrung on those drones you know, we talk about this. We talk about Two Brow being an operator that's been introduced. Obviously, yeah. Two Brow doesn't really have much bearing on drones, but what it does do is it removes a ban, and more importantly, it removes a ban then that you can use to exploit other operators on the defense. And what did we see Doki playing a lot of? We saw him play a lot of Solace. And I think the following effect with that, right? If you have that Solace, if you can kind of make those attackers blind, whereas they don't have the information, you can put so much pressure on them. Yeah. That's what we saw Doki do. He'd rotate it from like the kitchen hallway to stock to really flank these players and push them in their backs not knowing what's going on because you're blind and you have no information. Yeah, it wasn't just the proactivity that we were seeing from G2S, but it was also NIP every now and then getting close to where they would want to be, but not having a chance to be able to actually play off of that and just start snowballing. Round two particularly, and something you wanted to highlight was really encompassed that very well. Yeah, round two is a really good example of where NIP had decent starts. This is something that they did that I really liked. Wizard used a bullet hole to make sure that he could fire a Capital bolt up towards the cash stash area around the uh, Lodgy hatch. So there's a player playing there with that mirror window. They create space for themselves by using this. You see the players moving up the main stairs. They create that player advantage for themselves, get that control over Lodgy, and you'd say, oh, that's looking great right for NIP. They should be able to close around with this. They've got such a pivotal part of the map. They got that control, they got the advantage, and then they lose these rounds. And that's something that we've seen happening to NIP in this specific game a lot. They create openings, they get the entry. I think Psycho got two entries in round three and round four or something, and they can't close out these rounds. Whereas if you look at G2's attacks, they're doing exactly what we wanted to see from NIP. Yeah. That Garrett stake that did it in the final round, where they have these players refrag each other on the rafters of Clubhouse, where they're using Grimby's, for example. They're using multiple people looking up at rafters to make sure you don't lose that player advantage, that's how you're going to win out your attacking rounds against a team like NIP. Yeah, and when we're looking at IP, something particular that we said coming into this is like they are usually having these slow starts, not just when it comes to a tournament, but also when it comes to their gameplay to that mid round adaptation. And we had high hopes considering that we haven't seen them for a while, Ollie, yeah. but it felt like it was the same NIP that we've seen back in Atlanta. They looked a little bit flat. I'll be honest with you, I think they looked a little bit flat. There was a lot of occasions there where they were losing man count advantages. And you're looking at this and you're seeing G2 play super aggressively. There was yeah. a couple of occasions. I think Virtue was one of them jumping over the garage rafters, you're thinking, what is he doing here? And the round pans out just fine anyway, because yeah. NIP throw the man count advantage. There was another round, it was round number two, in fact, after that play yep. that we saw from the Capital, there was a little bit of a mirror window drama going on there as well. And you're just thinking, just slow it down a little bit, take a breath, yeah. you know, you can clutch these rounds, you can close them out. Often they've got tons of time left on the clock as well. And I just want to see them take those breaths and take that step to slow it down. Particularly when you're talking about seeing them slow it down, is there anything in particular that you think they can do heading into that next map and that would allow them to actually take that breather? Because we've seen them do the timeouts, we've seen them try and play with this man advantage, but it's not quite hitting the mark. 
The good thing for NIP going into Skyscraper, I think, is that it is a really big map, and we know that they like to play in that slow play style where they really hold off a push. I mean, we've seen it in this map as well, right? It takes G2 a proper minute to maybe two minutes before they can finally start to do something with the control that they've created for themselves. If you look at Skyscraper and that also being G2's pick, that allows NIP to pick what side they want to start on, you'd, you'd imagine they go for defense because it's, it's a stronger side right now and it allows them to play that slow defensive play style that we know NIP does best. That's definitely going to help them. If you talk about the mental aspect as well, being able to come back from this significant loss you've just faced, being able to come back on your defensive half on Skyscraper is going to really bode well for them. Yeah, I think it also further puts into perspective the fact that this is a map that NIP had picked, so they felt confident. They felt like this yeah. is where they could take G2 to the battle. This is where they could take G2 and potentially yoink it away from them, but that wasn't really the case. So if a little bit of a refresher and a reminder when it comes to these map vetoes, the next map that we will be heading on is going to be Skyscraper, but that's then, Ollie, the other side where it's actually G2's map pick. Yeah, I think that Skyscraper, we look at it and we think it's a map that G2 know very well. It's a yeah. map that suits them down to the ground. The attacks can be punishing on Skyscraper. Let's make that clear. It can yeah. be a very difficult map to attack into, particularly when you look at how you can sort of abuse some of the operators available on the defense right now. I'm expecting to see a very similar ban line up here. But yeah. G2, they got it together on those attacking rounds. It took them a couple to get one under the belt, but mm -hmm. that's not too unusual there. I think the thing that shone for me today was the fundamentals from G2. To, and that translates whether you're on attack or on defense. The teamwork was fantastic. That's going to be really important too, because the last time that G2 played this map, they lost against Yotaru, which is Into the Breach Academy's team, that Ooh. tier two team. And their communication didn't seem right, like we said in South Breach. And this time around, it seems like it's going a lot better. We hear these players communicating. It seems yeah. like it's looking good. Not sure if our microphones are picking it up, but you can definitely hear the players behind us. They're excited and ready to go. And so are we, because we're going to be heading on to Skyscraper for the second map of the series with our lovely casters, one once again, M and Hap. Thank you very much, Ginny. And yes, we are here heading into Skyscraper, which for me is a little bit terrifying for anyone to go up against G2 on. Yeah, G2, you know, I mean, Fresh said it earlier, the best team in the world on Skyscraper. And I'd be the... the, the dabbled in it themselves as well a little bit. So a little bit of a dabbling. It's, it's going to be a, a good Dabbler. game uh, that we should be seeing, but we do need to see more coming out from the side of NIP because, I mean, Yes, they were able to get opening kills last time. Um, they were able to, you know, get big man advantages, just not able to translate those and convert them into their own victories and rounds on the board. And that's what we need to see from them because otherwise it's going to be a very one-sided affair. I'm enjoying the music. I'm loving the music. <laughs> I'm feeling the vibes. I am living. Yeah, I think this is the thing about this map as well. As they sort of said, Skyscraper is uh, it, it's an uncomfortable attack. It is a very long map to get yourself moved around on. It's very shoeboxy. Yeah. It, it's, you know, it's a lot of tight corners. There's a lot of checking your 90s. There's a lot of sort of movements that have to be slowed down just on the structure of the map itself. So G2 here, if there are any other team, you're looking sort of two attacks. You're looking for a little bit of confidence before you head onto your defense, especially with how NIP struggled on their attacks in the most recent map. That is such a second level of pressure here because if you get flawless on your attacking half on a map like Club and then you've got to attack Skyscraper next, th that's a sort of alarm bell moment. Now Fenrir is being taken out by G2 again. Does this mean we're seeing the tubby to be removed from NIP? We saw it last time. Yeah, there we go. Tubby? Oh, again. Yeah, tubby. Some people call them. Yeah, <laughs> tubby? Tub around. Yeah, tubby. Mean. No, 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 to bro. <laughs> I just, you know, t Tubby is like calling someone like fat. Oh, no, I didn't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe that's just like an English thing. If you call someone like Tubby, it's like, oh, you're a little, you're a little bit Tubby. It's like, hey, yeah, I'm, no. I'm trying to lose weight. I thought that's Chubby. Like, tubby, that's Chubby. Okay. You know, there's a lot. Okay, well, Humans I, mean, I thought invented it was just, I read it and I thought, oh, that's cute. Humans have invented a lot of words to... <laughs> <laughs> to, to talk about each other. Well, I'm sorry. I meant Tuberau. Uh, Tuberau. All right. We find ourselves here starting on what is often and what is pretty, pretty much a hand lock in the first pick site for teams to defend onto Skyscraper. You can get yourself to sort of if you want to wrap your head around this map and how to approach it, the most common way 
is think of it like top floor clubhouse okay. where if you're going for say a cctv take you would do some of the work towards the site but your Five main pressure comes across the top floor you lock in or actually even a better comparison villa if you remember how that would play you would sort yeah. of get yourself in on top floor you secure the stair set so in the top right you've obviously got a house stairs and the opposite end is the two sets towards it and then you sort of just make sure that you have that protection on a back line. Here, with the lineup we've got, the black beard, the candelas and the Finca, we might see something a little bit sharp and tasty. Quick opening onto the VIP wall there. It's going to be putting up some pressure onto the side of NIP, or of course playing out there. Now, the big thing about Skyscraper, though, is we have that giant divider stopping house from uh, the restaurant side of the map and you know there's only two doorways through there and usually that's where we see a lot of the strong points to be created by these defensive teams question is will nip play the same like that or are they more fluid because we already Ooh. see quite some pressure coming through the side with candelas coming up right as doki moves right through uh, the actual barbed wire oh looks for the fight and wins it covered by the audio bend is able to get one as i said it's going to be short start and sh sharp and sweet they break their through into uh, their way right into the site itself. Alamau's going to go for the plant behind the hard wall. They have control of the site itself. I said the standard take is on the back end. That's what they were prepared to try and defend against. But here, a post plant. They've got control of the windows of the site. They've got a black bit to put on a window as well. And I mean, this has really been a smash and grab take. Alamau. <coughs> Gets the lockdown with, as I said, the Blackbeard in that role. Pino has to try and rotate up a stair set and make all the noise in the world because they left the barbed wire solid. They then have that. As the attackers, the barbed wire makes noise yeah. for whoever passes through it. And it's just a very little clever use of their saying, oh, you yeah. had this for us, we are leaving it there for you. It slows you down as the attacker, not so much as the defense, but what it's happened- It's the audio. It's the audio that's most important and that's why it gets played. What happened here is, oh, there's three people off site. Smash and grab. You know what that means? Oh, we're ready anyway. Let's just go. <laughs> they spot an opportunity. They instantly go for it. And this is some kind of playstyle siege that I haven't really seen as much as I'd like, where, you know, sometimes there is just a lot of roaming going on on the opposite side of the map. However, there's only two doorways to get back to this side of the map. So what do you do? see the opportunity to just grab it with five and you manage to uh, get yourself in a big advantage out there so i really like the call that's made by g2 there the play as well as i said the staircases are the pressure points of this map the, the sort of two-pronged attack there they well i say two uh, three-pronged attack because they had the black bit on the window of the site itself ready to hold off they then had benja pushing up the restaurant stairs the main stairs and you had Black stairs covered by Doki. Five it's a remaining. very, very good play. Stats: seven of the ten players in the lobby have Attackers lifted the Loki. SI hammer. This will be the highest percentage of SI winners in a single lobby throughout potentially the whole tournament. Yeah. It, 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 it's a, these two teams meeting each other. This is where champions are made, or have been made, or have been made. Taking point just behind me. Now. So you don't hear Blackbeard's voice lines often. Benj is going to be playing that. That shield is an advantage, but also a bit of a disadvantage because as soon as you start swinging, you see that shield before you see the player itself. Yeah. So you can take that out before you hit the player. Flashbang's coming through. Benj still trying to hold off. And because it is such a tight angle, he's wanting to have that little bit of extra protection to his face. Doki, still on the Ying, still trying to find their way up the back end. There is a very tight angle being held there by Cons, but he doesn't quite get the reward out of it. Instead, he gets the, hey, there's a Monty now. Yeah. Has to play against it. There is a bit of a rotation coming underneath, I believe. I'm, I'm not quite sure on where the pressure is coming through, but they're trying to offer some support towards Wizard, who is going to be battling himself and its virtue. Keeper that barrier. is forcing the player away. The floor-bound Keeper Barrier, as you said. It's just making things a bit more protected here for cons. And as I said, the sweep across, they're not quite able to get the first catch until Doki finds it from that vertical. Yeah, the keeper barrier allowed uh, Wizard to stay alive a little bit longer as the uh, C4 gets tossed out, not really exploded. Now they'll start to move through. They know about two players being out here. Cons gets down from below, and really G2 <laughs> is just completely <laughs> annihilating any given single bit from NIP, as it's only up to Muzi now. And he's trying to retake in a part that's not even close towards the side. As soon as they realize site's clear, Jeet is just going to be exerting themselves, or maybe even now because Music just made himself known. I mean, Alamau has the kit in sight once again. 
I mean, you're in a one versus three post plant, and they have a Attackers Monty. One versus users. two post plant. They still have a Monty. That's going to be the big sort of shake. And as I said, this is a hefty map to go for rotates. There's not too many sort of freewheeling options. It looks a little bit short on paper. And the drop down to try and take the buck first is the very clever read. Muzi, a hugely intelligent player here. Knows exactly where to sort of put the pressure on. He's been in this situation plenty of times. He's playing against the Monty that's taking it out. And there's that intelligence. But there's also 18 seconds. He's got to force the fight here. But it's Virtue to win it out. Almost Muzi making, probably if you pulled that off, a play of the tournament in the opening day. <laughs> Yeah, almost managed to clutch it. Ah, well played by him. And, you know, really those goo mines again coming in there. Alamau having to pull that out because otherwise he just dies if he does nothing. And yep. he gets shot whilst he's pulling it Let, out. For the context on that, that was an unwinnable situation. Muzi almost won. Yes, it was. He was a 1v4 situation out there. Opposite side of the map. As soon as he managed to get that first scale, that's the plan going down and everybody's yep. setting up for it. We're, uh, and in those four players, Blackbeard and Monty. Yeah, like, I, Monty can block off any doorway, right? Yeah. It's it's hugely, hugely big prey that, as a player as well, keeps us calm. And if there's anyone left alive, you sort of want them on the board. The ping just came round at the end there. Bitterly close. We go to barbecue. They're going to keep the site rotating. They're going to find themselves in towards the ground floor here, or the first floor, if you're American. Ten seconds to go. I'm not sure what it is. In the reference here, I Five guess I should. I think it's ground. I'm thinking about elevators that I've. I mean, in Brazil. Yeah. yeah. Do they do ground first, like Zero. we do in Europe? You press the the, the things. So. Yeah. And press the press the button. Yeah. So I assume it's ground. First. Now we open this up by saying, "Hey, skyscraper, not that easy to attack." Let's be honest, you two are making it look quite easy. This is how good they are at the map, though. Less a comment on NIP, I would say, for now, and more a comment on G2's abilities at sort of demonstrating this. Hugely confident for them. Huge map choice for them. And they've sort of put in that performance so far. Lucy was about to go for a run out there, but wasn't quite able to catch the person uh, to go on their drones just outside. And Stokey hops in and out, will be taking care of that goo mine before it does any damage or any more damage than it does on the initial pop. But it's just to make sure that they can move in right afterwards. And you already see that the complete house side of the map is being systematically cleared out. They know about the player that's in Drum Muzi falling back again, so more space opens up. That means that they can move in freely there. <laughs> Note as well. As I break my way through and they break across, it's taken a minute to get to this point. The site is obviously down below. They're just steadily clearing as much as they can. They're about to maybe be swung on. No, they pulled away from gold and Doki. He was so concerned about the pressure being put on them because he knows that's how they lost someone in the round before. Pino, not too far away from the fight. Con's even closer. Does he know about Doki? No, is the answer. He's able to get himself a second victory. There's the fight right back through the door, though. Muzi leading an important charge here and making sure that he can grab the reins of NIP and saying it's not over until it's over. There, Pino, in this one versus four situation, gets the first, cannot get the next. G2. Twice in a row, three in a row at the opening game and the opening map and the opening half. And I said NIP don't always have the best time on their first day. Yeah, they I mean, have a, it's the worst. I was just going to say, if you thought Clubhouse was one sided, I mean, that, that still had a little bit of back and forth in the rounds. If I it mean, wasn't for the Muzi clutch that we almost saw happen out there, there would be barely any kills. There would be one kill, maybe two. The, the worry, the worry, the worry, Hap. Yeah. They still have to attack. No, oh, that's it. <laughs> that's what they're going to that, be a bit slow. That at this point is, is sort of, as I said, two rounds for a lot of teams on Skyscraper Attack is like good and confident. And as you can see, NIP taking their time out both times. It's, a, it's an, a, you know, an intense reflection of the first map here. Three rounds lost. Take the time out. See if they can work things together. And I mean, you have to just give it here to G2. They, they played a great hidden game on Clubhouse. They sort of demonstrated a power there. And now they're sort of playing a strong, strong game. One that they've said, we are a skyscraper team. Try and fight us here. Yeah. And well. I do still think it's funny though, how they struggled against G Who. <laughs> well, I mean, I, this, this is the thing about, I, you know,
We always used to say it's maybe an excuse to say, look how they're struggling outside of it. How are they performing inside of it? We've seen teams not have the best time in off season. Yeah. Uh, you can talk about it as the other EU team that's playing right now. Wolves haven't had a great time in the off season. I'm not going to spoil the results. I've heard it bitterly fought on the other stream as well. Whereas G2, they're having a very smooth ride here right now. Are they saving strats? Do we do we say the the special saving strats words? No. I mean, okay, so we've, we've had a conversation with Fabian about it as well, and he's like, if you, if you're saving strats, that's where your fundamentals show up. That's where your yeah. team play needs to be on point, and where's your communication needs to be on point. And, and even then, I mean, we would expect that it doesn't happen in most other esports. You should be able to take down a tier three team. Yeah, tier you should team. be able to outgun them. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, again, Siege, very special game with lots of different factors coming in. It's not just your gun scale. So maybe it is a bit more like that, but it is, uh, it is still looking good for G2 now with the way that they're stepping up in this uh, first and second map of their tournament. G2, one of only three teams that's been able to get towards the live stages across the majors this year. The other two being W7M and FaZe. So they have themselves, I'm not going to say the greatest run, but a pretty good run to come on the back with the win before. Wizard, as I said ages ago, has a great entry statistic to his name. Hasn't quite been able to get it in this tournament as of yet, but with the first being Blackbeard removed and Alamau, they're kind of playing in to the defense this time. Remember last time around, they smashed and grabbed the site. Well, this time they're doing that take, I said, is sort of the default and it's being locked down. Virtue does find the fight against it. Dirk, Doki, ready to roll and blind onto the player that's just tucked behind the Kiba. There's the swing round onto one. They can't quite get it. Ring around the Rosies, finally finds the end. There's one more player tucked just towards the back of the bar. Uno's watching for the rotate out. They want to try and force the arm onto Pino. He's not blinded and Psycho's there for support. Swings on the fancy trophy armor. And Uno has left a little bit watching and waiting with hands. He's hoping the player drifts in, but they are fully aware that this is the cutoff catch. Everybody's offside again. There's no one offside. I mean, it's that the diffuser dropped yeah. outside after they got that first kill, but it's like Virtus just chilling in sight there. He's like, do I go down? Are, are you, you know, are you going to pick up the diffuser or should I go grab it? Or are we going for kills instead? Because right now everybody's just on the opposite side of the map. And no one is thinking about coming back either right I mean, now. Look, they're concerned about Valkyrie cameras. They're, of course obviously, they would be. She's on the board. As you sort of said, they're trying to piece it together. Now, the setup that we Attackers can sort of see from the top here team. is they're, they're holding onto drum. Not they're holding onto the long watch. There's the rotate, the foot angle that goes around the back of the drum all the way through towards the terrace on the back end. They had the watch. There's Wizard spraying through on the soft. They had the read on the player, probably audio, which leaves Virtue in this clutch situation. Battling either side of the bomb chassis. There's the one versus one. Fires towards the second. They've rotated their way towards the back end of Geisha in makeup. How aware of it is Virtue? He is a huge power player. He's against Wizard in this fight. He baits the motion to hard wall. He's going to go for the rotate round onto the soft either side. The swing and the ping, but he cannot get it. Wizard, the magic man, pulls out a trick of his own. That was way too close for comfort there again, though, for NIP. And, and they will find themselves around right after uh, the timeout they've done. And surely there was Valkyrie cameras because you saw that as soon as they repel in with the diffuser. They wait for the right moment and they start banging uh, through that wall. Managed to find that kill again, drop that diffuser. And because of that, they find themselves three to one right now. But you mentioned it before, two rounds on the attack is already considered sufficient enough. G2 already have three, and it doesn't look like they're willing to slow There's down yet for NIP. Either. All right, NIP, we're breaking through. As I said, you know, and as you guys have seen throughout the year, they can be a very strong team that's just a little bit slow to piece things together. They need to get a fire, and we're starting to get that. This is the hints of a team that has been a little bit, you know, beleaguered, a little bit knocked around. They are, I think, the fourth ranked team from their region. But if you read the wonderful newsletter, the wonderful magazine that Fresh put together, Up the Siege, if you haven't, please do go check it out. I think all of us have retweeted it and sung its praises, but it is so deserved. If you're new to Siege, if you're experienced in Siege, you read through it. He's gone through all the teams, interviewed them, 
and got such fantastic insight to get you all ready to go for this. Huge, huge shout out for Up the Siege by Fresh. Yeah. You will get the taste of a lot of a lot of the top teams. They think, you know, Latam's gonna win it. They think uh -huh. Brazil's gonna win it. Yeah. And then the second, probably Brazil. Oh, and third place, probably, probably Brazil. Brazil is well. third favorite as well. <laughs> the region is in a good, good spot right now. And this is the predictions from all around the world, from all of the teams and all of the players. It is always different though, when you finally do end up on the event. I mean, it's been a while since we've seen like any official uh, tier one play. Meta has shifted as well in the meantime. Not that we're getting to see much of it with the Tumorau ban, but uh, it, it always does change things up a little bit. And it really relies on which team can adapt the best to it. As uh, the Grimbies, as uh, we <laughs> wanted to dub them earlier, be tossed out to uh, stop any player from the run out to use that. Now, G2, they're slowing their pace a little bit. I mean, let's be real, they've already secured enough attacks onto this half that they should have. But this map can be slow, this map can be measured and weighted. They don't want to sort of throw themselves in because although it's been successful, how many times is that golden lesson? Look at this, just holding himself either side of the bees, but Benja at this range, at this pace, will get the audio, but the pressure could come from the back of Terrace onto the swing. It's cons. It gets rid of Virtue, gets rid of the watch before Wizards behind the Kiba. There's Pino getting one more, and look at this crossfire. Absolutely gorgeous from NIP. All of them had a different one versus one that they were synced up and ready for in an intricate network. As soon as the first was pulled, suddenly all of them were in a position to swing onto the second and the third. Beautiful read on that defense. Yeah, uh, for sure, but it was not just like 1v1s in separate positions, but also being ready to support one another. Oh, it was you saw it there on, on the run out. You see one in Terrace, you see one right next to the bar. One gets shot, the other one swings, and that way you can actually find yourself in the advantage in most of those situations. So it looks like we might actually uh, head towards a flawless round here from the side of NIP. As there comes the repel. Uno not able to get the kill quite yet in the first attempt. He's gone down to about one HP. And that run out might soon follow as well by the side of NIP. I mean, there it is, a flawless from NIP. They just shut it down. This is something that we've sort of been missing from them is this team play, this interconnected idea of, oh yeah, we know what we're doing. We had to watch. And as I said, it was, it was maze-like. They had the angles and the setup. They had the support. They had themselves ready to be in a position to go against each other, and suddenly, things get shut down. G2's approach pulled apart, and they can't quite know what they're doing. All right, so the Shrostfire is working out very well together. Can they keep that up for yet another round? Round three that they would like to take on the board as well. Barbecue, again, is where we're headed. Back to barbecue. The hungriest site in Siege. I was just going to say, we once dubbed the <laughs> hungriest site in Siege. I mean, it's how you remember it. Three to two, and G2. There's a fun stat in the top left. The first team to make it back to SI is reigning champions since SSG were able to do it in 2021. So we've had two years of teams winning it and then not being there. Yeah. Hey, those two teams, one of them, GSM, one of them, uh, NIP. NIP. They had won it and they weren't quite able Attackers to get it back. Now, look at Virtue. That's an Amaru. Where's the camera who's gonna go? There. Right there, yes. It's gonna try and put a oh. some pressure towards Dragon. It was really close to actually picking up a, a little bit of damage onto Muzi out there. I mean, he. that is a player who on his face always looks so cool, so calm. It, yeah. I mean, we saw it in the one versus four almost clutch before is same expression. He could be like sort of a train goes past him. He's like, and, like and he doesn't even either. look, doesn't yeah. even care. Cool guys don't look at explosions or trains right. or trains. They, <laughs> I don't know why that was the first thing. I just think that'd be a really cool visual. Like media train team. Was by, yeah. Media team. Can you book a train for the next media day? That would probably be a little bit outside the budget. How much do you think it costs to rent a train? I don't know how much it costs to rent a train. <laughs> do you want one of those modern trains or one of like the old steam I engines? Think, or? I think the, the, the faster and more dangerous the train, the cooler the photo. So you want like the, the magnet train that's yeah. going around in Japan, I Let's believe. Let's get a bullet like train. 500 now. kilometers an hour. Yeah, I think Muzi, if that went right by him, would still stand. Lay underneath the train. Talking of cool and connected. 
Venger, not caught, is actually the C word that gets him there. There's the swing over the top. Virtue does find Psycho in a different engagement as Wizard is slowly forced further and further out of Geisha. He has a bit of a rotate and Muzi has the support and Pino as well. Valamau getting a pistol kill. He takes control of Sushi Bar, but he's caught in the middle. And there's a lot of different angles and places he can be swung on here as he finds out. Wins the first fight, though. The close engagement goes into his favor. Has a lot of time, but he's still in a very dangerous position. He needs support. He needs a way to get closer towards Uno, which he's found with a little bit of a do or die hop. Yeah, I mean, there is that verticality that you still have to worry about, right? And uh, that is uh, what Wizard was looking to play. Now finds himself closer towards the actual staircase as LMI was looking to find himself away towards the actual bomb site. Still hopping around, though. Not quite sure where it's actually going to be safe to move as Uno takes, uh, be, gets taken down, rather, by Muzi from above. And again, that verticality is that true danger out here. And LMI, well, if he, as soon as he starts planting, he's just going to get shot. So. He needs to try and find one of them so he can isolate the angles. I mean, here it is. The one versus two. They have the full vertical control. They're more than close Attackers enough have recovered their to defeat. swing onto this engagement as well. There is nowhere that is safe. And he is well aware of it. There's the play on the plant. There's the hope and the hold. Yeah, Cannot win the engagement. And what a timeout and a team talk that has turned out to be from NIP. The first three rounds were tragic. Let's be real. The next three were pretty meteoric. I would say the first time today we've seen an IP play like an IP. Yeah, they've definitely picked it up after that technical uh, tactical timeout there, and you know brought, brought it back. Even though you know round four is still quite close, as you know the fuse was about to go down if it wasn't for that Valkyrie camera out there. Um, this round here was quite close as well, but just that verticality that G2 didn't deal with eventually being their downfall. They they wanted to go for just a purely for, uh, horizontal take. Didn't really work out for them. But now they'll be over towards the defense themselves. And we've mentioned this before, it's the favorite side to be it on is. for Skyscraper. Them yeah. having three rounds already is good news. I mean, it, it's great news. It's the best news. Them being the most recent three rounds, the even better news. Print the presses. Suddenly, they've been able to find their way of playing together because, as you said, their defenses, their holds. I'm super excited to go back and sort of look at the exact positioning because I loved the intricacies. I loved how ready it was to rock and roll with the approaches of G2 and sort of, you know, push back against it, counterplay towards it. It's given them a confidence, and you need it before you go into attacking this map, regardless of whether you've come off the back of being clean swept before. The issue that NIP was facing, though, was the early aggression from G2 on their own attacks when, when NIP was attacking on the side of Clubhouse. When G2 could just play their game, go go aggressive uh, early on and find themselves with those kills, that's when they really started to struggle. So what you see now is you see them watch their drones, watch those windows where usually these kind of jump outs come out from to see if they can catch any of these G2 players off guard. But it seems like they've slowed it down themselves as well. Like they're not actually trying to go for the earliest peak possible. Who will get that first break? It's, you know, as I said, the, the site choice and the site sort of preference is a first lead in. Usually it is towards karaoke side. Instead, here, G2, they opt to pull themselves onto the opposite end. The second site, and still with the solidity that it, the second story can offer you. But the first break and the first swing might come here towards Alamau. He's holding onto house stairs and VIP as best as he can. The break of the Thatcher, the break onto the walls is going to make his position much trickier now. The support has to come from Dragon, has to come from behind him. But those players, Benja and Alamau, are now very isolated. Pino is finding himself challenged as well. He opens up the floorings above, instantly uh, being replied on by some of the members of G2 that are just trying to find themselves with some aggression. Now, Virgil, he has been spotted getting into that position. Not sure if they know exactly where he is. Now they oh, definitely now they do. being right behind him. But, you know, he is not trying to overstep himself as well. But what do you do at this position? It is a minute 10. They have the two players underneath, but to get to that fight, you've got to take it. So they're just watching it. They're sort of saying, okay, well, you know, we'll try and put this pressure elsewhere and have some awareness. Alamo oh. goes down with the C4. It gets shot out. 
Nobody loses their life, but time is what is being sort of taken away. Here's the other option. They've rotated around. Virtue's caught on a drone, but he's happy to play against it for a little bit. There's the lockdown. Wizard finally makes some motion. However, 20 seconds has passed. Precious time. They can finally start opening up and forcing Benja out. The plant still has to go down. The kit still has to go down. They've lost his position before, and it's getting kind of dangerous, kind of dicey here with 30 seconds left. There's still really no control coming through from the side of NIP. They have the bottom floor, but what does that give you? Well, a lot of verticalities you have to worry about currently as Doki is putting down some shots, and it looks like they might want to go from the exhibition wall as well, but it's being held off by Benja right now, playing right behind that bomb chassis. A jump in from Samurai as well must be the saving grace for the side of NIP, but Benja's out there. We'll find the very first spot to player onto the wall as well, which he does take down. You know, with a team kill onto Doki, makes it very chaotic in these last three seconds. I mean, even with all of the take and all of the pressure underneath, the fact that Benja was able to stay where he was. He was in a position to swing onto the samurai window. He was in a position to swing onto the breach. They had the buck underneath. They knew the full read of Benjo's position. And yet, because of all the time that was needed to get rid of Virtue, and then the time that was left, they could not try and push that vertical advantage. They had to get those two players underneath, yeah. up top, to support the take itself onto the site. Benji's first kill, I believe, was a run out onto the breach as well. There it is, just the swing round onto the side. And here, that position, think how long the buck was working on the back of the table because of Benja and he never left the room. I mean, and this is the thing, right? Like, I call it with like 40 seconds left. Like, what real control do they have? Nothing, right? They have downstairs, sure. There is some verticality, also sure. But you need to be on that top floor at the moment that the fuser needs to go down. And when you start losing those members, when you try and make that entry, because there is no other option than making the entry at the time they did, then it really starts to get panicky. You try whatever you can. G2 able to punish that one, uh, well, supremely. We find ourselves obviously a bit more back and forth than we were in the previous map. I think NIP still showed some obvious good signs, some growth throughout this series so far. Best of threes handle very differently, obviously, to best of ones, which is where they've been able to sort of suffer. So technically, you know, that if they do lose their first game, it's only been the one map and then they bounce back. There were some great moments there from NIP. The difference could have been 10, 15 seconds on the round, and it yeah. could have been theirs to lock in, because even at the end, it was a back and forth trade. It was a back and forth fight. That can be tuned onto. That can be sort of progressed throughout this map and this series. And that can be something where G2 have to be aware of it because they are playing gen generally a lot more timid, a lot more sort of close to their chest. There is the stretch onto the other side in this round. They've given themselves a little bit more wiggle room, but that might be something NIP tries to exploit here. Full pressure towards the top of Black Stairs. Yeah, for sure, and as the Blitz is starting to come through, there is some smokes, some flashbangs, some bees, whatever you can imagine is coming through, and Cons now needing to push through. A player prone on the Black Stairs gets taken down from two different directions. A lot of damage on to Psycho as Pino takes down Virtue as well. It seems like NIP have a really good opportunity to get a quick plan done here, and no one from G2 currently in a position where they can find a response, where they can take down Set Diffuser Carrier. I mean, brilliant, brilliant drive there. As I said, they sort of went full pressure onto the top, and there's Doki getting one and a half onto Muzi, but saved as Khan slides their way through. They suffer the spray on the back, but they can get the revive, and that is the important part of this. Uno Looks does like suffer in a different hand. engagement. There's obviously still more than enough players to go for the fight, but it gives Benja a second to step their way in. Holding onto Black Stairs, holding onto the swing. The Blitz suffers a shoulder of damage, but he cannot sit around because if he does, he will be locked out and locked down. Uno, he's got the cross angle. He's got the watch. They have a little bit of attention, but as the blinds come through, they're just going to see if they can try and drone out. 50 seconds, and as I said, 15 seconds was the difference before. When you got 50, they have more than enough to get the lockout. Benja in the one versus four post plant, finally gets a bite onto the back end and stops some of the bleeding. But when you've got a blitz, they've got window control, they've got underneath. I mean, this is one of those unwinnable situations I talked about before. They've still got shields to watch as well. The utility was left up on the purpose of this and the purpose is for a piece. Now, NIP, they had the opportunity to go for a way quicker plant in the exact same spot where they actually put it down before, but it was a bit of doubt. 
Is the player downstairs? We don't know. Is the player trying to retake? Didn't also know that either. Disagree. It wasn't that. It was very well calculated because they had a player underneath. They had a player at the bottom of black. They knew they had the control there. What they did instead was go and keep their man advantage. They realize and know how much time they have because of how snappy they were. The revive onto the player outside onto the door became priority number one, not the plant itself. Because if they're in that situation, at that point it was a three versus four, and they go for the plant and a player's down, then G2 have that man advantage. They have that body advantage. Instead, play on what they know, push on what they know, keep the blitz close with the play against them. Do not give G2 even a whiff. I think they knew more than you think they might have known. No, I, I agree, but I meant on the initial push, they started to push in when the blitz was already finding themselves deep in karaoke. The players of uh, uh, G2 at that point, there's one in karaoke, the other two were on the opposite side of the map at that point. So there was an opportunity to plant, but back then they slowed it down, as you said, but mostly to stabilize themselves and not really keep on pushing as they get, uh, went on. Fix that in the top left. G2, only one of three teams to make both major live stages this year. The others are FaZe and W7M. I'll add on to this. They're one of only two teams to do that, including SI, with W7M being the other one as FaZe. I do not believe, at the top of my head, made SI live stage. Wait, who, who are we talking about? FaZe. FaZe? Yeah, they, they've been live stage at both Atlanta and Copenhagen, alongside W7M and alongside G2, but at six invite. 2023 if we want to get the full stretch because not a huge amount of teams were at the live stages I think uh, they no face got knocked out yeah. in the lower bracket round one by oh G talking about knocked out there's another team kill uh, that is a little bit of a shame but I mean to be honest maybe that's just a hey G2 will give you a freebie at this point Venger and Doki both gone as well you do lose Muzi on this approach however with Things have gone so far with Psycho going for the quick pace. The Candela's on the back of it. The, the zip inside doesn't quite net Psycho the rest of it. And with the C4 and Virtue, suddenly the tide has shifted. The round was in a good bit of control from the quick pacey play of NIP and the quick take. And with Virtue just drifting on by, Cons is left with the kit in pocket with the gun in hand. But not much else other than a lot of time here in the one versus three. Big difference in how NIP approached this round in the attack compared to how G2 did. G2 wanted to go uh, horizontal, wanted to take that site under control, whereas NIP really focused on getting the top floor. Oh, not that it seems to be working out too much here. Gonna die by the goo mine eventually. And G2, they managed to retake that lead, but it has been way closer this map than it has been on Clubhouse. I think there as well, NIP, they obviously went for a play and it started very successfully. I'm not sure how much the team kill would have shaken things. You lose one player, and as I said, it is not the end of the world. But they seemed a little bit stuck as to what to do after the quick yeah. play, after the zip, after getting in and getting the two kills. They were sort of like, okay, what now? Maybe Muzi was a drive on that. They're a nook. Yeah, sometimes with the chains of grenades, less so. Nowadays, there it is, the pop round, and here's the accident. Just unfortunately caught out. And then inside, above, not really sure what to do. Virtue swings and sweeps on by. It was a good first kill that we saw, though. Like, they knew that G2 was going to eye up the potential jump out, right? Like, it's like if we show that we're on this balcony. So being able to pick up the first like that, not expecting the second and thus the, the team kill coming in at that moment. So it is what it is. It's just uh, small mistakes happen like that. And now they just need to reset themselves. And prepare themselves for exhibition, which of course was won by G2 as well back in round seven. It was, and where I sort of, you know, had questions, or, or not had questions, had moments that didn't quite work for them, they realized that as well. And IP, they're not going for this block take, they're not going for the pressure underneath, they're sort of saying it didn't quite work for us. So instead, we have some of that direct drive, but the Muzi Nomad role gives me the idea of they want to take full top control. They want to just get those doors cemented, whether you do it on sort of black stairs or main stairs, or you pull it one level closer, yeah. you can cement two doors and they rotate on towards Geisha or make up it if they take that option on drum. It gives you a sort of carte blanche there of protection, you know, almost shot 
on the approach. I was just going to ask, how hard is G2 going to be defending this? And if they bring the fight out slight like that, it's pretty hard. Everybody tells you that hard. they are willing to go in quite hard to make sure not too much ground is lost. Now, they are aware of the fact that there is a Valkyrie camera up on the beams out there. So as soon as they do move in, they will be potentially spotted, or at least they know it's been cleared out as soon as the Valkyrie camera does get destroyed. And that will alert players like Doki, like Alamau, who were playing on this side of the map, that there is indeed trouble coming. Well, there's trouble, and his name is Doki, and he's able to take care of Psycho. They've lost the IQ. It's sort of reminiscent of how Doki dropped oh. the IQ of Psycho ages ago. Now they've lost the line as well, and there goes the ying and everything is sort of falling apart. As I said, this is exactly the take that they wanted to do. Unfortunately for them, this is exactly the take G2 has set up to rebuff, swung straight in to a lot of players, ready for the engagement here. Up. And well, with Muzi and Wizard able to get one apiece, they're trying to put the chase onto the fight itself. The flash is just to force the player back towards drum. He sees the other second story. Alamo can pull it back towards these other choke points and keep the man advantage, which they do. I think Doki went a bit too aggressive there, maybe around those boxes, right? You, you missed the first opportunity for the gunfight, leans back in, gets taken out afterwards, you lose virtue. Suddenly that 5v2 you were in turns into a 3v2. And, you know, there was no pressure even on the side of that point, so you could have just fallen back. If this turns around, that's the moment where it goes wrong. We don't know if that's the case, but that's the moment you would be looking at at that point. Attackers have recovered but their Benja is setting himself up on the next choke point. It is a Dragon that is slowly but steadily being taken under control by Muzi. He's cutting off the angles with those air jabs to make sure no one's going to be leaning back into that room from the uh, defense. The huge part of this is you have the two players on an IP that are between them 23 kills. They have been huge on this map so far, and Muzi is seeing if he can add a couple more. There's the first! A great take, but he doesn't know about the player on VIP stairs, and he gets caught out! Almost got the catch. It's Alamau with the lockdown, a two versus one. 15 seconds here for Wizard to try and make some magic happen once again, but it's the C4 spell that he's not quite learned. And G2 get themselves a little bit of a buffer, a little bit of a dangerous situation here. Six to four. They are one round away from securing the first series of SI 2024. All right. With that match point to come through, karaoke as well to be brought. Now, this was the initial quick take that we saw be quite successful on the side of NIP. And that means that we do need to see a bit of a, a bit of a change from G2 to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So they're ready for these kind of situations because it was a pretty good isolation from NIP. Oh, there's one player onto the black stairs. That's the main point we need to take control of. Flash brings to come in, smokes to block any other line aside, and they manage to take that under control and just Second T-roll flat. from there on forward. How is that going to change? Again, great round by G2 there in the last one. Maybe a bit of an overaggression in the middle part of it, but they still managed to bring it back and uh, salvage that round. Well, not really salvage, but bring it home round. Right? 10 seconds to insertion. G2. I mean, what a great Five start it would be insertion. to any campaign, let's be honest. But as I said, if you are unfamiliar Attackers with how things sort of work, one it. team won't be able to make it out of each of the groups. Yep. And then based on where you finish in the other reigning four spots is where you get filtered through. Some of them get upper, some of them get lower bracket across the board. It is a lot of siege to be played. So this win might not be the difference of whether they get out of groups, but it could be the break on whether they get into the sort of upper bracket position yeah. or lower bracket. Now, for sure, and you know, NRP, they, they have this uh, the stat, you called it, uh, they lost their opening games in the previous major. Oh, yeah. They're always slow to get going. It might be better to go up against what could be the favorite of the group first. Yep, have a true. tough game against that, it's whatever. Just win against the rest right afterwards. And obviously, as this is the first game to get locked in, you know that the other teams from this group are going to be very keenly watching this. They'll be preparing. They've got their games in hand as well. It'll be yeah. happening in the same place just after this. And there's Alamau taking care of Pino, getting that bite onto the buck. They lose that soft destruction. They lose some of that pressure. And this is where an IP struggle. When things change during a round, we talked about it at the very beginning. They are fantastic at their setup and takes. But if things go wrong, if bodies start to fall apart, suddenly it becomes much more reliant on players like Muzi to do things like that. Filthy take 
across the vertical. Wizard finds Doki as well, and without him out getting it even, you feel like Muzi might be about to find the back of this player. He has no idea. And there is a ring around the Rosies with a violent end. And up here to bring it back into their own favor, even though the opening kill was against them. Still some verticality, and Muzi gets taken <laughs> down as well, so we're back in a two on two. You might wonder, where are those last two players? All the way on the other side of the map, a minute 10 left on the clock. The fight was taking place all around the objective, but a Wizard and Cons, the they find themselves around the house area, moving their drones into position to find the information to go for an execute. Last time we had these two players as the last two alive, versus I think it might have been exactly the same two players. No, it was Alamau and Uno in Clubhouse. NIP, Wizard and Cons were able to win it out. Yes, they're on the sort of pressure position. It was a very different angled game, but here the pressure is still hot. You are still one round away. Can they try and double down? Get themselves a little bit more of that momentum as the new blood, the fresh players onto this team. Some of the only ones that aren't holding hammers previously in this lobby. 30 seconds left. And they're slowly just picking their way Jump apart up. here from the back of drum. Gold is going to get opened up. They just want to sort of tuck in, but the C4 tucks them right back out. And Wizard, a huge map, a huge game so far, pushes the blind, dives right up. But it's a crossfire from G2. It's a 2-0 from G2. And your reigning SI champions open up with a very powerful showing. This map definitely a lot more difficult for them than Clubhouse is. And I'd be brought a pretty decent fight here, especially after that first timeout that we had. Round three, they have a little bit of a chat, and they managed to well, bring it back to a bit more of an even game afterwards. I mean, this is what we've sort of said about it. It is a long, long tournament. It is. Siege at SI almost handles different to Siege anywhere else, even at the other majors, because you're not in this best of one situation, especially this time. You are playing days and days of it. You are guaranteed a certain amount of games, a certain amount of opponents, which hasn't always been the case at majors this year, especially. This was NIP's one of their toughest games, and they haven't quite been able to get it. But as you said, it's their first game. It's yeah. a game that NIP historically have usually struggled with as their opening day. When they're looking at their who else they've got to go up against, I think they're probably bank G2 for the tough warm-up. Well, that's it, right? Like, they still have a really good opportunity to find themselves in either third, uh, second or third place, maybe even oh, yeah. first. We don't even know, we don't know. how the rest of the game goes down. It's just one game so far. It's not like G2 have just confirmed themselves for first place. But it, it doesn't mean that it's the end of their group, nope. more said to said. They have the other opponents coming up right now after the warm-up, and that's where they need to get those wins in. And that's where it makes things sort of difficult moving forward. G2, they've said, we're the reigning champions. We love being the bad guys. We know there's a target on our back. We're going to sort of make sure that everyone's aware of it. And I guess, well, my favorite targets are aimed squarely at the desk as we throw it over and see what they have to talk about the game. Thank you so much. All right, let's uh, head straight into it. Thank you, Hap and Fluke. We do appreciate it. Uh, let's. Uh, yeah, that's right. That, that's the right caster duo. It's been a long, it's like, I don't even want to say it's been a long day because it's been like the first. One best of three. Best it's of three. Like and, it was, and it was a like, dominant relax. one. Like it was actually really dominant. This is not gamer hours, but I want to start off with saying congratulations on the win. A phenomenal performance because we had a lot of doubts when it came to you guys coming into SI. Same. Considering. <laughs> Whoa, mood. All right. Uh, when it came to SI, when it came to the performance on South Breach and what that actually would have meant for you guys coming into this. So can you maybe walk us through between that gap, that timeline, what has been the focus of G2? Um, well, first of all, you mentioned the South Breach, like touch on that quickly. Like uh, that tournament was like a small tournament for us and we had just came back from a like three week Christmas break. So like we didn't have any practice, which isn't an excuse, but our focus wasn't there. Like, and it, you know, it, it shouldn't have been there. Our focus is here. Um, so before, after that, we kind of reset. Scrum's well going well at home. Uh, we came to Brazil and we got a kind of wake up call. Mm -hmm. Like to all the teams here, they're playing so different to what we are used to back home in Europe. So we are like really thankful we had the boot camp because they taught us so much things. And it's like, it's, it's a different game pretty much. So I think if we didn't have that boot camp, it would have been a, maybe a different story today. But uh, yeah, it was really good boot camp. So, well, it was good boot camp in terms of learning things. We didn't play so good, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'm happy with the result today. Sometimes if you don't play well in a boot camp or a scrim though it's not always a bad thing is it because when it transfers to the official yeah it can change things up exactly something that i noticed today particularly being studying here during the last couple of rounds and during those winning moments of course at the last 
the comms on your team. Mm -hmm. It was really, really good to hear that there was, you know, usually you're known as a very whooping and a hollering sort of team, and there was there was time for some celebration. I think Alamal surprised me with how quiet he was today. He, Obviously, he, he told me he's humbled this SI. Yeah, That's what he told I mean, me. Can't before, really speak before on that, yeah. but he's humbled. He definitely was a little bit quieter than he's been previously, certainly in Copenhagen and things like Atlanta. Um, but the comms for me today were the standout. Do you think that that sort of extended boot camp has really helped you as a team? Um, yeah, I mean, comms wise, we're all pretty vocal, apart from like maybe Benja and Virtue. Um, like me, Uno, and uh, Alamo are very, very vocal players, and we're pretty smart players. Like we always, we always have ideas of what we need to do to win the round. So I think the key for us was finding like who can talk and who can't talk type of thing, because like the comms used to be really cluttered, so too many cooks in the kitchen. Oh, we've heard those on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> too many cooks in the kitchen. So I think we got that uh, down to the tea today. So keep it up for the for the rest of the tournament. Something you've mentioned a couple of times is that it was a good boot camp. So when it comes to coming to Brazil and having the boot camp, what exactly makes a boot camp successful or not? I mean, we've seen in your performance, it was clearly successful, but as a player for you individually, mm -hmm. what is the definition of a good boot camp? I mean, I, I think, first of all, like, you need to get the good practice in. I think that's a key to every team's success. But like for us, we did a lot of like team bonding activities. We did a lot of like, you know, hanging out like outside of the game. We went okay. partying, we went all, all these type of things. So uh, <laughs> that was pretty fun. Uh, and I mean, it gave us a good mood, you know, like we, we weren't stressed. Like, all right. So I think that's a big thing, taking the stress out of the, out of the game. You went uh, to Carnival as well? We I didn't I, go to Carnival because no. it just started. Okay. So we were try hard and thanks. We were try hard and, uh, when Carnival started. But before that, yeah, we were crazy. So, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for that interview. Uh, phenomenal performance for the side of G2. And just for you guys at home, if you want to have a little bit of a recap, let's have a look at how it exactly played out because it was a 2-0 sweep. And this one particularly 7-4 to four for the side of G2. Every single one of the players stepping up to the plate. We had Benja particularly, Ali, during that first game that we've seen today, going 10-3. and three. But then you look at Alma and he goes 11 and 8, and it's like, Every single time, it's a different player stepping up. You close your eyes, you spin a spinner, or you point at somebody on the GT roster, and any single one of them can show up. And that's what we got a taste of today. We only saw him play two maps. We didn't really see him, see him play too many rounds. We got a 7-2 and a 7-4. So in the yeah. grand scheme of a best of three, that isn't really as far as it could have ended up going. You know, we could have been sat here talking about a map three or yep. still in some sort of overtime here in map number two. So it was a very quick victory for G2 here. Obviously, to give a little bit of light onto NIP, I think that they did correct some of the problems that they maybe faced over in Clubhouse. They had some fantastic attacking rounds. They did some really good jobs at converting those man count advantages but overall, the story of the day here is that G2, they're here to play. I think for NIP, there was a spark of momentum, right? There was a yeah. few attacking rounds that they really seemed to have their things out, or defending rounds, and then that little rush take they did on the top of the Black Stars as well, which really seemed like, okay, uh, NIP, they've, they've had that slow start maybe of this series, but they're potentially looking at a comeback here. But those G2 players, as you mentioned, individually, you could just spin a circle and see whoever lands on, they'll be stepping up. And that's what they did today as well. I feel like so many rounds, we saw G2 players just get picks or get frags individually, and there was no one there on the side of NIP to be able to refrag them. And they're able to punish these players, these lone wolf players on the side of NIP, and then force that ground and control to themselves. Yeah. Something really interesting that I also want to talk about is the fact that literally just now at the interview that we had with Doki, I was like, we had a lot of question marks of you guys coming into it, and he goes, same. So it feels like G2, although the fact that they showed up with so much confidence, potentially it wasn't even there coming into today. I think that just, that's the mark of a very mature team. Yeah. You know, I was speaking to Fox in the green room and we were saying, you know, we were talking about, you know, teams and talking, to, like, saying that they're going to win every game. And I was like, but do you not always think you're going to win every game? Like, you've not got that dog in, you've not got that confidence. The dog in you. And he was like, <laughs> well, no, I'm pretty realistic. Like, I have to be realistic going into this. And I think the G2 have come into this very realistic. Yeah. You know, they weren't thinking that they're the best in the world. They were just thinking they were going to go there and play their game of Siege. And it wasn't necessarily about overhyping themselves beforehand and giving themselves that pressure. And it's obviously worked out for them here. Yeah. I think if you get that confidence, whereas you're like, oh, we're going to win every single game. Doesn't matter who play against, we're going to win it. I mean, yeah, yeah. sometimes you're going to say it to like fake that kind of confidence, fake it yeah. until you make it. But at that point, I'm not trying to say someone might get delusional, but it will hurt you. And like, you can oh, say you it. it's okay. Yeah, but like at that point, you're thinking, oh, well, we're going to win this. It's fine. I can play this on like first, second gear. And if you're not doing that, 
you're potentially risking away games that you really shouldn't be losing. Yeah, and this one as well, we, we hyped it up in terms of G2 defending that SI title after a little bit of an oopsie in the South Breach, which was not even a tier one or a tournament. We heard it from Doki himself. There was that Christmas break. They weren't prepped. It's not an excuse. They learned from that mistake. They got a wake up call when they came to Brazil. But then we were looking at NIP and that's a team that we highlighted in terms of they have also have that SI title under their belt. But let's have a look at the Intel plays in terms of how this exactly played out because I really want to focus on NIP IP this time around because I feel like as you already mentioned it and we saw glimpses but every single time that Benja was there yeah, in the tracks. Glimpses indeed of, of that momentum that we wanted to see from them because they were a pretty momentum based team as you could say when they pick up rounds they just really pick up very fast after as well. I just think some individual players really weren't showing up as we wanted it today. I mean one player that I would like to point out Wizard on the very first map yeah. I think he went like 19 and 7 on entries during the Atlanta Ooh. Major and he was on a donut for the longest of that game. So oh. these players not really showing up, maybe indicating a slow start. That is very unfortunate, but you're looking to hopefully get that from their future matches. Yeah, and unfortunately for them, I mean, they still, unfortunately, this is the first loss that they get. And it's kind of what we're used to from NIP when we're looking at Copenhagen, when we're looking at Atlanta. It's like that first matchup on that international stage is always going to be a little slower, but you, they still have to play GK. They still are going to have to go up against Dark Zero. They're still Fear X. So there are teams within the pool that could potentially cause a bit of an upset. And remember, if you're bottom of the group, you're outie. It doesn't look great, obviously. You never want to start off on a loss, but it's very early days. There's a lot of seeds yeah. left to be played here for NIP. And we want to stress the fact that they're a tournament team. I believe they are a team that get better as the tournament progresses. This is day one, game one. Let's not beat up on them too difficult. Aww. Let's see how they bounce back. That's what I'm more interested in now. Yeah. You know, they've, they've come here, they've played in the booth, they've got a rub of the green. Now let's see how they respond to not coming away with the result that they wanted. Yeah, they're in the swing of things and so are we because we are going to be heading into the second game of today and that's going to be Dark Zero up against GK. But first, a little bit of a break because we also need to get some lunch. So make sure that you also get a lunch, stay hydrated and we'll be back in just a bit. レイヤーネームは すごい、すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。すごい。
って言われるぐらい世界からもすごい注目されてるエントリークラッカーですので取り上げられてるぐらい、えー、まあ世界に通用する日本の一番強い打ち合いプレイヤーだと思います。シックスインビテーショナルはチージ年1回にしかないチージの一番大きな大会でそこで勝つっていうのは本当にその年に一番輝いたチームっていう証明なのでそこで勝つってことは歴史にチージの歴史に残る名誉あることだと思います。自分たちは作戦がすごい意識してる重要視してるチームなので作戦対作戦になったら絶対に負けませんゴーゴーゴー
I like to play like W7 MG2 because I feel like it'll be a fun game to play. Yeah, so we play Scars, so I think to expect is just a crazy match because they're crazy people, so we just got to expect the unexpected and come prepared for it. Scars, we beat you before. We're ready again. We're ready for your craziness. So watch out. We've got Ambi now. He's a bit stupid, a bit more stupid than Gunnar, but he's also smart with the plays that he does. Be prepared. You're not ready for him. Let's go. Can't wait. I need right now. Just watch how I move. Just watch how I move. Move. Hate it or love it. I came in. I pack up the room. I pack up the room. I spend all my time in the lab. Right like I'm getting big time in a half. Right now. We finally made Chances to rise if you blink out of vision, your way to the top. The chamber alert, attracting the things you deserve. Just know I do this on the regular. The hustle keep calling me up on my cellular. 5 a.m. stuck, hot and arrested. I'm sleeping, that's why I'm still all the way up. I cannot be top, block, hand on the clock. Marathon running and making no stops. I came from nothing, my days on the block. This just is why I just gotta do it. Right now, right now, right now. just watch how I move. Right now, right now, right now. Just watch how I move. Can't wait, I need right now. Just watch how I move. My name is David Iconic Ifedon. I play for M80 and I'm the IGL Flex. I feel like the, one of the biggest events for the fans was in Brazil. So, you know, to have the biggest tournament here with probably like one of the best fan bases in Siege is really amazing. So just getting the opportunity to come here and compete with, you know, just a community and culture that really loves Siege is just, it's amazing. I want to play all the teams. I feel like we have a really good group, so, you know, I love playing just the best teams. You know, I feel like it's always the funnest matchup playing against the best players in the world. And it's just going to be a battle, so I'm excited to take some souls. We play W7M first, you know. They're an extremely talented team, so you know we're going to prep them hard and we're going to come ready to play. W7M, I feel like talk is cheap, so you know. I'm going to show up on the game day. I'm going to be talking to you guys, so it's going to be a fun match. So I hope you guys come prepared. Um, I'm Foltz, I'm a player for Space Station Gaming, and my role is Hard Breach slash Flex. So after last Invitational, we did a big revamp of our, our roster and kind of switched our identity and a lot of players and even coaches around through Copenhagen and Atlanta. And now here, um, we've gotten better and kind of built those blocks up uh, to kind of get to the, the point we're at now. And I think this is the best form we've been in and um, I'm excited to, to play. I don't think there's any specific team I really want to play. Um, one thing I will say is the last time we played Wolves, we didn't play the best, but we've made, like I said, a lot of adjustments and we've changed a lot since then and learned a lot. And um, I think this time is going to be much, much different. Now we're here at SI and uh, we are no longer friends. We are enemies. Hi, I'm Ted. I play for Bleed Esports and I play the flex slash lurk position. In stage one, we actually missed the major. It was a heartbreaking defeat against Fury. We took the five months off season to really get on the grind and focus up. In stage two, we ended up qualifying for the Atlanta Major. We had a Cinderella run and we qualified for the sixth Invitational. Playing at the Invitational is like a dream come true for a lot of ranked players myself. Our preparation is going well. We had a 10 day boot camp here in Sao Paulo. We got a lot of scrim experience and we're ready for the challenge ahead. So we're in group C, the so-called group of death with W7M, Liquid, M80 and Virtus Pro. The team I'm most looking forward to versing is W7M because there's no expectations on us and if we win, then it'll be huge for us and APAC as a whole. JV92, get ready to learn Chinese. Uh, I'm D plus Gia에서 playing with Yasser and I'm playing with Flex. The first event in Brazil, San Paolo invitation, I'm excited to play with the event. The first event is Faze, and then we have뭐 에세시나 올브즈, 블리스 이렇게 있는데 어 저희가 뭐 미니 게임만 잘 이긴다면은 충분히 할수 있는 상대라고 생각을 합니다. 일단 첫 경기는 페이즈인데 일단 페이즈가 브라질 팀이라서 뭐 총싸움 같은 걸좀잘 하는 편이라서 그거를 이기기 위한 조금 같이 
팀, 팀적으로 팀 움직이는 그런 움직임을 좀 많이 하려고 연습을 하고 있습니다. 베이지 긴장해라. 저번에는 졌었는데 아, 저번에는 아쉽게 졌는데 이번에는 이겨본다. <웃음> I'm Jack Robertson, also known as Doki, and I'm the entry fragger for G2 Esports R6. Not a single mistake can be afforded. Doki finds a triple kill. I would say my, my main role is focused on getting the first engagement. Super aggressive, super in your face. I actually do play literally everything. I can kind of do it all. In G2 Esports R6, you have Alamal, who is our captain in IGL. He is a complete psychopath in every meaning and description of that word. You're gonna crumble! That's the difference between an SI champion and a normal major champion, okay? He's always, like, energetic. Alamal looking to seek an engagement. It's over! G2 make mainstay! He plays flex, plays literally everything, so really flexible, and he's one of the best players in the game. And then we have Virtue, Jake. He is our second support. Again, flex, plays type of everything. Virtue holds the perfect angle to take down Red Shiro. He is kind of like the dad, I guess, of the team. He's the oldest. Everyone looks up to him as that kind of father figure in the team. We then have Benja Master. He is like entry fragger, but again, plays everything type of role. Like he plays whatever you need him to. Benja Master, the Dane, holds on, falls back, re picks, finds one. He manages to do things that aren't explainable, like you can't replicate. He is the best player in the game, and I'll happily say that. We then have Uno. Alexei, he's our new, newest member of the team, yeah, but he's kind of like the backbone of the team, like right now. KZ has pulled off not quite the impossible, but a bit of a worker got there. Can't get He's adapted to the roles really well. He helps out uh, Alamal with IGL and shot calling a lot. Everyone that goes to Invitational, right, of course you want to win it, right? But not one team in the world can go there and be like, oh, I'm going to win it. And if people say that, then they're, they're lying. Everyone can now do everything if needed. Like, all my teammates are loved to bits. Like, they're my brothers pretty much. Three, two, one. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I got problems on problems on problems on problems on problems on problems I solve them. I run through the money, the pressure be calling. Left on my blessings, I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage, I'm going through something, that's why I ain't calling. Phone and progression, it's all that I wanted. The phone and affection, I summon and dub it. Cause I got problems on problems on problems on problems on problems on problems I solve them. I run through the money, the pressure be calling. Left on my blessings, I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage, I'm going through something, that's why I ain't calling. Phone and progression, it's all that I wanted. The phone and affection, I summon and dub it. Why you be all in my line about nothing? Why won't you go get you a dollar or something? Don't hang with it, who line for nothing? I see that we different, you ride and I dub them. I don't do discussions on bragging about hundreds. Don't go to your places, I know that they sunken. Don't call me your brother, I barely could trust you. I talk to a shorty, she bagging the bugging. And I'ma need all of my dollars on corpus, so hand me the money, I divvy the pie. I'ma give all of my people a portion to build them a fortune on flipping the ride. I can't be mixy when iffy the vibe. And 40 on 50 is really the time. Why is you all on my phone like you want me? Like you wasn't pushing the kids to the side. I'ma run through the money, the press will be calling. Left on my blessings, I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage, I'm going through something, that's why I ain't calling. Meu nome é Jaime Pereira Ramos Jr., mais conhecido como Cyber dentro do, do jogo Rainbow Six. Jogo pela FaZe Clan. Now, what is the idea for FaZe to try and mix things up? Oh, what a shot there from Cyber! O Major Suécia, eu quebrei, meu, quebrei o recorde né, de kills que teve em campeonato de Major. No próximo campeonato que a gente jogou, que foi o Major Berlin, a gente, eu quebrei de novamente meu recorde, mas não fui campeão. O estilo de jogo é muito agressivo, então eu sou um jogador que Penso em muitas possibilidades ao momento. Tem o Vita King, né, que é o nosso IGL. Ele é um jogador que é, direciona a gente onde ele precisa. Forest, you cannot... Essa parte assim ele faz muito bem, então acho que ele meio que nasceu para essa parte de fazer essa parte de GL assim. Tem um Souls, né, que tá há muito tempo comigo, é um jogador que é muito calmo. Ele consegue pensar muito sobre o jogo também, ele consegue trazer muitos rounds importantes pra gente, que a gente tá perdendo. Ele é um jogador muito habilidoso nessa parte. O KDS é uma pessoa que fica, fica 
parado, não faz muita coisa assim fora do, do comum. KDS is looking for him and the opening kill is for FaZe. Acho que essa parte sim é uma parte mais forte dele, assim, de ser um jogador também que pensa bastante dentro do jogo e sabe a hora de executar alguma coisa. O Range é um jogador que é muito bom também, ele tem uma parte de skill muito boa também, acho que todo jogador nosso time é muito bom em questão de skill. Handy from above is able to deny and that means there is no chance to have a clutch this. Ele consegue fazer bastante round que a gente tá perdendo ali de uma forma é, drástica. Acho que o Civitation, todos os jogadores querem ganhar, né? Acho que cada um quer se provar ali dentro do, do campeonato. E eu acho que todos os jogadores pensam assim que é o maior campeonato assim para si, né? Que é, é, o, é o troféu mais antigo que tem no jogo, então acho que é o que todo mundo quer ganhar. O time, esse é o time que ainda não que eu tenho que é mais unido dentro de jogo e fora. É um time muito agressivo quando precisa. Sabe que o nosso estilo de jogo é totalmente diferente do que eles jogam com. Então acho que a galera assim, tem um pouco de medo de jogar contra a gente nessa parte. My name is Faiz. My game tag is Jalad. Uh, I'm with Team Falcons and I play as a flex. We are really happy that we made it. Uh, it's our first time like for the mini region to be uh, to qualify for the SI and we're really excited and hopefully like uh, we do well. We had a little bit of change in our play style of course. We learned our mistakes. We're getting better and hopefully this SI we will prove it. The group we're in uh, is Sonics, Cars, Loss and uh, Fury. Uh, they're all good, uh, very good teams. Uh, I don't think there's a like top team from them. Like they're all very good, and we practice for them all. And hopefully, like uh, we do our best. Our first game is against uh, Loss. We never played them. I think uh, their play style is quite similar to ours in some way, uh, and we're very excited to play against them. Loss, be ready. My name is Cameraman. Uh, I play for Loss, and I'm the IGL captain. For our goal to be top six and maybe win tournament, we need to be prepared for what's coming. So we worked really hard since Atlanta to be in our best shape to be here. I think our most difficult match would be Sonics, but if we play our game the way we do, we don't have a problem with that. The preparation against Falcons, it's a bit hard because they changed their roster, so we don't know what to expect. They have a resident coach as well that I played with him. We are confident on playing and stuff like that, so uh, it's more like um, what we li like to play over of what's their weaknesses. Well, Falcons, I know you guys are a bit like unexpected. I don't know what to expect from you guys, but you know what to expect from us, and you know that's going to be a hard game for you. I'm PIX's entry player, Lin Changbyunguk입니다. First, the dark coach is coming in, so the away team is able to deal with the deal club and other strategies, so the condition is good. 좋은 상태를 유지하고 있습니다. 저희는 일단 A 그룹에 속해 있고요. 개인적으로 가장 경계되는 팀은 GK e스포츠가 제일 경계되는 것 같습니다. 저희 첫 번째 첫 번째 상대는 G2 e스포츠고요. G2 e스포츠 같은 경우에는 과거에 이겨본 전적이 있기 때문에 이번에도 충분히 이겨볼 수 있을 거라 생각합니다. 오랜만이야 G2. 이번에도 과거의 기억이 나도록 한번더 이겨줄게. I am Bolo. I play for Dark Zero and I am second entry. Personally, I feel pretty ready for the event. I think, you know, I, I had a little bit of a, a little bit of a break. You know, it's been about a year, but I'm ready now. I think the team's ready. The boys are ready to win, and so am I. And, you know, what's a better place to do it in Sao Paulo? The group is well matched for us, you know, there's no, you know, you don't want to underestimate any opponent in any tournament, especially the biggest one of the year. We got GK, G2, NIP, and FearX. I think they're good matchups, and I think we're ready. I think we're prepared, and I don't think they will be. But FearX and GK, you, you never know what they, what they can throw your way. GK, I've been gone for a little bit, but that don't mean nothing. I'm excited to play you. Let's just, let's just, let's, let's show out, why don't we? My name is Joystick, and I'm playing for Virtus.pro on Open Fire Roll. Our goal is to go here for the stage and like show 
everyone what we can do as a team. Our group is uh, Group C. We were playing versus Liquid, W7M, M80, and Bleed. Our first match will be versus Liquid. We have uh, a lot of like matches before. We didn't win them any time, so it will be a crazy matchup because they are Brazilian teams. We are like a Europe team. We are playing so slow. They are playing so aggressive. So it will be some crazy stuff, different playstyles, different like countries. It, it will be amazing in my opinion. Hey Liquid, you know that we are never trash talking to the other teams, so just have fun and I think we have a good match. Hey guys, I'm Iconic, I'm IGL for M80. M80 decide it's go time, Iconic for a double. And I'm just kind of the guy that just takes the gaps and just puts people on the same page. Sport, he's our entry fighter. I mean, he's a wonder boy from Europe. Seeing him inside the server, it just takes your breath away. The shots he hits. There is nothing that they can do. How does he keep fighting these? Five seconds as he forces it down. Spike to clutch. He has like that willingness just to like get better. Gomez, another entry frag for us. We call him the boss man. As Gomez finally gets the first kill of the round for M80. But inside the lobby, he's like my secondary IPL too. So he helps me see things that I can't see inside the game because he knows M80 system extremely well too. He's a dog, he doesn't give up, he wants to win, and it's what we need on the team. Last but not least, Diaz. We call him the Punisher. If you're being too aggressive, you know Diaz will be good, so he'll, he'll catch you. He's also mechanically gifted, he's nasty at the game. Some stuff he does is just like, wow, to me. As he picks Gomez back up, quick thinking, Hoffman looks for it, but Diaz says not twice. Winning the sixth invitation, I mean, that would be a dream, you know, I've dreamed of lifting that hammer multiple times. All I do is make dreams come true, so we'll see. It's like it's a perfect blend of personality and characters, you know, something that what other people don't have, other people have, and other people have, some people don't have, so it's just, it's a good mix of people to be around.
Welcome back to the first day of Six Invitational 2024 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm Jenny, your host, joined on the desk with Anne and Ollie. A little bit of a switcheroo in terms of <laughs> positions, but we're going to be heading into the second best of three of today here on the A stream. And it's going to be GK up against Dark Zero. Now, both of these teams had had a very interesting uh, last couple of months. So I want to jump straight into it and start off with the side of GK because Let's be honest, they completely exploded onto that international stage back in Atlanta. Yeah, but a, a really exciting thing is this is the first time at SI, right? If you're looking at this graphic, they haven't had a result at SI yet. They're newer to the international stage due to Mena being added as a region for this year in competitive. And that also means that if you look at their past, they haven't actually played against an NA team before. Because at the Atlanta Major, they played against Brazil teams, Japan teams, EU teams, but none of those were any of the NA teams. So this is some kind of new Ooh. territory for them. I mean, new territory. Even more so, we're looking at the LAN appearances here, like there is a One. lot <laughs> of experience. Sick for Dark Zero. Yeah. But then we're looking at JK here, Ollie, and it's one. It is one. Um, a measly one. It will go up to two, though. Yay! It, only in about <laughs> only in like 30 minutes when map one has been played, bang, you can put two LAN appearances in there. And you can say that you played against an NA team. I think for me, it just goes to show how exciting this is because we don't really know what we're going to get with GK. Obviously, we've seen them play internationally before. We know what this team's capable of, but they're now at SI. They're now running with the big dogs and they need to step things up and how they're going to stack up against a team like Dark Zero, especially yeah. with how exciting that roster is looking now. There is so much to break down for this matchup but before we do so let's head over to the coach from dark zero who has an interview in terms of what they think is going to be played out like uh, really excited against gk this is a new roster we got uh, star boys bolo and troy canadian ready to <laughs> ready to go uh we didn't get to play gk they had a little bit of a cinderella run so you know we're hoping we don't let that happen here a man a few words but a lot of things to unpack here i think mm. we're going to start off with the fact that dark zero has had some phenomenal pickups which i think if there's anything to get excited about this game here and it's the roster for sure i mean those pickups are phenomenal it's really good to see this for dark zero as well and um we've seen them pick up like newer players or more rookie players and now they're picking up these experienced players but we have seen them perform before at major events and in a very significant way as well really excited to see Bolo back at the uh, retirement home as well an eu import of course that's going to make us yeah. like uh, you know major eu desk very happy exactly. about that as well <laughs> true actually I didn't think about that exactly you know you look at a player like nathan what he's been able to do in rosters that he's been in previously He's been in and around the conversation. He's played with a lot of players that have gone on to do great things. And you've got to look at that and you've got to think, what's he going to be able to bring now? And touched on it there, DZ, they've had a habit of bringing in rookies. We look at players like Rice, yeah. didn't quite work out. They were looking for a very vocal player on this roster. They've already got Canadian. That's a shouting match that no one really wants to get into. But yeah. Nath has got that experience. And hopefully if he can stand up and be that vocal player that DZ are looking for, fantastic. And I mean, I don't even need to be logged into Twitch now to know what Twitch chat's typing. <laughs> but believe me, uh. Bolo plays soon. Chat is uh, always an interesting one to look at. But another interesting fact here is going to be looking at GK in terms of how they have performed in that first ever major, which is Atlanta. But there have been changes ever since, which then again brings the question, is that Cinderella run something they can replicate here today, Anne? Yeah, it's a very curious thing to see, right? Because they had a bit of IGL issues, I guess, the last time around. I mean, they've said that this is usually on multiple people's shoulders to fulfill that kind of role. They didn't have a leader for that miracle run they had in Atlanta and then decided not to continue with him, even though he helped them a lot on that IGLing part. So that's my main question for when we see JK in play for their first game today. Who's taking on the IGL role? Who's going to be the main talking point on that team? And how structured are things going to be? If we go back to the point where IGLing is on multiple people's shoulders, how effective is this team going to show up today? Mm -hmm. GK have still got remnants of that miracle run, though. They've got Noodle, don't forget. And Noodle, of course, did play last year in Montreal at Six Invitational. So you're going to be looking at him and you're going to be saying, give me a little bit of that information. Give me a little bit of a head start. You know, let's really understand what we're going to be going up against here. One thing that we know about these Mena teams is that they don't get intimidated by a big stage. They don't get intimidated by a big storied opponent. They're just here to play and they're here to have a lot of fun. GK embody that mindset 
set. I don't think that they're going to be sat there worried about what's going to go on today. They're just going to get into the server and start running around. And also something to really highlight and hammer home here is GK is one of the two teams that are representing the MENA region at Six Invitational. The MENA region has continuously proven time and time again that they belong here on this international stage. So this is so important for the pride of the region as well. But without further ado, let's head into those map features because that's what we're really looking forward to. It's been a while since we've seen these. I mean, we, yes, we just saw them G2 against NIP, but in terms of the teams, in terms of the last time we've seen them play, that's been a couple of months. So Oregon Bank, Border, as well as Cafe are immediately taken out of the map pool. Nothing too crazy. No, but I, I'm kind of surprised to not see Clubhouse being banned by Dark Zero, considering it is a really good map for, for GK. They've got a nine game win streak on that map. Ooh. It's also not picked by either of these teams. So that's very curious going into this whole situation as well. We've got Shelly coming out as a uh, as a pick from Dark Zero. That is a map that they have had uh, changing performances on. It's not been the greatest for them in recent history, but they do have a high preference for this map. So it's a map that they definitely enjoy playing. Shelly coming in there and Conchla as the second map guaranteed with a Labs Decider. I mean, Oof. I can't wait to see a little bit of Night Haven. I'm really biased. I love the map. I'm glad that we've got it as a chance and a possibility here. I do think the map veto is a little bit strange, though. GK okay. have obviously targeted those really two powerful picks from Dark Zero. They're not looking to go to those highly preferred maps. But the Clubhouse, it does beg a little bit of a question. Has an opportunity been missed there by GK? I think the Night Haven one's a curious one too, right? Because we saw on the graphic earlier that this is one of the strongest maps from Dark Zero on land appearance. In recent history, not so much. But then if we look at GK, they've got a flawless one so far. Played it three times since September, also won all three times that they played it. Oh, this is looking like a really interesting map pick and in general, an incredible veto. But with that, we're ready to head into our second best of three here on the A stream. Dark Zero going up against GK. So let's head over to our lovely casters. We'll be breaking it down. Thank you so very much. It is excellent to be back at the Six Invitational, but more importantly, it's excellent to be back in Brazil. Yeah. You've and been here both times. I've been here both times. I was going to say. Now all three times. Yeah, just like that. And yeah, it's been a while. 2019 was the last time we were Brazil. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And I looked much less clown-like. <laughs> That's your own doing, though, Parker. That hair that you have, that lion's mane. Here's, oh, here's okay. in my defense, here's the issue. Okay, the issue. It takes a while for hair this thick to dry. Okay. And as it dries, it changes shape. Okay. And maybe it gets a little bit poofy. A little bit? So don't blame me. <laughs> a little bit? Okay. Oh. But before we get started, Nick, there's one thing I want to say. Okay, what do you want to say? Hi, Pengu. No. It's me. No. Your only spectator. <laughs> For months, I have created the illusion that you were posting to a large audience. Yeah. But here's the truth. All those people in the comments are me. And now to prove it, I'm going to send this message from all my accounts in the Twitch chat. Thank you, Parker. That was what was posted below my most recent tweet about us casting today, and you even joined in and copy-pasted that into your very own message. I went so far as to copy-paste your entire you tweet, did. including your photo, and just make that same tweet. Low effort tweeting, Parker, what can I say? Twitter is awful. I don't use it pretty <laughs> much ever. I check it once a day at absolute most. It is a hellscape. However, However, you're telling me that at events, I have the opportunity to troll you by using social media, I'll do that. I will That's do fair. Just that. No, no more trolling, no more jokes. DZG are going up against GKY. They are. And before we get into it, I just want to say, what does the G? Mean? <laughs> Where's the what, what is the G? Where's the G in Dark Zero? It's not Dark Zero game. What's the G? It's eSport in gaming. Oh, and immediately getting under their skin, the Lopes backgrounds coming out oh. from GK. If you recall back in Atlanta, DZ got absolutely stomped by Lowe's. 7 0 on that final map of Skyscraper, I believe. It was uh, brutal. It was, it was DZG's map. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of DZG, um, 381 days. That is how long it was that Jason, aka Brolo, stepped down as an active player in the personal scene of, of Siege. And he's back now for Dark Zero for at least this tournament of the Six Invitational. And hovering glass for a brief moment there, but switching onto the floor is now. When we're looking at Dark Zero, a lot of people are going to talk about Bolo joining, superstar player, big deal, yes, we know. But Nave coming from Europe, being that support player, and maybe possibly going to be a voice for Dark Zero as well, making him more loose, he can do more things on the flex side of things. Nave on that more supportive role, probably like lead from the back. So if Troy is going to let go of his reins on this team and let Nave kind of help him, I could really see Dark Zero have a different performance and maybe even a different play style throughout this entire event. I am eagerly anticipating the changes to Dark Zero. 
I, I'm gonna... I, Jack, are you listening right now? Fresh. Always. Fresh, I know you're probably listening to this. I hope you're listening to this. You shoot me a message. I want to know. Fresh came in here and said something about Dark Zero before we got into the matchup, and I'd like to use that on the broadcast. So, Jackie boy, if you are listening, to give me permission to say it, because I think it is an intriguing thing to say. Providing, of course, he's watching the other match, which is SSG versus Wolves, happening on the B stream. Either way, we can talk about it at a later date. The addition of Nath is the most intriguing part of this new Dark Zero roster. Yeah, and not surprised you see a slow start. It's your first matchup, your first game of six invitationals. You don't want to just lose bodies early, so a still, you know, very methodical Dark Zero attack right now. Mostly pushing from the south side, that's Solar, Master Bedroom, etc. But they do have some pressure on the library balcony as well. So good old split theory, as we have to use as a term these days. But GK doing a great job, they're just kind of sitting still. Now, this is the perfect time, as we're still in the early moments of the round. The zenith of the round, if we shall say. Maybe explain some split theory for the people watching at home. I actually hate the term. So split theory is basically when teams, they attack from like many different angles at once and you gotta kinda gotta play for yourself. Whereas the old style of seats is five or four people from one single aside, but maybe one guy backstabbing. So right now in Dark Zero, they are showing us kind of like the split theory. They got library belt pressure, they're roam clearing as well. They're attacking from multiple areas off the map at once. There you go. And there's the very first bit of flames sent out by Naif. First kill for Dark Zero comes, of course, on the heels of Pandazine getting the first kill. Nate's first kill for Dark Zero, just in case you're curious about it. Control now of the upstairs by Dark Zero. So the three remaining members of GK have been relinquished to mostly the basement and playing peripheral sites. Noodle will attempt the retake upstairs in Solarium. He'll have a heads-up gunfight with Bolo. He'll have to wait for his very first kill on Dark Zero because he's out for the count. Canadian down below where Noodle could potentially retreat through. Nafe another kill, this time on to Key. Hashalm on the board. Trading back and forth with 30 seconds to go. And there's the thing, Dark Seer, they're kind of everywhere. Like we see Troy holding a window, we see Nafe holding a window as well. And yeah, the active gunfights right now favor in GK, but it's still 3v2 in favor of Dark Seer. They still got this round favored so far. Now one of the best guns in the game in the hands of Canadian. Inching up and down goes Hisham, the 417, just chewing right through him. Noodle over by Chimney, punished by Pan Bazoo. First kill in the round, last kill in the round. DZ, take round number one. If you're Dark Zero, I feel like you go into this thing, okay, GK, they might be running into us, seeking gunfights, play really like overly aggressive because that's kind of like the Mena playstyle. There was this interview a while back where I'm not sure who exactly said it from Mena, but it said, we know really typically planned, it's all like over those kills and that map control. So if you expect that kind of performance from your opponent when you're Dark Zero, it makes sense to hold angles on those window balconies and let them make the first one you see it here. Nave, he holds his angle for a solid minute and 30 seconds. He finds one kill, Captain Fire comes out, finds the second kill as well. And then Nave again, just holding a doorway, sees a bit of movement, gets that easy Attackers kill. Recovered their Dark Zero didn't have to move a whole lot and didn't really have many gunfights happening. It was just GK that run Running away from them and <laughs> running into them. Yeah. Nate with the energy there. Love to see it. Of course, had a phenomenal start for him. We love seeing on support players, they get a couple of kills, they get to be a part of the action. And this is the thing that I think Dark Zero can really benefit from. Having a vocal player on the one side of the map, which was Canadian, on the Trophy Master Bedroom side, and having Nathan on the other side on Library Balcony. If they're both vocal players, they can be like, oh, hey guys, movement over here, or hey, I, you know, Library players have left this position, expect more people to come fight you guys on Master Bedroom, for example. So I just want to see Nave stay as vocal as possible when we see those player cams, when we see maybe a tactical timeout, and to kind of gather like how much input is he actually providing for this team. DZ have never really had a problem getting the players that they want for their team. If you recall, they picked up Rice for the Atlanta Major. Or, well, before that, but of course he came to the Atlanta Major. Yeah. I think after what we witnessed in Atlanta, it was very evident that he was not the answer for the team. He was relatively quickly moved off of the roster once Atlanta ended. And now, of course, reaching out, getting Bolo and Nave after Gavin was also released from the roster, which was a bit more surprising as just from the eye test, Gavin didn't seem like he was that poor of a fit for Dark Zero, but clearly we never have the full information. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. 
And as to why teams make these decisions, it's anybody's guess. Now, <laughs> first bit of contact is going to come up in the library. Trix dies yet again from a very similar position with Nafe on the board. Bolo 0 for 2 to start off with. Seriously, with one kill before NJR punishes him. Those DMRs in the hands of DZ are so strong. A 4v3 with well over half of the round. And same thing with GK. They start off well just sitting in their corners, but then when they start to make a little bit of a movement, they get picked off every single time. And DC again, they're rotating, swapping things around. They start being very passive, but now they're going to get proactive, right? They're going to make that pressure down towards the basement and no noodle on the solids is downstairs. And if they can take him down, that's going to enable a stronger position for them, knowing that flank is removed from the game. But noodle reads it well. He runs further back into the basement and hides downstairs, knowing that simply staying alive is all he needs to do right now and that he and Hashom make the magic happen on the side first and then he can go for a late flank. Well, 40 seconds elapsed since the last time we spoke about the state of these teams. Hmm. Hashom will get a little bit brazen. He'll duel NJR, lose the gunfight. Second kill for NJR now with less than a minute to go. Dark Zero was always a methodical team, but their biggest weakness when we've seen them from the last stage and the last major was they were very slow. This has not been the case so far here on Chalet. Their pace is noticeably faster. Yeah. Getting those early kills and still progressing well, and now Smoke's going out. They're going to hit the side momentarily, but 30 seconds still, they can take their time. He's in a tough position because they could collapse on him from three separate angles, maybe four if somebody were to head in towards that billiard table. Oh my! Key with a kill knife, immediately punishing him for that. Now it's all up to Noodle to take back the sights. P90 in hand, yeah, down goes Pambazoo. Noodle will ascend to the very top floor with the diffuser running in favor of Dark Zero. Defenders have eyes to on wait the out this time. Solus is often uniquely equipped in a post plant. But as long as neither Canadian nor Nave sit on electronics, their actual positions will be concealed from the operator. So it's just guesswork for Noodle at this point. Half of the diffuser now completely gone. As Noodle is shooting through the floors essentially hopelessly. He doesn't have information. He's got a good shot, but that's pretty much all going for him. Nafe watching the doorway looking for kill number five. Time's about to run out. We're now past the point of no return. Dark Zero will get the round, and Nafe will get the kill. Five kills through two rounds for the new flex slash support player brought on to Dark Zero, and it's an excellent start for these. Best start you can hope for, that's for sure. Individually. Oh, chop, chop, <laughs> and the trash talking, by the way. Ooh, chop, chop from Nave. Yeah. I mean, now I can look at GK right now. They need to change something up. They cannot just sit in these corners and just get picked apart by utility from the Capital, Fire, the Flourish Drones, etc. They gotta get proactive. I like what Noodle is doing. He's getting out there, trying to get things, you know, to happen. But most of Dark Sea are playing so far to building again. They find one, two, or even three kills right here. Just from sitting or repelling outside a door or a window. Three kills, in fact, in this round, yeah. So, GK, they gotta try and bait Dark Zero into the build them, let them get a bit of a foothold somewhere, and then maybe strike back, either C4 below, or just take two people together and go for that single or gunfight, because right now, they're just losing out in 1v1s or playing against 1 versus 2s, and it's not a great look. They did try bar back to back, okay, it didn't work either time, so it makes perfect sense now to change up that bomb side and look at the other line. Completely different. Tuberu, Mira, Warden, the Kaid, Wamai. A ton of utility now to play against Dark Zero. So they say, okay, we're not going to have the best weapons necessarily, but we have different tools to drop. Deny the walls, slow you down, because Dark Zero, yeah, they've been fast in terms of pacing. They get a kill early, they get a kill in the mid round, and then they win in that final 20 seconds of the round. But if Jiggy can now stop dying early and have Kai to Bromira, well, if Dark Zero attacks the bombs are 20 seconds left, that's not going to be ideal and longer for this round. It's the first time that you and I are going to be casting the newest operator, Tubaro, who has the Zoto canister. It's more of a cryo canister, essentially, for those that don't know, and it does an awful lot. If you throw it at the floor, you can see footsteps from down below, it can freeze walls, it's basically breach denial. And we'll touch on everything that those canisters do as they are deployed, providing we get that far. I mean, when Noodles went to the very final moments of the previous round, it's yeah. good to say that he plays relatively sheltered. Also, he's got Mavericks DMR. Yeah, on defense, more DMRs on defensive side. We they see hurt. Them at land. Exactly. So they much. hurt so much. Two bullets or three, you're either injured or you're outright just dead. And pairing the Kite with the Tuberu, 
is exactly what you want to see. Or a Panther for that case. So you can freeze the wall, trick it, deny that heartbeat sketch, and keep those mirror windows alive upstairs because, yeah, master bedroom defense, but they're extending balloons out of kitchen as well. So a fair bit of map control now in the favor of GK and Dark Zero. They need to work on their problem solving now because, again, this time, GK are not surrendering these free kills any longer. They're sitting in strong, fortified positions, and now DC, they have to make an active first move. That's the big concession for GK is that they were so strong in holding that library. They weren't successful, but they were investing a lot into it. It's not the case this time. Located. So DZ are able to walk through that part of the map. It's been the slowest round so far, though we're only three in. Just a little bit over a minute remaining. The Lion Scale will gain some information. Panbazoo is on the hunt, but he's boxing shadows. His key is long gone before being finished off by NJR. Dark Zero. Striking first in all three rounds so far. Though, in previous rounds, GK has kept it a little bit close. Not the case in this round. Technically, technically it was a trade in the previous round, but I mean... Yeah. Getting on the board first or at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll take those. I mean, it was a great collapse with four players in DC working together, but again, the time is so low now. 35 seconds, walls are still reinforced, they're kite tricked, and Trooper Noodle, still three of those canisters in pocket. DC, they gotta go for broke here, just push in that doorway. Not it's not gonna work out. Get downstairs through the hatch, find set of Noodle as well. Now those walls might be opened up, but there's no time for DC. This dude's gotta go for broke. The advantage the Dark Zero had has been reduced to nothing at this point to show with two kills. Naif giving the advantage back to Dark Zero, but more work to be done. Hashoma's last one left. Bolo on the board for the first time. All match. Hashoma with the sidearm out, turns his back. Bolo in hot pursuit. Naif is down. Bolo needs to win it. It's a game of keep away. And Hashoma gets them all. Every single kill. <laughs> with the pistol, the runaway, the fadeaway, and saving the round for GK. Well, it wasn't pretty for a moment there, but he clutched up. Hashom gets all five <laughs> kills, and Ace and then types chop, chop. Chop, chop. In chat. Oh, the LeBron effect, right? You talk your smack, and then it, uh, karma hits you really quickly. It's, that, is such, that is such a reference. Oh, I know Iconic lost that one. LeBron effect. There we see it, the first kill. I mean, just the pre-fire, just the first bullet headshots all the way throughout. And of course, the injure. Two pistol kills in a 1v2. Not sure the it was, probably on the uh, the office exterior door, I reckon, onto Nath, if I had to guess, because otherwise they could have gone for a plan, so we have to assume here that the diffuser was not in Dark Sears control. The only logical play here in that scenario. But again, the walls not being opened up for DC forced him into a bad spot. You know, one doorway and piano double door, and one uh, doorway on that office balcony. So, no real good pressure points for Dark Zero. They could be set far back out of those long lines of sight. They had to push through into close quarter combat, not knowing exactly where the members of GK were because they were so low on time. So, strategically, a beautiful reach from GK going from round number two into round number three. And they get the round, well, partly because of that. And of course, Hashou i just stepping up for his team. I always like seeing players who are relatively new to international competition start to pop off. So when you get players like GK who don't have a wealth of international experience, it really is great to see the growth in other regions and the growth of individually skilled players. GK will need more than a shome to ace every single round if they want to be competitive in this matchup. Very first defense down below. Tomorrow being brought again, this time in the hands of Key. Didn't really see much of an impact from Noodle in the previous round. At least not that I did. I don't know if you can shine no. light on something that I might have missed. No, you're right. I mean, he died pretty, uh, not early on, but he died before anything really happened. But also, they kept the kind loss intact, so the trooper wasn't needed for new wall deny. But as you said, Parker, it has many applications. Throwing it on like a regular floor will also slow any attackers down and just make it more difficult to take those gunfights. So. There's still, of course, a ways to find it, if not for the walls themselves. Again, DZ, very good at getting on the board. First, Trix has had a rough start to this matchup. Because of that, GK finds themselves a down a man. Half of the round still to play out, and the Kaid as well. So you have to hope that that Electric Claw has gone somewhere. Noodle is also gone, and so is Key, as Bolo and Pambazoo have found ways into the bomb site. Suddenly, Hasham and Seriously will need to retake. Six kill in a row for Hasham. So far, a seven on the match. Looking for an eighth over towards Trench Door. All the while, this is happening. Dark Zero having GK's attention. 
It allows Canadian to get the diffuser down. Attackers are active. He'll get out of there. Along with the rest of Dark Zero, now scrambling into the post play. Pam Bazoo over in connector with a cross on the seriously loses the gunfight, leaving GK with two members still to go. The Dark Zero have that timer working what? in their favor. Another from seriously. And now it's a Shonda wrapper. Over towards Trench Door, he knows that JR is there, gets him, leaving Canadian in a 1v1, who's playing by blue. The jig is up. Hashom with that SMG at close range will decide to hop onto the diffuser. He has time to get off of it. He'll wait and hear if Canadian aggresses, which oh. he does, and Hashom wins it again. Two rounds in a row. Good grief. Tie game. It wasn't even like Dark Zero misplayed that. I mean, they were holding, you know, long angles far away that established somewhat of a crossfire, etc. But the shots that are being hit right now from Hashomen, seriously, in that 2v3 or 2v4, is incredible. And just like that previous round, Hashom in the end game chat will type chop chop after brutally clutching that round for his team. And again, I was gonna praise Dark Zero, the off pace play, pan by on the nook, just into the breach, goes to the backstab, and seeming out of nowhere, Dark Zero, they go for an execute. All Dark Zero, so to speak, before Nathan Bolo, I feel like would have taken 20 seconds, 30 seconds extra, been very predictable, very slow, but they are quick right now to those punches. One minute, 30 seconds, Panba's in the breach. It's five versus two. How's it fall apart? Well, the shots that have been out here, one and two, that starts things off. Let me see how Shom is in G11, close quarter. I will say, not the greatest post and position there from Canadian on the Thatcher. You're up against SMG11 on a T5, high fired weapons, and he's sitting there, Troy. Relax, calm down. Too many things going on right now. So it looked good on paper, but when you can hit your shots, anything can happen. Now it's tied up 2 2. All of a sudden, this is going to be a map. I thought Dark Zero in the first two rounds were going to run away with it. But it might not be the case. If GK can do the full bomb substitution here, three in a row, going back to bars a third round, um, potential round victory in a row here, that'd be a great spot for them. Maybe they can show us that they figure things out, those weaknesses in the first two rounds, getting picked off early, etc. Or maybe, without those clutch moments, they wouldn't have gotten those two rounds, it'd be a fall for Dark Zero. So they gotta show up now more than ever. Get that round advantage, and show us that they have learned from those previous two rounds. We have an update on the match happening on the B stream. If you don't want spoilers, close your ears for the next 10 seconds or so. After a disastrous start that looked like all hope was lost, the Wolves pulled it back in map two and then prevailed in map three to topple Space Station two to one. Quite amazing, given the fact that the Wolves almost lost to Fresh's Ranky Stack. <laughs> Yeah, almost twice, in fact, actually. I one was overtime. Did you play on that team? Simulation. I played one of the matches. There you go. We lost 5 7 on Night Haven Lab. Good for you, man. Yeah, we got slaughtered. It's a, you know, not slaughtered, <laughs> but we, 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 you know, could have been OT. Mm -hmm. Now, back to bar, GK will go. And the things that we looked at from Atlanta for Dark Zero here, because right now they're on attack, they're the ones who have the job to do. Mm. It's that how does the speed of DZ's execute? stack up to what we saw previously. And I think it's inarguable. They're much faster. Yeah. They look better. But GK are a terrific team from what we saw finished top eight in Atlanta. Despite the fact that that was their first major international event, they have proven to be a force to be reckoned with. And obviously the changes to the team, the one change bringing in seriously over, was it Leader? Yeah. Who played in Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, but that was a question, right? Without leaders, the IGL, how is this team of GK going to adapt throughout? And so far, it has been pretty promising. But a minute ago, though, things will stop. But it's this time GK finds an opening kill, shutting down Dark Seer's initial entry and stopping that bombsite attack. And there's another That's shotgun that. pointed right at the window. If Canadian doesn't know what's about to hit him, he's going to go down oh. for the count. The Nitro goes out, but instead, it's tricks to break the curse and get his first kill. Securing Nafe as Canadian will continue to bleed out. Dark Zero tripped up on that window. Now it's NJR who's found his way into the bomb site. Goodbye, Trixed. Playing behind bar. NJR still in this position. Diffuser will need to be retrieved. That's the greater problem. But instead, GK are playing full court press. Bolo and NJR last alive. Bolo goes down to Noodle. And now it's NJR to clean up inside the site. He's got two kills. There's three more to be found. He himself will need to ace. Only 10 seconds left. No diffuser means no objective. NJR is in a very tough spot. They know exactly where he is. 
and it's seriously to clean things up. Three rounds in a row for GK. They take the lead. Very puzzling round. I mean, Canadian twice gets caught with a candela in his hand, not ready for a gunfight. First gets injured, second time around he dies. But not just that, but four members of Dark Zero are outside the bar gaming window, essentially. Just gonna all in, you know, lie in, yin candela, jump in, go for a plant. That's like, you know, you can say it's a rush direct strat, but it seems more like desperation, where they couldn't problem solve around the round, they didn't have the answers. So then for the quote-unquote easiest solution, which is rarely the best solution, and this time around, GK, they're near the site, they're ready for it. Noodle often is roaming way off on the you know, other side of the map. He was actually near the bomb site itself, ready for that confrontation. And DC, they didn't have any pressure elsewhere. If you have nobody killing default cameras, you know, in Solarium, you know, West Main, etc., as an attacker, you know as a defending team, hey, nobody's on the west-hand side, they must be on the east-hand side, something's wrong here. When no one's making noise around the map, you can pretty much assume as a defender, hey, they're gonna hit the bomb site straight on from, you know, the mud window or the actual bomb site window, that's probably gonna be it. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, NGR got into the bomb site, but the fuser wasn't. Nobody was there to help him. That's the worst spot you can be in. You have half bomb site control, but you can't do anything with it. And with that Dark Seer now playing from behind, 2-3. If they win this upcoming attack in round, it will be a tight half. But it's not looking too good here the longer this game goes on for. No, certainly not. DZ had all the confidence in the world through those first two rounds. They looked as good as I think you could possibly say. But it's also worth noting that they've got, what was it, six kills in those first two rounds. Mm. He was single-handedly the reason for round number two going in the favor of Dark Zero. Ten seconds remaining. But man, Five seconds left. this GK team cannot at all ready. be written off. Is to a bomb. So I don't know if you saw the content piece beforehand, but the groups, the players in the groups were talking about who they think they fear the most, and it was GK. Interesting. I did not see that, actually. But I mean, it's because you were paying attention. You built their reputation, right? You it's because you were paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually here ready first. But if you do what you do in previous match of Atlanta, get top eight, you know, you're, you're a scary looking team. Nowadays, teams will respect you. I, th I think it's back in the day, you had like a one good tournament. People ah, like, oh, it, it was a fluke, you know, it was a one man wanted team, whatever. But nowadays, because W7M started in a similar fashion, you have mm -hmm. one good event, teams respect you because, okay, these guys could be the real deal. If you come from mana with very little experience, you make top eight in the major, you make the next major, there is something about you. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Well, DZ having to bust a timeout in the first five rounds of their map is not, I think, what we had on our bingo sheet. But by the way, if you are following along, there is an official bingo sheet mm. from Fresh. Deploying drone. The unofficial official bingo sheet. We've already had one of the categories checked off, so if you're playing at home, congratulations. Which one was that? It was the reverse sweep. Oh, mm -hmm. of course. Another Tubaro, but so far, again, this operator, the newest operator after the game, have really not seen a ton about this operator. We are what many people have called the second coming of the 22nd meta because Tubaro really slows things down. Not in this match, though. I wouldn't say it's a slog by any stretch of the imagination. Key is the first casualty, by the way. Pambazoo breaching in with that buck. Control of the backside of Chalet over towards Trophy, but not the upstairs component. Canadian will now engage as seriously he's under fire in this spot. Moving now over towards the bathroom. He'll survive for the time. And much quicker as well. He got a full minute to work with. Basically got Solarium control, got the downstairs control. He can draw up the bomb side, Pemus with the bucket, do vertical uh, destruction, or of course, walk up the Solarium staircase. The question now is for Dark Zero, how will they get in towards the bomb side? They missed showing the player thing in the Master Vision corner. I don't think they have the intel. Nope. He crosses in a safe position again. No one's on that big window repel. Dark Zero missing a crucial position here to cut the bomb side in half. They do nope, flash the Shome, and NJR takes that spot that you had talked about. Is he aware of Hashom? Ambazu is. Down goes the best player so far for GK Noodle on the board. It's him and Trix. Try and stave off defeat in this round. Now it's just down to Noodle, who for yet another round is playing off-site. Attackers activating diffuser. The post plant, GK will go. Well, GK <laughs> just Noodle here. They pulled it off last time. Noodle will need three more kills. This is Nitro Cell is good enough to remove Pambazu from action. There you go. The Zoto canister thrown out. 
on the floor. Now it's Noodle to head over towards Stellarium. Another canister to go, and well, at that point, you're down below. There's just only two ways up, really. You're gonna go through main lobby. At that point, or you're gonna go through trophy. You ought to go through trophy. There's kill holes there. DZ just sat and waited. Far better post plan for Dark Zero than what we witnessed when they went and attacked downstairs just a couple rounds before that. Yeah, again, like, beams will go faster and change that pace, and of course, I want to see more of the, uh, the Super Robot. We just don't get to see it, unfortunately. Is he being brought right now by DZ on there? Oh, we got a call in. Yep. Oh. The team manager of GK. Hello, can you Hello. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Awesome. I have a question for you. Yeah. What was your game plan going to, in, you know, against Dark Steel right now? Was it about being aggressive or about being passive? Like, talk me through it. Uh, actually, now we will play aggro. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, the guys, they are, uh, even that Dark Zero, they pushing us, like, uh, so hard. Uh, I hope the player, they will do a great job in uh, next phase, like uh, they will do. Uh, and I hope it's, uh, everything will, do, will go with us perfect in uh, attack side. Okay, so the first two rounds you guys played, like, you were moving a lot, you got shot in the back from Dark Zero holding ankles. Then in round number three, things changed. Did you guys talk about possibly changing that up before the game, or did that happen just as the guys were playing? Uh, actually, they will, like, uh, they will, the player that will, uh, hello? Hello? Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, the player that will do their job, sure, and, uh, and also, they you know, uh, what he will do right after, uh, uh, tactical time, so time out, sorry. So mm -hmm. I hope I hope the player that will do a great job. Even that uh, Hashum is uh, he get two clutches yeah. in two rounds. So okay, I hope everything will be good with us. Well, that's perfect. Let's see if they do it again. Thank you so much for your time and thank you. good luck to your team of GK. You thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Perfect timing! <laughs> Very first kill comes out. Sends on the board for the first time in this matchup. Seriously, with the leadoff kill, Canadian roaming on that Solus. Now, have to imagine that part of the reason why they brought Nathan in the first place was to allow Canadian to be cemented in that non-traditional support flex and roam role that he likes to play and has played on DZ. Obviously, this round doesn't work out. Keep an eye on it, though, to see if there's any changes to the roles with Bolo and Nate on this squad. No, exactly that. And I mean, GK doing a great job of kind of like understanding what are the pressure points that we need to worry about. The Solus downstairs, for example, in that late round is a phenomenal thing to deal with early on. It buys them time, basically, so that when they get to the side, if they can get there, they don't have to worry about that any longer. And now, 1 minute 30 seconds left, opening up the bomb side wall. Noodles there with key to support it, locking down those angles, and they got the glass. When this wall gets open, only one thing can stop them. That's Bolo on the Warden. He's got a shotgun, doesn't have the MPX, so a weakened DC setup here. So nice to see a Glaz get brought. Mm -hmm. I am a big Glaz fan. I think he's quite strong, especially in ranked, but obviously in a more coordinated level, you can bring different tools. You don't necessarily need a Glaz. But you got smokes, you can see through it. That's what you got the Warden to do on defense is to answer back. Key is dead, there goes the Thermite. Your singular hard breachers. Ball goes massive. Panbazu credited with the kills, though, before he's removed, and NJR is down for the count. So don't let the number at the top deceive you. It is, in fact, a 2v2. The two newest members of Dark Zero, but hold on a second. NJR has been brought back from the dead. So now DZ maintain that advantage. I wonder if GK heard the shotgun pump. Sure seems like they did. Noodle outside, disoriented. Near-sighted by the Fenrir of NJR. Only 30 seconds left. A scramble and a small change. The diffuser had been walked into the bomb site and surrendered. So now GK will need to retrieve it. They do just that. The bomb site plant not on the menu, so instead let's run to A. That's what Noodle will go. No, it's him alone. Time and time again, Noodle finds himself as the last one standing. Will he be able to pull off the plant successfully? Yes. Now it's a post plan. By firing away, he's given his position away. This collapsed upon by NJR. Dark Zero, two rounds in a row, and they win their very first defense. <laughs> 
3k, Warden shot A. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, when I saw Bowl in the water, I was thinking, this is great. Then I saw the shotgun, I was like, yeah, you know what, against the glass, trying to plan a bomb side with that smoke coverage, the shotgun is really not what you want there. But the thing is, I think there was a small miscalculation from the side of GK, where they planted in a spot that was seeable by Bolo up above, and he found not just one kill, not just two, and the glass, but the third as well. So a huge positional play there from Bolo, but he had support. Nathan Castle in Master Bedroom had a long line of sight supporting him if he were to fall in a gunfight, but he just didn't, simply didn't need it. We'll have a quick tech pause, but of course we'll stay right with you here. We can talk about what happened in the previous round. You see it here. Bad plant spot, essentially. Two deep into the bomb side. Glass up there on the show. Gets shut down immediately. So the entire strand here from GK falls apart. The whole win condition is glass with the sense and the smoke grenades. The plant, bang. You play far out the building. Easy peasy. The moment the glass dies, it's not a good look for GK. The second the planter dies, well, things just start to fall apart and snowball out of control. But strategically, a very sound attack, just a very small thing was missed, and that was ward number buff. Sure, they could have would have droned it, but they didn't. We have a tech pause right now, and we're not exactly sure what it is, but the culprits seem to be Dark Zero. Hmm. I think it was uh, Troy's in ears of sound. Admin came over and like, pointed his ears, yeah, and he's like, yeah, my ears. <laughs> ears. Yeah, I saw that as well. The good thing for Dark Zero is they're maintaining good spirits. Now, just from an outside perspective, mm. go back and rewatch DZ during Atlanta. Both Gavin and Rice did not seem to be talking that much. Mm. And if you knew either of them in person and spoke to them in person, they both seemed like quieter people. Now, obviously, that can change in the server versus outside of the server. Some people come alive when you're in game, some people can level up. I mean, look at all those Ren Shiro clips of the man screaming and pounding the table. <laughs> but yeah. outside of the game, he doesn't really say much. No, no. In this instance, both Nafe and Bolo are extremely talkative. Nafe has been talkative on all of his teams. Bolo has been talkative on all of his teams. So I have to imagine part of why you bring these two players in for DZ is not just because of their prowess in the server. It's their mental and their personality outside of the server because it can't always be one person, in this case, Canadian, mm. doing all the calling. It can't always be one person Five telling them, hey, center yourself, get your head in the game. But if you got somebody like Nath, you got somebody like Bolo, who's Bolo's always good vibes, let's be honest, it's gonna go a long way to ensure that when things start to go back, as they did during that first half, you can keep your head and maintain that level of composure so that you don't throw the game both in the server and yeah, that's the thing, like, you, know, you build rookies, sure, but what about the veterans? DC, for a long time, they were like, oh, we gotta pick up young gunners, inexperienced players, try to teach them how to play the game, so to speak. But Nathan Bolo, they got experience. I mean, Bolo won the six invitations with TSM before they disappeared. So that alone has so much value in a different form than someone like Pandasu, who didn't know much about the competitive side of Rainbow Six Siege. Yeah, I mean, Dark Zero was looking at bringing in all these rookies over time. Rice yeah. was relatively inexperienced, NJR was relatively inexperienced. Pambazoo was, you know, for a lot of people, brought out of nowhere. Yeah. But people know who Nave and Bolo are. So you bring in experience, does it change the dynamic of the team? Well, GK is a presumably a top eight team in the world, as Dark Zero is, if we just go based off of Atlanta. Yeah. And right now, Dark Zero are, at worst, competing on the same level with them. Now it's a good look, and uh, this time it's DC staying alive in the early round. It's key off the board, and that's, you know, it's the Thermite, but there's a backup here. Tricks on Hibana. Yeah, he doesn't have the, you know, nicer scoreline right now being 1-7, but that's not his worry right now. Get those walls opened up, figure out where the pressure point is going to be, because you can't spread yourselves too thin here in Shelly. That's never a good, oh, that's rarely, rather, a good look, so it looks to be a backside take. But they need to worry about the roamers first. They go top floor, break the soft floor, try and get that dining, kitchen control, etc. Work their way down, but time is kind of slipping. One minute 20, they've only cleared the very top layer of this entire building. The bomb side, well, it has reinforcements. Goyo canisters, those fenders, the maestro evil eyes, etc. So many different tools to slow you down on the bomb side once you get there. And they still are dealing with the roam as well. A Canadian, up and alive, waiting for this gunfight. Left and right, two angles, but again, there's backup. Nave again, the supportive cast, always helping the roamers. Slow two rounds so far from GK. I mean, when you lose the Thermite <laughs> early on, not all hope is lost because you got that Hibana. It was the Thermite that they lost first in the previous round as well, but I think at that point, the Thermite wasn't oh, ultimately the big deal. This <laughs> 
Maestro KM set up earlier on will claim all the ex Kairos that were put on that wine wall. Making it even more challenging for GK to get into this site. They're stacked up over the back of wine. They'll rush on in. There they go. Tricks taken down. Now it's Noodle next in looking for a plant tucked away. Seriously is down. So again, it's Noodle last alive. Nave is the only casualty, but Canadian and Nave are there to get the final two kills. Technically, Nave at the down on the seriously, so it wasn't all him. Canadian gets the very final pick. And now, momentum very firmly in the hands of Dark Zero. Yeah, also, like, it's been a defender sided invitational so far. Yeah, it's the, the second matchup of the day, but in the first series, in both matches at least, very defender side, like 74%, I believe. So, not surprising to see. You know, DC coming out strong here in the side swap, but also what a phenomenal amount of depth in that previous round. The Rome game top floor into first floor. They have also always had bar control from Dark Zero. They had the Evil Eyes on the bomb side, the Goyo Cannons, as I mentioned before. And the second that GK they hit the side itself, they retook dining. So they're on the hatch, they're on the side. The Maestro cams are sapping you and the Hibana pellets as well. And that's something that we haven't spoken a lot of so far. Maestro actually got buffed not all that long ago. Instead of two Evil Eyes, those Maestro cameras. He's got three of them. Mm -hmm. He's still got that LMG, tons of bullets, so I'm not surprised if we see a little bit of Maestro play here and there, but it does take what we call a genius to play it. But in GR, he is a bit of a genius. He's a quote-unquote support player, you know, he plans sometimes and does stuff, but he actually frags out relatively often. Right now, 11 kills to his name. He got the utility tonight with the evil eye, sapping those six cards away, held the bomb side down as well. There's so much value here on a single player for Dark Zero. And GR is that person right now, and often is. Yeah, 11 and 3. The vibes are high for Dark Zero. Even the rounds they lost. And this is the thing about bringing in new players as well, that honeymoon phase that you go through, where you're building something new together and everyone's on their best behavior because, oh, new people, you know, ah, let's be nice. It's like when your parents, they have guests over, you know? You bring out your best behavior. So, up in the top left, a quick stat for you through the first four maps of SI defense. Yep. Has a 76% win rate. Disgusting. So the fact that DZ was able to go three for three in the first half should bode well for them, of course, Chalet is historically more friendly to the attackers. The numbers go back and forth as yeah. to whether or not it's a defender side of the map. We did have that period of time where, if you'll recall, the defenders were pretty much better on almost every single map. That's true. And of course, Tuberu and Chalet, I wouldn't say, based off my best guess, that it would be a very impactful operator per se, and I'm not surprised that we don't see all that much of it, that GK brought out twice, the gadget didn't really impact the rounds at all, Dark Zero yet to do it, they're staying with their old, like, what they know, so to speak, and it's working for them, why change it? But I will say, Canadian, no surprise here, has been playing an even bigger flex role than usual, because Nate Johnning opens that up. He played the Ying, he's playing the Kaid, he's playing the Solus, but he is usually actively on the map looking for something like Canadian loves to do. And GK, they're struggling at finding a good entryway right down the map. They're out of the building, opening windows, shooting those default cameras, and droning and droning and droning, but they're not really getting anywhere right now. And perhaps that's okay. When you got Brava and a Twitch, you can just kind of hack those gadgets, default cameras, deny into etc. Then later in the round, you've done the prep work, but the issue is you need to get a foothold somewhere and an initial starting point for your attack. Timeout was taken by GK. Will they find some success off of it? So far, the answer is yes. Bolo with the bailiff out, a bit of a... Hmm. Questionable choice, and Nafe goes down as well. That's second frag on Dark Zero, so not exactly ideal. Good news, though. Both Nafe and Bolo's gadgets will persist, though keep in mind that with Fenrir's gadgets, you can juggle them with the phone. So whatever is activated will remain activated. You can't really change much beyond that. The Lion have seriously finally finished off, and now it's GK with a numbers advantage and a 4v3. It's important that Kane is like sole person on the side. He really has to hold on to this position. If he falls, that means a plant is very much present. They got the read there in the blue staircase. Fire goes out. Now can you isolate it on site with Pemusu in dining hallway? Staring down the smoke. We're warning present for Dark Zero. I don't really see much that will aid them through that smoke as the drones still continue to go out for GK. Dotting their I's, crossing their T's. 
Noodle walking up. Excuse me. Neither NJR nor Canadian have their headsets on whatsoever because Noodle is able to assert himself on those garage stairs. Recovered the bomb. Two kills. Oh, Pambazoo next in line to a show. But we got a tie game, or we've got one step closer to a tie game as it's four rounds for GK. All 12 rounds feeling very likely at this point. I'm still curious what happened with Bolo there, swinging in mock door with the Bailey secondary shotgun in hand. Not sure if that was like he was out of bullets or was like desperate for the trade or maybe got the call. Oh, this guy's reloading, like just go for it, no bullets left, whatever. But losing two members instead of just a single member, it really weakened the bombsite structure. I have to imagine it's because if you know somebody's just vaulted into mudroom, they're not expecting anybody to swing them That's right fair. away, right? You're not expecting an immediate challenge. And in Bolo's defense, at that range, the bailiff is usually good enough to kill you after two shots. Usually. Usually. Yeah. The bailiff is also a relatively fast firing weapon. That's so you can get those two shots off pretty quick. Oh. That was just yeah. Noodle finding a blind spot and taking advantage of it. Got to give him credit for that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's you know, blind spot for sure. One of those two members of Canadian India could have held that angle, but it wasn't communicated. The thought basement was clear, etc. It just wasn't. Those late round flanks really working out. And that's again, when you play the Bravo and you play the Twitch as in the previous round for GK, you deny so much intel from your opponent and you gain so much yourself. Odds are, without those two operators, that play might not have worked out because something would have been in their way on their path that would have stopped them from achieving that flank. Now things will change again. Now we see the glass, we see the Osa. Things constantly shifting here for GK, keeping Dark Steel in the dark as to where, well, where they're gonna go from, what's gonna happen, and what operators do they need. One thing is evident, Sol is always great against GK so far in this matchup, as is the Warden. They love using smokes to deny lands of sight, stop the crossfires from being effective from Dark Zero, and of course, you can plant more effectively if you have smokes, especially with a glass on the board. But the only downs of this lineup here for GK, they need like all four or five members alive. If anybody dies, it's a huge loss, either utility-wise or their primary gadget. So who's gonna do the entry duty? Who's gonna take the reins here and get stuff done? That's my big question. And they don't even have, like, a hard breacher nearby right now, like Ace, Key has to rotate it over, get that wall opened up, and then they can start working on office. But Bolo is there again, waiting on that office half wall for his fight to come. Would you believe it that half the round has gone already now? This has been fast. It's been very quick. And the issue last time has been fixed. They know where Bolo is, they got an active drone on him, and of course they lost to him last time in that position, so they know what to do this time. Oh, the impact misses onto the Osta shield. Noodle gunning down Pambazoo, three players from GK at least stacked up over in that library hallway looking towards Double Door. Amidst the smoke, there's only one warden and he's good as gone. GK sinking their fangs into Dark Zero this round. Now, Trix falls, and Dark Zero have to start getting some kills on the board. Attackers have dropped got the bomb one minute user. to go. Attackers Noodle is heavily damaged. There's still plenty of utility here from GK. There's not a lot at this point that gives me hope for Dark Zero, outside of the fact that NJR and Naif are the two best gunners at this moment from DZ. <laughs> Other than that, GK has everything going for them. Oh, man, it's over, dude. Hashomis just, oh my god, three kills in the rounds on the glass. Someone stop this, man. Boop, boop, <laughs> boop. It's popping up over the Osa shield. Small errors committed by Dark Zero. Snowball out of control. That first impact onto the Osa shield. Oh, nice shot by Hashom there. It was earlier on in the round. That really could have helped slow down that take that was coming in from GK on Library Hall. But when the impact misses, and then you have somebody immediately follow up, presumably on Intel that the shield yeah. is gone, and there's three players there. You're not expecting a warm welcome by GK like that. And no. DZ got humbled in that round when they tried to be aggressive in response to the fact that after a minute and a half, GK assessed, hey, we can take some map control quite quickly. Let's do this. First half of the round flew by, and then GK lined him up, as cliche as it sounds. Have now we have a tie game, and all 12 rounds will be needed. Both teams have used their timeouts, so it's just going to be a slugfest from here on out. Yeah, and, and the big thing to note here is that the devil really is in the details. If that impact lands on the Osa shield, 
to go. Yeah, them, DC might not get a kill from it, but they will remove one of the two big obstacles that they, they denies them that top floor control. It is so difficult to combat and also shield from far away because, you know, you can see each other, sure, but it's almost like, a, you know, a double-sided Blackbeard shield. Where, yeah, if Osa doesn't, you know, take a peek, she can die, but at the same time, they have all the intel. They know exactly when to go for that swing. They have a better gun usually with that long-range scope. So GK, they've done a great job at utilizing different operators for what they want to accomplish right now. This is arguably the weakest lineup that we've seen from them so far in terms of like utility. Yeah, they got soft breach, they got the ram on seriously. They can break the floor parts in a lobby in about five seconds if they want to. But for the bomb set itself, there's only smoke grenades and brow from a shum. This time, no glass. There's no, you know, frag grenades this time because like that's not a thing anymore, right? That got nerfed to the ground. So they don't have a lot of ways in besides going for gun kills. And that has really been their biggest strength so far in this matchup. I think that's one thing that hasn't really been mentioned that much. And I didn't really hear it on the other broadcast, though I'm sure it was probably brought up at some point. And it's that with the changes to the nades not being able to be cooked, they've essentially fallen off the earth. It's as if grenades don't even exist. Basically, yeah. Additionally, DZ are running with all reliable. Despite the fact that GK went three, maybe four rounds with Tubaro, Dark Zero hasn't used him once. Well, they haven't. And to be honest, the way they're playing, I don't blame him. I would like to see more utilities like Maestro again, but this time, Fucking seriously, back. finds the win kill onto Pambasu, who's had a bit of a silent game, I would say, quiet for him at least. Six and nine, no big stand-up moments I can recall, and just really not finding his stride in those gunfights, usually falling pretty early on. where everything gets real quiet and real tense. And North American fans in particular are hoping that it won't be a repeat of previous events where the team's early struggles do not allow them to catch up. And NA as a region just too tough. Yeah, obviously the previous matchup that we saw on the other stream with SSG, NA fans not particularly happy about that one. Dark Zero on their own map getting pushed to the brink by GK. And you mentioned the Ram, and this is exactly why. So quick, so efficient, and this thing, you get so much line of sight onto the bump side. Before Ram was an operator, Fuse was actually used a couple times to do this. You'd throw a cluster charge upstairs on that balcony, it would go down and blow up the entire floor and completely clear out whatever shelter you had for the defenders in the bomb sites. That's a good point, but now the way in for, for a GK or walk down the staircase, they don't have a lot of presence here, and they lose a player as well to Canadian. It's a 4v4 now with 25 seconds left. They gotta go. Now Hashem will throw out the smokes. He'll get challenged and immediately pre-fires it. Through the smoke, no real information. Now it's Bolo on the flank to cut down a shome. He's not alone, he's got Canadian with him. And there you go, the raid boss of GK removed from action. But now a flank as well from GK. Everybody's rushing in, time running out. Noodle getting the plant down, but has to bail off of it. Time about to run out. Bolo and Nafe, the final two kills. And it's map point for Dark Zero. The blue staircase became a blender. Four people, they fall back to back to back to back. And it looks so funny because, well, GK, they push down the staircase. What do you know? Right behind them, two Dark Zero members. They get that initial kill. GK, they try and flank it back in their control. They get shut down. Then Dark Zero, they say, you know what? We got blue control. I'm going to go back up to lobby. Then he dies on the blue stairs too. Four members. Just like that. The entire round to find in that small area off the bomb side and this was the issue that I spoke of earlier yeah you got vertical destruction you got one set of smoke grenades on the Brava but they don't have any real way to break apart the bomb side or establish a plant or bomb side control no Osa no Monty no glass and the smoke grenades they were on blue staircase they couldn't go in from the primary breach they didn't fully lock down the flank in the room clear so they get flanked late round so GK they have this big painting that they want to Attackers approach and say, you know what, make a sky, make an ocean, make some trees, but they're missing some of those small details. The tree has no leaves, right? Nothing's growing on that tree. So I like what they're trying to accomplish, but there are a couple of small gaps and perhaps, you know, with Leader not being here this time to help them, maybe that was his job. Maybe he was the guy that was like, you know what, nitty gritty details, make sure we have this covered, guys. Otherwise, great plan. <laughs> I know there's going to be a lot of eyes on Bolo because he is one of the biggest figures in all of Rainbow Six, not just as a player, but also as a content creator. I mean, for those that are maybe a bit old, they don't remember what it was like when Bolo was underage. All the, oh do you think Bolo will go pro, etc. Mm -hmm. I mean, the man popularized quick meaning, for God's sake, yeah. which completely revolutionized the game for a period of time before, of course, the game then got changed, so it was slower. 
And as much as the spotlight will be on Bolo, I really want to give the spotlight to Nate. This is a player who I think, unless you are a very big EU fan, he flew under your radar because he never really played on an amazing world-beating team, despite him being so good on all the teams he played. Yeah. He's always been an instrumental figure in those teams succeeding, and now he brings his talent to DZ, and I think what we can argue is the largest spotlight of his own career. Uh, it's nice to see him immediately acclimate to Dark Zero and not have any major stumbles so far. I mean, the biggest thing is that when you're a player is that if you have like a good start to a tournament, no matter if you're a new player or an old player on a team, just get like your first kill at the 6 Invitational. If that can come in the very first round or two, you're going to be so happy about that because you're not going to build that doubt in your mind. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Like, what's wrong? Get going, you know, whatever. You got to have that confidence. Nave, he's got that in the first two rounds. Got like four or five kills and he's held his own so far. 10 and 8. GK with more utility, got the Nomad, they got the Capital, things are going out. There's a fake smoke, try and bait a reaction from DC, it happens, it works out, they get that opening kill, and Key has found the gap, a weakness in the defensive lineup right now. He's inside lobby, and because Twitch on the board, we know that they Twitch tap that camp early in the round. DC, they have no active intel on that position, and if Key can find the right spot, the right moment, he can definitely get one or two more kills and create chaos on the side of DC. Right here, the timing. They got the read, but the Canadian falls off. Well, oh, oh I don't no. know if Key meant to drop, but he's fallen through towards Connector, and Canadian now has two separate players from GK in his sights. Doesn't matter, Key wins the duel. Meanwhile, Hisham falls to Naif. Naif with very limited HP. Looks like he'll retake from above, but he looks away. There's somebody upstairs, top library stairs, that he needs to be very keenly aware of. Now, Key's dropped. It's a 3v3, Naif. All hell will break loose, and suddenly Dark Zero is punishing GK. Trixed with a single kill so far through this map, will end it with one. It was scary through the midway portion of this map, but DZ sticks the landing and ultimately wins 7 5 on their map. They retake so many rounds, they give up something, they take it back with two or three members, and it's a new look for DC. These roster changes, maybe the fundamentals being a bit altered, so far a good look, but GK definitely put a good fight. 7-5 is not a bad way to go out in your first map in the best of three. Yeah, I mean, a great first look, but you did start on your own map. So yeah. let's see what happens when Consulate shows up next, because that could be a completely different ball game for DZ. Nighthaven Labs would be the tiebreaker. Will we need that? That's familiar territory for Dark Zero. They love that map. Yep. They could very easily lose Consulate and then go on to win. But let's not theorycraft. We'll go to Consulate in a few minutes, but first a break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to SI 2024, where we've just seen an absolute nail biter between Dark Zero and GK, with Dark Zero coming out on top. We had a lot of questions, Anne, about both of these rosters, their playstyle, and their behavior that's going to be on the server. And we have a few answers now. now. Yeah, a few answers, but I feel like we still might have a few questions, right? It's only been one map. We've mm -hmm. seen a very close one between both these two teams. I reckon that especially Dark Zero had a really good start. Nath, especially, I think it was five and one after a few rounds, really having a solid start for himself. Their their post plans in most of these rounds seemed really decent too, uh, except for round three though, where Hashan <laughs> decided to put a break onto that. He went absolutely Beautiful. massive. And one thing I really enjoyed seeing after that was the player games, and you could literally see the relief on Hashan's face. That's what it at least yeah. felt like. Like, okay, we can win these rounds, we can take down these players. And that's why I feel like the kind of momentum on who is leading a dance shifted because mm -hmm. you can see that the GK players are playing way more in the faces yeah, of absolutely. the players. Yeah, the confidence from GK started shining through. Might not, not have been enough to actually close this one out, but that is a scary position for Dark Zero as well to be in because we're going to be heading on to their mapping. A lot of things to unpack here. I want to start off with you, Ali, in terms of looking at Dark Zero. We had questions whether or not there would be changes up in their styles once they're coming here onto SI. We haven't seen them play in a while. They've had two massive pickups as well in terms of uh, Nate as well as Bolo. So has that has anything changed for them when it comes to how they're executing things? I think it looked like it definitely changed. You know, it was a shaky start there for Dark Zero, I think. There was a couple of rounds there where Bolo took a little bit of a long time to get in. I know that there's going to be a lot of pressure on this player yeah. just because it's Bolo and you want to know when he plays and what he is doing inside of the server. <laughs> but he got himself warmed into it that very easily, very easily could have been a 7-3 if it hadn't been for Hashom. And Hashom, for me, was one of the players that stood up for GK, and that's what you need. You need those hero plays that people can get around. But fortunately, Dark Zero managed to rein it in a little bit, and they kept really good control of a lot of those early rounds. Communication seems to be pretty solid as well. When we were listening to the last few rounds of these players talking to each other, it felt like there was a pretty general like direction, a lead into that team, but players are also listening, communicating very well. Um, I'm glad to see, for example, Nate not necessarily put on a leash or is he's really put in control and like people are telling him exactly what to do. He's got these plays that he can make by himself, which is really nice to see too. So it's it's good to see this kind of play style come out from Dark Zero. And despite it being close on that first map, it was it was their map pick. And the only times we've seen it from GK was um, against teams in their own region. So mm -hmm. maybe they haven't had the kind of international experience on a map like this one that, for example, Dark Zero definitely has. Something that I wanted to comment on is who's the entry for Dark Zero? Because everyone's getting yes. involved. We've got Nath, we've got Pambo, we've got Canadian. Everyone's at NJR as well. Everyone's having a little bit of a taste of that entry engagement. And sometimes you look at the lineups that they're bringing on the attack, they're bringing like one hard breach and just flex flex operators. They're not necessarily playing into that meta of bringing that entry and having someone drawn in. It seems very flexible. It seems like whoever is in that right position is going to get the opportunity and it can take a little bit of the pressure off sometimes. Yeah, overall impressed with both rosters and I think ex expectations that we have from both of them have been to a certain extent met. And I think especially when I look at this time around on GK particularly here and because when we're looking at GK, we're coming into this matchup, we, we even heard the coach from Dark Zero say, oh, that could have potentially just been a Cinderella run. It might not be mm -hmm. easy to replicate, but I think the fact that they were able to bring this to such a close one, not even on their own map pick, to me, that shows signs of life. It does, but you have to also remember for some players, like they don't have this much international experience as the players on the side of Dark Zero have, right? And that's when you can literally see that relief on this on the players' faces, how they started to play way more confident. That's something I would like to see continue into that second map because yeah. when Dark Zero played another Mena team during Copenhagen, um, we mentioned that Mena sometimes can really play into your face. They can really try and push you um, from when you're not really watching. And that was a concern we had for Dark Zero then. So I'd hope to see that, that again, GK here can bring that playstyle where they're really pushing into Dark Zero's face and, and leading that dance in regards of who's taking the engagements. Yeah, we've seen that from them so far. So again, going on to their own map pick, which is going to be Consulate, will be a really interesting feat to see. Just a reminder as well, in terms of the picks and bans that we're having through Consulate being GK's pick. So that does give yeah. Dark Zero the opportunity here, Ali, to pick their side. I um, guess we're assuming they're going to go for defense. <laughs> there was a stat that popped up, wasn't yeah. there, during that first match? Uh, yeah. Like 60-odd percent yeah. out of the game 76. so far played. In, was it 76? Yeah. yeah. All have been defender one. favored around. So we, we had that sort of an inkling. Uh, but moving into Consulate, there's a lot of opportunities on this map. I think there's still a really exciting brand of Siege that can be played here. We saw a lot of Ying play previously. We saw a heck of a lot of Glass play as yeah. well. GK really not afraid to be bringing the Osso, bringing the Glass, using those tools. Even if a Warden is up, they're happy to go and challenge it. 
Sometimes it don't work out because Bottle picks for 2k with the shotgun, but there are other times when it works a little bit better. And I think that that's what GK want to really sort of lean into here. The thing that they can hold the head high with is that they took it really close on Absolutely. Dark Zero's old map pick. Albeit it was down to hero plays, but we take those hero plays. Yeah, we you know, do. We yeah. hate that hero sometimes. I'd take it if I were a GK in that case, <laughs> for sure. But looking at this map as well, Consulate, I feel like this sort of international experience might come into play as well. Dark Zero have played this map only against NA teams since September. So only in their own region against teams that they're familiar playing with. But then for GK, same goes for them. They've only played this map against Triple Esports, I think, Ooh. in the Saudi E League was a full on overtime as well. So both these teams have experience in their own regional map, but not against an opponent from a different region. Yeah, also really important to keep in mind here as well that for GK, this is their chance to keep mana into the competition for a little bit longer. Like, yes, there's Falcons, but at the end of the day, only two mana teams are competing here, and this is going to be their map pick. So will Dark Zero make this a quick 2-0, or will GK hold on for dear life and push it to the decider? Let's find out as we're heading over to our caster to break down map two. Well, Consulate is maybe not as much of a well-known map as Chalet because of the rework. So when we look at Consulate as the second map between these teams and it being GK's map, I think we're in for quite a showing. Map number one was as close as it can be without going to overtime. Yeah. So yeah. Consulate, maybe the same thing? Yeah, and also like Chalet, like, it's like kind of like Oregon. Any team can play it usually. Like your defaults are defaults and the way it plays in rank and comp pretty similar. Consulate is like, either you can play this map Oh, you kind of suck on it. That's how I said to find it. So DC, they kind of shows that they got the homework prepped for this because this is not their map. No, and I, I will say, back in the early days of Pro League. How early? When we used to, well, like 2017. Okay. That's 2017, 2018, when we used to cast Brazil from Poland. Mm. Remember that the Brazilian observers in Brazil would pipe the feed to us. It was entirely <laughs> in Portuguese. And I'd always remember when they'd start this map and they would always go, Consulate. <laughs> Always stuck in my head. Oh boy. And we were in Brazil. So that is why I am bringing it up. Dark Zero prevailed 7-5 on their own map of Chalet. Obviously, they had some big roster changes. Mm. Are they going to continue a hot, quote unquote, streak? Because GK made them work for it. It wasn't that easy. Console, it's a different ball game. It's GK's map. GK's gonna be starting on attack. Dark Zero on defense. We really didn't talk a lot about operator bans back in map number one because I didn't think they actually had that much impact. Do you see anything so far through Dokubi and Montaigne being banned? Now, Dokubi, by the way, was banned. Yeah. Number one as well. Do you see anything immediately that jumps to mind? I mean, you gotta speak up the Monty, right? Like, Dark Zero, they're not known to play a ton of Monty, but Canadian does have the occasional time where he does bring it out. But he's not like. What I would say, like a fantastic Monty player, he does it because no, he has Kino. to. He's not. Mm, oh, but how do I bring this to Parker? Uh, Kino is no longer an active player because of his Monty. He's um, he's here. We can, I know. He's but here we, in Brazil. By we the way. can't keep talking about Kino. He's like, uh, it's rude. I didn't want to. I didn't want to sound rude, but when I saw Kino, he was getting food for M80. Yeah. Oh he no. Was, he said something like, "He's like I'm the analyst slash like errand boy." <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, I hope he lands his feet in a different team as an active player. Nick, what is it like single-handedly getting Kino kicked off of no, 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 no. For we did that. excoriating <laughs> him over his Monty play. What do you like, mean we did that? Like, you were you were absolutely the aggressor in that situation. Okay, you I was along me? for the ride and I antagonized you. are like Robin it. to my Batman. You're certainly helping me get that done. You, That's for sure. You're the Batman? The Batman. Yeah, I'm the, the first and foremost no, iconic. I am the knight. That is iconic. Batman is iconic Batman. Okay. I was waiting last night for the iconic Batman tweet. Oh, and it came and this it morning, came. right? Or this night? Yeah. It's like a picture of a like Gotham. Yeah. And I was like, it's time. <laughs> Good luck, W7M. <laughs> which, by the way, we are casting them. Yep. I don't know what's happening with my voice there. This is what happens when you don't cast for three months. We are casting M80 versus W7M later today in the very final matchup here on the A stream. I'd like to remind everybody that the B stream is ongoing as well. Currently, Lynx and Stokes are casting over yonder, literally just a few feet away from us, maybe some meters if you don't know what feet are. <laughs> <laughs> but stay with us because, you know, we're, mm. we're, we're bad. It's hard. Just, we're hard. Yeah. Sorry, Lynx, but I'm better than you. Okay. You think you're better than me? Hashem. Yeah. Look at this! Hashem on Amaru already in the building. Now, not near the bomb site because the bomb site's on the first floor in lobby, but they've managed to open up the wall on the top floor, got what looked like Hashem was in yellow. Yeah. Oh, still there. Oh, Bolo doesn't know. Bolo doesn't know. Bolo's dead. 
can't win that. That's an impossible gunfight to win. Let me use the bolo word. Unfortunate. <laughs> that is what he would say there, isn't it? That Nalara, mm, I'm dead. Unfortunate. Now Bamba still struggling a bit of fear. Knows that that yellow staircase, not the place you want to be against a shotgun. And it's up against you. And GK done a great job here to get that early pick and they slow things down. The way you can look at kills in Siege, like when you get a kill, you take and you buy some time on the clock because there's less opponents against you, less things to deal with. So you just bought yourself 20 seconds, take it slow. Panda makes a bunch of noise with his teammate that goes down first of NTR. He got baited, but Panda gets the trade one for one. Feels bad if you're NTR, feels kind of funny if you're Panda Zoo. <laughs> And Pamazoo's got information on those drones, still playing safely on yellow stairs, because, well, you can't shoot through those floors whatsoever. Might like to re-aggress now, heading back up on, to the top. The, the track stinger's out now as well, and this... A grenade! I was gonna say, is this the first time that we've seen a frag grenade be used? It almost killed Canadian! It did, it did some damage to him, he manages to get away, that's not Canadian, that's Bolo. That is, however, Pamazoo. That's bad luck. You run past the barricade. Oh, the flank? No way. He might be able to pull this off. It's just a little bit slow. Wary of what might be below him, but Ooh. just cannot outduel Gridlock. The F90 is a formidable gun. Now it's all up to Naif and Canadian, both members of FBI on the Pulse and the Castle. Canadian on Pulse. Be able to give information and continue to call it. But man, oh man, this is going to be a tough job because there's still an IQ on the board for GK. Yeah, it was a big loss to lose Pembezu upstairs. He had vert control, could see the bomb side, and might even have gotten that kill on so serious in the gridlock, but now it's 2v4 instead. Canadian downstairs at C4 and Parker could maybe get something done, but he gets a scanner out instead, sees the flank opportunity, but has to win the gunfight. Trick's planting, gets off it, gets one kill, it's 2v3, favoring GK. He needs to get Attackers in there. Diffuser in the hands of yeah, Noodle. Time running out at this point. Key eliminating Nafe. Canadian can stop this in his tracks, but he needs to pick the right target. Where is the diffuser going down for Noodle? Canadian seems to have Maybe. an idea. It gets tossed up oh. and he gets Noodle, but literally the second that the diffuser goes down, he's given his position away. They know he's lurking down below. Could be impactless kills now as Canadian will tussle on that first floor to keep away as a flash goes out, but it misses Canadian still with his eyesight. Seriously and Key will now watch what appears to be the only way in towards the site for Canadian, and it's seriously to get the kill. GK starting off with a victory in round one. Would have been a beautiful C4 to win the round with zero seconds left. And Troy, I'm not sure if they had like a bit of missed intel or he just like doubted the situation there. We saw he put out the scanner, he saw a member to his left, didn't see the guy actually planning to his right. So he wiggled back and forth, maybe thinking, okay, sound says one direction, but the scanner said another. And just that split second of doubt, the hesitation, it cost him that round victory. But otherwise, a beautiful C4 attempt. Pambusu dying earlier upstairs inside of CEO. That could have changed the outcome of the round as well, very small things not going their way, but it's GK just early round. Amaro in the building, getting a lot of map control established and doing that good old take from they're everywhere. They breach the meeting walls, they're in yellow stairs, they have a person in the basement early on. They open the castle barricade with a grenade who almost takes down Canadian. They were just really fighting from every single distance. Look at this. He just gets it planned. It's it unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, it's like half a second or something. I mean, I do love to see Canadian on the pole though. It's such an iconic operator for him, and of course, one of the most uh, experienced players on that particular operator throughout time. If you're wondering why we are not in the game, there's currently a tech pause. Both teams have lost at least one player. I'm not sure what the reason is for it, but they are slowly rejoining the lobby. It's a calm before the storm. So, you know, some... <laughs> <laughs> You're not technically allowed to talk during technical timeouts, so I think a word here or there is fine, but you can't calm. There's no strategies that can be discussed. Don't believe so, no. I love that GK is running the lowest banner, by the way. I love it. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty good, right? Also, Run the banner of the team that knocked DZ out of Atlanta. And it's like, it's like a fire. It's like, it's like we're on fire as well. It's like when you get commendated in Siege, you get that fire emblem next to your name. It's like that. This is the logo they used when they were Los 1, if I remember correctly. Remember believe, when Team 1 merged with Los? Yeah, I believe you're correct. <sighs> be interesting to see how Los does at this event. Runners-up at the Atlanta Major for those that watched our most recent 
LAN event, which was all the way back in November. Very reminiscent of their run through Mexico, where a team that didn't seem like they were even going to make it out of their group suddenly explodes and performs admirably. I mean, when you got a team that's got both Loban and Maya on it, you can never yeah. really count out that team. It doesn't matter. You could put three of me on the team. <laughs> and I honestly think that Maya could carry my sorry ass through the match. Might be possible, actually. And it's funny because uh, we You're can't... supposed to hype me up there. You're supposed to... I mean, Mark, I'm sorry, Shut but Shut me I... down, man. You're supposed to hype me up. You're supposed to be like, no, I'm you know what, we should get the, the meme invitationals going again, and you can prove your worth to me, to everybody else. Live on broadcast. <laughs> okay, then. There for those, those that are unfamiliar with the history behind it, Dark Zero got humiliated on their second map against Los, losing 7-0, and then were bounced out of the Atlanta Major as Los went on that miracle run the second time that organization has done that. They went on a miracle run back in, back in Mexico when Alimau was on the team. Yep. That was his upbringing against G2. Him and Lagunis had a uh, 2v5 clutch. And next thing you know, Alamo is flying to Europe to join T2, who he beat out of Tournament Fire. See, what he did was he invested in Team 1. <laughs> and then he withdrew his savings and spent it on a ticket to Europe to go join G2. Very nice. And now, Carl was in action earlier today. For those that didn't watch the matchup, it was on stream. A, immediately preceded this match. For those of you that don't want to be spoiled, close your ears for the next three seconds. G2 prevailed. It's a 2 nothing. Yeah. Clean victory over NIP. G2 up. G2, yeah, that's the way they go. 7-2 G2 or G2-0 in this round, however, is very G2 slow, as you say, although no G2 in it. After it's been burned, G2, I mean, it has been a slow round. Like, you know, it's a basement hold from Dark Zero. They're holding just the basement portion itself. They got, like, Canadian Pepper Spoon, like, Spiral Staircase, etc. But this is a full one sided take, pretty much from GK. Four members on the backside, one person holding that yellow stairs rotation for any, like, uh, support to come from the roamers. This comes down to the early engagement. Oh, Opening kill here, very important. Seriously, on the Grim can use those fees, get life, you know, red pings on their defending team and then try and get some kills going but it's gonna be like a proper blender situation the second they step one foot too far forward it's gonna be two or three guns from dark zero gunning them down it's not an easy position to find yourself in if you're gk in this round oh shotgun out and he can hear it he swings on the oh. key but he's a little bit too slow pan bazoo wasting those smoke canisters, wasting one of the most valuable anti-plant operators you can think of. Good news for Dark Zero, they've still got Nafe on the Echo. But Do you need to swing that? Up is important. I mean, I don't think swinging it was a terrible idea, but oh no! Now you've lost the Echo too. Post plant, or at least the Execute, will not be in the favor of DZ. With two of their best denial operators removed from action. Seriously, is dead. Bolo will swing. Good enough for one. He knows somebody else is there. Losing the duel to Noodle. Only 20 seconds remain, and it's a 2v2. Good enough time for an adrenal surge by Noodle as he and Ashom will march their way to the bomb site. Dark Zero doesn't need to move a muscle. NJR isolated from above. Canadian now will look over top of it. He's got some pings as well. Not on the pulse, but on the solace. So he'll still have information. He can't see where that diffuser is being planted. And as he drops, he has no information. He's also blinded completely. The play now by Yellow Pillar, by the bomb chassis. Out goes an impact. Injured. Gets the injure on Hashom. Now it's him and Noodle in a 1v1. No adrenal surges remaining. So Hashom cannot be retrieved unless Noodle goes and does it manually, which at this point in time, it's unlikely. The Canadian will need to hunt for the last member of GK and then get himself over to the diffuser. But Noodle's positioned in such a way where Canadian will have to fake attempt it. And here it comes. Noodle will look for the swing, but good patience. Canadian falls off. Noodle not giving him what he wants. And it's oh. too late. Kill or no kill. The round was going to GK either way, but Noodle just makes it official before the timer hits zero. Two nothing. For GK. GK, both opening kills in both rounds, both plants and both, you know, post plants being held successfully. And it really comes down to details now for the other team. It's Dark Zero that are missing out on small things. And this is where I want to make a direct comparison to old Dark Zero, aka, you know, previous last two majors, versus current Dark Zero, where I feel like in the past, 
Pamusu probably wouldn't have swung that because the mentality is if you're smoking toxic babes, you gotta stay alive. Current Dark Zero, they are playing more loose and it really worked out for them on Chalet. When you're Pamusu in this position and you shotgun key in the back, taking off the vast majority of his health, you can be happy with that. He's one HP. That's not gonna matter in the long run. Like, you can take that fight later. There's 50 seconds left. And the thing is, it's like the dominoes effect. The second Pambusu dies, they lose crossfire on the spiral staircase. Then Nave is alone. Nave dies, they lose the bomb side pressure itself, and it comes down to the flanker or the roamer of Canadian. So one person stepping out of line a little bit too early or dying in a spot that he shouldn't die in, it has a really big immediate negative effect for everybody else. That's why it's kind of a big deal. Attackers if Pamba sits back, uses those toxic babes, just like relax a little bit, you're gonna stall out GK. They weren't really problem solving anything, but by running into them and dying, you pretty much give them the answer that they didn't know that they had as an option because you just hand it over. DC are now down zero two. We gotta see them have their mental in check. And the vibes have been good on Chile even when they were losing. So far, they do quite all right as well. But it's a slow start from them, and especially Pambasu, who's not had a great game so far in this first Pista 3. It's been a slow start, but I mean, go back to Chalet. GK looked quite bad in those first two rounds, if you remember. Then they won the next two, and it was a completely different ball game from there on out. In fact, they won the next three, which was what prompted DZ to use their timeout so early on. Pambazu in tough position. That was probably bad information, but... Goes for a little go see -do, the run out, the hop back in. Noodle is happy to greet him. It was three rounds in a row with GK is struck first. Yeah, I mean, he was isolated, didn't have anybody on that half the map, and I don't think DC has enough intel right now to make conscious decisions as to where should we be going, where is it safe? And this is the issue. The Valkyrie was banned away from GK, so they played the pulse. That's a good kind of solution to this, but pulse's range and how much intel you gather is much more limited than that of Valkyrie, so they clearly don't know the majority of the map, what's actually going on. And that's what gets someone like Pamus in a bad position there. Solus, pretty crucial in this round, right? This Arkham still has bombsite. You just you deny that bombsite with Nova C4, so you got three of them. They swing now two people on the staircase, evening back to a 4v4. That's a good way to come back into the round. Now, strategically, these DC, 3C force in pocket, full scanner. They want to deny yeah, this off this bomb side by playing below. GK got a minute and 10 seconds to figure out how to actually get a plant established or try and go downstairs and pick some kills apart and try and figure out a gap in this bomb side because right now, they're just... Okay, he won the gunfight. <laughs> I thought he was going to get slaughtered there. Rough start for DZ across the board. Not a ton of bright spots so far through these rounds. But I will say getting rid of Hashom is likely a side relief with how he played in the previous oh, yeah. map. He hasn't been the star so far through this consulate yet. Noodle yet to die is striking. Can he survive yet another round? Seriously has oh. two players lined up. He gets them all. Nape eliminating seriously almost kills himself with his own nitro cell. Plant goes down. Nape down below. I smell a timeout from DZ after yeah. this round. I could see that as well. I mean, something's not quite right here. Nath, looking for the 1v3. What again. do you do here? <laughs> I mean, oh, you look and you die. 5 0 for Noodle, by the way. No deaths through three rounds. You pointed it out after the second round. Diffuser down, first blood drawn. Yep. Other than maybe an ace or a flawless round, it can't get much better than that for GK. They're doing excellently. DZ are not calling their time. Oh? You got and it. as you say that, Parker, they call their tactical time. There's nine seconds left. <laughs> no timeout called. Haven't mm. heard Nargis' timeout. I'm like, okay. They're not. And literally, as that happens, the Dark Zero timeout stretches across our screen. But you're still right, because you said this surely is the time for them to do it. And you're right. like more of a clown than my hair does. <laughs> <laughs> and that's saying something. How dare you. I mean, you had a phenomenal clown cosplay at the previous major, but I wasn't even wearing a wig. That's <laughs> my natural hair. That's the best part. <laughs> All you need is a nose and like some colors on your costume. That's it. I remember the, this is a funny story now. As they as they go through this timeout, and then we will we'll talk about this after the fact. So my makeup was like worse things. It was so hot. Yeah. It was so hot in the studio in Atlanta. I guess that's why they call it Hot Atlanta. And then we decided to go to an even hotter place by coming to South Paulo. <laughs> yep. Which for me as a Canadian, and I'm sure you also as another northerner. It's I'm, warm. I'm not, used to, I'm not used to these heats. Uh, not used to this heat, but my makeup was just slowly getting worse. And I was like, oh, like we'll do it a, we'll do it as a bit. Like the whole point is that like I'm deteriorating. 
and somebody came up to one of the makeup artists, and they're like, you should, you should go touch up his makeup, do you? <laughs> do you see it? Like, he looks so bad. What's going on here? What are you doing to him? And I'm like, we're not doing anything. That's just what he has done. Yeah. And they're like, what have you done? They didn't do anything. Okay, it was all me. But the makeup artists, they loved it. They loved, they, the they, they loved it. Yeah. I, except for the fact that the red didn't come out of my mustache for like a day. <laughs> That's terrible. That's <laughs> terribly a unfortunate place for that Five color to be left. applied. Either way. Time out. Now finished. Attackers Round started. GK. 3-0. What do you talk about if you're Dark Zero? Yeah, so there's like there's two angles here. Either it's about settling the, the nerves here. It's like you feel like there's some things that are, you know, not going the right way. Or it's about finding people like, hey, like, remember guys, like this is the situation. We got two new players, we're here to like obviously win, but like have fun with it. These are the problems, etc. And I imagine that if you're dark here right now, you're gonna tighten up a bit. Play close together, don't make those like a little bit like overly aggressive mistakes, or if you are going to make those aggressive plays, do it together. Take your nearest body with you say, hey, I'm gonna swing this guy. I'll want you to help me. And we're seeing immediately a very big Orbital lineup change here. The, the Fenrir, the Kai, the Warden, they're gonna play in your face style siege with good guns where they can take those gunfights comfortably and try and lock GK out of map for as long as possible. And when they step forward, they will just take the fight to them. It's not about util anymore. It's about enabling those good players off DC to take the fights. Dark Zero need to get on the board first. They need to show some level of confidence and competence, frankly, on this map, which has not been the case. GK, excellent at finding the first advantage, the first little misstep by Dark Zero, punishing it, going from there. And the time and time again, we see GK exploiting the fact, both on Chalet, but also here, more successfully here on Consulate. There are times where Dark Zero is just not aware of GK's advances. Now it's Nave to get softened up quite severely, in fact. Still alive, but very worse for wear. Noodle's first death will come in the fourth round at the hands of NJR with about half of the round to go, just a little bit less. DZ of the best start to a round so far on console. Yeah, and I, I'm watching the top down viewers right now. DC are not moving unnecessarily. They're not swinging aggressive drawn. gunfights. Canadian is, of course, roaming and immediately gets shut down as I say that. Hashom on the armory shotgun is just impossible to stop on that yellow staircase. But besides Canadian falling, it's been a very disciplined and tight round for DC. GK, they can't seem to find any openings or any gaps to abuse right now. It's seriously in the flank. And the other three members working at the lobby portion of the map. DZ wants to take these gunfights, though. They're not allowing GK to establish any map control unless they earn it. And GK is fighting tooth and nail for that. DZ have lost out on a number of those gunfights across the three rounds. This time, though, a sluggish round in terms of kills. Eight players still alive with only 30 seconds left. Diffuser in the hands of Key. Seriously still looking for another opportunity, and he misses the silhouette of one player. Down goes Seriously, Tricks trades NJR off before Bolo eliminates his shum, so they will come to blows, largely spread across the map. Key still with that diffuser while Tricks will watch oh. over top. Beautiful shot on the Bolo, not good enough to get Pambazoo, and Nafe shuts it down. DZ finally get on the board. And cleanly so. I mean, yeah, it's a bit of a close round, you can say, but they got a lot of different win conditions. The retake upstairs from Nafe, they get that final kill. The bombs are playing close together, and yeah, yeah, Trix almost had that nasty 3k back to back to back to get that bomb site completely opened up, but a plan did not go down. It was not established. Key didn't feel comfortable enough or covered enough to just stick it. When that toxic bait went out, he came off it multiple times despite not actually taking damage from it. And that's tough. When you're in a two versus three or two versus four and you're trying to plant, it's basically effectively a one versus three or one versus four. Because the guy planting, he can't see a damn thing. He can help the teammate. But look at this, NGR holding down the fort. Bolo, same thing. And even though they won like their individual gunfights, they did have teammates nearby that could try and go for a trade if they failed themselves. Yeah, Nafir is saying the same thing as we saw. He was AFK the entire round. He was sitting back stairs, but seriously, and they're holding each other. Like, they're essentially holding each other hostage, making the game from a 4v4 to a 3v3. And usually what, what will happen is that, you know, defenders, they will get impatient and they will, like, see that the bomb side action is happening. And then a player like Nave would normally leave that position and go elsewhere. But he's stuck around almost the entire time, locking out seriously from joining the ground in that scenario. And it was so worth it. And when he was done holding the flank, he walked upstairs and got the final kill to the hatch as well. So Nave with a really great understanding of what is needed from him.
His entire playstyle so far in these first two maps has been to support the nearest team member, holding a crossfire, being there for a trade, joining them in on attack, or often holding a flank and trying, or a rotation rather, and getting those kills when the opponent moves a little bit too much. A really great work from Nave so far. This time though, he finds himself on a warden, so perhaps it's time to seize them action. We'll see our first bandit, try and trick those walls, deny the breach. It does just appear that Darks here don't want to lock out GK and make it as difficult as possible. But Key will get that first wall opened up, meeting wall has been breached. They were very quick to do this on round number one, I believe it was. Yeah. Hashom was playing on the Amory though, and was very quick to get to the top of the building and then hold yellow stairs, denying Dark Zero a play on that part of the map. And more importantly, because the bomb site was on the main floor, cutting off a vital part of the top floor that is used so much in shutting down a plan. I think it was a show who got the kill on Nabolo early on in that same position mm. as well. This time, of course, he's running an LMG, which is a very rare sight to see. Usually, when operators are played, the LMGs are just too unreliable, so you run with the para on Capitao. Show him instead. Going with the LMG. Bomb located Give me your by thoughts attacker. on this. Give me your thoughts. I mean, I was going to say how Shum likes to, like, reinvent the wheel. You know, like, it's not like no one's done this before. It's Reload. just that no one seems to do it at the moment as of right now, and he's bringing it back. Grenade, it won't be cooked, but it won't matter because, well, it will just roll towards that shield and deny Bolo's position. The issue is that while well, my magnet was too far away from that drone hole, they maybe didn't expect it, and now Bolo has to fight for his life in a very tough position. And the thing is, Hashom on the capital can toss out a fire arrow, force Bolo away, and then he's gonna be in a very, like, big amount of trouble here. There goes the fire, and there goes Bolo. And the LMG oh. just tearing through not one but two. Stay Bolo and Pambazoo removed. Hashom doesn't need to reload. He's still got 71 bullets left. A fire hose to spray at DZ. Elsewhere, Noodle eliminating Canadian. Tricks first attempt at the diffuser fails. We'll have to go again, and it looks ultimately like it'll be successful. Hashom a third. Nafe in a troubling spot. Another round where GK has gotten the diffuser planted. So Hashom far. is disgusting there right now. I mean, Hashom is tearing it up. Nave no running warden. away, re-aggressing. Trix looks the wrong way. <laughs> Nave just trying to, I guess, keep some motivation going. Oh. Dies to the Trax Stinger. That should be on a bingo card. A Trax Stinger to win you the round. Doesn't happen all that often. Oh, it does not. Timeout had already been called. 4-1, though, so far for GK. This one is a breeze so far for the Saudi team. I mean, you can definitely tell that this is a map that GK feel a lot more comfortable on, oh, or maybe absolutely. DC they do not, but I will say, you can say like DC are playing sloppy or they're making mistakes here and there. No, no, I think genuinely that GK are playing a phenomenal round of Siege because if you break down the round that we just witnessed, they perfectly dealt with the shield position of Bolo, with the Wamai. Once the shield was gone, they smoked off the meeting door, fired the shield position right here, fired off top, or sorry, smoked off top spiral, pre-fired the run back knowing Bolo has to run. Hashom one tap for the smoke of the Pepper Zoo. Phenomenal stuff. Pre fire to cover the planter. Either you swing this and die, or you don't swing it and the plant goes down. While that happens, Canadian on Solids was downstairs trying to impact the night the guy planting. But guess what? GK also had a player in Loppy. They had everything covered. The nade, the well, my burn, the 30. fire, the pre-fire, the smoke cover, the plant, and the plant Five cover. The, all those were all things that happened ne like nearly the same time. It was fully Attackers set up for exactly what they wanted to accomplish, and then they did just that. Darks here right now are being out red on console. They are definitely the worst console team between these two teams. They are always reacting once something has happened. Instead of being proactive and getting, guys, they're gonna go and clear out Bolo, we gotta help Bolo. Because if they had thought about that, then Nave on the Warden could rotate over. He's Warden, he can see through those capital smokes. He could have saved the round, arguably, but they're not being proactive about it. So DZ gonna figure things out, maybe make this a 2-4 half, then really fight for it on the attack inside, because if not, they gotta go Night Heaven Lap, which will be that deciding match, or map, rather. It's the same position being opened up by Key out on balcony. Give him access to a part of the map that actually I don't think we have a consensus call out for at this point. I think someone was called Tables. Somebody calls I think Catering or something like that's the official call out for it. Back when Consulate was first introduced, we went through 
we had a meeting where at least NA was trying to get on page with, on the same page with where the callouts would be applied, and well, even we couldn't come to an agreement. It was tough, and I mean, the thing is, like, players have these like very specific callouts that you only know if you're like in the scene or like you scrim or something. So even what we say is what players would say. No, and I mean, there's been a there's been times where a pro player will come on either as an analyst or as a color commentator, etc., and they'll bring those callouts with them, which yeah. to a casual viewer, somebody who's just watching for enjoyment and doesn't actively play the game, might think this is odd. Why would you call it that? Mm. All the same. Hashom is rewarded for a good previous round by an early death. Dark Zero strikes first. Track Stingers go out with Seriously now governing over Yellow Stingers. He's got tricks up top with him. Reload. I mean, you get top of control, soft destruction throws a bomb side is a good look, but losing Hashom on the Capit Tower is rather important. Those smokes and fires are crucial previously. And of course, just like the capacity in which Hashom can find kills is very you know, crucial for this team. And GK, they're going to like reevaluate what is going to be the change of pace in this round because what they wanted to accomplish might no longer be possible the same way any longer. And Dark Zero actually playing proactively saying Yellow Stairs is important, try and go for a retake. Solus and Pulse, they can see the flank camps, they can see what the players are. If they can establish a retake here like they did on Chalet, that could just be the way to win the round. A really triumphant two maps so far by Noodle. Down goes seriously to Bolo, so Yellow Stairs has Changing been. Bag. The main contest so far for this round. Down goes Nave. Diffuser in the hands of Trix. I do remain. like that GK has been kind of tossing around that Diffuser. Ten seconds left. Trix will attempt to plant now. You have no time. He's still holding on to it. He attempted to plant it, dropped it for a second, went on. Two seconds left in the round. And that's all she wrote. Canadian's Nitro Cell gives DZ their second round through six, first half, goes in favor of GK 4-2. Much better look there for Dark Seer, but this is one by one. We got this ish. Yep. <laughs> and then, of course, Bolo's yep. But that is the mentality, especially on attack when you're down. I mean, everyone knows here that Realistically, Dark Steel shouldn't win now in Consulate, being down 2-4, having a pretty terrible first half on defense in a defender-sided tournament and meta so far. And to make things worse, the Monty's banned by GK. So they obviously came in prepared to not play the Monty themselves, but Dark Steel, if they had planned for it, if they're com like comfortable playing on that particular operator, that's no longer possible. So one round at a time, just like that. The way you think about this as a player is that it's 0-0. Zero, zero. It's not 2-4, ah. no. One round until someone wins or loses, that's really it. Don't let the nerves get to you when you're close to winning, but also don't start fearing, you know, your opponent or doubting yourself just because you're down a couple of rounds or feel like you're losing a performance um, pretty poorly. Of course, easier said than done. We all are humans, we do have emotions that affect us, and when you're a player, there are so many factors that go into it. Confidence in yourself and your team is extremely important, yet for a lot of players, it's hard to deal with. You have a slow start to a tournament, slow start to a match. You start being like, mm, can't really hit my shots, boys. Like, what am I going to do? And all you can do as a team is say, you got this. Next round is yours. Next map is yours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And don't lose trust. Spawn peaks, early aggression here. GK slowing down Dark Zero saying, you're slow and chilling. If you're going to be equally slow here in Consulate, you might just run out of time. These first two rounds are going to be incredibly Play important. More active. You cannot allow GK to win this first round. You can't let him to win the second either. I don't see Dark Zero coming back from a 6-2 at that point. Then you just slap the go next button and then you hmm. essentially gamble on Nighthaven Labs. But pacing is going to be really important here. How fast can DZ assemble some map control and get into the building? It's a good question. They use a Grimby, Nate, and Stingers, all from outside the building. And again, Yellow Stairs might be the focus right now, but first they just they open windows, they apply this like phantom pressure. They they like we're like a ghost, you know, you don't really know exactly where we are, but we're just like in the wall somewhere. We got yellow pings on the yellow side of the map, so it might be a yellow scarlet CO take here. Grenade tossed down onto yellow stairs. We're seeing frag grenades being used yet again. Ooh. Pambazoo looking for more. He's got a shotgun this time. Noodle, I think, managing to take out the bees. Defending this position right now. But 
He'll get collapsed upon very quickly. Noodle with the first kill, but it's two in a row for Dark Zero. As now they assert themselves towards the bomb site, but Bull has been cut down to size by Trickster, who doesn't find a second as it's seriously credited with the kill. Trickster punished for that. Dark Zero still with two upright to the two to match GK, but it's NJR now as the last one standing as the Nitro Cell from Seriously connects. Him and Ashom still remaining. Seriously now tying Noodle for eight kills to top GK. NJR has some semblance of an idea as to where these players from GK are. He's got 45 seconds. Clock will continue to tick. Get rid of the bulletproof camera, but great patience right now from GK. Tucked away inside of that catering tables area that we mentioned before. NJR squares his body away so he cannot be shot at. But now, re-aggressing. Trying to get seriously out of that cubby hole, softening up his shump. Both players so low, but NJR just looks a hair above. Excellent patience from GK as they win their fifth round and are but two away from pushing us to a third map. It's actually a very, very beautiful one versus two to watch from both teams. Often it's like Messi from one side, but NGR had a perfect read on the exact locations of both of the defenders. Yet GK also had that near perfect crossfire where if one person was in a, in a you know, a combat situation, the other member would swing out and kind of equalize it into a two versus one. And it really came down to who's gonna hit your shot the best. If NGR hit the Jaeger headshot there, peeled back, could hit the you know the warden proning, etc., maybe he wins the round. But if you don't hit those near pixel perfect shots, that crossfire will for sure be your doom as the sole player. And it came down to Again, very, very small things. Look at the sloppiness of Dark Zero. Bolo sprinting into the angle, dying to cover the planter, and then things just kind of fall apart. They didn't, they didn't get that strong foothold they were looking for, where they felt comfortable to make an active plant attempt. But the initial start was good. Hibana shotgun in, yellow staircase. Bolo follows up with a trade one for one. You get that 4v4 near remaining. the bomb set that you want as an attacker on consulate. But if a bomb doesn't go down, you're not having a good bomb. time. And that's what GK did so well. Out of six rounds, they won four of them. In all of those four rounds, when they were attacking, they got the opening kill and they got the bomb planted. That is how you find success here. It's not all that often that you just gotta go for broken go just, just purely for kills. You typically have bombsite play be a part of consulate. And it's why we see both teams bring out something like the Ying, the Capital, the Grim, the Gridlock, etc. Because it is about getting to that stable position. DC now will change things and go into like the Brava, the Thatcher, the Capital, the Ying, heavily favoring utility. GK, however, they're pretty aggressive here. Milusi, Fenrir, Solis, Lishan, they can go for swings. They can try and risk one or two players. And if you kill any of those important operators, like the Ying or the Capital, you get an incredible amount of value there for a one for one trade. It's been a cakewalk so far for GK through most of this map. At this current point, I think you can argue that they've looked like the better team through two maps, but alas, DZ1 Chalet. More and more likely like we're going to need Night Haven Labs. Yeah. Loading new Meg! As GK now sits on what I'd imagine is the more favorable side. GK picked the map and G2, or sorry, rather, GK picked the map and DZ opted to go in the very first round on a defense. Didn't work out for them the way they wanted, which is ultimately what is the biggest warning sign. It's very direct attacks from Dark Sea. I mean, there's like Oz at the breach, Pemus is rotating back side. It's like a four one take right now, it looks like. Yeah. Four guys front side. Pemus is looking for something. An entryway. Place to backstab perhaps. But you can't just walk in with Yin Capital. That's it's that's too simple. Yeah, you see vertical control noodle. He has got piano control. Toxic babes going out. Still one in pocket. So you can see if you're planting exactly where you're planting. This looks like it's too simple for DC. I'm not sure I'm sold on this. They're gonna try. And you still got some tricks up your sleeves if you are GK. And you got utility in pocket. Bolo walks in slaughtering too. Nate dies, but advantage is still Dark Zero. And Pambazoo will take no prisoners. He sprints <laughs> through the bomb site. Canadian's not too far off. DZ of full control. GK's players arranged upstairs. This could be a great bait, but three kills so far from Bolo as the diffuser goes down means that any bait or any trap that GK might have set has been picked 
ripped apart by DZ. A fourth Rambolo, but a single kill separating him from what could be our second ace of this series. All he needs to do is find Noodle. Lords above, DZ's not that team. They want the kill and they don't care who gets it. Noodle shrugging off some damage. Timer continuing to run away. This is a big round for DZ. Advantage still for GK, but it's NJ already get the final one. A 4K for Bolo. Denied every single one. But the bigger fish that they land is the victory in that round. And DZ will stay alive for the time being. I mean, I'm still not sold on the take itself, but if Bolo walks in gets three kills like that, anything can work. It doesn't matter what you're going to be doing. But what I will say is that DC did have a good read on most of the gaps there. They kept our smoke off the ceiling, and they said they recognized that Bolo got the two kills on the side, push all the way through. You're not a plan inside of the garage. You're like cafeteria bomb set instead all the way through. There's no bit of calorie. You can't get flanked as much. And then we see it. Bolo picking up one, picking up two. And then, of course, also held the flank. Perfect play there from Jason. Literally locking down every single angle imaginable. It wasn't pretty to start things off. <laughs> you wanted an ace, and I get that. If you're coming back after over a year of being uh, out of the pro scene, and you're in your second map here in the first game, I too would want my ace, you know? And rightfully deserved, Bolo single-handedly changed the outcome of that round. 3-5 now. DC finding some comfortability now, finding some success. And the one thing that will work for them, they are very flexible in terms of the operators they can play. We've seen Bolo play Ash a couple times, the Canadian play utility operators, playing entry, playing Lurk, etc. So it really comes down to what they think is going to work the best, and that likely will be based solely off what bombs that they're going to be attacking. With Valkyrie being banned, there's no reason to play the IQ really. Echo doesn't really see play typically on constant either. So just get on comfortable, strong operators. Operators. Soft destruction, of course, very favorable. And something like a Jackal, since Dokkabi is banned, is excellent for Canadian to find those roamers and try and isolate some of those kills and build an early lead. That's what they did on Chalet. DC almost exclusively found every single open kill when they were on the attack inside. They need to try and replicate that here on console as well to even the numbers right now. Jason's being droned in, holding an angle, waiting for a rotation, but nothing's really come of this yet. GKR comfortably just playing upstairs. You on a first name basis with Bolo? Jason. That's my boy, yeah? Mm -hmm. you know, he was actually at my uh, my house in Vegas a couple times. What's hype like that? Yeah. Very cool, man. Very cool. It's a copy pasta where it's like, he's my friend. I can, I can say his name. <laughs> he's my friend. He's our friend. It's a much longer copy pasta. I'm not about to dig it out. So, first Jackal as well in this matchup that mm. we've seen. First Capkin that we've seen. Capkin. So nice to keep track of the operators that aren't played with the same uh, prevalency as the other operators on the board. The duties. Mm. Even an operator like Ash, who for a period of time wasn't shown all that much, is now. Uh, There's a bit of a delay a there. I think he had to prime the shotgun. I'm not sure. After a very good round from Dark Zero, it is answered back by a not so great round. Canadian is dead, as is Pambazoo, and Pambazoo is having quite a poor map so far. In fact, he didn't really have a terrific chalet either. I think he, I think it was NJR finished with 16 kills or something like that. Which yeah. It's a huge component of why they were able to eke out that victory seven. Why? Oh, oh. Bolo, almost nearsighted by Trixt, but just as the fog was coming in, Hasham finishing him off. No flawless round so far. No. In either of these maps, but GK primed and ready for it. Only 50 seconds left to find the final two kills. Get a flawless round and move on to map point. Oh, he almost sees the solace to the crack in the floor. Oh. JR downed. Finished off. Hashom, two kills. Looking to break double digits. Will they silence Naif before he can get on the board? Yes. Seriously, giving a flawless one to GK, and they are pummeling DZ objectively the better team in almost every measure right now as GK are looking locked and loaded for Nighthaven Labs. One of the difficulties about ever making like significant roster changes, quote unquote, shortly before a big event, is that there are nine maps in the pro map pool right now. It is a lot of maps to learn. And while you can argue that every team can play like maybe like a Chalet or an Oregon, because they're quite default, they've been around for a very long time and they don't differ all that much into the team. Console as mentioned earlier, isn't quite like that. And I feel like it's very evident that Dark Zero don't look all that comfortable, especially on the attack inside. It doesn't look like it's super thought out. They just seem like they walked in the building, crouch walking around, didn't have like a really good grasp of what was about to happen. 
Yeah, let's, let's spawn the mouse a bit there, Nave. I'm sure that's the reason why you're uh, <clears throat> not dropping kills right now. Six and seven. Doing much better on Shelly, of course. Now, um, but yeah, like it seems like the overall plan isn't quite coming together for Darkseer right now. And I think that might be a mixture of two things. Either, let's say, Nave and Canadian, the two callers of the team, they have different ideas on how to approach this map. Or it seems that they haven't really scrimmed this all that much, or they are not getting enough intel. That's something to consider. When you are droning on the attack inside, that is how you gain all your intel to make decisions. If your droning is poor, either because you play a mute or a solace, or a lot of drones are dying, or your teammates just aren't droning that effectively, you cannot make good active decisions. So it comes down to guessing and taking risks and blindly walking through doorways and taking that gamble. And we see time and time again someone like Pembasu walking through a pathway and just die. Either knowing the enemy is there and losing the gunfight, or not knowing exactly where the enemy is and just having not, like a, no real chance to win it in the first place. I want to see DC helping Pamsu more in the early round, because they, they need entries. Need to get in the building, need to gain control, need to gain a foothold, and Pambusu usually is your guy to do that. Bolo and Ash last round was crouched walking around the map in the basement and lobby, etc. But the second he made contact with an enemy, he got nearsighted by a Fenrir and he died. Like that was it. So much effort and so much time, but nothing was truly gained. Pambusu first and again. No help, very much alone here, but locking down Visa at least to help his team take control of the admin upstairs. Track Stingers deployed, and three more remaining for Bolo. Honestly, doesn't really show much rust. They've been scrimming like crazy if you talk to the players on DZ. Mm. I mean, it's SI. What team hasn't yeah. been scrimming like crazy? But when you have two new players coming in and you do change up your system a little bit, as we've seen from Dark Zero so far, obviously a small snapshot, but you need to get those players in to acclimate. There go the EMPs. Seriously, still stalwart in this position. Pambazoo dies to Noodle again. You cannot have Pambazoo going two and seven, especially on entry, if you want any hope of winning this matchup. No. Might but seem a bit reductive just to say that and that alone, <laughs> but I think that is a huge part of it. No, it is. Uh, it goes to, like, he needs help. All of DC right now, they need help. GK, they have vertical control. They got so many like, holes in the floor. They know what corners are clear when they can't get like pushed out of. Like They have this so figured out all the way through. And Darkseer, they just can't seem to break it apart. They can't seem to find any gaps or weaknesses. It's a really solid concept from GK. I don't know if they knew that Hashom was in there, but as he was proning, he accidentally fired. And as mm. he did that, he's given his position away, which is intel that Nafe will use. Oops. The greater issue right now for Dark Zero is not necessarily just kills, but retrieving that diffuser. I don't know if a plant is what DZ has on their mind. Down goes Bolo, and I think at this point, yeah. it's a mental reset for Nighthaven Labs. NJR and Naif in a 2v5. It was a flawless previous round for GK. They can basically do the same thing and put our exclamation mark on this map, but NJR has something to say about it. Noodle and Key double up for kills, and this one was fast. DZ looking like a fish out of water as GK rush them on console. Yeah, but I will say both teams are get to really prove themselves because DC, they love that Haven lap, and GK, well, they definitely can fight back on a map that they're more comfortable on. So whoever takes that third map certainly deserves this best of three series. The more best of threes that you play, the more experience you're gonna get. However, for a team that doesn't have that same level of international experience, which I think it's fair to say GK does not. No. Best of threes, can expose some serious flaws. On Chalet, not a lot of flaws, relatively close. Consulate exposed DZ's flaw yep. on that map. What does Nighthaven Labs have in store for us? We'll be there in just a moment, but first, a break. We'll see you in a few minutes.
Welcome back to SI 2024 live from Sao Paulo, Brazil. GK holding on for dear life with an absolute dominant performance on their own mapping, forcing this all the way to the decider. And, and that was a performance that we've seen glimpses of in that first map, but on the second one, it was just completely exploding. Yeah, it seemed like a really organized GK as well in that regard. So I kept track of the opening kills and opening deaths during this whole game. And it was actually the every single time that team that got the opening kill also won the round. You could see this very well on the attacking half, in my opinion, of GK, where you could see them get the opening kill. They would solo out that single roaming defender, wouldn't be able to get the refrag on it because it's a single roaming defender. Yeah. And then those last remaining guys on side, uh, in particular, seriously, would really work well with that zoning utility, with that Grim, with that Gridlock, just putting these players locked into their own position and that allowed GK to go for their own execute. I mean, seriously, he's had international, he's had a domestical land performance, mm -hmm. no international land performance, but he is really showing off and it's, it's definitely good for GK. Scary position to be in as well because when we're looking at DZ, they won their own map at 7-5. That was a pretty close one, Ollie. This time around 7-3, GK is giving them an absolute run for their money, what it feels like. GK really have. They've come out bouncing onto Consulate here. It's a map that really suits this playstyle that they like to bring. You can see they bring exciting operators on the attack. They love a little bit of an Amaru. They love a little bit of Gridlock. Yeah. We don't always get to say that, but Gridlock can be a fantastic operator to utilize and to zone these players out. As Am was saying, and Dark Zero, they were really easy to zone out here. There were a lot of occasions where there'd be one remaining player alive, whether it be Nate or the Canadian, whoever that was, and they were often a floor away from the action. Granted, they're meant to be playing a C4. They're playing some intel. They might be on a pulse, something of that nature. But when your team's collapsed on the site, it's no good. So you talk about that play style that you were questioning whether, you know, Dark Zero have changed anything with those new players coming in. I feel like um, Canadian really enjoys that playstyle where you can just be that solo player, like that Jack or like the Solis. And that, yeah, sometimes it happens in a situation where you're standing off site, you're playing that pulse, you're playing that intel operator, and you're not that close to you can immediately respond to one of those chaotic pushes coming out from the GK. Yeah, and it feels like that does answer even more of the questions that we have coming into this. We said, okay, GK in map one going blow for blow with Dark Zero. They do come out on top. They head then onto their own map pick, and it felt like they're in a lot more comfortable waters, which then to me brings the question in terms of that decider on Night Haven, which team is going to be leading the set, the, really the charge this time around. I think as well, when we're looking at Dark Zero, something that we've touched upon potentially is like maybe their play style clashing a little bit with GKs, but something else that was noticed when sitting here with the players watching them play is that communication, Ollie. It was very chaotic at times. And I understand that in the heat of the moment, things do get quite chaotic. We get very lucky at land to sit opposite these players while they're playing and we yeah. sort of yeah. scurry away in the corner <laughs> and, and do our thing. But they'll be playing and we, we get to listen. And listening is a really big part of this game. And you can hear some of the communication, particularly the night and day difference between the shot calling that's going yeah. on on the yeah. side of GK. And then on the flip side, some of the more tense moments, some of the more moments that are getting a little bit too animated over on the side of DZ and things are just getting a slight little bit confused there. Yeah, sometimes people talking over each other when it's, uh, things are happening at that moment and we were talking like, okay, what what's going to happen to GK when they no longer have leader who was that IGL for them during the Atlanta run and so far it seems like Noodle's doing most of the shot calling, I'm here uh, the IGLing, I'm hearing some shot calling from Key as well and it seems way more organized, way more Absolutely. structured, whereas they said that they had struggled before with having yeah. that IGL pressure on multiple people's shoulders where it just gets a bit rowdy sometimes. Yeah, but it feels like GK genuinely has worked on that very well. I mean, Dark Zero, again, you're bringing in new players. You have that adjustment period yes. that you really need to get into. And fortunately, this is this first. This is the first land that you have the chance to really adjust to it. So it's going to be a matter of getting into the tournament, getting into the game, really getting a feel for it. But we still have one more map coming up on the series, and that is Night Haven. This is going to be the decider. And I want to look at the play styles that we've seen from both of these teams in the first previous maps. And, and what do you think GK can do particularly well on this map that could set them up for the majority of their success? Well, Night Haven is a pretty big map. So once again, if you're looking at similar plays like Consulate, where the Fendels will be offset they'll be working verticals and you once again have that opportunity for GK to solo out the roaming uh, defender and then go for that zoning utility on site they could potentially replicate that playstyle coming onto this map now GK also have international experience on this if you look at the stats in the previous performances 
say it was with that different lineup they played with in Atlanta, but it, yeah. it's the core that still has that experience, though. Once again, the same issue for Dark Zero. Previous map only played it against domestical teams. Once again, they've played it for the majority against NA teams when it comes to their Night Haven results. I know they played a lot of Night Haven in NA. We could hear yeah. Stokes and Carl. They were crying about it up in yeah. the green room <laughs> earlier. So you, you got to believe that they're ready to play this. They yeah. know how it runs domestically and obviously now bringing it onto that international field. Not only are they ready to play it, we are also ready to have it casted. Uh -huh. So we're going to be heading over to our casters to cover the last map of this best of three series between GK and Dark Zero. So Parker and Pengu, please take it away. I get my first name, you don't. You are just Pengu, I am Parker. Yeah. Not in tarot. And we have DZ versus GK in the final map. Essentially a best of one at this point. Yep. On a map that DZ likes very much in Nighthaven Labs. Might be a bit scared of you, GK, but uh, I've actually played with Noodle in the European tournament for the uh, multi qualifier, and we almost beat Wolves, the pro team that is here. So I might have it in here as to what Noodle might cook up to beat Dark Zero. Hey, Grandpa. Hey, <gasps> it's cast time. It's cast time. Okay. Sorry, you when just Paul? literally bored me. Just leave. That was quick, man. Is it? I, I thought it was Assumers who had like really bad attention span, but you're a bit of a. Oh no, my attention span's great. It's just it was very boring hearing oh, you talk about your glory days, AKA. Smoke. Okay. The most glory that you're gonna find, AKA playing in rank steps. I mean, that's my life these days, Parker, you know? Actually, your life is a caster. Yeah, that's more like my holiday vibe, you know? It's like every once in a while I go somewhere for like three weeks, I comment it a lot, and I never do it again for like three months. It's more like a vacation time, <laughs> you know? DZG versus GK. Still haven't found out what the G stands for yet. <laughs> I am very curious. It's got to be gaming, like Dark Zero Gaming. But they're called but Dark, Dark Zero, Zero Esports. Right? I know. Yeah. But what else would it be? I don't know. On the Monty Ben, not Doki Ben. Some things will never change. That's okay. Sierra, do you like the Monty's keeping things the same? That's exactly. Nami. Yeah. Yep. And then a Valkyrie is pretty likely. That's been the trend so, so far. Tuburu is playable, I would say, on Nighthaven Lab. We haven't really seen it much in this matchup, but no Valkyrie will be that same operator. So, operator panel wise, there has been one or two specific target bans. Grim was the only difference. Yeah. Back in map one, all the way back on Chalet, it was a Grim ban instead of Monty, but it was Monty on map two, and now Monty on map three. So operator bands on Nighthaven, exactly the same, which suggests, of course, that these are not necessarily target bands. I mean, they could be target bands, but they're not map specific bands. These nope. are just, we don't want to play against these, we're going to get rid of them. Yeah. And I mean, that's how most teams do it, especially at this stage where you don't really have that much like live intel on your opponent. It's the first day of a tournament where in a couple days from now, in phase two, in phase three, you know, when we come to land, it's gonna be a lot of bots to study. You'll see, okay, these guys love playing this operator, but only on this map. That's when those operators tend to get banned more often than not. Now, the way the teams typically play this base in bomb site is that you will actually have a pretty big roam game going on, which you see upstairs. And you play a bunch of C4s below. We see it right now, three C4s in the lineup and a bulletproof and of course the solace and you'll roam a bit run around waste yes, time for the attackers and hopefully get a one or two c4 kills in a perfect perfect Five world you have remaining. valkyrie obin or an echo or some sort of intel attackers to pair with those c4s but that's the attackers gameplay here so gk while they're not looking to win the roam it is kind of like a waste as much time as possible maybe get a kill or two and fall back to the side and waste a ton of time and utility Dark Zero, they know this. They play so much Night Heaven Lab. It's, I believe the statistics before this bit PO3 started, the desk said it was their, like, the, the map they've performed the best on on land so far statistically. So we should expect a lot from Dark Zero, despite the fact they've changed two players, getting in Nath and getting in Bolo. They have experience, they have the knowledge, they shouldn't look lost like they did on Consulate just the map before. Things start off quite well. Open up the wall to Garrett's downstairs in stock room, looking for the roam. It's tricks right now on the Solus, finding drones, pinging them, trying to deny them. And DC just taking things slow here. They're not going to rush anything. Only four rounds of Tubaro, as you pointed out, can see some play on this map. And what the operator does is greatly slow down entry to certain points of the map. When you're looking at this bottom floor defense from GK, the ability to trick those walls is huge. You get a Kaid, you get a Bandit on the board, even a Mute on the board. Always going to find EMPs being brought. If you don't have a Thatcher, Maverick's a great addition, but I mean, Chubar even counters Maverick. Yeah. So you don't really get ahead of it. 
I wonder if we're not seeing him because either A, he's banned out by teams, or B, he's just too new that teams haven't worked him in just yet. I'm not sure. Bolo first to die. Seriously eliminating him. Canadian trades right back. Capitao showing up, but instead this time it's the para in his hands instead of the LMG. Hmm. So just a small change. You've also seen those can openers open up two holes on the other exterior wall after the main wall had been opened up by the exothermic charge of NJR. Also true, but the issue with those can openers is that you got a vault on in. It's not a sexy thing way to do it. You stuck that animation in. I mean, Canadians got a tough job here. The smokes, the fires go out, but what's the follow-up plan here? Are you just gonna have vaults into sight or is it gonna be a flank elsewhere looking for an opportunity? I'm not sure. Oh, but Noodle looked yeah. for a long-range kill. Canadian is doing an excellent job. We're used to him being among the worst performing player on the team, but Canadian's actually held his own so far through these two maps. I mean, impactful rounds, but also getting very necessary, though not particularly sexy kills through the mid-round. Now he's got Diffuser in hand, two kills to his name, and he's halfway down with the objective. It's perfect. Attackers Nobody from GK has an answer to this. He goes for the run out, gives his position away, NJR dies, Canadian with a third kill. He's no more to tricks. So three kills for the team captain of DZ is all he will find. Now it's a 2v2. Bambazoo and Nave waiting patiently. Tricks down for the count. It's key. One point of HP. Not a lot left to do here. DZ in full control. And this is something that a lot of people don't know about the Candela. You can use the blink cluster charges and go through the floor. Flashes over top of the objective. The clock wasn't his friend. And neither was Naif. First round goes to Dark Zero. I mean, it's an impressive round, but it comes, you know, down to Canadian opening things off, finding those kills, because he's outside the breach in a less than ideal situation, and he just lands the craziest shot all the way through both bomb sites, basically. And it's like, okay, that's the bomb site player. I can walk on in, get that diffuser plant, and he does just that. DC, again, they look much better on that even lap already, but GK didn't really seem like, well, well, to, okay, to be fair with GK, they weren't really met on what they wanted. They wanted a roam clear. That's not really what DC went for one-to-one. -one. So this is just DC recognizing, okay, they want us to do X. We're not going to do that. We're going to hit the bombsite straight on, apply pressure, force the roam to be weakened and fall back a little bit, and then hit the roam a little bit in garage to deny verticality. And we saw seriously swing out and get one kill, but immediately trade it back. Those those small decisions you got to make in an instant. Okay, I got my one kill. Is that enough? Should I go for more? And if you overextend a little bit too far, you will lose bombsite pressure. That's when the bomb gets planted. So if you roam too hard, well, gotta be careful. Smile on Troy Canadian's face after that first round and for good reason. I am very curious to see the confidence level of GK here. It seems like on round number two, they are most interested in immediately running it back on that bottom floor exo bomb site. I like that. I, you know, it, it kind of signifies that small things that went the wrong way, we can go back and fix those and then they have a different result. And I do agree with that. The way that seriously died, the way that things fell apart, yeah, you can fix that very easily. I mean, Noodle took an engagement he didn't need to exactly. at longer range and died pretty much needlessly at that point. Not that the smokes or anything was a huge, not that there were smokes or flashes or anything that were hugely important for that post plant. But Noodle just simply staying alive and being an active gun in a post plant is a massive boon for GK. Yeah, I like to use the term that doing doing nothing is doing something. Just this sheer aspect of like being alive, having five guns up, it's gonna make the enemy more aware, more conscious. Like, okay, we can't just rush the bombs out here. There are five enemies alive. Whereas if you just died for nothing, it's like okay, there's only four people alive. Now it's more feasible. So sometimes just this sheer act of simply staying alive and you know not falling early does have a lot of value. Trick's upstairs roaming. There's a drone on him. He's solid. He should know this, but somehow Canadian set a sneaky drone. Because they have the intel, they can make an aggress aggressive advancement here, and he drops at the right moment. Both members swung him. He gets out alive. I've been really impressed with Seriously on this roster. Had a very quiet but still strong game back in map number one, and the map number two was very dominant. Obviously, his showman, I think to a certain extent, Noodle are going to be the two players that resonate the most with the community and his showman yeah. in particular is going to be somebody that people will cheer for because his plays are quite flashy and back in map number one his showman was excellent despite the scoreline for GK. But seriously he's been getting in there, getting into fights, taking early engagements, but also having very impactful kills. If he's not involved in the first pick, 
the second and third pick beyond that, while also playing heavy utility operators. He's not just a gun. And I think that's fantastic, frankly, for a team that needs that level of depth at this level. They're finding it in seriously. This time, GK, they get the strat they wanted. They get all three C4s used. Don't let that kill, unfortunately. But they, they want TC to roam clear. They did just that. Now time is running low. 50 seconds. They're just stands under the floor, the hatches, etc. Has shown the swings, but this time he falls. Pemisu is successful. He's 2-0 now in the first two rounds. So while time is low for Dark Seal, most things are going their way. But as I say that, Noodle finds Canadian. That's your captain off the board as well. One can opener remaining for Dark Zero. That's it for Hard Breach at the moment. Other than, I guess, Bolo's single Selma, but a single Selma is not, I think, going to pay as much as that can opener will. Hold on. Pambazoo heard us talking ish about him, Nick, in the previous map. Is now showing up huge. Naven Bolo, the final two kills. We said that a couple times. Three kills, though, from Pambazoo is the real story. And he almost gets the diffuser down. I don't know if it was successful right as the timer ended. I don't think it was. I don't think so. Either way, a big round for Pamazoo and DZ now up 2 nothing. This takes me back to the first map of Chalet where, you know, GK, they picked Bar and Chalet. They lost it. They did it again with a slight alteration. They lost it again. They've done the same thing here. They go basement. The first time they lose it, slight alteration, go there again, they lose it again. And now, what we expect from them based off previous maps is they're going to change up their play style, right? If they've been playing very fast, quick, like moving a lot, they're gonna start playing more passive. If they started playing more better guns now, they might play utility because a change up has to happen here. So I would expect some different operators. Of course, you would expect a very different bomb side. Otherwise, DC will just run with this. They're winning their attacks. Look at that. Different bomb side and more importantly, very different set of operators. The Bandit and the Tuberu, the first combo that you and I will cast, Parker, where the whole goal here is Bandit will trick a wall, and then either Noodle on the Tuberu will uh, delay it, so Bandit can run over there and trick the wall to deny something, or you sit there together and you just like, you trick through it. They throw out the EMP in a thermite charge, you will Tuberu the wall, and you Bandit trick the wall. You go back and forth, you waste a lot of time and utility and, and, um, and resources, really, from both sides, but usually this will favor the defenders. You have four Bandit batteries, you have three Tuberu, what should we call them, EMPs, canisters, etc. Uh, okay. Um, Canadian almost dying early on. So, I want to keep an eye here on AMJR and Nath, the Thatcher Thermite combo, because that's probably going to be the biggest way to counter the bandit tricking right now. Maybe even Bolo and the Ace will get into the mix as well. You Thermite one side, you Ace the other, EMP goes out. One of those two sides hopefully will go through. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when the, the Tubara video came out, it was Nighthaven Labs where he was shown off the most. I believe so. In the trailer, because there's just so many exterior walls that already are relatively easy to bandit trick or throw electric claws down on. There you go. Look at that. Now you can get in position. Two bandit batteries in the pocket of Hashom. Know that there's hard breach there, but has to be wary of that window down below. Another will go and trick it. Should get it. Device. No. Okay, so. One thing changed in the most recent patch, and I haven't played it with it myself, but they nerfed Tuperu where the freezing gadget will also freeze the bandit trick. So I think you have to shoot at the same time as you place it. Now you can't just lazily freeze the wall, bandit trick. You have to deny the freeze before the bandit trick goes down because you freeze the bandit battery as well now. I think that's what happened. And that's because the, the thermite traps are almost, almost, you know, almost all the way through, sorry, um, before the, the freeze came. Yeah, it was instantaneous. The moment that that, uh, the Zoto canister was shot, was when we saw the wall open up. Yeah, so I've really I've... playing just on borrowed time at that point. And now there will be another attempt. As there goes yet another canister onto the wall, and you can see completely frozen. Those two Selmas suspended in action. Yeah, you see. So I'm pretty sure the way it has to go is Tuberu has to shoot his own device prematurely right before Bandit puts the battery down. That's how you got to do it now. Just a bit more complexity being yeah. added, but. I mean, if the criticism for the operator was that he was bringing about a 20-second meta, which yeah. was something that we didn't like, by the way. Boo, we didn't like the 20-second <laughs> meta at the time. We're glad we're past it. Then you've got to find a way to make it so that Kaid and Bandit do not have even greater power. And if that change does it, so be it. First pick is, of course, from the Shom. Down goes Bolo. Nay finds one as well. With 25 seconds left. This has been a plodding round. Very slow. Seriously looking for another kill 
for his team. It would be his first on the round. As Shom goes down to Pambazoo as Nave is traded off by Trix. Seemingly everybody getting involved in the fray. Now it's Trix to die to NJR. Seriously, a second pick on NJR. He'll lose his life. Noodle in a 1v1, and he wins it against Pambazoo. That was a close one. As close as you can get in the dying moments of the round, but GK bre break the two round streak that we saw DZ riding on. DZ still with the lead, but it's only by one round. And very close. If Troy had the idea that Sirius was hiding right next to him, that could have been a different outcome in that round. But when there's no time, there is no intel either. You don't have those spare moments to go in a drone, ask for backup, etc. So you gotta take the gamble, take that risk. This time it does not pay out for Dark Zero, but they got the previous two rounds. Already now in a 2-1 half on the fourth round to begin here. It's a great spot for both teams. DC already got some leeway. And of course, GK, they're starting to build it up themselves. Go through those bomb sites, figure out like what's gonna work, what play style will counter Dark Zero right now. It's about reading into your opponent. When you're defending, you pick your five operators, you gotta stick it. When you're attacking, however, you can what's attack or repick as much as you want. Seconds to go. And kind of analyze what the weakness might be. The there you see, seriously, just sneak, sneak it into that corner. Getting one and getting two, and doing damage to the third. All Noodle needed was one bullet. And one bullet indeed hit the mark. <laughs> My favorite thing about LAN events are playing back the fist pumps, and you just, if somebody shouts, you just hear it over and Every over time. and over again, yeah. On your screen right now, by the way, an advertisement for the R6 share skins, which are 40% off at the moment, but reminds me of times long ago when Zofia was picked. Now, just a ghost of the past. She was played last round, just to like annihilate your point, but yeah, she's not played meta anymore. Okay. It's called an outlier. <laughs> oh, outliers exist, yeah? And that was an outlier. Okay. Well, you're she, right. has, she currently has the same pick rate as Jackal and Capkin. Yeah. Because oh, okay. they were picked okay, once each once, yeah, okay. last map. <laughs> okay. Just to annihilate your point. Yeah, that's fair. Outliers, yeah. I guess. Nice bait, by the way, on yeah. to Seriously. As Bolo now actually playing the Jackal, means that Jackal is a higher pick rate than Zofia. So oh. take that, Nick. <laughs> I am losing on both sides, but DC, they'll win the fights right now. They're approaching the bombs, even Pampas, who's six and one, by the way. Nice bounce back from the previous map where he only had two kills to his name, which is just simply not enough. A seventh now for Trixt, as he and Nafe are holding an angle. A seventh now as he takes out Trixt. Just trying to speak too quickly. You can hear the echoes of the phase D plus game going on next to us, but a small partition uh, separates us from the B stream. And for you at home, only a URL separates you from the B stream. As you can go watch all the other matches that will be occurring over there. There are four matches on both the A stream and four matches on the B stream, all best of threes. Oh, yeah. Best of threes to phase one is, uh, I love this, you know? For teams that tend to go home early, you get more experience going to an event. And for more experienced teams, they can also ex we get exposed as to who has a weak map pool, because best of ones don't punish poor map pool teams. GK Dark Zero, they've gone to the distance now. Shelly, Consulate, and currently a Nighthaven lap. And they're still fighting it. But it's 5v, well, 4v2 now in favor of Dark Zero, with still almost a minute to go. A good pace here, much quicker than the previous round. Absolutely. No Nitro Cell for Hashom. His band of batteries are already down. Key does have those smart goggles and a Nitro Cell for a post plant situation. But utility heavily favoring Dark Zero at the moment. Tons of skeleton key ammo. Still, three of those Rotero drones. Looked like there was one nade for Nath that just got tossed out as well. A swing from key on the window. When you're down those numbers, DZ doubled up on you. You got to swing to try and equalize. That's exactly what GK do, but unfortunately, you take those coin flip engagements 50-50, you lose both of them, and you're back looking at defeat. 3-1 for Dark Zero. They regain a two-round lead. But jostling bomb sites. Looks like, not EXO, we call it EXO, or I call it EXO for shorthand. The official name is Tank Assembly, which is the basement bomb site. It was played through those first two rounds. Not very successfully. 
No. You said that the reason why GK would go back to that basement bomb site in round number two was because they had some small adjustments they could make that would improve their standing. But that wasn't the case. The second round was arguably just as dominant for Dark Zero as the first round. Yeah. What is going to change now for GK on their third attempt to this bomb site? Well, the impressive thing is that GK did change things around, but Dark Zero had solutions for both of those problems. So if anything, I think the applause goes to Dark Zero more than the criticism goes to GK. But they will have something for a third attempt here. They're bringing out the bandit. Just like they tried on that CCTV defense upstairs. My only issue with this is when you just bring the bandit and you Five don't bring a mute or Kaid or Turo to kind of assist him, I don't really Attackers know what I should expect from how efficiently you can trick the walls. There are so many choose between. There is a triple wall on main breach, a double wall on main breach, and there's also going to be the single wall as well. You cannot trick both walls at once. I and mean, when we saw Dark Zero play Thatcher in previous rounds, they're able to if they want to. Not that they are right now, but I don't know if the bandit here will be the solution. This round, this bomb site, typically will either fall or it will win on the Rome game portion of this map, which DC, they've been excellent at so far. They like playing the Jackal Bolo again, third time they'll bring this operator. So, if there's a roam, they will find it, they will shut it down, and then it doesn't matter if you're playing Bandit or the Mira or what you're doing on the bottom side, because with all that vertical destruction up above you, you're not going to have anywhere to play. Legion has been a staple of GK's defenses, and has been jostled around from various players. What do you think leads to this resurgence of Legion, an operator who didn't really have a stable or steady footing in the meta, being played a lot by Seriously, and now obviously this round being trotted out by Hasham? Let me tell you, the goo mine damage being back, the second you step into it, it's a tilter. It, it, it's only a little bit of damage, but still, like, you go into this play, like, ugh, another one, right? Like, oh, Kikolo shoots, he's a better player than I am, but, like, you're supposed to hit them and then get annoyed by them. Was that ever up for debate, by the way? Kikolo being a better player than you? No, no, no. He's, a, he's an SI champ, he's a legend. He's good. Did you ever win SI? No, 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 Parker, no, no, no. Certainly not back to back. Oh, certainly not back to back. And Fabian didn't win a third without me either, you know? <laughs> Drone out! And now he's an analyst. Yeah, he downgraded. No. Bolo, as you spoke of being a better player, gets punished by tricks, but Panbazoo has his teammates back. And you say goodbye to Jason Doty. So long, Bolo. Playing the Jackal yet again. I wonder if they are concerned with the roam, and that's why the Jackal is being brought out. I mean, yeah. Jackal obviously has good utility too. We won't see the smokes from Bolo be of much use. They die with him. Yeah. That is a problem. I almost think the second their shotgun it might even be a bigger problem. They have no buck this time from Pamburu. Mm -hmm. They have no vertical destruction. So the side is not going to be as exposed or vulnerable as I said Attackers earlier because they cannot the break the floor apart. So while they cleared the roam, while they have first floor control, they can't do a whole lot with this. So Darks do a bit of a... Uh, they're kind of stuck in this round, honestly. They just got to brute force their way through it. No shortage of hard breach on their side. There goes the can opener. Another can opener in the back pocket of Pan Mizzou. That's the secondary hard breach. No thermite charges remaining for Canadian as there's just a little bit of obscurement. Walking on in, excuse me, someone called 911, but not for him, Pan Mizzou. Nine kills to his name, walking in, getting the knife pick, looking for a 10. He's got some numbers. Looks down, smoke goes. Another two as well, maybe for Pambazoo, looking for his fourth on the round. The cross is there, outdueled by Noodle, shut down by Nath. Canadian looking to extend the round, doing so by getting the diffuser down. Seriously, needs to win this for GK. Three players from Dark Zero standing between him and that diffuser. The clock, also an adversary. A nice shot, controlling the MP7 for Seriously, but he's given his position away. He's got a good idea of where the last two might be. Canadian and Naif, they don't need to move a muscle. Just sit, and wait, and that's exactly what they do. Naif punishing him. DZ win their fourth round, fifth round? Fourth like, round. Fourth round? <laughs> My goodness. No, it's flying by, and honestly, a perfect 2v1 crosser there from Dark Seer. But we've been saying, where is Pambus map number one? Where is Pambus in map number two of constantly? Because he was nowhere to be found. Two and seven, I think, failing almost every entry, dying early, didn't get help, no assistance. But now here in the third map where it matters the most, one could say, it's Pamba party time. He's getting knife kills, he's walking in, triple on the entry, and also he's initiating. 
He's setting things up and he's acting upon it as well. He gave his team all the space in the world in that round. He opened up the plant possibility, got the bomb side control, and sacrificed himself in that final 1v1 to buy time for the plant cover. It was a selfless act that worked for the team. It was perfect. <laughs> the big eyes, they all oh, blinded. The knife there out of nowhere. You see it here. You can see they love that important round. They were so locked out, no soft destruction, the main walls weren't open, the bandit did technically work for them, but when you lose out on a single staircase rundown by three attackers, well, that sucks. The worst way to go out. 4-1 now in favor of DC, and if you're GK right now, your biggest question mark is what bomb site do you go to? You just have not really found any stable success. The one round victory that they had was quote unquote due to a mishap from Dark Zero. Seriously snuck into a corner, almost got three kills, shut things down for DC. Had that not happened, odds are that would have been an extremely close round or DC would have stolen it outright. They're gonna go back to CC. The one round they won, one bomb set they won rather. And they're gonna bring that same lineup, the two Burrow Bandit, but hopefully this time they're gonna navigate the Bandit charges a little bit better and uh, work proactively to deny that wall and not have that slip up where the Exothermal Charge did indeed go through. Adaptation though. Reload. Panda will actively box below Canadian support, Bolo on the window, so they're gonna take down this control first, then breach the wall. Oh. Ooh, Wrong tricks way. getting out of there with his life. Vice Pro Chaser. I mean, that's excellent. Three players downstairs. It's solace off the board. They can breach the wall now. It's really excellent room clear. It was a like textbook entry, too. Yeah. Well done by Dark Zero. And this round not starting off particularly well for GK. Noodle's been the player rocking Tubero the most. I think all but one round so far that we've seen of the newest operator in the in this matchup has been played by Noodle. Yep. I think it was Key who played him back in map number one. It might have been. It might have been. No Maverick though. Like Maverick is like the easiest solution to Tuber, of course, but it's also a slow process. EMPs, verticality, more coordinated, you know, positions are gonna get the jump on faster. But now you clear things vertically, but now the Tuber freeze is still gonna be happening. 20 seconds gonna be taken out of way, time and time again, or those 12 seconds rather, it builds up. This wall will take a while to get opened. Those banded batteries are there, wall opens up. Banded batteries remain, but, or at least one of them does. Ultimately, this tricking from GK is not as successful as it could be, though it looked like from our top-down view that most of the defenders had fallen off of that position, so map control gained by DZ. Night Even Labs has a bit of a reputation for being a slower map, and it's certainly living up to that billing so far, but again, I gotta give some credit to DZ. They look quicker than they have with previous iterations. They found two kills so far. Key eliminates Nave, who didn't look like he knew where it was coming from. Over on the top of Fish, if you wanna call it that. Yeah. Seriously engaging, taking the duel with NJR again. You kinda have to swing when you're in this situation. And NJR running out of ammunition. Oh Nitro God. still goes out, but Bolo to the rescue. <laughs> two kills from the ace. And it is indeed finally five rounds, not in the previous one, like I had said. 5-1 first half for DZ. They are punishing the Saudi Arabian team on this third and final map. And now you really hope that GK has that same mentality as Troy said when they were the team losing. One round at a time. Because when you're down one and five, you make one mistake, you lose one round, you're looking down that match point scenario where things get really, really tough. Then you have nothing left to like, to throw away. You can't make a single mistake, then it's over. This is the best of three. They have fought their way here. It was a sloppy start on Chile. They had a phenomenal console at GK, that is. But now here at Nighthaven Lab, they are getting picked apart every single round so far in the first half in various setups, both in utility, in the roam clear, and most importantly, in the adaptation. Because this is so different than Consulate. On Consulate, it was GK always having Dark Sears' card, always understanding what they're gonna do and shutting it down. Now, we flip that. Dark Seer, that, okay, they're gonna play a guy below who's gonna, you know, deny us from breaching with Azure Sophia to stop the Benetry. So what to are they gonna do? We're gonna take Ace, Jackal and Buck, we're gonna hunt down that roamer, bait him in by fake three. breaching the wall essentially, get the kill, break the floor, then get the Attackers wall. Small adaptations like that are vital to success in these rounds. Because 
when you're attacking the opponent for the second or third time, you're building upon what happened every single round and trying to get that final picture of how you think they're going to play it. What change could they make, which they've not done yet? Now, Geeky on attack, and they've changed things around themselves. They're playing Maverick, the first Maverick of the series as well. But what happens next? Well, Canadian finds Noodle very early in this round. So a 4v5 start, when you're down 1 and 5 in round count, this is not where you want to be, and it gets worse. Because Nave also killed the shot. So now you're playing 3v5. Attackers drop the diffuser. This is a great start so far for Dark Zero. 45 yeah. seconds into the round. You've taken out the Jackal. There go a set of smokes. The only set of smokes, in fact, in hand for any of these operators. Good news is that all three remaining members of GK have access to Heart Breach. That's true. Yeah. So you're not going to be necessarily pressed to get into the building or get closer to the bomb site. But those, those peripherals, those other tools that you need, flashes, Breach charges, smokes, etc. You're not going to have all of those at your t at your disposal because of these two kills. Additionally, I think it's fair to say that with the exception of maybe seriously, oh, the two best players from GK are removed. And speaking of seriously, he's got some weight that he needs to hold now, shoulder, and he does it. Getting Pam Bazoo, the best player in this particular map for Dark Zero. NJR now standing against the tides, is tricks with half the round to go. What? Gets the diffuser down. Dark Zero don't seem to understand this. They've lost control. They hop on the Yokai drone, but it's too late. Their guns need to come alive. Tricks another kill, this time on Denae. NJR not far away. Maverick pushing up. Shotgun blast from NJR. Works. Collects two for the price of one. Seriously, last man standing. He'll need to get every single kill for his team in this round or else Dark Zero moves to series point. Just a small jiggle peek around the door, gets the drop on a Canadian, followed up on by none other than Bolo. And with three seconds to spare, NJR is able to hop on that diffuser and successfully disables it. DZ moves to series point. Way too close for comfort. I mean, I was going to say that, that he, like realistically, that round was over. The second Hashom died, it was a three versus five. But a quick three to one, drop the hatch, go for those kills. And somehow, some way, they just stake the plant. And DC, despite having toxic babes, a C4, and Yokai drone, had no idea the plant was going down. They were thinking, we're fine. We, we, they smoked off the window. There's no way they can do this. But the plan didn't get, indeed go down, and they almost were also successful at defending it in the post plan. A ridiculous set of events, which I don't even know how that happened, but NGR, the hero once more for Dark Zero, finding those two shotgun kills was vital to their success. That's not you on me, fucking hell. Yeah, there it is, Nate. That's on you. You're playing Echo, buddy. Where are the Yokai's at? But I'd love to see this, you know, yeah, they're winning 6-1, taking responsibility when you're losing. It's probably not that difficult because things are going well for you. But I do love seeing when players, they say, you know what, that's on me. Like, solely win or lose that round, I should have played my part better. If you're the Echo with the Yokai's and you don't have active intel, and you know that one thing they can do is rush the side probably in that scenario. Yeah, that's kind of on you. But team effort regardless. 6-1 for DC, they are looking mighty comfortable. And uh, GK, I don't blame them if they're just going to go for something crazier. Running through a building, you know, try and counter a spawn peak. You know, maybe do some split theory sessions here. Just like go five people on five different sides of the map. Try and go for a pick or a kill. Because right now at this point, as a team on the, like, the fundamentals of Siege, you know, communication, teamwork, crosswalks, etc. DC are just a better team. Which, to be fair, given the experience difference between these two uh, game, uh, or sorry, these two teams, is expected. Yep. Accountability is also really important, and that's something that teams maybe need to keep greater mm. mind of. Yeah, going on Twitter after a game and blaming your mouse or your computers <laughs> or your yeah. monitors or the weather conditions or the chairs or the table or whatever, you know. That's a whole other conversation for another day, but mm. when you mess up and you say, my bad. That's all that matters. Yeah, goes a long way. Obviously, if you keep messing up and then you keep taking accountability for it, that's great. The idea is to not mess up. <laughs> Mistakes are going to be made almost every single game by every single team. Even as dominant as they've looked, W7M has made mistakes over the last run that they've been on for the last year. It's bound to happen. Yeah. But try to limit the amount of mistakes you make and take accountability for it. And it's good that somebody like Nate is coming in on the team and doing that because leadership is something that I think Canadian will benefit greatly from by having somebody else at his side 
to take accountability and take ownership of those mistakes, even if they're team mistakes. Dave doing that is great. And clearly things are working for Dark Zero. Maybe not in this round, Nick, mm. as GK are up 5v3 with half the round to go. Yeah, they got good solid draw intel. I mean, they got, they got the locations of every Dark Zero roamer locked in. And he's just saying, okay, this guy's gonna move soon, guys. Get ready. They hop off the can to shut them down. Nave looking for a pick back here. They have the exact read on each other, but NGR is first with the C4 vertically onto Trix. That's Maverick off the board. Not crucial operate in this round necessarily, but the numbers go back to Dark Sphere's favor for just a moment. I mean, it's closer than it looks in all reality. It's just a matter of a utility list Dark Zero needing to come to blows. Oh. Hasham is there to shut them down, at least for now. He and Noodle in a 2v1. And Bolo be the hero. Pops up, down goes Hasham. Noodle and Bolo in a 1v1. Oh, how sweet it would be for Bolo to give DZ the win. Attackers His first match season. in how long, Nick? We 381 days. Unbelievable. And he finds himself in a tense moment. He alone could propel Dark Zero to a 2-1 victory over the red-hot team of GK. But there's work to be done. Noodle will find some comfort, some security in the corner, getting the diffuser down. Bolo will attempt to get him out of this Attackers position. Noodle just needs to hit him with a single shot. Bolo will tempt fate Ooh. with the super shorty, but Noodle wins the engagement at close range. And we continue onward. Another round for GK, but it's only their second round. It's a tall hill for them to climb to get to the top. Right now, it's DZ trying to keep them down. It certainly is. And I mean, Noodle did a great job at establishing what could be the win condition in the 1v1 because Bolo played it smart. He had intel with the bulletproof camera if Noodle were to push him. And he had, you know, the, the cover from the desk slash table in front of him as well. He's just playing the positional game. But there is one weakness there. The corner in exactly where Noodle planted, Bolo has no vision of. He has a push to a rotate that's crouch hide. It's not great. And of course, he was low on HP from an earlier engagement. So Noodle did find the one way he could win. And well, he took it for his team. It's a close round though, despite the fact that they got two picks early in the round. Nave always holding angles, very disciplined, very patiently. And then usually either looking away at the wrong second or just losing the gunfight. I almost feel bad for him. But it's hard when you're up against a team like DK. They can really shoot back. We talk about experience, we talk about regions and practice schedules and like how much, how many other good teams in your region you can practice against with these big teams, but Mena doesn't have any of those excuses, or they don't use, sorry, any of those excuses. They just show up, they do really good, and then they go home, and then they come back and do better. There hasn't been a lot of, oh, it's hard as a Mena team to find good practice or yada, yada, yada. No, very simply, they perform. A very new region to the tier one space of Siege but already impressed us at multiple events in this year alone. It's their first year. Now, taking on DC as a start would be a fantastic beginning for this team, but how realistic is it in reality? Well, if Shalea had gone better, could have been quite close. Nighthaven Lab, not the way they start, one of the things to start at least, but they have had a lot of good rounds and a very good map in consulate. So perhaps the one weakness here for GK is just they need a bigger map pool. That comes with time, comes with experience, comes with studying. Bambazoo kind of got it at the last oh. second. My goodness. Okay. Bomb okay. located by attackers. I was unfamiliar with your game. <laughs> I didn't think you... Oh, so... Rob. You know why he got that? Because Ace's Selma charges are like, you know, 0.3 seconds slower now or something like that. Very minuscule difference, but it mattered there. Would you look at that? Mm -hmm. Scanning for devices and Tricks opening up small avenues in to try and shake off those bandit batteries. A more troubling spot for GK, other than an inability to shoot out the bandit batteries, is now you've lost to Shom, who has shown that he can take over games on the squad. Could need an awful lot more from, seriously, who's looked like the best player, but honestly, GK have not looked very good in this map. No different than how DZ looked on console. Let's see now, they got no summons left, just the Maverick and Trix. And DC, they read this, they fell back to the bomb side, reinforced off the connect the wall. They got a Maverick it open, or brute force way through a single doorway where Injia with a shotgun will be awaiting them. <laughs> the walls are closing in and he's about to get pressured from behind as well. Oh. But I... How many bullets missed him? Yeah. At the, that was <laughs> half of a mag. And where's the backup? Like, how does he die like that? Uh, I'm confused, maybe just waste time. Bolo holding steady on what I imagine is the beachhead. 
as he's made his way now onto the catwalk and can cycle on over to close in on the bomb site. Key is gone as well, meaning that this triple hard breach combo for GK allows them a little bit extra insurance, but you're down to just the Maverick at this point because all the Selmas have been used by seriously. Good guns in the hands of all three operators on GK, but the wherewithal I don't think is quite there. Bolo has woken up, can't go for all three. And seriously, continues and trudging forward with that goo mine in his foot, he pops up and Pamba shuts the door. A very muted celebration from DZ, who <laughs> you wouldn't know it from your screen, but they won. the match is over. <laughs> there's no triumphant music, there's no screaming, it's just, oh, oh, there it is. I spoke too soon. DZ prevailed in the second match here on stream A. Just simply out-muscling GK <laughs> on a very lopsided Night Haven Labs. I know that celebrating is important, but I feel like when you're a team with big expectations from yourself and from your fans, celebrating your first win against a quote-unquote weaker opponent compared to like the top dogs, you can't go that far, right? Respect the fact, okay, there's a long way to go for us. This is just the beginning. Celebrate, but don't overdo it. There's a lot of time to be made here, a lot of practice to be had, and better teams, arguably, no disrespect to GK, to fight later on. But a great BO3, they went the distance, but Night Haven Lab and Shelly DC are just a tad more scary than that of GK. I mean, a good look for a team that has made probably the biggest changes to their squad in a long time. Yeah. Probably since Pambazoo was initially picked up, or maybe even Canadian came onto the squad. We've seen DZ continue to try with the same formula, just substituting different pieces. But it is abundantly clear that Nave and Bolo have changed the way that this team plays. There's far more communication among all five players. There's more cohesion, it seems, greater flexibility. So an excellent first look for DZ. GK, still good, but a best of three will expose a weaker map pool and clearly yep. Chalet and even more importantly, Night Haven Labs, not exactly their strongest. That's it for our second matchup. Let's break down what happened between DZ and GK. Thank you so much, Parker and Nick. See, I can say both first names. Uh, I really <laughs> do really appreciate the cast, but that is right. We're looking at DZ, and they have secured themselves the first win here at SI. I mean, a dominant performance on that final map. It does, however, showcase that GK doesn't have maybe the deepest map pool. Yeah, but I like that point indeed that Parker made at the end there, right? I mean, we did talk about that three game win streak that GK have on this map and the fact that it was international as well during Atlanta, but that exposes certain things that we've done in the past on this map that allows for Dark Zero to see what's happened, what's been going on before. And basically they expose that and they showed that with an international experience, they can take down a team like GK. Yeah, and if we go back to the wider shot, you'll actually see that we have uh, kicked Ollie off the desk and instead we have our- <laughs> Got the better brown. We Oh, okay, <laughs> coming with smoke straight away. Thank you so much for joining us, Nate. We do appreciate it. Congratulations on getting that first win here Thank at SI. You. Joining a new team, getting the first win under the belt, being here in Brazil, how does everything feel? I don't know if I'm good, honestly. A bit, a bit shaky nerves, I think, on Chalet. I think I think we could have closed out a lot earlier, but I will concentrate, you know, it was epic. We played pretty bad as well, but I think yeah. the third map, third map we were there. Sounds good. I'm, I'm very curious about the big difference between your prior team and the team that you're on right now, right? It's a different region, everything's different. How's that been? <clears throat> well, first of all, they don't ha understand half the stuff I say, and they oh. blame that on me being British. <laughs> I mean, I, I can understand that, to be fair. <laughs> no, it's the other way around. I can't understand half their, their lingo. Oh. American, they should adapt to me, pretty much. Yeah. So, so, so far, that's been the only... <laughs> only be like, oh, the girl can't hear what you're saying. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm speaking English, you speak English too. Yeah. It's like us, we get different language today. <laughs> I mean, honestly. it is what it is. Uh, but you touch upon as well the fact that potentially that second map was not your greatest moment, and that's completely true. It was a 7-3 and three for GK. What were the shortcomings in that map? Because you're talking about them not understanding you, but it was kind of like all five of you, you know, talking at the same time. Yeah. What was that? Uh, yeah, obviously, in, in the real game, obviously, it's nothing to do with that. I think we kind of... Well, I hope it was that. We thought they were going to pick one of Club or Labs. Okay. Not that we weren't pre prepared for Consulate, but maybe it wasn't as good as like the other two. But, uh, I think, yeah, honestly, I think it came a bit down to preparation. And honestly, I think the, the first few rounds, it was early picks, giving them the solo picks that they want, because I think they struggle on execute. So I think that's, that's what we realised that, like, the last two defences, like, just, just don't, like, play far back, let them execute, and then they're like, we finally got the two rounds on defence. Yeah, congrats.
where he's saying makes sense. I think Clubhouse would have been a very sensible pick to pick against you guys. But um, to look at things in perspective of the group, who do you think is the most difficult opponent in your group? Or have you already faced the most difficult opponent? Uh, honestly, uh, yeah, I don't know what that guy's doing. Uh, honestly, I think they're, they're, I think everyone, everyone in the group's going to be hard, you know, cliche. <laughs> but these these guys play their own kind of siege. I think we, we, I think we're probably more confident against the other teams in the group, just like for the way they play. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of the games. All right, thank you so much for the time uh, for the interview. We really do appreciate it. And you guys at home are going to give you guys a refresher in terms of how this last game went. So when we're looking at the performance here and. DZ came out swinging. I think that second map was potentially just a little blip in the radar, but all in all, a really, really great performance. Oh, we have, do you want to say anything about him being the better Brit? Actually, Alia, I want to start off with that. <laughs> thank you for joining. Um, hear the interview, believe it or not. Oh, the he, they said loud. he was the better Brit. Uh, he said he, he said they got the better Brit on yeah. the desk, so he was. Ah, right, yeah. okay, I get it. I was going to be really nice and say it's so nice getting an NA team winning and having an EU person on the desk for the, interview, <laughs> for the winner's interview. So I was going to be quite nice about this, but there we go. But that's Loki still a dig at NA, though. Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. But I think yeah, I, I'm a DZ <laughs> fan now, you know? I was, I was starting to be a DZ fan in Atlanta. I'll hold my hands up to that. Okay. I think we have the sets up on the screen just now, right? But one thing that I am very curious about is what the hell Pambazoo had during that break because he didn't have the greatest of map two, but on map three, he came out swinging. He, he was had... on the entry, he was active. What did he go, 14 in something? He was absolutely showing up on that third map. He had the beautiful Sao Paulo air. Like, it's really warm and... Fresh. Yeah, and yeah. That probably was it. Yes, humid, but <laughs> that could have been it. But all in all, I think like definitely like the difference between map two and map three from Dark Zero was absolutely phenomenal. It felt like a completely different team, a lot more in terms of that cohesion that we were seeing. Also from the communication side, Ali, it felt like they were more on the same page. And it does to me bring the question: when they are under stress, we are in that stressful environment. How exactly? How is is their resilience? They've definitely got a little bit of resilience there. They've got a heck of a lot of experience on the team, and it's mm -hmm. something that I think everybody will say about this Dark Zero roster, is they've got a lot of experience. I think this is Canadian's eighth SI or something crazy like that. Like This guy yeah. has been around, Ooh. and the rest of them as well. So you start looking at this now and thinking about going up against a team like GK, I really think they just got found out there. And maybe that's the difference between the difference in quality in terms of region. Obviously, we spoke saying that Dark Zero have played this map a lot domestically. We've seen them play this map quite a lot. Although GK have played it and they've got a reasonable record yeah. on it. They haven't yeah. played it that much. And they haven't really played it up against top competition. They've played it a little bit internationally, but look at what happens when they go up against Dark Zero. Yeah. One thing I will say is it was really interesting right at the end of that game, even though DZ won the map, Bolo swung in the three versus two. And at the end of the map, Canadian was like, Bo, like reset. Like we can still lose those three versus twos. Like we still need to rein it in a little bit. But throughout the whole game, Bolo was screaming for kills. He was like, give me the kill, give me the kill. And someone was like, it's first come, first served. I think that was <laughs> on like cafe or something like yeah. that. They were having a yeah. good time. They were having a lot of that's fun with it. About. And that's what you need. You need the vibes to be high. Yep, and they were high indeed. But also, I want to talk about the Intel play of the game, and that will be the ace that we've seen. Think of as the first ace that we've seen here on the A stream, at least, and it was from Hasham. I mean, we were talking about him during that first map against yeah. Dark Zero, and how he had a phenomenal debut, just an incredible performance on those hero plays. Yeah, just getting all the kills with your secondary like that, that's just, I guess, showing dominance. But we talked about it earlier, right? It's that kind of relief that you see on the players' faces after you pull up a play like that. It yeah. just shows that maybe on the side of DZ, especially with this iteration of the roster, there is a lot more experience than we have seen with previous iterations of the Dark Zero roster. And especially for the GK players, this is still relatively new territory. This is, like yeah. we mentioned, Seriously's first international LAN event. So it's all still a little bit new, but hey, that's why maybe they should be lucky that we have this group stage and they still have all these games yeah. to get warm up into, into this tournament. Yeah. All in all, when we're looking at the both games that we've seen today, especially so with G2 up against NIP and now with Dark, uh, with Dark Zero up against GK, I think we've seen in terms of how the teams can really come into this international event swinging. Yeah. And that's the case for G2 as well as the case for DZ. But then we're also looking at teams like GK and NIP that need a little bit more time to get into the swing of things. But you mentioned, yes, they have the group stage. That is correct. But Ali, the bottom of the group will go home. 
Absolutely. And that's something you really want to start keeping a bit of a keen eye on. And things like round difference will start to make a little bit of a difference potentially as well when we get a little bit deeper because there will be sort of tie-breaking factors to see which of those teams go home. We yeah. commented on DZ in Atlanta not really giving themselves the easiest time of things. They do like to go to three maps. They do like to go to an overtime. They've gone to three maps today again, which does lead you into believe that, you know, although it's a different roster, is it the same old DZ where they don't quite make things easy for themselves and they could have got it done a little bit sooner? Maybe something never change. I've looked at the roster for tomorrow or the schedule for tomorrow in regards of Group A because, of course, Fear X today have it their off day. Um, GK actually have their off day tomorrow. I think this might benefit them in the way that they just suffered a loss, whereas it went all the way to three maps and they were close to someone taking that one home. And then have this day to really like calm down, yeah. see what went wrong, try and make some changes, make some adjustments to come out swinging against T2. Yeah, sit back, relax, and have a break. That's exactly what we're going to be doing because that's it from the three of us on the desk. But we will have two more games coming your way with the lovely batch of analysts. We have Jesse, we have Laxing, and we also have the amazing host Rob that will be taking care of you for the next two BO3s. So don't go anywhere, or maybe if you need to grab a snack, go do that. We'll be back with the halftime show, which is going to be really interesting, and the remaining of the game. So take care, and we'll see you in a bit.
Yeah, welcome back. Of course, behind us, we've got two teams preparing, but we're not here for that yet. We're here for the halftime show. We've got the incredible Jesse joining us. Well, it's Bibu from Wolves. Bibu, how you doing? I'm good, and you? I'm yeah. winning to, to, uh, this morning, so good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really good, so. yeah it, can't, it can't get much better than yeah. to start with a win. Yeah. How, how did it feel, though? Um, really good to start uh, our sixth international with a win against SSG. Uh, like, uh, I think it's the best team, uh, second best team in, in our group. So, uh, yeah, it was good and uh, feeling good. We, we came back, sloppy start, but at the end we, we got the point, so that's the most important. You kept it interesting for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to make it too easy. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and of course, you're saying second best team to Bliss, right? Bliss is the number one in the... Yeah, because it's phase... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we don't underestimate anyone, but of course, on the paper, uh, they, they were the second best team. Phase is so uh, consistent and making mm. so much events that you can't say then they are the favorite of the group. So that's all. That's just for that. Yeah, of course. Now, obviously, you're here in Brazil now. What's the preparation been like leading into into this. This has been, uh, like, obviously it's a huge event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we prepare a lot. Uh, we had a boot camp before, uh, one, one week before coming there. So, yeah, it was uh, interesting to play against uh, other, other regions uh, because most of the time we are playing EU and we are just playing against uh, other regions in, in tournaments. Yep. So there it was uh, interesting to see different things, trying uh, different stuff and learning, you know. Uh, it's uh, always a learning uh, learning path uh, in sports. So, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I think it helps us uh, to be to be there to, today and winning tomorrow, uh, the, this morning. Sorry, that's all right. <laughs> it's, all, it's all the same. It all, yeah. it all just tomorrow kind of, up to into. It, yeah, just, yeah. it just okay. pushes together. Jesse, I yes. have a really important question for you. I, I'm actually getting these fed through to me. Okay, uh, pizzas or hamburgers? Pizzas or hamburgers? Yeah. Ooh, I think if it's like a really high quality meal, I think you would rather go for the hamburger. A great hamburger or cheeseburger I think is going to outpace a great pizza <laughs> but if you're going to someplace that's like kind of sketch you don't know get the pizza pizza's always going to be solid yeah. okay I'm I'm agree with you yeah I agree with you. yeah I'm, I agree with you. okay that's fair one's greasy one's you know it, it's hit and miss but it can still be okay mm -hmm. now I do have a, a big question here uh impact of Mowgli coming onto the team like what how, how's it feeling now I um, mean, he's an impactful player, so yeah. obviously uh, when he's in the first line and taking his skill, his gunfight is making a huge difference for us. Yep. Uh, most of the time we need to close the games because, I mean, he's, uh, he has a risky role. But yeah, I mean, these players like uh, Deadshot or uh, Mugli also like are very impactful and it's always good to have player like this to, to make your job easier as support. So. Mm -hmm. Welcome to them, <laughs> I guess, every time. Yeah, and for Mowgli, I mean, he's often playing kind of off on his own sometimes. We saw that a bit today. Do you feel that that's maybe a, a high pressure situation for him? And do you think that that's something where it takes a lot of trust to let him go off and be on his own sometimes? Uh, of course, I mean, trust, uh, it's what builds your team. If you don't have trust in your teammates, anyone, it's, it can be Mowgli or your support or everything. You need yeah. to trust them to, to make a, a great team. And, and after that, yeah, sometimes it's, oh, on the on the side on lurking and stuff like that but he's most of the time he's playing his comfort zone mm -hmm. uh, if he wants to do something is because he's he's been confident to do it he have like something just the game the game sense say you can do it and you will be able to do it so we just trust him and we know that he can bring magic on the server so <laughs> that's all <laughs> bit of magic on the server sometimes that's what you need just a little bit of the sprinkle now obviously you've been to si a few times i believe it's four times yeah. now this is the fourth yeah the fourth one so what like in terms of you know this versus other events versus like your leagues how does it compare what what's the difference to coming to si to say going to a major uh I mean, SI is the top. I yep. mean, it's the world championship of, of Rainbow Six. So yeah, I mean, it's always the the, the most in, uh, event you want to go there to bring the armor, you know, the, the, the iconic armor to to, to lift this uh, this uh, this trophy. And uh, you are playing the best the best team in the world. And as competitor, you want to be the best. So you, you need to be the best. <laughs> and yeah, and and uh, also the, there's the first one in Brazil out of Montreal. So Feeling a, a bit uh, something, uh, something more with this one. So yeah, I'm happy to be there and uh, sharing every every moment with my team and everyone there. Nice. Now there is. Uh, I, I don't know if you're even going to be able to answer this one, <laughs> but have, is there any specific Brazilian food you want to try while you're here? This is from Bear Zero Eight One Seven. Um, I mean. 
when I came, I uh, didn't know about uh, Brazilian food. I know they had good barbecue, so yeah. we mm -hmm. tried. But I mean, it's meat. We we have a lot also in in Europe. Yes. But um, our friends from W7M uh, advised us to try some stuff, and I think there is like a cheese bread. They have a cow queijo. I don't know. Sorry for <laughs> Brazilian. <bread. laughs> sorry, uh -huh. but it's very good. Uh, I like cheese, so I'm just a fan of that. And uh, they also um, have like a thing in chocolate. I think it's. Uh, Perejo, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> it's yeah. like something in chocolate, like just chocolate. It's feel yeah. it's look amazing at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to try. <laughs> so yeah. that's yeah. the thing I want to try. Jesse, you? Yeah, I mean we've got like a, we've got like a room upstairs that's filled with like Brazilian candies, which I've like never heard of. And oh. I tried the first one like today for the first time, and it was this like peanutty, sugary, like amalgamation. I don't remember what it was called, <laughs> but it was really good. So I mean my initial impression of the Brazilian food, maybe candy's not the best thing to judge all the Brazilian <laughs> cuisine. On, but I thought it was good. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we tried it. Uh, I'll be our assistant coach. Tried the the peanut thing. He yeah. said it was if you like peanuts, you are you're in the paradise. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's the thing you need to take. So uh -huh. I got that message too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, obviously, you know, like being at SI, I believe that the lowest that you've placed might be fifth to eighth. I actually, think, yeah. from looking back in the history. So, how confident are you that you're going to be able to get to main stage? Um, I'm very confident. Uh, I mean, every team I think who's coming to us I, uh, are confident to, to make it to, to the end. Yep. Uh, I think our, for us, obviously, we want to win. But our main objective, I think, for all the teams to play on stage, uh, especially uh, uh, in front of a Brazilian crowd, I think it would be amazing. Mm. And uh, yeah, all my all my SI I played uh, played on stage, so I will try to keep the traditions uh, up and try to be on stage uh, for for the SI. Any particular teams you'd like to face on stage in front of the Brazilian crowd? I mean, there is two options. Uh -huh. G2 for the revenge, <laughs> obviously. Mm -hmm. And because we, it's always banger games when we are playing against them, we have like, uh, we are friends with Alema or free for everyone, so it's always a bit of a banter and a great show. But I think I would love to just uh, play a Brazilian team, a favorite, and just crash them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Put the AC on on the stadium. You want, you want the trouble, uh -huh. you want all the heat, don't you? <laughs> I mean, it's it's a, it's a different feeling to be like, you know, all the ground be, uh, behind you trying to push you, but it's uh, I think it's a great feeling to just shut down an entire crowd too. <laughs> yeah. I never did it, so maybe once I would try it. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, I'm going to ask you, obviously, you know, within your group, who do you think is going to end up knocking, being knocked out in the first phase? Uh, for now, with my experience, with what we, we see, uh, I would not, would not say too much, but with the practice and the first games, I would say probably D+. Uh, I think uh, they were they, they had like the peak, uh, like I think it was uh, back in two, year, two years again, majors. I mean, they, they mm. keep out the standard, you know. But at the end, like now, uh, I think Bliss is just on the on the up. On, they are going up, going up, and trying to improve every time. We saw it at uh, Atlanta. They make us yeah. scared. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think that they will be better than G Plus, mm. and I think uh, G Plus will be out, unfortunately, because it's a great team too. But. Uh, one need to go out. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'm going to let you ask a question now, if you have any. <laughs> sure. Or Bibu. Sure. Bibu, I, listen, some people after the game were talking a bit on Twitter. I remember you brought Ram on Clubhouse twice to attack the top floor. Can you explain the thought process on that? Because people were chatting, they were a little bit confused by this by this operator pick. Uh, I mean, Ram is like, uh, I think Ram is a good operator to do uh, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's bringing chaos, it's bringing verticality, it's bringing flashbangs, and now with the, the nade meta, which just disappeared because you can't cut nade anymore, flash is very useful and very, I think it's the new meta, Kenda. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a lot of Ying too, so that's the same thing. And uh, this she has a good weapon. Uh, sometimes on on positions that you need to drop or take big gunfight or risky gunfight, having a three armor is always a, a huge, not a huge difference, but can make the difference. And sometimes uh, on clubhouse, it's I think it's Deadshot who's playing it. Yeah. And he's just an absolute beast with our forces. So <laughs> and we see it on cafe when he clutch one v three. Uh huh. So uh, most of the time we say, okay, when you can just pick up a gun you want. It just go for RAM because it's so much utility. I mean, after the game that Deadshot had today, I think you let him play whatever he wants. So yeah, you can play Monty every <laughs> round. If you if you're confident to pick everyone with Monty, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I want to ask you as well. The integration of Tiburao into the uh, into the game has caused a lot of people to ask some yeah. questions. It's changed a lot of playstyles 
for a lot of teams. How have Wolves and, and, and yourself in particular, how have you dealt with these changes? Um, I mean, uh, at the beginning, it, it, they make a change on the operator. At the beginning, it was way too strong. Yeah. You could trick too much. Uh, it was easier, uh, easier to trick. Now you need to at least communicate with your Truba and keep Bandit and stuff like that, so it's better. There are, you have less, so. And at the beginning, we were all, I think, thinking about it was going to slow down the meta, shut mm -hmm. down. But because now there is too much stuff to bridge the meta, the, the, the walls and the, the, all the stuff you have, it's going on the other side. It's just speeding the meta because you don't want to bring, to, you don't want to be facing all the utility, Azami's, uh, Benchies, Fenrir, stuff like that. So just go on site, kill everyone, trade. <laughs> At the end, you are 2v2, 1v1. and. Just play the game. The, just taking the shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> so that's rush. That's a bit different, but uh, yeah, Chubari is a big meta changer. I think. Yeah. Ah, not big, but it can change the meta, mm -hmm. and that's why we adapt to that. Try. I think all the team trying to be faster on the attack side to not face the Chubaro uh, issues that uh, is bringing. Right now. How's the uh, jet lag going? What? How's the jet lag going? How's the travel? Ah, oh, huh? good. Everything. I All mean, we, we came like one week before. Yeah. So, uh, it's okay. And it's always easier to come from Europe to America because you, it's, it's feel like we are a normal person. Yes, life, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, working up at 8 uh, <laughs> yeah. when we are home, not at all. <laughs> right, right. More like 11 or 12. So it feels like great. No, it's, it's good. And we are playing to the, the, in the morning, so it's not like too long, you know? Or, I mean, we, for us. So uh, I think it's good for us, for our European team to not play too late yep. with the jet lag. Yeah, all right. Well, fantastic. Bibu, thank you very much for joining us, my friend. Do you have anything you'd like to say before we let uh, you go? Thank you to every fans, to you for the interview, for everyone supporting us. Thank you to Wolves for the support since uh, two years now. And just uh, let's go one pack. See you tomorrow on the servers. Uh, we'll bring hell. Yeah, fantastic. We love to see it, Bibu. Thank you very thank much you. for joining us. Bye. Mate. Best of luck with the rest Thanks. of the phase. Jesse. Exit stage left, please. Yes, we have sir. two new people joining us on the desk. Again, swapping out nice and quickly. We've got Bolo, we've got Laxing, two gentlemen that really need absolutely no introduction whatsoever. I'm gonna ask, Bolo. What up? You've just finished your game. You exhausted? I'm hot. Yeah? I'm you're hot. hot. <laughs> it's real hot out here. When we, when me, when we, came, we, when we came in to set up the SSD, it was kind of cold and I misjudged it. Yeah. So I'm layered up. Oh, it's all good. You're not. You're not really. You're not really playing a match unless you're sweating, right? That's true. That's that's very yeah. true. I'm just forcing and, it out of me. And like he said, sometimes you know it's cold when you get in. Yeah. But it's hot when it starts. <laughs> it got a little bit hot and heated, didn't it? It was a little bit more uncomfortable than expected. Or yeah, we'll be fine. Well, to be fair, we're you fine. got you got the double layer on. That's what I'm saying. And you got the. Uh, and I got the mocks. Talking about the game, I'm not even talking about how hot you are. That's, yeah, okay, now we're going down a different path. How did you find the game? Did you expect it to be so difficult? Did you expect to go to a third map? Um, I mean, you never want to expect to go to a third no, map, right? We won, we won all the points, oh, but um, I mean, I think it went according to plan. Consulate was a little bit of a wrench, you know. We we, we thought we were better prepared for that, yeah. but, you know, it is what it is, right? Um, but we, we came out on top on Nighthaven, that's all that matters. We knew. We would have a pretty good matchup on Nighthaven, even if it were to go to the third map. We knew it was going to kind of end the way it did. So, now this is going to be a two-part question. One, who do you think is the most dangerous team at the moment? I think we all know. But then the second question is going to be, who do you think is going to be the most complicated to, to play? So I'm going to let you answer first. Who's the most angriest team? No, 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 no. <laughs> who's like, in your opinion, okay. who's the best team coming into SI? Well, the obvious answer is to say W7. Oh, it is. I mean. Obvious. They've won Copenhagen. Yep. They've done really well in their region. They yep. just won the Atlanta Major. They're a fan favorite coming into here. And they also have a storyline with their with their org, this being their last run. So it kind of creates that storyline of like a last dance yep. sort of situation. But I do want to change that because that's the obvious answer. I do want to give a different answer. I want to say Liquid. Yeah. I think Liquid has underperformed. Yep. But I do believe that they have what it takes to really show their true form and what they've done throughout the many years that they've played as a team and throughout the history of Liquid that they've always been a top four team and have always came so close to closing it out. So for me, I'm going to say Liquid. Bolo. Sheesh. Who are you expecting to be the hardest team to verse? I'm sorry, I know we're in a... Sheesh. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. It's honestly, I, I, I'm just going by groups here, right? It's like you got you to gotta get out of groups, right? Yep. So I'm looking at G2 right now. Uh, that's, that's the first real big hurdle, you know, previous world champs, right? Current, I guess, world champs, yeah. right? So that's going to probably be the most dominant team at the moment. Um, and then everything beyond that is 
I mean, it doesn't really matter. We'll just, you know, we cross that bridge when we get there and then we play our game and we should win. Now, I've got a, a very um, interesting question here that's been asked multiple times in the Twitch chat. When does Bolo play? I knew this was gonna, I knew this was gonna be a question. I bet y'all thought you were done with that, huh? <laughs> um, I mean, today, right? Today, I thought I thought it was a pretty good, you know, a little bit, a little bit rusty in the beginning. Got There's nothing that prepares you from for getting back in the lobby. Honestly, it's like we've been screaming for a couple months. I've been back at it for a little bit, and uh, nothing beats just you know loading up in the server. Lights are on, <laughs> and it gets crazy. So, can I ask a question? Of course you can. So, like, Jump in. so with with you, obviously, attending invite being former world champion as well. When you get to invite, and just to like tell the audience and stuff like that, is it super intense the second you land? Like it's like it's on the second you land wherever the designated area is. Like it's just on. Everything just feels way more intense because that's how it's always felt for me. And it's weird being here now, being this the first invite that I'm attending now as talent and being yeah. on that other side. But like from a player perspective, like it's always been so intense for me yeah i think like the travel part of the actual event is like the huge thing because i feel like for me like that's when like the zone kind of kind of happened yeah. it's like all right everything's led up to this moment you know the plane ride the hotel right. getting everything set up starting to do the international scrims it's all it's, it's game time from there so for it's sure. always it's always like the the snap yeah it's always the definitely snap. now of course probably the uh, most anticipated question something that i'm sure you're uh, very much prepared for how long are you staying for hey you never know you never know <laughs> see if if I were to just tell you my intentions, then it'd just be boring, right? That's right. Nobody would ever ask again. Mm. <laughs> then they, then they you wouldn't, wouldn't have a reason to ask, ask when yeah, You playing. wouldn't ask me to come back on here on this little podium and talk some more, right? Well, how, I think we will. <laughs> well, well, how is it coming back to up. invite specifically? Back to invite? I mean, it's interesting because that was this is the last or SI 2022 was the last like international or I guess we went to Yonko and see I'm a little hazy a little hazy here yeah. don't but, even ask me any questions yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. forgot half my career already. I mean it feels good it feels good but like everything in the past is in the past yeah. right it doesn't matter it's only ahead of you mm -hmm. and the opponent in front of you so feels good yeah I'm hopeful and I'm ready yeah well mm -hmm. uh, one of the other questions that we've got here from Twitch chat what operator is giving you the most grief at the moment grief yeah. Yeah, I know. I just, uh, man, an operator just pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It gets under uh, your skin, Bolo. I guess Hasham on Brava 3x DMR. That was kind of annoying. <laughs> I don't, I don't Are you know. getting sniped? I've actually never played. No, it was, it was some. Don't worry about it. Okay. Don't worry about it. Ridiculous in the past. Uh, I never really played comp with Fenrir up, so that's it's a new, you know, Fenrir. Yeah. So it's, it's new. Grim the, the the Grim changes now. That's a little bit interesting. So. Yeah. I don't know. Not the best answer, but I'm I'm learning still. I'm learning the new the new changes. So we asked uh, before. What's your favorite food here? Have you tried Ooh. enough food to, to let us know what your favorite uh, local cuisine is? Bolo. Yeah? It's cake. Interesting. Bolo mm. cake. Squishy? Fluffy? Mm, I had a little a little bit of variety. What's it taste like? No, it, good stuff. It's just, it's just cake. I'm well, just, what's, what's, bolo well, is what, cake. What, what flavor cake is it? Though? I, some, I you think gotta, I gotta let the audience digest chocolate it a little more. What else? There's some, they, they love the coconut over here. Yeah, I saw that. I I'm not too much of a fan coconut. of coconut. But. Okay. So you don't like a good almond joy? Mm, no. I can get down on an almond no. joy. You got any questions for Bali? Hmm. I mean, how do you manage to look? as good as you do oh, okay. and play as good as you do that i think play that's a very good. serious question for the audience i think we're picking the wrong twitch chat questions i know there's some interesting comments <laughs> in there uh <laughs> i mean you know i'm just i'm just doing what i well, do all right let me this is this is more a serious question that i think a lot of people are wondering what's it like playing on dz versus tsm Ooh, great question that was it's a little different. It's a little different, uh, you know, believe it or not. DZ is a lot more structured, more strategy based, and you know, you, have, you got Troy Canadian, right? So compared to TSM, which a lot of people would probably hail as like the more aggressive, like yeah. NA team I mean, back in the day. It's kind of like to, to put in perspective for the, the, the newcomers, it's like kind of like M80 in a sense, but like, yeah, I mean, that's how we've been I, putting up the numbers. That's how I always viewed you guys was that you guys were the more aggressive team, like the two staples of like NA in terms yeah. of like that same play style that DZ had yeah. was always DZ and SSG. Like they were very, yeah. very structured, very to the core of their strat. Whereas like you guys were not, not, not to say you weren't structured, but like you guys had a purpose of like getting yeah. in the face, taking the gun. Yeah, fights, it was more about, done. you know, right now in DZ, it's more about getting like the round win rather yeah. than getting up in their face and like getting the kill in TSM, which for sure, you know, sometimes would result in a round win, sometimes it wouldn't. So. Well, this is a personal question for me too. Outside hey. of that, that was more for the audience. What's like the practice regime looking like? Cause obviously, you know, 
from an outside perspective, Andy, I've heard a lot about DZ's practice regiments and how, you know, they get ran that they can either be super intense yeah. or they can be super intense. So, like, what, what does that look like? It's different than the TSM one. Um, it's not the retired life. That's 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 for damn sure. Uh, I mean, it's pretty good. I mean, I knew going into this, I would have to sacrifice, you know, a lot of time and a lot of effort for, you know, this event. But I think it's worth it. It's definitely a little bit more ramped up than my previous TSM team back in the day. But it's nothing nothing that we all can't handle because okay. we're all we're all here for one purpose, right? For sure. Yeah, things have probably changed a little bit since uh, you last competed at this level. Uh, one of the questions that I actually find quite intriguing. TDM meta. What do you what do you think of the meta at the moment? I don't think I don't think it's a thing right now. No, nah. no. I think that's I think that's a ranked issue. Yeah, <laughs> rank 2.0. <laughs> I don't I don't. I mean, it's I think the meta right now is I actually really enjoy it. Coming back, it's really fun. Even before I left, like I enjoyed the meta a lot back then. And yeah. I didn't think it was TDM because that was still kind of the concept back then was rank or yeah like a rank you know tdm meta and i didn't really feel like i feel like you can play into the utility you can play into the strategy but in the event that you need to you know get up in their faces right. you see a gap you know you see a dent in the armor then you have to you you capitalize and at the end of the day you have to yeah eliminate the enemy team right it's a gunfight <laughs> at the end of the day it's pretty simple isn't it yeah even simple if you have a shield yeah. and three one eyes you know you gotta hit that shot straight to the point actually there's a there's a question in here about shields um the first part of the question is, uh, what's it like playing with Troy? The second part of the question is, uh, what would he say about your behind the shield plays, AKA Bolo plays? I mean, I think he likes it, right? Like uh, that's the that's the whole like lore behind that question is like Troy on a podcast was talking about me on a shield because that was kind of like my, you know, my forte back in TSM. And I still, I mean, whenever there's a shield setup, you know, chalet top mez, soda on consulate. Mm. I'm probably behind it, right? And I mean, I love shields, right? Who doesn't love sitting behind a bulletproof, you know, window? Love that. But it's really fun with Troy. It's really awesome. And I mean, I sure do love me some shields. Is it bolo proof? Sheesh, well, that's a that's a new one. Hey, that's a new one. Bolo proof. Well, uh, unfortunately, this segment is now bolo proof. We are done and dusted. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Thank God. Kidding. Uh, that's I'm kidding. Kidding. Enthusiasm I'm kidding. Final comment. It's really hot in here, by the way. It's, it's really hot. Yeah. I mean, if you can't yeah, tell, he's, right? he's he's shining. I'm I'm dying. I'm dying. But uh, final final comments before we let final you go. comments. I'm back. I hope you guys enjoyed the first matches. I'm looking forward to the rest of the group stages. Hopefully you guys are as well. And thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for, you know, just supporting. And hopefully you're supporting the new team. DZ to the top. Beautiful. Thank you very much for joining us, Bolo. We're going to go to a short break. And I mean short because on the other side, VP take on Liquid.
Well, it is time for our third matchup, and this one is a big one. This is pinned to be probably the match of the day. Team Liquid, they take on VP in a very important first best of three. This is where they get to kickstart their venture for the hammer. Some teams come into this tournament in their opening game, it's against, oh, maybe we get to play you know, an APAC team, some teams that are not necessarily the favorites. VP and Liquid, two teams that people expect to go quite far through this tournament, have to play each other in the very first round. I think we're set up to have a great game here today, Manic. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a great game overall as well. I mean, especially for VP coming out of Atlanta, they didn't have the strongest showing and they were losing to a lot of very good Brazilian teams, one being NIP and the other being W7M. Now you're going against a powerhouse and a juggernaut team like Liquid. So in that sense, you got you to gotta come together as VP and realize here like what your mistakes were going against those Brazilian teams and how you're going to fix this going into this game or we might be seeing the same result going into the future. All right, well, looking at the head-to-head -to, -head to kickstart the proceedings, uh, I don't really know how much I want to note here other than probably the land appearances is the, the big one for me. Yeah. Um, just the significant difference, obviously. You know, that two years uh, is a long <laughs> time. Mean, uh -huh. it's, 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 a, it, it's There's a lot there to, to kind of gain. Well, I mean, there's a thing to note with Liquid 2 coming in in 2018. They've attended literally every single invite leading up to this date. Yeah. That, that's important coming into this event alone because these players are very well-rounded and know what the environment feels like. And for Virtus Pro as well. I mean, it says that it's their first SI, but you got to remember, four yeah. out of five of these players were in the Six Invitational mm -hmm. Grand Finals yeah. not too long ago. They lost that one, so they're looking for a bit of revenge here. You know the players are hungry to get back to that Grand Final stage. You can kind of hear how hungry the Liquid players are. That's <laughs> for damn sure. That's I mean, right. I just love the environment and the atmosphere of SI. Everything is just, it. it's just going. It's just going like this is it. This is this is the beast. This is the main event. This is the event that you want to be attending as a siege player, as a professional player. And when you make it here, the goal is to win it. That's it. And look, there should be nothing on their minds other than winning it. So Absolutely. let's go ahead and start talking about VP, the team that really for us, we, we do have a couple of questions about. I mean, they've got some some very solid uh, performances throughout this year, but is it? it is it uh, amalgamating amalgam? So, I mean, my thing that I even just said in the beginning of the intro with VP is VP have, they're, they're a dominant team. They are a strong team in the EUL. My biggest gripe with them is that they play an old version of Siege still, which is sure. a very strategic based Siege, where, where the meta right now is very in your face and it mm. really caters to the Brazilians that are, have always been aggressive for as long as we can remember. And again, touching up where I was saying, you know, they struggled in Atlanta against the Brazilian teams of NIP, of W7 again. And now you're going against Liquid. That's They're going to be in your face just as much as those other two teams. So it's a matter of, did you use those three months or the time off to figure out what you needed to do? Are you going to bring out things? Because we also know that their map pool hasn't been that strong at all. So it's a matter of, are you coming into this event, coming into this event knowing that you needed to fix these things, that you are going to be playing against these powerhouses, or are you going to try to continue to force that same play style? Yeah, Virtus Pro, I mean, they're not going to be happy with the two majors they played this year. They're not going to be happy with Copenhagen. They're not going to be happy with Atlanta because they didn't make main stage at either either of those tournaments, despite coming very close. And I think if you look at some of these star players, the people we expect to pop off, there are some good performances. I think Dan's played really well this year. I think Posh is really uh, contributing a ton to the team. But then you look at players like Joystick. Three out of the five games that they played in the Atlanta Major, Joystick had three or fewer kills. Some of these players have not been very consistent, which in the past, if we're talking history, have led yeah. VP to their championships. Well, it's a, it's a big task. And the first matchup going up against Liquid of all teams this is where the conversation might change a little bit. You said they've struggled in the past. Is this the team that is going to kind of open up their day with the first three? I mean, again, it's when you look at Liquid, when you look at their entire history, and I could spend tons of time on their entire history throughout 2018 and up until now, they've always been top four contenders. They've always been a juggernaut of the Brazilian region. And now you're here on your home turf, a fan favorite. Yep. You have all of that leading into making it to the playoffs, making it to main stage and having that hype all around you. I mean, I can only imagine with players such as Paulo and Ness, that one of the longest standing duos, one of the best standing duos to do it, that they're going to be as hungry as ever coming into this game and are really going to put up a performance that we haven't really been seeing throughout the regular stage of 2023. Certainly. Comments? I mean, I think that for, for Team Liquid, this is a team that we've seen kind of have some good moments and have some rough moments. Obviously, they're here because they made it all the way to the grand finals of the Copenhagen Majors. But in stage two, they fell off the face of the map. They're honestly looking somewhat fraudulent coming into this tournament. Would you agree? Would no, you agree? No, I, I think it's a fluke. I think it's uh, I think it's I think some teams have their ups and downs. But overall, I mean, I, I wouldn't write off 
liquid in that regard by any means. I think they are still just as much of a powerhouse. You just, you know, you you, you run into hiccups. That That's very normal for a strong team. It's just a matter of fixing, and I believe they've had a lot of time to adjust and make those things that they need in order to have the successful run here at SI. All right, I'm going to jump in right now because you've actually triggered, without knowing, you've triggered a hidden mini game. That's right. It's fraud or flukesters. How this is going to work, both of our incredible talent will have 30 seconds, only 30 seconds to determine I get my why ready. they are either frauds or they're flukesters. Who would like to go first? I'll jump in. Yeah, you'll go first. 30 seconds, remember. That's Wrong. all you've got to okay. save your point. Okay. When you're ready. Thank you, Manic. Well, I only need 30 seconds because Team Liquid have struggled immensely throughout the second half of this year. They've gone through through the Atlanta Major uh, and failed to qualify already to that big event. Throughout Stage 2, they won only a single map in Tier 1 official competition. They struggled so hard, and if you watch their games, they couldn't get those attacks going. Early round attack, they struggled to find those opening picks. Looking for an opening pick from Team Liquid was like trying to find a Jinxie stream where he doesn't take his shirt Five off. Seconds. It just wasn't happening. Liquid have really failed on the attacking side of things throughout the second stage, and their map pool as well has been so, so be poor. All they you've got time for. The no, really sorry. Hey, no. He's cheating. He's Don't cheating. worry. They couldn't hear anything over uh, over the mumbles. It's okay. 30 seconds is all he had. We'll actually do a Twitch, uh, a little Twitch poll at the end of this. Uh, you cheat. Laxing, are you ready? Well, I'm going to keep it shorter than that. I won't okay. even need the full 30 seconds. You ready? I we'll start. Now. Okay, so given their SI placements in general, again, coming into 2018, they placed 9th, 12th, 2018. 2019, they were 5th, 8th. 2020, they were 9th through 12th. 2021, they were 2nd. 2022, they were 5th, 6th. 2023, they were 13th, okay. 16th. They got worse, but given by that algorithm that is currently happening, this has to be a first place finish. And I'm also chalking that up also to my career at SI, whereas I won one, Five. I played, then I got knocked out in groups, then I placed in the middle, then I placed in top three. Five. And that's and all we've got six, time for. And, yeah, that's it. That's all we've got time for. Look, I, I don't know. Did, did we sell it enough? I don't. It was thirty seconds we, enough? For okay. Me. The thing is, we're talking about SI, so I'm scratching their entire. This is stage. extra time. This is extra time. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying where this came from. I'm just saying where this came from. I'm scratching the this entire stage, the entire 2023. This is SI, and given their performance of making every single SI, this has to be a first place finish. Okay, that's like, look, I understand the math. I think you're wrong, but anyway, we're gonna go ahead and have a look at the map <laughs> videos. Let's dive into this one, because this will determine quite a bit. Uh, who wants to take okay. it on this? All right, That's, well, Clubhouse first okay. pick coming through from Liquid. Historically, the VP map. They used to love Clubhouse. Now, they have had some rocky losses uh, in the past. They lost to BDS in a 7-1 game recently. So That's... I understand where my, maybe Liquid want to go for this. And they have had some close games on it um, to begin with. And then uh, Oregon as well. Very obvious pick for VP. Yeah. You saw it on the graphics, Absolutely. their favorite map. If it's open, they're going to pick it. That's not a shocker. And then Border. There are two maps that VP have historically never wanted to play. Those were Night Haven and Border. We were assuming with best of threes at SI, we would see one of those come into play. Turns out it's Border. I really hope we get to see VP on that map. Well, it goes into what I was saying, that they use the time from Atlanta, the time off to fix anything that they needed to fix, to try out something new. And you're here at SI. You need to be trying everything in your arsenal to be getting these wins. Wins, even if it's getting you the round up, even if it's getting you the map, whatever it is, you have to be bringing everything and leaving everything on the playing field here. And I love that that is coming out of VP because as we've talked about, they don't have that strong of a map pool. They are very stagnant on what they have. Yep. So the Oregon is really no brainer to me. They've loved that map for as long as I can remember, even back when I was competing. So that should be a map that should favor them. That third map is really the toss up for me is to see because they can't play their play style. They can't play that stagnant play style. So I am really curious to see what that third map could possibly look like if we get there all right well that's all we've got time for it is time to get underway with our first map of this series we're going to liquid and of course to run you through all of the action it's a fluke and a fraud <laughs> <laughs> see i already knew this was coming because as soon as, as you were doing this you i was like it, i'm gonna be the fraud am i not as soon as the bit was going together it was like oh yeah yeah i'm gonna be the fraud hey what's up it's fluke and the fraud we're here with well, I guess the breakdown of this. Two teams that, okay, for sure, there is some history. For sure. There's some slightly wobbly performances yeah. recently, but I think this could turn into a good taste of possibility. I think that's a way of phrasing it. That's a way of looking at it, is there's a possibility of these two teams to have big performances. It starts here, though. We are back on club. Our second time here today. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, we could be getting new maps or newer maps like uh, 
Labs? Not in, no. Not in this showdown. No, not in this showdown. This isn't a Labs kind of game. No. This isn't a Labs kind of game. Clubhouse, though. It is the House of Basics. And we're going to be... The House um, of Base? I mean, basically, both of them runner-ups at an aside at some point. Yeah. Maybe, you know, not under the current organization for VP, um, but you know, the experience is definitely there. We actually, obviously, you know, in the game that we did earlier today, GT versus NIP, we said this is the lobby with the most SI champions in it throughout the whole tournament. This is the lobby with the most SI runners-ups <laughs> in it throughout the whole tournament. And you, you wish for possibility on them because the success story and what could have been and what should have been and what hasn't been hasn't always been their fault. You look at, obviously, the easiest thread of that is Virtus Pro on the right-hand side of the screen. That roster, at least four of them, when you come second place in an SI and then get dropped within about a month and a half, I think it was, you know, and then you have to spend a whole year and a half rebuilding. That's yeah. a Trying tragedy. To get to get That's a horrible to have to go through. Yeah, and of course, you know, if, if we look at the liquid side of thing, um, I mean, Nesk and Palu pop up. That was our first SI that we ever worked at that point. Memories. Uh, during, during the finals, Palu playing under some in, immense circumstances as well that day. And they just fell short against NIP back then, uh, who we had in our previous matchup. So <laughs> Liquid is one of those teams. <laughs> is that Bionicle? Yeah, but it's been around with them ever since the first game on stage. It's always there. Nice. Love Bionicle. Yeah. Love me some lore. All right, we start here. A standard map, a standard setup, and two, I mean, they can be standard teams. This is one of those conversations that you will all at home probably hear quite a lot about this, of the two main play styles of Siege that are currently floating around. One of them is the famous bit theory, is the one where it's, you know, sort of balancing out the idea of how do you product a map, how do you find it, that's modern Siege. Old school classical Siege is what you'll know this Russian yeah. roster for. Yeah, they are very tried and tested, I have to say. Like, they, they are just, they've ran the same setup, the same attack thousands of times, and they've perfected it almost, like, a hundred percent, which makes them very difficult to stop once they do finally get going. And that's always the danger with VP. Like, some people are like, okay, well, we know what they're doing. Yeah, but they're doing really good. <gasps> Crime. Crime has occurred. Fenrir, who is actually often banned, was banned in our earlier series, is here. If, you know, that, that sort of terrifying gadget, it can stop an approach unless... Nesk is able to slip their way in there with those drones that do a little tee-hee and steal the utility, steal the gadgetry. They've doubled down, in fact, on the drone power. They might have banned Flores, but they're more than happy to bring the others. Well, they've got the Twitch rolling through and just clearing this route here to Volps. He's slowed. Sort of a statement of intent there, popping that Goyo and saying, look, we know you're coming. You're not as sneaky as you want, but well, maybe always might be the one that gets caught out. The pings come through. Volps, if he doesn't know about this player on the left, there's a stack up here and it's all sort of focused onto blue. There's a route through and an escape. The air jab doesn't quite get the full read through, but look at this full send now. Reinforcements coming through, extra air jabs as well. It's definitely keeping him at bay. Nest has found himself into the armory, but the second player that's inside of Church will find him instead. Fulves looking to find a response, will find so as well. Player still behind the half bar. He's not able to respond on the side of VP. Now there seems to be this pressure, this close down here onto the site. They read that there was this roam, this extension over towards the top. You can still see Dan is above. Reset's going to try and get the plant itself. Always is pulled back. They need Dan to impact and attack. Joystick, he's about to hit a hatch. There's been being firmly watched by Lagonis, but he can't get the swing. A post-plant situation. It's on the far end of the AK. It's right on the back corner. And there's the smoke. Stop a little bit of the motion. Volps is swinging either side. Always is trying to sneak his way in. They've got to go for the pinch at the same time here with the shoulder cover of Dan. There's the swing. There's the first take. 25 seconds. They've got control along Corridor. And palu has got control of one, but always is always there for another response. There's Joystick. And they may have lost control of the site with Liquid seeing an opportunity, but Virtus Pro were able to turn that into their own. Yeah, and I mean, of course, you know, it is an opportunity that uh, that they took. They managed to get that plan down, but the control they had upon themselves was not really too too well established. 
you're playing on the A case. You have slightly control of blue, but there's still the above. There's still going to be, a, you know, the main hallway, the, the blue side of things. A lot of area where VP can go for a repeat and retake. Managed to successfully do so this time around. I think it was a good sort of push and pressure there from Liquid that they saw that, okay, they've extended themselves towards the top. Okay, they're playing this. Okay, what's this? Hey, you remember when I talked about the beginning? Old school Siege and how it can be read and it can be changed against? That is the perfect example. You yeah. expect where they're going to be. You expect how the hold is going to go and you have to give a bit of credit there because where VP have struggled before is their adaptation. Is there things are going wrong? How do we change that? How do we bite back? How do we get ourselves back into this fight? Well, there was a good read. They knew that they'd lost that position. If Always had gone into that fight, he probably would have died. If Joystick had gone into that fight a little bit earlier on the hatch, he probably would have died. They were waiting for the perfect moment to strike. That moment came after the kit had gone down, but it netted a win. And I mean, right, if the kick goes down and you manage to defuse it, there's no real problem. It's not like it will give you a disadvantage. It wins a win. Of rounds. It's just a win, right? Oh, so, Pasha. Yeah, he's being loud. It shows you how much it means to these players. And I know we've made the joke before when we saw them play, and like they hit the most insane clutch ever, and they just have the most neutral face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To this is it. a changed team. This is a changed team. But, there is okay. so much emotion there. Very, very quick okay, history lesson of SI and yeah. performances from teams from this region. Now it was once upon a time four of those names on the right-hand side of the screen and one different roster who had these huge okay, runs, who were a terrifying force in EU and obviously being able to make the distance there. Pasha was on a different roster that qualified for SI once before. Unfortunately, the yeah. team, which was Virtus Pro at the time, uh, could not go because of a COVID situation or an illness situation during the height of the pandemic. Yeah, was it the same SI that uh, NIP won? It was. It was, right? Yeah. It was. It was uh, the Paris, and they had to pull out. And this is, and Pasha is a player who's been in the scene, who has been sort of chomping at the bit. I think one of the other years he was second in the open qualifiers to get to SI. This being the first time he's been able to make it here. I so want him to pop off. As a player that we've watched toil yeah. and fight against everything and have the one chance at doing this before unfortunately taken out of his hands, we're gonna see a lot of we're gonna see a lot of passion from passion. I mean, this is the thing, right? Like SI is the dream of every player that plays Rainbow Six. hundred percent. That is this is what you work towards. That is what you work towards if you play competitive. There's nothing else that you wanna go. You wanna go to six invitational, you wanna play in front of that crowd, you wanna lift that hammer. And of course, only five players a year can do so. So it is a very tough dream to achieve. But Bomb they are just a little bit closer by just being here. Now, how will they get the rebuff this time around? Liquid, as I said, had a great read before. They saw opportunity and they tried to smash their way through here. They're getting some of the busy work done. Maverick, his pick rate has sort of flown up, but this has always been quite a good map for him. They get the electrics and the breach on the break. Palu just dipped underneath the fight and the engagement across CC window. He's not entirely going to lead that in himself. I am wondering oh. if we're going to get a bit of a charge here from the players on Jacuzzi because they haven't really done a huge amount of work elsewhere. No, but if I open up the mirror window, so Joystick's position is slightly compromised right now. Whoa! It's going to be oh! using the warding glasses to not be flashed, gets a kill on the back of it, and that really reinforces his current position out there. I think that was a little bit of a luck and a little bit of unfortunate siege timing. That is more than luck. Joystick double dips. Nesk is the response with Palu getting the even hand on the back end. Okay, three apiece, 40 seconds. There's still a lot here that Liquid can play with and manipulate. They may have lost two of, the bre uh, two of the sort of players. They've lost their hard breach, they've lost their soft, but they have a lot of guns behind them. They still have a little bit of wiggle room, and as you said, they've done the hard work. Now, can Palu on the back end cause some problems, cause some chaos, maybe get one more body? He's in a one versus one here, technically, but he doesn't know! Nesk is able to get always, but gets caught out by Pasture and Virtus Pro. Hold the line. I might have not expected a player to be that close in cash considering the pressure was, till that point, only on the site so yep. far. So he might have expected he could go on, but no, caught off. Still had the person watching the flank out there, making sure that there was no way they'll be uh, struck from the backs. And VP with a bit more of a convincing second round. This time they were able to stop that plant from, uh, from even going down in the first place.
Look at that, enjoy this. Activating I mean, it. Swing and pre-fire. Yeah. I, you know, it's a huge kill from the practice of that, but that's just unfortunate yeah, place for resets to be at that time. Because we've seen him just repel up as well. It's siege timing. It happens. It, it does happen. And I mean, like his point was always going to be to swing as soon as he activated those classes. He's like, yep. oh, yeah, Flashbang yeah. just bought. They will feel confident they have the upper hand. I'm going to be changing that and Cause bringing it trouble. into our own hand and cause some trouble. So, you know, well done. Uh, good decision made there. And it paid off in the end. And, you know, while some people might be, oh, that's luck. But he has practiced that exact same yeah, thing yeah, yeah, yeah. so many times like i'm gonna get the railing from left to right so whoever's repelled up there they lose their head you know what the you know what the best people at anything say in any sport any competition you make your own luck yeah you make your own luck you make your own luck and that that's an example which all of these players have we're not just saying the only player who has that in this tournament is in this game no every single player that's fought to this point knows those tricks knows those swings and moments They'll know that they got bit by it, but you know that Liquid is going to want to bite right back. And here it starts on CC, a site that we've always talked about is being a bit touch and go for the hole. They're putting some attention onto the back end. They're going for a bit of a logistic take. They're spreading themselves out rather than the direct push towards Jacuzzi as they did before. Palu on a solo mission on the Dockaby once again. To be fair, if Palu says, I'm going to go over here and kill people, you sort of go, okay, right. <laughs> You're going to. Good yeah, luck. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> I believe in you. Uh, just make sure you manage to get one or two out. Just use one of those phone calls basically to, to drone himself into some extent, right? Like, okay, don't hear any of the logic bombs going off right now close to me. Means I'm clear. Means I can move on. Nesk in the meantime on that top floor, making sure that bedroom is under their control so they can start pushing towards construction. And that is because they want to go for a two-prong kind of approach. You saw them opening up onto uh, the big wall on the outside with the mirror window before, and I believe they popped the mirror window and stopped the x cars from blowing up but still that's an angle now that they will have to be wary of and the rest of the team is going to try and find themselves to construction however joystick i think that is all we need to say in that situation a minute 30 and liquid still hasn't been able to get this first engagement but they have some of these loose players you don't always see a maestro out and about enjoying himself but the air holder is a hell of a gun Unfortunately, not quite enough as the catch comes round. But Joystick, as you said, he isn't too far away. He's a shoulder and a shake and a shimmy round on the corner. They're still being cautious, but not cautious enough. Joystick takes one, has the option to hit strip. Instead, goes up to Billiards to find the next fight. But it's Volps the pick up from this year to see if he can try and keep the momentum going. A minute on, four versus three. They have the man advantage, plenty of time. And as I said, the take is one across the side of construction and the wall starts its destruction. Now they do need to take care of the red staircase because right now you have the, red, uh, the mirror window on the top of the red stairs, which are just going to be a problem. The evil eye out there is going to be given away. Volks blend slightly. Gone six used to get rid of it. So no more information being fed in. But as long as that mirror window is still left up at the top of red, there is no real safe way for these players Players in construction to try and move through. Oh, that cam. I mean, this is exactly the point I was going to make. You've got Maestro Bubble. Yeah. You've got one extra Maestro Bubble now since the change. They've got three and you've got the sort of Intel of the Valkyrie and the Mirror. They are full Intel at this. Alongside the Goo Mines that'll trigger, they are more than happy to play on the reactivity. And this is where Liquid have struggled to get in. But 10 seconds, they're knocking on the door and get right pushed back. Dan sprays through, cut in the crossfire. It's a one versus three out of nothing. And that was all built on that intel, on that thread of knowing where everything was coming from. They kept on putting up new obstacles, new walls, and Liquid just could not find that breakthrough onto the site. It wasn't just VP's intel though, Emmy. Because that dog, they hacked the camera, they hacked the phone. They were the ones actually looking on the Maestro camera on that side. They knew, okay, there's two people inside of CC. There's one person on the side of red. We can go for the push right now. And, and, and Whilst they did that, whilst they opened up the mirror window, uh, weren't able to eventually get those shots off. VP uh, standing strong out there. I mean, I mean, Joystick didn't really have the full impact that they wanted to, right? Like, you won maybe two kills. But in the end, it didn't really matter that much. VP able to hold off. A little bit of a missynchronization possibly coming through. Well, three rounds in a row here for Virtus Pro, and obviously when you're sort of getting yourself set up into club as a map, into what is Liquid's map here on this situation, you go, oh, how's this going to boil together? But it was a point that was raised on the desk is this was for a long time. 
known as a Virtus Pro map. It was a great place for them to play. It was well constructed for their game. And also, oh yeah, it's Clubhouse. It is known as the default map. A lot of teams have a game here. And, you know, a lot of teams construct it in different ways. They haven't taken their time out. Liquid is sort of par for the course at this point. It's not that they've been a million miles away no, on some close. of these rounds. Different close, they just need one or two gunfire to swing the other way and they're there. And it's like, do you really want to take the time up for that right now? Because no. these players will probably know, with all the experience they have, what is going wrong and what they need to fix. So you probably will see those adaptations to come through very soon as uh, they are trying to get themselves established on that top floor, making sure there's no roamers out there before they actually hit the site. Because players like Dan are out here, are trying to cause trouble. You just need to pay attention to them. Well, will the drone game become something that slows them down a little? We're seeing an attempt now at a full catch, a full clear. They went for a quick nippy play on the first round and didn't quite have the rewards that Liquid yeah. were hoping for, even though it was close. A post-plant situation isn't anything to scoff at. Here, though, when you look at the past couple of rounds as well, they're much more sort of, okay, well, let's play the full game. Let's go for the full clear. Let's sort of get everything checked. And they're losing a lot of time. They might get the man advantage. But time is that sixth man. So here, getting the strike onto Volps with this sort of minute and a half situation left, with this drive that's continuing its way across. This is, I think, maybe one of the fastest they've been able to get that opening body. It, it has definitely been one of the faster ones. But the thing is, if you go for a full top to down clear as you come in, it, it is just oh. going to be costing you a lot of time. And Reese is now picking up joysticks. That is actually going to be a very important one. Cameras are going to be hacked as well. So any other form of intel that might be there, not that there is any, you know, besides the default cams, is going to be uh, known now for the sides of Liquid. A minute left on the clock. All they need to do now, open up these hatches, get themselves ready for the execute they want to go for. Or they go for triple wall, or they go for kitchen. But that's the only two options they really have. Sprayed through against Palu, and always is just going to pull himself back and give the structure towards the site itself. But I like that Liquid is sort of playing their own game and pace, because look at this. They have the two-body advantage. They're still getting control of the hatches itself. The wall of church is being opened up. Dan does get some control into dirt, but at the same time, the four versus three, Shepard has to do a little bit of magic here. I'm not sure where the Fenrir mines are still up, if there's one on the swing, but there's one definitely swung around onto there. Cannot get the second, Volps. He's able to keep securing bodies as Lagonis almost goes down. It's the third for Volps here, always in this clutch situation. He's dancing either side of the hard wall onto Blue. He's got a bit of pressure down onto Long, a bit of pressure down onto the swing onto Moto, and then the kit post-planted just tucked on where that breach was onto Church Wall. Finds the first. The second, as I said, is on that Moto door. There's a bit of a split approach. Oh. He downs the Gonus. It'll be very hard to get the confirmation. Oh, no, There's a big bit of confirmation. And now, as he suffers the bite against the last, he knows they're on this wall. Sprays just over the top. The rotation round to his right-hand side. The resets is trying to get himself propped up. 20 seconds. He has one flash in pocket to waste a bit. Does he know how close the fight is? Might have heard the swap, but look how resets keeps moving away. He knows exactly the game he needs to play here, and he has played it perfectly. Either side baits the time, and resets wins that round out after the huge work done by Volps. That is like almost bringing it back from that 1v3 position. And I think that the moment he picked out the super shorty and started reloading that, that's the moment when they lost it. And of course, the idea is there to go for the peak with the shotgun. If they were close, that would have been the kill confirmed and he could have gone. But it just took too much time and that allowed him to just rotate through perfectly red. I think there might have been a drone. I think there might have been a bit of intel because look at, well. look at the motions resets was making at that point. You know, he had a secure place. He had to watch onto the site. They knew where he was, but at the same time, they still got to swing for the fight. Resets motion going past the opening of the breach. You at that point will only do that if you know that they are pushing towards Moto Door. That's the only time you'd be like, this is the smarter move right now. Rather than holding the position, I can only assume there was a drone. But at the same time, he still played it perfectly. He kept his cool. He kept himself sort of in that cat and mouse game. Even at the end, just popped around. Didn't try and secure the kill on the hop on the breach. Because he's like, ah, I don't need to. There's not enough time, to. right? Yeah, exactly. Like because at that moment, when they when they jump over, there's 10 seconds left. There's only two options. Either they hunt for the kill or they start defusing. If they start defusing, you can go in after three seconds. Either you get the kill, you get killed. But then there's no more time for them to actually start that defuse. So 
With that said, uh, Liquid playing that perfectly out there. But we do have to say, it's very close actually. They're just taking the head off with that one single oh, yeah. ping Reload. over the bar. That was right next to his head. Almost. So almost got that. For VP, they lose their first round. Liquid managed to get themselves on the board after VP. Well, they've played three incredible rounds and, Reloading. you know, turned the tides multiple times. Attackers have located a bomb. Gonna see if they can try and get the breach done onto Jacuzzi Wall pretty quickly. They pulled this off last time, but for me, the problem was they didn't have anything else. Look at Vops, look at the players, look at the inside of the site. Well, they're more than happy to. Pasha goes down, Virtus Pro. The alarm bell should be absolutely screaming in the comms right now. It's suddenly just two players left. And I said they had a fast take in the first round. Well, at this point, you'd think they set up the site. They were there that quickly. It's a post plant. No, it's not. And that is fluid liquid. And that's one of those good, like, realizations, good calls to come through. It's like, okay, there's too many off site. We can overwhelm them if we're all on board with this. If we all just rush as soon as that breach hops, there's no way they can stop us. They also had, obviously, Volps pushing up main stairs yes. as well, getting into that position whilst getting the breach open and taking the one player that was on site. Beautiful read by Liquid to know what to do there. Because as I said, I was about to sort of make the point of the problem was they didn't really put any weight elsewhere. Last time they had four players on Jacuzzi and then the Docker be on the far side. I was gonna say, oh look, they've got that. And then they're like, oh, they, we'll just take the site. I was like, okay, cool. If we put a lot of weight on one side of things, we can actually maybe go through in the end. And Palu on the catch there highway, able to, uh, to find a couple. It's just, I mean, VP at the moment, they're already flooded all the way through from Jacuzzi. You're finding yourself in such a tough situation because the bedroom is a pretty defendable site as long as you hold control of the actual rooms. As soon as you lose gym, as soon as you lose the bathroom, as soon as you lose the top of the stairs, suddenly there's not a lot of positions left where you can play safely. So that is something they definitely need to keep in mind if they will be going to back to that site in the future. But for now, we are headed back towards the armory. VP not looking to complete the rotation for a second time around and go CCTV because they knew they were quite close on this bottom on floor, they just needed to change one or two small things. She has a huge, huge bit of experience as well to sort of get to the 03 position on your map and go, no, 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 we, we, we're confident, we, we can pull this back, we can sort of get the drive down. There's always that balance of whether it's the coach that sort of says, I know what my team can do, I know when these players need to have someone talk to them just based on how they're moving, how they're playing, or there's something obvious, or no, they'll work this out. It's a confidence and it's an experience, Volps. He steps into the goo mine and gives a little bit of the intel of the approach away, but they're more than happy to sort of still bait that. It's a bit of utility. You just you just traded a little bit of health for the utility. It's fine. It's not just that, but also the prox alarm that just went off. So it's like all the alarm bells just went off. Like, ah, oh, there's someone here. <laughs> not again, not again, not again, not again. He instantly fell back. He's like, I'm not going to try and take this. Fight. Look at this, though. Obviously, the last time we were here, we lost two bodies on the top floor in the set and the sort of middle area of the map. Here, Virtus Pro entirely pulled themselves down towards the site. All five players, flat as they can be, across with Joystick having the most adventure, slightly up his deck. Now they did put up a lot of barricades just to slow down the, the side of Liquid slightly and also of course gain a small bit of information like hey they right now have entered this room and they've entered the bar area, stuff like that. And as they get going, the drones uh, having a lot of extra time right now to actually do work on the site. The track stingers being caught off by the magnets. The Volps now looking around with that Bravo. It's going to be hacking one of the magnets just to make sure that utility can fly through in the future. Well, they're sort of waiting currently. The hatches, they're not quite being battened down, more blown up. The catch onto the utility that's otherwise across it and Pasha playing the Tuberau the first time we've been able to see the operator if you're new to knowing what they do well they're a little bit chilly they throw a canister that freezes things in their tracks and gives you some of the tracks on the approach but with the proxies and the bullets that quickly follow they don't really need the slowdown right now more than sort of saying come on speed it up 40 seconds and the spray against the chair is reset, stacks all the way in. They've got control of blue and there's the freeze. So as soon as they try and swing this, suddenly they'll be a bit slowed. Lagonis, he's tucked on the close plant. Hera C4 would ruin his day, but with the attention being put in from the far end, it's Shepard on the swing, gets the plant at 20 seconds. Now he's holding himself behind the table. He's waiting to see if a new face tries to show up and get the kit. It's Parley when resets with one apiece, but they haven't got the man that stopped it before. They're double stacked. Second again, joystick. 
gets another round for Virtus Pro and make sure that they keep their advantage into the second half. Well, not even double stack, triple stacked at some point, but one of them got taken out. It's like, and as well, Shepard there in the first moment, they realized as they went through, but before that, let's just uh, quickly go for a mid half call in. We got a mid half call in with <laughs> Jesse on the line. Hello, Jesse J. Chick. Hello, Emmy. Hello, Hap. Listen, I've come in to uh, perhaps warn the people because although I did come into this series predicting Virtus Pro to come out on top, and although they had a great first half, 4 2 split, not bad at all, this is a map that we've seen VP struggle to attack a lot in the past. Throughout stage two, Clubhouse was Virtus Pro's most played map. Despite that fact, they struggled on attack. 41% overall win rate attacking this map through stage attack two. And Liquid, for their point of view, have never lost a defense through stage two on this map. Now, that's because they didn't play this map. So, big caveat on that. <laughs> However, that still does lead into things. They've clearly been hiding some stuff. VP may not know what to expect, which may make their attacks even more questionable. So, although I do think VP win this series, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that they only got four rounds in that first half. Well, Thank you very much, Big Brain Canadian. And away he goes. I don't know where to. I don't know either. They Are keep you? analysts and casters very separate. Yeah, just put them back in the jar. Put in, in the <laughs> jar? <laughs> He's small enough. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't need like an entire... Jesse looks like he could be tall, and they started putting him next to Lax, and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> the ram going through is going to be opening up quite a little bit of the kitchen. He came in and said really good, interesting points. And he was like, yeah, Jesse Small, lol. <laughs> I mean, he said, they've never lost a defense in stage two. Why did he sound play. like that to you? No, that what he sounds like no, to you? No, 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 just not what he sounds like. Okay. Yeah, he does. I it was know. a great impression. Thank you. That's what he sounds like to me. Sure, yeah. <laughs> a minute-ish has gone-ish, but so is all the Liquid players. They have fallen their way back towards the site. We saw it as the final hold there of VP, where they sort of held everything close to their chest. You can play it. It's how it was traditionally played way back when, before we sort of had the extension, the roam, the play around the space, because there's a lot of space down here. There's a lot that needs to be taken control of. There's a lot of hatches. And the bait onto where to do it has slowed Virtus Pro down quite a lot. As I said, pace might have been an issue before, but VP are a slow and steady team. They are using the ramps to try and speed up some of the clear on it. They're going for the break here on towards the opposite end. Volps isn't quite gonna get the impact of the angle on the first, but we'll go for the second and maybe the third set. Yeah, I mean, the second set soon to be deployed. And that is, of course, the, when you really want to make sure it's not going to be opening up. But another Bugi is starting to come through. It's a lot of sound that is uh, being emitted right there by the device, but also opening up all those angles, making it really unplayable for the players down below. You don't know when you are going to be uh, well, swung at from those angles that are opened up. Exothermic to be used on one of the hatches as well, just to make sure that the uh, well variety of options is going to be there for Brutus Pro, but also the amount of pressure points that they could utilize when the final execute finally will hit. And if you look at how they set up, well, a lot of hatches have been opened up, so it seems like it might be a normal armory plant. I mean, they love to do the play that they're sort of building towards. They love to do that structured hold here, and that's the take and the setup. There is a lot, including the mute jammers, behind that church wall. You've still got Lagonas pretty comfortable and confident with that wall solid onto dirt. So it it's going to be a little bit of an awkward push in because, well, they don't have control of any of the swings. Pasha has to try and force some of this church wall to make it a bit safe to drop down onto the back end. 20 seconds left. Joystick finds the first. They've finally gone for the break onto the church wall here. They're going to swing into the fight in a second. The flash has come around the corner, but with time ticking, they swing into their own flash. Drop down onto blue. The double down swing from Reset gets the destruction inside Moto. Tucked around. Can't find the fight. They're a little bit lost. His liquid just stepped into the space they claim. Dan's a little bit too late to the party because there might be four players, but there's that many seconds and they just run out of time. And just look at that, it, it, just everything kind of falls apart. This moment that first flash hits, resets, allowed to go for a double peak, take down Bo, get into motorcycle as well, whilst the third player is starting to come through. And it's, it's just... Unfortunate there for the side of Virtus Pro how that round eventually played out because it seemed like they were starting to get into the right path and then it all just broke down. All right, good start here from Liquid, but what changes?
can come through from the side of Virtus Pro because time is a cruel mistress, but no crueler than on this side. When you've sort of baited them into the full clear, the others are much more direct routes through and they're able to win a couple of their engagements, but when only one engagement going away from you sets the sort of style you're down for and you don't have the time to reconstruct, I, I mean, it turns into that nightmare situation. And it fe fell to that point that the opening from the triple wall actually hurted them because they lose one to reset. Then you see the Habana turn around. It's like, oh, wait, there's an opening there. I need to be watching as well before someone pops out. Get shot in the back. And it's like they, you just lost the entire flank out there because you were both taken down due to a faulty flashbang. And again, it is unfortunate the way that that round played out in the end for Virtus Pro because it felt like they were building him quite nicely. It started like they were getting some good control. And then it crumbled. We talked a little bit about passion of the players earlier on, and I know it for one of the teams, but let's be real. It goes without saying it's liquid here. Liquid on their home soil. Liquid with a Nesk and a Palu who have been fighting and biting for this chance for the Dawn of Siege. Being able to claim that sort of trophy position, being able to claim that lead in position from the side of things in front of a home crowd, you cannot imagine a team that is as fueled up. And yeah, you know, there's sort of a lot of strong teams, especially from the Brazil region. There's a lot of huge potential. I mean, there's the current two-time major reigning champions that are in contention. But I think if you will see anyone that is fighting to the end of this possibility, you are looking at Team Liquid players. And people, even on socials, they keep saying like, when? When are they finally going to win it? They keep getting so close every now and then. Fulps open it up. It's going to be a great start of this CCTV round for uh, for Liquid. I mean, they are here at this major because of the run at one of that at one of the run majors. Even they're here at SI. Oops, Pasha. Slips happen. Workplace accidents happen. Oh. Oh. Well, it's definitely a way to finish it off. <laughs> yeah, there's a great take from Volps, who has been tearing through some of these rounds. He seems to have these big triple kill, quad kill rounds and, and gets that pace going for the roster and the team here. A two versus five. And they've sort of fallen to bits on this approach onto what is supposed to be the most sort of standard and known attack. And it does seem to uh, be the... Fault, like the faulting kind of attack in the intercom, just everything going away. I mean, just look at the breach as well. It's just not completely Ooh. done right. Shepard will find Volps though, as he did decide to jump through the wall again or through the little gap to get back towards the site. So definitely an opportunity for VP to bring it back slightly. They need to work together though. They need to be that two men pushing up, making sure that they work towards that same goal. And as they are on the rafters, they might actually have the opportunity to locate one, maybe even isolate two of these players into straight up one-on-one -on -one fights. But they do need to win them if they want to have the opportunity. And the big danger is still in the player that's in construction, but Palo being below as well, having the opportunity to just deny that plant with the C4. And with 10 seconds left on the clock, Shepard taking damage, wanting to go for a plant. He doesn't know what to do next. And as now his cover down below falls, it is Liquid that equalized the score. For a piece, and they are a team with a fire. So, as I was sort of highlighting towards the middle of that round, of all the teams here at SI, only five of them have been at just one of the two majors we've had this year. And two of them have been from Brazil, and one of them is Liquid. Oops. Yeah, there's a frustration. That's, I mean, it's rough. It, it, it's the toughest stage. People are going to make mistakes. People are going to make slip ups. It happens. It, it's beyond frustrating for anybody. Their run at one of these two competitions, getting themselves second place to W7M was enough to get them here. When they make it, they can be ferocious. Apart from last SI, yeah. where they got off to a bit of a bad start. Got off to a bit sto uh, bad start indeed. And uh, but this is also the thing about Virtus Pro, like either they're just like playing like the stars align, or they're just 
just not getting over the finish line every single time. Like, they, they bring close matches. It's not like they get 7-0, 7-0, 7-0. No, it's always like the 7-5, 8 7, 7 5 again. It's like just not able to get things across the finish line. And, and of course, that is frustrating for themselves as well, but that's why they need to get the strong start right now. They just need to try and get themselves with an early map one victory. Now, Claymore's being set up to uh, prevent any runouts from happening, of course. It is Virtus Pro trying to get themselves ready as they start opening up on the uh, cash and CCTV side of things. Holding on with the C4, ready for the approach on towards the break of the mirror window. You sort of play this position so you're ready to clip the edge of it, get the pop onto the wall and put the pressure down, the spray down on towards oh. it. There what are you goes. owing? C4 double kill. Oh, just a single one to come just through. Just a single. But, yeah, I mean, that, that was what we were eyeing up. They open it up, and as Dan Wolf find responds into Nesk, it's still that you've lost your Maverick, however. Now, Pasha, if they really want to be going down in from this side, would have to use some of his Xcars to open up. And you now there is still two players out there, so is that decided to go for a bit of a different route. Joystick entering from the garage will be followed up by Pasha as well. They'll be taking it from a, you know, alternate angle at this point. Okay, well, the time is still steadily ticking. We're always going to have these late sort of moments between these two teams on this map, which does make me really curious about what a board is going to be like, because you sort of are forced yes. into engagements quick. And the sort of comparison I would make with some of these players was, Virtus Pro, I could be wrong about this, and I'm sure the other EU heads might be shaking their heads. Were they a good coastline team? I think they were. As a comparison to an aggressive Finn map. I mean, they were a part of the... We're talking about like the old empire, right? Because we're they, talking about the players that are in. Yeah, this they, they were part of the longest ever match that took they place. Were. It was like 12, 10 or something like that. And in the year afterwards, they actually took revenge on G2 by, I believe it was a 7 1 or 7 2 victory. So I, I would say they're pretty decent at coastline. Okay. I'm glad my vague recollections of four years ago of Steve's <laughs> when two of the people sat in our talent room way beyond it were players. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, Part of that game. Was, uh, <laughs> so I would love to see them on a border because I want to see if they still have that sort of pace. They still have because I personally think that those two maps can handle in a similar way. You can go for these quick takes. Talking of Lagonis, he's going to swing for two. He gets one though, which to be honest, with three guns swinging at you, it's still a good take. Pasha moves in behind the slightly deconstructed wall there. There's always getting his second for the round. The last two players, one tucked right onto the corridor, watching for Dan's hop in. And there's Paul, Palu getting always on the back end. Dan, he slinks and slivers his way across. Pasha doesn't want to go for the plant, but he goes for the player instead. Volps is all that's left. As I said, he's had a huge impact on some of these rounds. The down onto one, a one versus one, and only six the seconds bailiff. left, and it's Volps! With the bailiff as well, swaps over to the pocket shotgun. There's only six shells in there, able to find both connections. And that is definitely a bit of a tilter for Virtus Pro out there because they had the control, they could go for the plant, and at that moment, it's just that little, little, little shotgun that comes through, which is only used for landscaping usually, this time used to close around. Timeout as well to be called by Virtus Pro. I said it just before in the previous round, he has been that impact factor. Yes, he's well, at the time, wasn't sort of the most bodies to his name, but over the past couple of rounds, that one especially, if he can get a win in the column, that is all that matters. And what a bite back in this has been for the side here of Liquid. Five to four, three rounds tied in a row, and I said it halfway through the first half. Oh, Liquid, they're 0-3 down. They're not taking their time out. They got the trust that things can go right. Virtus Pro, oh, They've just gone 0-3 down. They think they need to change something. Yeah, and especially, I mean, the sort of two rounds, they're like, okay, that one, they had quite some control. They, again, went quite well. That bailiff is just, you saw it in the faces as soon as it happened. It's like the hands go up and it's like, what are we supposed to do against that? It's, it's, 10 seconds to go. Because Forbes was just in the right position at the right time. Three shells left. Dumped them all uh, into the body of Pasha out there. It's, look at that. I bet you there is going to be so many good, like, B-reel shots of players popping off at this event. There is definitely going to be a lot of uh, pop-off shots that we're going to see. I don't know if it's something that is, like, said, so I'm not going to be the one that accidentally says it in broadcast, uh -huh. about 
how many people are going to be in the audience. Five seconds left before it's a lot. So yeah, I don't know if it's like <laughs> a, we're releasing the numbers or we're building to a social media. I don't know if that leaks it. But I am so, so excited. Very excited as well. These teams, I don't even I don't even know if they're ready. Even if it's their home region, I don't think they know how huge things are gonna get. It's and I I wanna see it. It's been a long time since we've had the Portuguese chant overshadow everything else. There's always like the hardcore Brazilians yeah, yeah, yeah. everywhere. You can paint this picture from every event we've gone to all around the world. There is a Brazilian contingency that will travel with it, whether it's players, whether it's sort of teams, whether it's fans, it doesn't matter where you are, whether it is 12 people, whether it's 50 people, whether it's 120 people, or even two. Or even two. They're always the loudest in the room. They will be the voices of the room. There was Berlin, where there was a balcony of Brazil versus an arena of EU chanting back and forth against each other in the finals. <laughs> and it was even, if not, I was a little bit more hyped for the Brazilians. <laughs> that was such a, like, a cool feeling. It was well. amazing. Just sitting in the middle of that. The drive on through towards the site here, Virtus Pro. They're trying to make up for some of the lost time. As I said it before, they sort of didn't leave themselves a huge amount of wiggle room when things went wrong in the previous round. The Ram does speed up the process here. They have all the eyes down towards a B drop, but it's not just those eyes that matter because if you don't have control of the swing around the back of the dining table from church, well then as soon as you hit that hatch, you'll probably get hit by one of the two C4s that's in pocket, as well as if you don't have anything onto dirt. You have to choose one or the other, whether it comes from pressure from dirt or blue, you need to make sure those angles get forced. They're going for the church take. They're going for the break. Open onto this wall and the bandit. Oh, tragic timing. It is tragic timing. Reset takes a little bit of damage from the MK14 above. However, you've just lost a bunch of those Xkyros. Not sure how many Pasha still has left in pocket. If this changes the plan at all, because you see Shepard, he's ready up above on the kitchen hatch. Has the, uh, the crossbow ready to send some incendiary bolts, but also the smoke bolts to aid himself in the push. But Palu might be coming quite clutch here as he does activate his glasses so he can look through the smoke. There he is. He's up on top of the top box and he sees the player drop right back down. Nesk is able to get one of his own. And as I said, if they've got free reign to freely reign over the that's drop. Well, there's not much else you can do. The C4 came over, but not before Palu had it, and not before Liquid. They don't care about the timeout. All they care about is getting themselves to map point. And I feel like in this round, Liquid allowed a lot more of the setup from Virtus Pro to happen without really challenging it. The hatch opened up. The floors open up. Well, there's no real fight going back through because they knew they're going to try and go for an execute. As long as we keep this triple wall shut, they're going to have to go for plan B. And their plan B would be to go for the hatch drop on the kitchen, which was watched by Parler with those glasses on. So they kind of they kind of forced Virtus Pro into that way. It's like, yeah, you can open up the entire kitchen and everything that has to do with it. Just not this triple wall. It's like, this is for your real estate? This you cannot have. <laughs> this? Yes. This? No. Yes, exactly. And, and they fell for it. It went for the exact same thing that they were allowed to do by Liquid. Wow, one round separates Liquid from being able to push this game from what was 4-2 down to now four rounds tied in a row and setting themselves up for the success before we head over to potentially Oregon. There it was, Nesk got the catch to said, you have to make sure you get control somewhere else and Virtus Pro just could not force that first engagement, could not force that first fight. All of those power positions I talked about, inside blue, inside dirt, inside church wall, Liquid just held on to them, and yeah. there didn't seem to be the second setup to take care of it. Tubera, he's back in the top corner. Palu is going to be bringing the operator. Now, we've, I sort of lightly talked about Zoto Canisters and what they can do, but also heck of a kit. A DMR on your defense sets you up for some success alongside the C4, and you've got what is a very explosive and throughout this tournament probably oh, frequently banned player. The gunner just moves back out, but it was a claimer just being set up as he moves through. But back towards that kit, it is the .50 M4 that Maverick otherwise has, but the M4 uh, carbine is just a little bit better. High fire rate works, a little bit. works better in the in the way that's being used, whereas in defense you want to hold off these tight angles. So those, you know, in those cases, the DMR often is better indeed. But the amount to just slow down everything is insane. 
Well, that's it. They have the possibility of freezing the canisters Reloading. onto the wall. So as you deploy them, it will instantly freeze all of the gadgets that it's up against for longer than you feel like it should be. Pockets falls and double seconds, sets of seconds. And you've just got to sort of wait and sit. Maverick can burn his way through. Sure, all the defenders can at any point shoot the canister. The freeze will disappear. Whatever was in motion before, like breaching charges, will finish their rotation. They will not be destroyed. Merely paused as everybody takes a breath. Though, you partner it with a bandit, you partner it with a Kaid, some sort of electricity that can be deployed. Well, that will kick in first. Oh. Nesk taking a beautiful shot down onto Dan as he spotted out the player that was on the balcony. As he uh, shuts him down, it is now going to be a bit of uh, pressure arriving from Virtus Pro onto the garage. As they're starting to uh, to try and open up even more, you can really see what the, um, what the what the plan is here from the side of Virtus Pro. They want to get that garage under control. They need to get the garage under control, and afterwards uh, they can try and get themselves into the actual breach. As Nest stands up, finds another, knows about the player that went through, but gets help from above. Takes down always as well, and it's just falling apart. It's only up to Joystick now. Well, Joystick, he has the world of pressure on his shoulders and the world to do in front of him. He doesn't do any of it. Resets is the one to reset this game. They pulled it back. I'm not going to say from the death, but they definitely were missing an energy in the opening few rounds. And they screamed back into towards the rest of the half. Virtus Pro, even with a timeout, could not bring any of that back into their favor. And yeah, it's club, but you're heading to, if anyone had a sister site, Oregon as the follow-up. Yeah, it's going to be one of those other kind of default kind of game styles to come through. And where Liquid weren't really in the game those first three rounds, they definitely were as the second half went through. And that's a scary foresight for Virtus Pro. And that's all that they can sort of look forward to at this point, because even if you get through this, you're then at Porto. You're then at this aggression. You're then at this horrible sort of place that's going to be very thin, very fast, and very sort of aggressive. And talking about those things, I think we'll throw it to our desk. Who are some of those adjectives after this quick break?
Well, a 4-2 first half of VP. It falls by the wayside. Liquid, they've run away with it. Yeah, I mean, Jesse, the first map didn't look so fraudulent to me, so. Okay, okay, listen, BO3, you wanna win your map picking the decider. Liquid have done the first step of that, but it's still plenty more siege to be played. Of course you got something to say back to that. Anywho, <laughs> talking about VP specifically, that map, I mean, the good thing that was for Liquid specifically is they ran away with nine of those opening kills out of those 11 rounds. I mean, that's massive for Liquid. VP, like granted, they did win those first three rounds with the man disadvantage. So, I mean, they were clearly still playing, working together. We're seeing big plays from Pasha, uh, big plays from Dan as well. But you need to be getting those first engagements going in your favor because that way, especially on defensive half, you aren't trying to flex people and try to switch into positions because the second you start losing someone, you're losing control somewhere else. And Liquid started to ramp up as the rounds were continuing on. And then we were just watching Liquid run away, run away with those rounds. Now, looking at like the bigger picture of, you know, the scoreboard, it doesn't look too stark contrast, right? It doesn't look like it's been a blowout for no, Liquid. not by any means. Yeah. You said halfway through the show, Jesse, you said that, you know, you were a little bit worried. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, sometimes you say things as an analyst, sometimes you say things as a commentator, it comes to fruition and you go, oh, I'm pretty good. But it was nearly exactly how you had uh, prefaced it. Yeah, I mean, stats don't lie, right? I mean, we're coming here onto Clubhouse. This is a map that uh, we've seen Team Virtus Pro play a ton throughout recent times, throughout Stage 2, and they've always had problems on their attacking half. Now, especially in a meta where attacking is even harder than it was in Stage 2, my worries were that we might see those old tendencies come back in. And of course, they didn't win a single attack for that second half of the game. So I, I think for VP, you know, this is a map they're very comfortable on. It's a map they love their defenses on, but they've got to figure out what's been going wrong on these attacks. It has been consistent for many, many months now. Maybe it's just not a map that they can continue to rely on as heavily, or maybe it's a map where they need to come back and maybe rework those attacks. I don't know, but they got to get it figured out. Now, I'm going to ask you because, you know, you made the comment halfway through and then it, it obviously followed through. Mm -hmm. Did you see anything in particular on their attacks that, that were concerning that raised those red flags? I mean, we started with some questionable uh, things going on, right? Round number seven, they're attacking Church. Shepard blinds himself with a flashbang and loses the fight. We saw somebody fall off a roof. Like, there were some goofy things going on for the first couple of attacks um, where they struggled to even open maybe the CC wall with the uh, C4s that were coming through and the mirror windows that were coming through. Um, but I think later in the round two, when we started to see those final couple rounds on Church and on CCTV, we started to see some Capital play coming through that just wasn't getting very much value. The basement attack with Capital, they try to smoke the plant there's a warden sitting in sight completely shuts it down then the rafters the very last round they try to use those fire bolts to force nesk out of rafters what happens they get caught in magnus he gets a 3k so i really do think there's some specifics when it comes to the cc wall and when it comes to specific ops like capital where they were struggling um and it's just a shame that they weren't even able to find maybe one squeak out round to make that happen and what's tough about those rounds and from like a player perspective it's those initial gunfights like one gunfight could have heavily swung that favor back into vp's hands but because they were just losing the man advantage and then losing another person. It then just sets you up for that success for the other team of forcing you out of positions that naturally you should be holding that are a lot stronger, but because you're losing these people, you just don't have the numbers to keep working with everyone in a unison that you'd have had had you had those extra people up. Now, we are moving across to Oregon next. So yep. do we, are we concerned? Because, you know, so, the two maps, you know. I don't want to say, so like both with Clubhouse and Oregon, I've even said this during the regular stage, I've said this during Atlanta, these are two maps that are very default. There's nothing that you're going to do that should really surprise somebody. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that you're going to pull out of your hat and be like, whoa, we've never seen that. It's more so just like staying what you know, what works for you, and figuring out maybe the small, minute details that you can change within that strat, whether that's bringing a shield somewhere else, whether that's putting, you know, what, what are certain traps, whatever that is, just in a different location from what they were prior. That's what's really going to set the tone and make the difference for me on a map like such as Oregon. It's just a small change, not a gigantic change. I said at the start, I really wanted to see what VP looked like on border, and I ain't worried because I'm pretty sure we're going there. Oregon is a super strong map coming through from Virtus Pro. They're undefeated in Tier 1 this season through four contests, beating Heroic, G2, BDS, and Wolves, all domestic, of course. And for Team Liquid, while it was a strong map for them back in Stage 1, they played it for their opening game in Stage 2 against E1 Sports, and they only got two rounds. 
I think ultimately, Jesse just doesn't want to be a fraud. I think that's the biggest <laughs> thing here and why he's like really holding out here is because I'm not if Liquid wins, as I do see possible, you just don't want to be a fraud and you don't want me to call you a fraud, but it's going to happen. It will. It will. We, we will worry. both Listen. sit here and we will both call you a fraud. Absolutely. We'll get to map three. We'll have this conversation. Okay. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of praying for it. Uh, look, I, I think at the end of the day for me, when we move to Oregon now, you know, much of the conversation we're having there, uh, is there concerns that it will echo? Like, are, are we genuinely concerned that the the struggles that we see from VP, mm -hmm. are they going to echo? I know, I know that this is a good map for them. Yeah. Does that at all worry you, concern you? This is, obviously, they've lost many rounds in a row. They're on a losing streak in terms of rounds. But this is also a roster that has been in the most yes. stressful positions a Rainbow Six player can possibly find themselves. I don't think, even though it's first day of event and sometimes things get out of whack, I don't think VP fold over and die on, on Oregon. I don't think that's reasonable. I think if we do see that, that'll be a huge shock and we will really be starting to question, okay, VP, bring it back together. This is their home. They're going to be comfy. They've been in much more stressful positions than this. I think they'll be okay. And even in in terms of play styles, I mean, Oregon is a map that this would heavily favor their play styles in terms of that slow, dynamic, methodical play and forcing a team into the wrong position. I definitely think that does favor VP going into this where they don't necessarily have to be going straight gunfight for gunfight. They can hold angles, they can force angles, they can do what they need to do to set them up for set themselves up for success. Yep. But ultimately, I think what they're gonna need to do is they're gonna have to shut down Volps. Volps yes. was an absolute menace that last game. And if he keeps that up, and that's the beauty about everyone on Liquid in general, is they all can pop up at any given time. When you look at Palu, you look at Ness, those are the two players you hear, but then you got Volps just absolutely demolishing VP that last map. Now, coming back to you on this one, for the, you know, we were talking about opening kills being a little bit of a concern. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're now moving on to Oregon. I believe it's VP starting an attack. Yes. Do you consider this to be an alarm bell? Um. I wouldn't say necessarily. I think, I think again, Jesse said it best. You know, this is a team that has tons of experience. They have sure. tons of things that they need to do in order to get things back and going instead of just giving up. So I think it's just a matter of recognizing where those mistakes happen. And that's the beauty of a best of three is you can learn from that first map and implement that going into the second. Ah, yeah, we love the SI format, don't we? Yes. That's it. Best of threes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we're only a third of the way through the day, but it is time to get on the way with Oregon. We're going to go across to the incredible commentators and Emmy and Hap. Aww. No longer a fraud. No longer a fraud. You graduated from being a fraud. I graduated to hat. Now, come on. Oh, you can see me. Yeah, I can see you. I can hear you in my... Oh, that's as well. I'm supposed to be duo. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not a fraud. <laughs> I'm the fraud at Siege. We are going into Oregon. Will we find out about true fraudsters? Well, it's down to you, Virtus Pro. Still a pretty even prediction here, even after what has happened in the previous map, even this being Virtus Pro's map. There seems to be, uh, you know, a feeling of par for the course between these two teams. Well, no, fun stat. What? Fun stat? Yeah, all right. Treat Both me. of these teams over the last year have had a 50% win rate on attack uh -huh. and a roughly 70% win rate on defense. Now, that can both be true here. Not both teams can have seven. No, seven that numbers. doesn't equal 100%. No, that doesn't equal 100%. If I put, if I put the two numbers together... That's 220 or something, 240. It, but it's just too high. But that might mean that whoever has the best attacking half could take this map home. Wow. Liquid, again, removing the Flores. Don't want to go up against what is a pretty powerful operator in the right hands, and they think Virtus Pro are definitely the right hands for the use of the drones, and the same response is the Candelas. We saw a couple of quick executes that came out from Liquid on the previous maps. There are some very quick executes you can do with Ying here. You're looking at maybe the push onto blue and barrels. If you're holding on the defense, you're looking at the push and the pressure on towards double window if they're holding up in dorms. Yep. But by Azami as well, one of those like sort of five powerful defenders, the architect, gone. Fenrir two, so a couple of changes in the bands. And I, you know, there's about five defenders at the minute and you sort of go, I wish I could ban all of them. You can't remove them all, so you have to make a decision. <laughs> yeah. It's choosing whether you want to die from being poisoned, being being shot, being pushed. I mean, most of them shoot you. Mm. But it's like Valkyrie as well. It's one of those like powerful operators. Just Solace in the right hands. Solace in the right hands. Fenners. What? Fenrir. Oh, I was going to say Fenners. <laughs> Which operator is that? <laughs> But yeah, no, Fenrir also uh, he's, he's, he's Ollie's crutch. <laughs> what? Exile Trucker. 
Oh, is that how he says it? Well, I mean, it's... I'm sorry. Uh, this is me doing UK bits. Throwing and UK words. Your fellow UK members on the bus. Just throwing UK words out there and, re and remembering that you're Dutch. Yeah. And don't understand humor, mate. <laughs> Only driving cars really fast. Yeah, I know, I know. Dutch yeah. people are very good at that. Not all Dutch people. I mean, we had Nick de Vries. Okay. For like a couple races. Okay, yeah. Oh, oh. Things are evened out. Liquid could send this down in a 2-0 with Virtus Pro trying their best to hold this off and push us on towards border. Now, they start on attack where things did not quite work out. And it's not that they were a million miles away, but by the end of the game, it definitely felt like they were getting yeah. there. They were on a downward trajectory. There's no sort of two ways about that throughout the second half of club. I mean, the first three rounds, they managed to all win. And after that, one more round in the eight that were played after. So it, it, it was definitely a bit of a unfortunate series of events how that played out for Furtis Pro. But they have a way to come back now, to, to basically push themselves to border, bring the aggression to the table. As we're now, of course, playing on Oregon, still one of those basic maps. There is still some step-by-step -step plans, quite linear as well in how it plays out. But it does mean that whoever does those basics best is going to be landing themselves with this map victory. It has got itself a position where it can be a little bit shorter, a little bit sharper on the approach. They're still feeding and filtering the information that's coming from, well, mainly the Valkyrie and the pockets of Nesk, who on Oregon is just always one of those one of those operator and player combos where you're like, oh, this is triggering a lot of flashbacks to huge moments. Now, hatches are being opened up, not really being contested whatsoever due to the fact, of course, no Kate being brought currently. So that means that those hatches will open up. But fortunately, that doesn't mean defeat in this map because those drops are very difficult to fight around, especially if you look at the E-Box drop. The wall has been opened up to the side. Nesk has the opportunity to just swing around a Shiko door and try and put some pressure elsewhere just to make sure that that drop is not safe. So as a result, Virtus Pro now need to take barrels because you cannot really have a player that's inside of blue who play the way they currently do as Paolo finds the first kill to Joystick. Just swung round onto the bottom of tower stairs as well. And as the wall gets popped open with pillar control still in their favor, having to get a second player into that position. Yeah. You've done the work Attackers elsewhere, but you don't quite have the support to go for the full confidence. Send it. Here is that confidence in the pockets of potentially Pasha, who wants to bounce some of these blinds towards that pillar player here. But the fire is keeping Shepard at bay. It slows down and importantly, wastes the utility that we've seen pop before. The EE1D, the first one was let's send it. And then suddenly, Liquid put the walls up. The first was made of fire, the second's made of wall, and a little bit of a smoke canister. They swung their way in, but that difference of 15 seconds here has caused problems like this. Lagonis gets one with the E1D, uh, not the E1D, the cat cat trap, even the EDD. They've been able to fight their way through onto this power position, but you're still looking at just a swing round. There it is, the first, the second, a flawless from Liquid. A flawless from Liquid and one to check off of the bingo card, actually, with that Capkin kill to come through. Ah, oh, fresh is bingo. <laughs> Tick it off. Oh, that was a brutal round for the side of, of Furtis Pro out there. They had the right idea when they wanted to push blue. They, they went in. Yeah. They had the uh, E on D to go off. They had the finger boost to stop them from being flashed by themselves because, I mean, it's, it's one of those more intricate kind of, uh, you know, effects of the adrenaline surge, flashbangs wear off much faster, which means that if you get flashed by your teammate, it doesn't really matter right. that much. So you have the opportunity to just walk in front of a flash because it will be fine. But as Palu starts uh. it off like that, I mean, that's just an average Palu shot, right? It's like, there's <laughs> nothing too much about it. I just completely ripped the card. They're trying to go for a plan, but... That was never gonna last. I mean, th that's one of those rounds that's textbook siege for me. Yeah. You look at how that is played, and it's broken out in a step-by-step, -step, perfectly measured basis. Now, the take was Virtus Pro pushing from blue. As you said, they're a bit short, they're a bit sharp. They have the E1D going in. They're just sort of taking it step-by-step, room-by-room. Yeah. They're looking at what is in their immediate front with the power of hoping they can get it with a bit of a strike. What was the response that we got through from Liquid? Well, they had the E1D, so let's just pop this Goyo canister. And then, as the Goyo canister was about to run up, there was a smoke canister that followed it round as well. So suddenly, Virtus Pro, I mean, yeah. you do a 3-2-1 count, 
before you pop that E1D. They're a team that will do that. Not every team will, but we know that they are a set up and take team. Yeah. Liquid know that just as well. That one bit of disruption disrupted about 25 seconds. So when it came through to the next push, suddenly the E1, uh, the ED, that's twice now. It's 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 annoying because it's it is. E one D and E D D. Like the Dang it, denial Ubisoft. of device and well, I mean the entry denial device was first. Darn it. I'm just I'm just saying Either way. E D D was uh, and and those mistakes <laughs> happen and liquid they pull back, they built the wall back up, they reinforced blue. Yeah. The surprise strike was perfectly red. I think you know you only waste a couple of seconds by um, you know, reinforcing that wall because the player sees it, has to go back, go for a different approach. But that's the more important part, have to go for a different approach. The plan suddenly has been disrupted. The information they were acting upon and that they actually went for is no longer accurate. So you've just went for an execute with that incomplete information. And you find yourselves not having all the cover you needed to go for that plan. They just start losing. They have personalized tile. But he's using Lagernus's. He's using Lagernus's tile. Nesk, come on. Nesk is using Lagernus's tile. Maybe Nesk just uses everybody's tiles and Lagernus was is he sick having, of it. Ha, is he giving it back now? Is like Lagernus passing it back along? Lagernus was like, man, stop using my towels. It's got my name on it. And I've Nesk, told you to stop Nesk using like, towels. You should stop buying the best towels. Stop buying the softest towels. It's like, I really like your towels. I really like your towels. <laughs> it's like, buy your own towels. It's like, no, well, I mean, I could. Maybe it was a gift from someone. It might have been a gift from Lagonis. Do you think? Oh, do <laughs> that. Imagine, like imagine gifting someone a towel with your own name on. Whenever you lift a next trophy. Whenever you, <laughs> whenever you look at that, you'll remember that I got you that. Um, so we are just on a quick tech uh, pause. If you haven't noticed, you can see the players. They cannot talk to their coach. They cannot talk at all, apart from to themselves, I guess, if they're feeling yeah, a, the a little bit fun. Or the referee. Because we have seen players like sing and things during this. And oh, I mean, is that a workaround? Is singing counting as talking? What? Is singing counting as talking? If you cannot talk. I'm not a ref. Okay, if you cannot talk to, to your team, yeah. can you sing to your team? I don't <laughs> think so. But I, I, don't know I, if I wish talk I would communicate. I wish you could. This I think that because I would love to legal. hear. I'm actually going to. It would be gonna... like Eurovision, <laughs> which is a singing competition, if you don't know of its existence. I do know, actually. Uh, yeah, well, you're from Europe. Oh, really? This was, that was a mainly a segue to explain a Eurocentric thing to the rest of the world. But I'm glad that you know what it is as well. Europe based hap. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm quickly trying to find if it's just communicate or talk in the rule book. Are you actually are reading the rule book? I'm going to read the rule book right now. You know, there's some players that have never done this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do uh, League Ops as well for Ben Lux. So I'm, I'm very used to reading rule books. And I used to protest everybody and go for So I'm. Okay, well, now all that sympathy is gone. <laughs> Unless you, like. Well, I, 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 okay. Fair enough. I stayed it with the protest. I don't want the free win. I just want them to upload their moss next time. That's literally... I wasn't doing it for the free win. Oh, you did it because of missing moss? I was, no, not just that, but also okay. like other stuff. Like right. bad words being said. Like <laughs> tell them to stop doing that. Stop it. It's like I don't need That's the win. Help. I just I just want... I like the idea of you being like... Oh, well, that's, going in, that's going in the report. You are being reported. Where's your moss files? I played... Um, the last thing that I played that required Moss uh -huh. Files was with other members of Talent. Tactical Talent. Including Dez, including F Fresh, including Easy, the Observer. We lost. Um, and, I, and I said, should we upload the Moss Files? And the ref said, no, don't worry. Um, you didn't play well enough. <laughs> so that's kind of... Of a shame as well. There's something <laughs> about technical timeouts, but I don't see anything about technical timeouts. All right, we're singing. Uh, uh, League Ops, if you're listening. League Ops, <laughs> sing so please, to us. Please tell me. Um, I am definitely going to be spreading this. You can <laughs> sing during technical timeouts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that might set a pace. Uh, so said, if you're just joining us, we're just on a, a tech pause. The first round was won by Liquid. It was won very well on the defense. They perfectly read the approach and, and perfectly read how to lock it off. 
So they kind of want to get back into this, but we are only one round in, as you can see in the bottom left of the screen. First round, it was a, a defense hold onto the basement floor, onto the laundry room. I think that's actually the map score, but... Oh, is that also the map score? Oh, it works for both it's ways. It's also the round it's score. It's also yeah. the map score. They won the first map. Team Liquid won their map pick, which was Clubhouse. We are now on Oregon. And if VP can win this, we will be heading to Baudet. 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 Sorry, Sorry, the game was made by French speakers. So yeah, you so we to... have to pronounce it like that. It's just, it's just the law. Le border. <laughs> I know, like some Ubisoft people are right now, like either cheering or. I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> I'm gonna get like you know when they like. You said worse things in French. Took so. people off. Yeah, <laughs> my bad. Accidentally. So you can see the players are getting themselves propped up and ready. So assuming we'll be back in in just a moment. There it is. Perfectly done by production. Thank you very much. We find ourselves here on the top floor. Now, Tuparau is back. Do you want to talk about Tuparau? I did, I did it twice last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can talk. Uh, Tuparau. Um, I had a nickname, which I'm not longer going to use. Tubby. Yeah, Tubby, apparently. <laughs> not very nice to say that. It's just call, it's calling somebody <laughs> a chubby, like fat. It's... Yeah, I didn't know that. I thought that had a word already. So, okay. okay. Tuparau. Either way, has Zotto canisters. And those canisters, they have the ability to not yeah, quite like stop flag. time. But to slow everything down quite cool a bit, down. right? They cool it down a little bit. Any anything that is caught in that radius will temporarily stop. Except if you're a person, you can still move, but you will be slowed, and your footsteps will show up. But it kind of stops any like heart breach, for example, to go through, or, or or drones being able to be used, and that gives an extra opportunity for, uh, for example, your bandit to come back over. Place down a bandit battery, so as soon as the auto canister expires, hey, the electrification is back on. And that heart breach is now gone. Still in the process of finding itself balanced. They lost the canister. There was also a, a bit of a buff towards utility going against it. And the activation time was nerfed because otherwise it turned into a little bit of an instant game and a juggle. You should see Tim and Pengu, uh, Ace of Pyrite and Pengu playing the combo with the bandit. Meta defining. <laughs> really, Ace is able to teach Pengu a trick or two. But he's finding himself not hugely picked as of this point. Parley's more than happy to run and roll with the gun. Pasha, he's got himself in towards the bedroom. He's sort of drifting back and forth and hoping for a fight to come his way. He's expecting to be swung. And to be fair, with how it could have been playing, it's not the most out there possibility. No, definitely not. Phelps, though, on the cam is going to be giving away a lot of information towards his team. Who's that? Parley's trying to line up. Thief. Yeah, look at this lineup. You don't see many of them inside a siege, but some of them are really well thought out and need to be pixel, uh, pixel perfect to, uh, to get on that right spot. He's doing it again because he quickly had to go for a move. And again, uh. has to go for a bit of a challenge. So, you know, he, he is busy. He has multiple different jobs. Not just this C4 as Volbs does go down. I was going to talk about Volbs for a second there because we could see them as the sole player underneath and drop through a drone. All is just, well, an unfortunate way to go. That's a lineup that's built into the map for you. It happens. We've seen, obviously, in the previous map, said mistakes happen when a player fell off the roof. So is being caught out by a drone hole once or twice, even with all the reinforcements. It buys them a first body, though. And with how haphazard that wall has fallen, and Parley more than ready to try and make a little bit of a chill with the Zoto canister, there has to be this push up towards the top of white. They're concerned about a rotation that might still come from underneath. They don't feel entirely secure in that they don't know that there's not another player that's currently out and about. The four remaining players of Liquid are all inside the site. Uh, C4 gets tossed a little bit too late, Dan. He was out there, he was oh. spotted. Nesta will lean into the fight, will find a single kill. Brings it back to a four and four. Suddenly, Liquid find themselves in a good spot again for this round. Nesk, however, will go down. Whoa. Masha lines up a second as resets. will find Joystick, a two and three right now. Still in favor of Virtus Pro, but they don't really have to breach as they would like it to be. So they have to go for an alternate opportunity to go for a plant. But this Goo Mines is actually going to be stopping uh, the opportunity. Need to be pulled out first. And it's Parlin now in that 1v2 trying to stop it from happening. Shepard's gonna see if he can try and stick it, but he won't get all the way as Dan gets the bite back. That is an attack round that has been able to be taken and won by Virtus Pro. They weren't able to do that on the previous map here, so Oregon has led them already more success than it was before. It's their map. It does make sense, but I think they're still working out some of those kinks, some of those problems, some yeah. of those eyes towards just how much attention they can pay towards the swing onto the site. 
Right. And there you have it, that drone hole shot to come. Ah. Uh, it is just a pixel. <laughs> it is, I mean, it's not it's much more than that. There's Pasha getting on, getting the second at the top of the white stairs. I sort of talked about how there has been a tendency from Liquid players to swing. They're happy to sort of dabble in that test, see what's going on. Don't let this team set up and get all the way. Ness found the first bit of success, but then Pasha getting up towards the top of white was able to get some of that revenge there. All right. Now, Kitchen is going to be up next, and it is not Kitchen Meeting, as it is one of the signs as well. The yeah, camera will be deployed there, but it's Kitchen Dining. And that means a small tower could be a crucial part of the actual attack to come through. He can open up the heart roll from above, and I believe Nesk is going to be setting himself up in what some might call a suicide position. He's going to be out there. There's going to be uh, ADSs ready for him, but he will be playing there until he dies or until he takes down any other enemy that might be trying to go his will for, uh, way from the side of Virtus Pro. So it, it is going to be an all or nothing position. And his main goal, waste as much time as possible and hope to take an important operator off the board. Joystick on the Blitz. That is, for me, an interesting little yeah, combination. Yeah, we don't see that off. You don't really see that every day. I don't even Bro, think Fresh would have put that on a bingo card in his wildest dreams. Let's see. What can come on the back of it? The lineup itself has a, has a couple of bits of flirts with danger. You've got Ness playing this power position at the top of Small Tower, and you know it, it's the one, as you said, you've got to sort of force your way through, get rid of those ADSs, try and put the fight onto the shield, or get maybe an ADS to do just this. It'll stop any of the catches, any extra ADSs or discs you might have missed. The break comes against it. There goes the shield. There's a Blitz that takes a little bit of damage, but obviously resets has taken some more. Hello, oh. it's me, Blitz. You're now blind. Swings with the pistol. And a little bit of a pocket of execution. A great take to Small as Shepard gets Volps as well. Suddenly we have this reinvigorated performance from the Russians here sitting in the school bus and seeing if they can send someone back to class, but they're not quite ready to learn the full lesson. Lagonis escaped with a sliver of help. Barlu is now thinking about double dipping. But at the same time, a minute 20 of five versus two with a shield to lead this push. Surely they can lock out this dining tape. Yeah, this should be locked out, but one kill will go the other way. Palo takes down Dan and was set up in the school bus. Lagones is quite low on HP, spots out the shield. Joystick takes a lot of damage actually from uh, the, the support that's there for Palo. Smoke canisters, however, will be blocking the line of sight. Palo needs to step up big if he wants to stop this win <laughs> to go into the hands of Virtus Pro. But Joystick already it? digging so deep. He's going all the way towards the kitchen. Palo will find yet another kill, swings around, oh. but couldn't connect onto Shepard and leaves it only up to Lagones and about one HP. Can not last, Virtus Pro take round three. I mean, Parley was doing his best. Lagones with that teeny bit of health was holding on for as long as he could. And you can see a little bit of frustration there. <laughs> the joystick was like, I'm going over here. I'm going to keep going. The cover and the smoke and the motion. I like to see it because it's often sort of talked about that they're a team and a roster that does their takes as the time and time again, does their plays as the time and time again. Whereas in this situation, you're sort of looking at, you know, these new ideas, these new sort of pushes, beautiful sort of take in the play. They had the second gun with the swing as well. And that, the that funny. stop of Palu's return. Yes, what is funny? That was a warden. <laughs> Never have uh, glasses Did they? flashed. <laughs> No. Would have been a good way to use them here. It's a shame that. <laughs> All right, it's always the meme, right? Like, oh wait, Warden has a gadget. The thing is what about is gadget. The thing is about Warden's gadget. Obviously, they went through a change. Yeah, there was. There, it, it's not an instant activation. You don't. No, it takes a bit. It takes a bit. It used to be more powerful in that situation. Now it's sort of like glass mechanic. You gotta be patient and still. Deal. Yeah. You can't really do that when a shield. Uh, yeah, he's about to hit no, you. In the I, face. I get it. What would have worked though is a mute jammer. That would. That is real going off. preparation though, and you don't really expect the blitz to be the charge through. No, I mean, this, great this use kinda, of it. This kind of thing, you, you don't really expect a blitz to be there. Now Shepard on a shield. We're just relaxing a little bit. It's like now it's your turn for the shield, Shepard. I, I mean, I love looking Dan at next. I love looking at Virtus <laughs> Yeah, Dan comes out with a fused shield. <laughs> I love looking at Virtus Pro's lineups. I think they, they always like to sort of 
test new things, test new operators in what can be their sort of stand up, standard takes, their standard holds. They're happy to play in the new meta in terms of operators. Not always in terms of maps, though. That's where things sort of go away from them. They don't have the deepest map pools. No, and that could really hurt them the further on they get into the tournament. But of course, they've had a lot of time to get themselves prepared for that tournament and maybe even increase on their map pool here and there. You know, it is only day one. It is only it is. match one for them. So why would they be instantly picking up all those maps they might have been practicing whilst, you know, maybe the basics are just enough to take care of Liquid? At border. Yeah, they've not really played that either. But it's not like... It's a very... I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to get in trouble if I say it. You'll get more, more of a frag heavy map I'll than it is you. of pure strategy. Yeah. They've used the Monty to get the clear. As I said, we've seen a, a little bit of a faux pas in terms of their control of knowing where everybody is. That wasn't the problem last time we were here. What was the problem is, well, they hit a wall of utility and they couldn't quite do their execute at the same time. Shepard is making sure that there's a little bit more pressure. They've gone for the freezer side take instead. You do still put the pressure. You can see always was around the top of the hatch itself. They had the can openers, one less that so you assume it got open. They draw the attention. They're putting a route through. You cannot just charge your way in, but with the coverage and the break onto the wall, you can hear the canister go. You can see the player is going just as much. The pings onto them. They are now a door. The knock on it, the shield rework hasn't quite come through, so they're happy to still swing and hold that position as the bees force the player, but Shepard's the one with the kit, so they can't do anything else right now. There's three people in the same corner out there for the side of, uh, of Liquid. They really need to try and find it. That's a new position as Ness goes around for a huge flank, but only gets one, and it's not even completely confirmed. It's a down onto Joystick, but it gives an opportunity for the opposing or remaining members to go for a bit of a fight. But as they get picked up again, VP have a good opportunity. 15 seconds, always is going over the top. He's going to go for the drop onto the hatch right around the top of the players here. Lagonis does find the kill. They're going to go for the swing and try and stop the plant itself, but they somehow get it down. Dan holds on as Pash has got the long watch that's watched right back. Joystick and Shepard a shield. And a man that's trying to be the defense of that player gets it locked into the two versus one reset. All that's left here. They're going for the long bit of pressure. Joystick has a sliver of health. Oh. He's not quite knocked out, though. And you can hear it on the opposite end. There's a bit of power back on the side of VP. They find three rounds in a row here on their attack. Yeah, and that was what I was aiming for as well. Of course, both these teams had around a 50% of last year on Oregon on attack. So first Pro have just managed to get that 50%. Now they need to try and edge over it to make sure that they put themselves in the best possible position for the second half of this matchup. One of the things that we are kind of missing in comparison to the previous map is, well, Volt, actually, one of the people. If anything, he was, as I sort of said, the, the defining factor of a couple of rounds. He ended the game pretty much defining the second half of it. I think he might have been the top KD as well. He popped off. No two ways about it, son. And here hasn't been able to find a kill yet. Hasn't been able to get himself stuck into the approach. They are still having these moments of swing, still having these moments of confidence. However, with one big missing factor coming through, it really shows a different shape of the pace and it gives a bit of pace have for them to fight in. And obviously that was the tax timeout called by Liquid. These three rounds in a row, they think, well, this hasn't quite gone the way it wants to. It's not their map. They have the buffer, but they don't want to get there. It's no! somehow started off with like a flawless roundup. No! First round, they could round with flawless. flawless. Perfect. And then... First row just shows up. It's like, no, 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 no. This is our map. <laughs> We're, we want to go to border. Don't get us wrong. Jesse was confident. He was confident. He doesn't want to be a Very flaw. confident. As, as confident as he is Canadian. Have we actually ever ran, like, the DNA uh, sequence to find out if he's actually Canadian? I mean, not that I'm doubting him, but it's like, do we have the hard proof that he is, like, 100% Canadian? You've opened a can of worms, though. Yeah, that's what we got to check it on Liquipedia. Yeah. Is it, would it be on there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to edit it. I'm going to get banned from editing Liquipedia. <laughs> Three rounds in a row, Riders Pro, and let's see if they can try and do what's done to them and respond to a timeout with just more victory. And going back up towards Dorms, this was where they were able to get there first. It was a 
pretty back and forth over the past yeah. three rounds. It was the closest of the rounds that they have won towards well, not quite getting it. And if Liquid had got two in a row, this could be a very, very different game we're looking at. It would have been a different game, that's for sure. And if, you know, we removed correctly, the C4 just came in a little bit late. The wall wasn't opened up properly, but still managed to hold on in the end and, and the enough for some pressure to come through. Oh. Ness starts it off great there, takes down Pasha, instantly leaning in. Games as well, hoping to find one more as he sees one go by on that repel, but they also realize we have the entry. We do not need to be more aggressive than this. I was going to say, that's the sort of change here. Last time, remember, Pasha got control of Bedroom, pretty much uncontested pretty quickly, but didn't go any further and was expecting swings like this. Nesk, he is now in that trophy swing position. He got the first onto the armory window. Virtus Pro maybe expected it to be a bit emptier because, well, it was last time. And just moving into this space, just making this a fight and a contestion is something that has been able to net them that player. Oh no, that's the player with the hard breach. They've lost the Selmas. If the wall gets a little bit locked, they find themselves in a sticky position. The wall that's onto trophy. Uh, or, or the wall that's onto the, the backside of Trophy, even, that leads towards Pit, that is now much more problematic. Three people around the attic there in the Pit. Seems like that is going to be the crucial turning point of that entire defense, just so they can get C4s over, but also so they can look into the actual dormitory with the um, um, mirror windows that they have set up. So that's a bit of a, a question mark right now for the side of BP. Why is there three players in there? How are we going to be dealing with this? Can we maybe even circumvent this? Because if you don't need to take him down, that's even better. Now, Volps is underneath once again, a slightly different position. I'm not sure if Always is trying to hunt them or just prepare for a rotation, but with 40 seconds left, you got to do something. Volps doesn't have to do anything, and there it is, Always. Gets the kill, gets the take. Instantly responded to, though, by Nesk, who's getting one back, keeping that body advantage and keeping the fight into their favor. As I said, it's one of those players that you sort of associate with Oregon throughout the years from the performances that they've put on old and new. And here, they're making sure they've got a new one. 20 seconds, the C4 goes perfectly this time round over the top of the blinds. Palu got his lineup right there. 15 seconds remaining. 15 seconds, a four versus two. Always does find another bite through. They're trying to get the scream up the stairs, a two versus two. Suddenly, Shepherds put a little bit of life back into it, but they've got to go for the plant. The swing, he runs out of bullets, a two versus one, and he can't quite get it, Palu. Just keeps things into Liquid's favor. Not enough ammo in the SMG 33 there to uh, to keep the fight up and actually get the kill to Palu. Could have opened up uh, an opportunity there because that would have meant the player on might still be alive. Could have been the cover for the plan to actually go through, but instead Liquid find themselves with that second round on their defense. Now we'll be headed back down towards the laundry, towards the supply room. The one they were able to win flawlessly before, but then Virtus Bro, they brought a shield. And then they were able to just basically shepherd out all these players. So that is something they need to be ready for if that is going to be brought again. And we do see a, a bit of a different kind of, of, of operator lineup. I mean, you don't see it yet. We do see it. We see um, the Thorn coming out. So the Razor Bloom gadgets to come through. Mute Mozzie combo. Castle to be out there. So they're definitely trying to play some information game whilst also slowing down the attackers as much as they can. The game is afoot. Is a foot? Yes. Yeah, you know this like phrase? The body part? No, you don't I know this phrase. It's <laughs> underway. Five seconds remaining. I was just memeing. Ah, the boy has <laughs> learned to me. And, and the boy has just spilled his water. It almost went wrong. <laughs> it did go wrong. You spilled it. Yeah, but I caught it mid-air because I released it with my thumb somehow. And I. Why did you let it. go of the cut? I don't know. Intrusive thoughts one. <laughs> like Parker when he dribbled on himself during rehearsals yesterday. Out in shame publicly. <laughs> Three to two. And as they approach, what is a heftier hold here? The castle to obviously make things a bit uncomfortable. The wall being instantly double locked. Liquid sort of said, well, they played in the space and we locked it up successfully once before. Let's go back to maybe paying attention elsewhere. They don't want to stuff on the back end of the shield once again. The shield is not here. Yeah. The Monty take, although it was successful, change things up. Change things up because Liquid are a team that can counter strat. They can change things. They can alter their ideas, their approaches. They know how to change if they need to change. 
It's a pretty heavy top four kind of roam going on right now. You see one all the way in T3. Uh, someone up on the back stairs. We see people uh, around the actual attic as well. So it seems like Liquid want to play this everywhere but the actual site. And that means if Virtus Pro do realize this, they have an opportunity to basically bank on the back of that. Now, as resets, we'll find the very first one to always. He's still out in that tower. They now know he's there. And this is the decision that Virtus Pro now needs to make. Do we want to clear him out, or do we let him live? Well, they have the jackal track. They have the feet being put down on the pressure. They've got long distance angles, but as you said, resets sitting there, holding on, time ticking away, and that has been that dangerous sixth member, especially against them. They're going for the take and the pressure. They're blinded and hoping that they can survive a bit longer. No is the answer. Joystick, a very Hacking. clean response and take. Gets the cams, gets the read, and gets the click of the fingers. Of course, those cams only going to be uh, revealing the default cams and, you know, bulletproofs as well. So it isn't like there's any real hidden things that they're going to be able to see. Of course, still a bit of a nuisance if you are on the defense because your positions can be checked out. The Shepard is driving around with a drone as well. He's going to be finding about way more positions, taking out some new gemmers as well. Could actually lean into uh, opening up. No, they have no way to open up. Oh, he's already died, so not necessary is Nest finds joystick. Oh, Nest has just been so problematic here. The energy that he's brought to a team that started to fall away from it. Palu takes bits of damage. Volps takes a little bit more. The player's still tucked, and there's Dan just screaming their way through. But again, tucked behind the soft. Lagonis gets caught out. The spray against it. I don't know if they had the full read, but they've only got about 10 seconds and one body. So now it's technically a two versus two with Pasha head down onto the plant, watching either side. Dan is tearing them apart. And Virtus Pro, fantastic response here towards things going away from them. A bit of a back and forth, but the timeout used and utilized by Liquid. They've now just got to play their attack ahead of them. That's it, and VP have set themselves up perfectly with that round score, managing to find four attacking rounds. That's better than both these teams, their average. So they're definitely one step ahead right now, and they just need to make sure that they're able to get those three rounds on their defense on the board right now. And they will start off on the basement, they will start off on laundry, as that is where uh, Liquid started it off successfully once. Now they hope to do so themselves as well. I'm kind of curious what game here we're going to get from the sides and the second half. Obviously, where Virtus Pro did quite well was in the opening three rounds, was yep. in the setup on their defense. If they do the same here, the game's over, the map's over. You know, you're, yep. you're sort of in that you're position correct. where <laughs> I can count to seven. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've learned that some people can count to 19, so it's always good to check. Good way secure. It would make things very sticky, and it would send us, obviously, hurtling in towards the border. I know of at least one series that has gone to three maps today. I yep. don't know if that's the only series? I think her Two. No, I think both SSB oh, yeah, and DZ's yeah, yeah. games went no, to, that's true. Went to no, all three maps. Yeah. And eight teams love three maps. At least it's not an all overtime, you know? Yeah. Just like, you're looking at it like that. Either way, Liquid, you need to step up on your attack right here Reload. because otherwise, it's going to be Virtus Pro that's going to find themselves into a map number three that they're unknown for. As one kill comes in for the side of Pasha, Volks responds and manages to escape as Joystick tried to get a lean back in instantly, but Volks already gone before he could. The check further forward, the slow sort of steps into this engagement. A minute gone and two players removed. Does show an increase in pace in comparison to how they went at Clubhouse before, but they've got to make sure they don't fall into those habits that they had a little bit in their early attacks previously where they would go back to thinking and the thinking would take a little bit too long before they had the time towards the execution. The great take onto the utility, the roll on through of Palu with the Twitch drone is able to at least secure one more Goyo canister. We saw how powerful they can be in holding off the time on the site before. And the second is gonna see if they can try and apply a little bit more of that pressure and control. You wanna get rid as much of that utility as you can, but 
second Twitch drone has been taken down. Dan using some of these punch holes here to find himself at a bit of a cheeky angle and get the upper hand, but as he deals about one or two bullets worth of damage, he has to rotate back out, takes a little bit from the DMR, leans back in, finds the kill onto Palu. That's going to be a great one. Now has the opportunity to lean over towards Freezer as well, but with the amount of HP he has, doesn't really want to put himself into that position. I mean, that's the thing, right? You're looking at a minute, so there's loads of time, so you want to take a surprise fight, but he has no health. He was lucky to sort of get away with the first rotation when when Parley was watching you with a DMR in the pockets of Twitch, one of the sort of most consistently powerful guns in the right hands at the minute. You expect to die. He got back, double dipped and got the kill. Well, it's turned into the Nesk show, but he's locked out by the quick trade back. Joystick has the stop to it, the end to it. Nesk is still having these big effects, but cannot quite get the full end of the sentence. Lagonis goes for the flash, goes for the plant inside the cover of the noise with Joystick getting one. Even if he gets this down, he'll put his head up towards three Russian guns, making their way closer and closer towards the player. Popped and dropped off. And they know that the round is over at this point. There it is. <laughs> I said it was still, still a frag. It is a shotgun on the other side. If you're not certain that it's if down. You're not certain, I mean, we've seen them drop down. Yes. <laughs> to a, a, a sort of pocket carrot, I think it was. No, it was the bailiff that, the bailiff. Uh, that went through. So you want to make sure, you want to, you want to be careful enough that you don't both go down to the same pump because that happened before. One pump, two kills because both were low on HP. You don't, you, you don't want to have that in that situation. One pump, two kills. Yeah, one pump, two kills. Nice. The true one pump champ. Just in a different way. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not responding. This is an 18 plus. Yes, it is. Because of violence, but you disgust me. <laughs> Five to two. Virtus Pro, as I said, the danger is in their early half. Has been good. Liquid can adapt. They can adapt fantastically. They've proven it in this game alone, as well as other tournaments as well as getting themselves here. But the time limit on how they can do that, well, it might technically be zero because you're sort of looking at maybe one site, one swing on each of them before they are looking down border. Yeah, and, but the thing is, I was just watching that last round, you know, as we do as it's our jobs. Um, and <laughs> What? I, I looked at like Paolo not being able to hit those like shots completely with the DMR. He got two shots off. Wasn't yeah, just enough. But Nesk, that one was more obvious. He was like, completely next to the person and wasn't able to transfer over the spray I, I as mean, a person swung him. It's like it's tough. It is tough. Nesk is. He feels like he's playing with a lot of pressure, and he is. You're looking at Volps still, unfortunately, not being able to show up to the huge effect they had on the previous map. Lagonis obviously playing the support role. You don't expect him to put the numbers down, but this is the difference of having a player go huge and then not quite getting the same effect in the follow through. Nesk is having to swing into these fights and engagements because he, with his experience and his skill, knows we have to put pressure onto. And it forces you to take these gunfights that are a little bit, you know, more awkward, more sort of disengaged from what can be the practice transfers, yeah. the practice approaches. And it's like you don't expect Nesk to miss those shots, right? He's like one of those top caliber players, like one of the best that's ever touched a game. And you see something like that, and it's like, ooh, I, ooh, I love hurt. this. Oh, the flat take, it's very audible though. And Shepard's able to get a second. There's Nesk again, still knowing the importance. Gets the fight for Joystick. Once again, gets the response. The kick goes cold in the middle of the room. Volps, he was huge in the first map. He unfortunately can't follow it through there. Six, two, two. No timeout. Nothing now stopping this Russian revolution in this series. I like how Dan was still like upset about something that happened because he's like <laughs> making like all kinds of wavy, like how am I supposed to hit this? As uh, they, they won that round pretty flawlessly. I mean, it was they, they tried to go for a quick play, completely shut down by Virtus Pro. And this game where we were expecting like, okay, Liquid, they just really warmed up in that previous game. If they managed to keep that going, it could be, you know, a quick end for Virtus Pro here. And then suddenly it's the complete opposite. I guess, all right, so you look at that play that they did, it's a known play. The the quick zip across, you go into the window. However, you usually do it with the window, the double window take, that was done, the push up white, and I think one on trophy. Yeah, yeah, that was done, that makes sense. 
but that was missing the one ingredient of we need something to distract from this. Whether it's an EE1D, whether it's a Docker be called, yeah. whatever it is that covers a little bit of that chaos, I'm not going to say it's a That's silent flat. zip, but it was a very easy pickup. Two players turned and faced it. Yeah. You are going into a slaughter. And of course, it didn't help that someone just walked in front of the window at the moment that starts, and he's like, oh, hey, man. Is there someone coming? Hello. Hey, um, how you doing? But hey, what could be the last round here of this map before we head towards our decider border? Virtus Pro have looked to become quite a dominating force over Liquid. They've been able to just really set themselves up in the best way, really. Like, the, 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 the fan... The flawless round in, in round one, which they lost against them. Then round five, they, meant they, they lost another round themselves as well. But ever since, VP has been in charge. Now, Forbes did start off with an opening kill. Nesk finds himself in the middle of the side, but eats some buckshot right through the face. And as a result, we're back to a four and four. So the early opening that they managed to get, really not able to back into. Shepard again playing with that shotgun close to split is about to be finding himself in some contact. Two pumps necessary to find Volps but eventually will shut him down as he didn't check the corner. Shepard's still out there in set corner. A very well, the difficult position to get rid of. Well, there's a spray around. There's a swing. There's a three versus one. And here I think we are looking at a three map position. Palu could be a difference maker here. He definitely has the capabilities, but look at how much sort of utility is still in the pockets of the remaining players. They also have the verticality. They also have the full structure of the site itself. It is a sticky situation. The throw of the drone, the chance on the swing onto the back of split. They're just waiting for it. And Joystick is that final throw, the power of VP has shown up a little bit more on their map, but we are going to, I mean, a very exciting, powerful map after this. Yeah, we're going to be headed towards Border, which is known for aggression, for pure gun skill, gunplay to come through. Of course, there is strategy involved, don't worry, but it is just a bit more of that raw gun skill that we really rely on. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. There is there strategy some, involved. There'll be some strategy. It's not just a rank pick of game rules. What? Yeah, I'm, I mean, it is a six invitational after all, right? So, do you know what it is after all? What is it after all? A quick break before we're back with the desk.
Well, that was an impressive turnaround from Virtus Pro. We now look to the series as a little bit more. It's uh, no longer two and done. We're going to see a lot more from Liquid and Virtus Pro. However, we've got to break down Oregon first. Oregon, a map that we went into expecting Virtus Pro to feel a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. But Jess, you, you got to say, that's that's the kind of performance we needed to see out of it. It certainly is. Then, I mean, I told you I wasn't worried. I told you I, I was expecting to see a border, and we've got a border coming up next. I do think for Oregon, VP looks so much more at home. Obviously, it's their map pick and a BO3. That's what you're expecting teams to come through when their picks, but VP's attacks in particular, so much better the second time around. We saw Shepard going huge. Not a player you often talk about topping the scoreboard for VP, but he can absolutely put up those numbers when he needs to, and today he did. Oh, and it's also, I mean, we've seen Shepard numerous times put up those numbers, and it's, again, like a lot of these teams here at SI, they do have a five-man roster that can really totally. step up in any given moment. And, you know, even talking about players, you know, we saw Volps last game. He was popping off tremendously. This game, he really tanked off. So it happens, but that's the whole point of being on a five-man roster is if you aren't having a good game, you do have the four other players to pick up your slack, allow you to still be a good teammate, give the call-outs that you need to, and still perform the way that you need to perform outside of getting a stat line. Look, I, I guess that's probably the concern for me is more so how this game's finished. 7-2, we didn't see any attacking rounds from Liquid, and their defensive rounds were few and far between. Two, in fact were all they were able to amount, uh, and they were quite separated as well, Chris. Certainly, and I think, you know, you look at Oregon as a map where you're wanting to see more defensive rounds than a 2-4 two, yeah. two split from Liquid to start yeah. things off. That basement's usually considered one of, if not the best, bomb site in competitive siege they lost it twice and so i think the huge variety we saw from vp the different ideas they wanted to bring to the table the different things that they were bringing um even on the same bomb site multiple rounds we did see them catching liquid off guard never really letting them learn never letting them adapt and that's not something we're known for vp yeah. typically this is a team where you'd say like historically they will run the best strat, and they will stick to it. Yep. This time, we saw a lot of variation, a lot of cool ideas, and I think that really came in clutch for Virtus Pro. Yeah, I mean, the shield play and going to that fourth round with the Monty, with the Grim, forcing people out of Freezer, and like from a player perspective, just to give you guys a little more insight on that, that Monty clearing all the Freezer and pushing down into that hallway, he is essentially feeding all the information to his team to let them know that they're back in sight, yep. no one's in the hallway, maybe someone's playing pillar, so the people that are pushing down from laundry side or from Freezer side are then able to collapse on site, and that's why we saw that bomb go down as smoothly as we did. And not only was it just the uh, the monster, but we also had another little play uh, from the Blitz the round earlier, yeah. Jesse. Yeah, round three, they used a great little Blitz play, but it wasn't even just the Blitz. Everybody came on through. I want to show you, they're clearing the small tower here, and there's a Warden up there. It's Nesk. But all of the utility is going to come together. Versus an EMP gets caught by an ADS. Second EMP goes through. Lion Charge goes through. Shepard on the Ash, not a, an operator you expect from the hard support, clears the shield, and then Joystick jumps jumps on in. Now you're thinking, that's a Warden. Why are you running a Blitz at a Warden? That's because the EMP had just gone out. Warden's glasses don't work because of that EMP. So he's able to rush on through, clear him out, and notice how not a single person died. Very little damage onto the Blitz. Otherwise, it's so clean. It's so practiced. Everybody is working together. That's the type of coordination you don't get unless you really run a strat over and over and over again. And that was executed to perfection. And to touch up on that, that's the beauty about Siege, as whether you're a new viewer or an old viewer, this is a siege at the highest level, and this is where you can really see where the team play, the coordination of how to abuse operators or how to even use operators and their utility properly. And Jesse explained that perfectly. Those EMPs completely countered and negated all of that info or that vision from um, Warden that he can't now use. And then Blitz is now viable once again, blinds him, they get a free kill, easy pickings. It's kind of like two master classes put back to back, right? You saw mm -hmm. the Blitz and you saw the Monty. Exactly, and they, and they played it beautifully. And that's what we need to see going into the third map. Well, that's just it, right? Speaking of the third map, that's where we need to start to hone in a little bit more, turn our attention, because Liquid, they had a little bit of a rocky map, but that's that's nothing in comparison to where we're going. We're going to border here. I mean, yeah. what are the expectations, Jesse? The expectations? There are no expectations, because Virtus Pro, the last time they played border was June 2020. 2020. Obviously, a completely different roster. They've changed cores. Nothing really resembling that. Technically, the org is undefeated. 3-0 lifetime record. But realistically, when you're looking at this, this is a blank slate. We have no idea what VP play on border. We've never seen it before. So for Liquid, you're walking into the dra into the den in the dark. You have no idea what's coming up. And it is border. I mean, there's only. Uh that many plays you can play yeah. it, right? It's a map that uh, often encourages very early gunfights. So 
Some people have said it's antithetical, uh, antithetical to VP style. I guess we'll find out today. I can't even spell that. But yeah. anyways, no, I think I think it's great for Liquid specifically. Well, not great for specific. Sorry, it's great for VP going to this. They just came off a strong win on their map pick. Now you're going to border that. Liquid is going to have no idea what you do in terms of they want to watch something old in the past, which typically really isn't, you know, it's going to give you kind of an idea of what they do, but they could have changed everything drastically. So to like try to use that info, it's not going to be as great. And you're really going to have to focus up here and really pay attention to what Liquid's doing on top of also VP managing their best and what they can implement into Border. Well, we are going into this blind, so it's only fair that the blind do lead the blind. Emmy and Hap wait for the matchup. Blind? Are we blind, apparently? I can't, I can't see. I you have hands didn't. in front of your eyes. Oh! Making things easier to see. That explains it. Yeah. Do you know what's really cute? What is cute? I like that Laxing uh, and Jesse have dressed as Barbenheimer. As I didn't pay attention. One of them's in bright pink. <laughs> well, maybe you are blind. <laughs> Point has been proven. Yeah. But okay. 51 to 49. This is the exact reverse of the predictions of what it was on the previous map. So you were all still split down the middle at home. Congratulations on keeping consistent. I legitimately do not know which way this is going to go. Last time Liquid played it, they lost it against uh, a little team called W7M. I've heard of them. Yeah, you've heard of I them, I think right? I've heard of them, yeah. 8-7 the score. Ooh, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's not like I was against like, oh, W7M. Wow. That's. Yeah, I, I think any score that goes the distance against W7M is like, oh, that's good. Grim is gone. No bees, not for you. Ying is gone. No blinds, not for you. Yeah, it's a standard sort of consistent ban there. You're looking at the quick pitch aggression. Grim isn't the most standard sort of removal. Fenrir is going to make some of those swings that Liquid like to do a little bit more palpable to the palette of destruction. What are you calling? Fen's army. Oh. 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 It's almost like we do this for a living. That was a pure gamble, by the way. But there's only really five operators that get bent. Yeah. And there's a short a short list. Yeah, it was like a, take from. a one in four, 25% chance. Imagine, imagine you're in the past when Grim was introduced. Uh-huh. And you would go, Grim will be banned. <laughs> and it's legitimate. I remember when it, like, it just came out. It wasn't, like, the most impactful operator. Like, it's a unique gadget, but the it impact... Wasn't, it wasn't the no, most... It wasn't just being... was just not... I think that's like, a very kind way of describing Grimm. Be kind, Wasn't right? the most impactful. Was I factually correct? You were. That's what I mean. <laughs> but he, he's been getting into the metamorph after, the, you know, the reworks that came through with the instant deploys of the bees. Um, yeah. Larger radius, uh, long, longer time of being active as well. It's great. And now, really good at being a sort of area denial. Not because it hurts you. He's a problem. He's a problem maker. Yeah. He's, he's allowing for a movement and shaker. What was that word that Jesse mentioned on the desk? Because Lack said I can't spell that. I don't even know what that word is. I wasn't listening. You weren't listening. No. They difficult. might think I'm blind. I'm not. I'm just deaf to them. <laughs> deaf to analysts. Just Would you, whatever Australian that is, it's hard to tell them apart. Uh, <laughs> they can sass us. I love that we get Australians here because they're great at sass. They can sass us. They have a very small window to do it. I have 45 minutes of a game ahead of me, probably. Yeah, that's very true. We have I have a lot 45 of minutes, Manic. Right now. Strap in. <laughs> You've chosen war with... You've chosen war, Manic. Sass. I don't need to do a type five. I can go full <laughs> George Carlin. Right, to the game. To the game zero piece, and we're propped up and ready for maybe a quick look through here on towards the bathroom. The thing about border is it is a very dangerous map at all points. It's very thin. You can get ideas from one corner and go, I'm gonna approach here and suddenly someone shoots you from the opposite side of the map itself. Resets gets the first. Dan Funny is Max. gone. They'll lose a frost, it's a nice gun, but you assume the gadgetry is already in place, causing problems out and about. But that is one of the first and uh, that's one of the earliest oh, first bodies of blows we've had across the three maps. Yeah, overall it's been like around the one minute 30 mark uh, and then, you know, two to one minute mark where we've really right, seen those first blows come in. It's not like we've seen any like 20 seconds left on the clock first kill hit to that moment. Yeah. 
but it's it's generally been a bit later uh, that's for sure now as we are holding off it's just right now liquid trying to find themselves at an opening just opening up some walls or taros are being sent in next kairos are being sent out and all of that is just trying to work towards a common goal. And this seems like they want to go for an archive's plan. There's basically no pressure towards the armory <laughs> whatsoever right now as Lagonus is just making himself. All the blinds are coming through onto Shepard, but Pasha is able to see through it and sees right through one and two. Oh. There's the third Pasha! Locks it down inside Fountain and fills it up with the body of Liquid. That's four! Now we have had an ace today. Will we find our second? With 30 seconds left, you're up against Palu. Flores, long banned in this series so far. The bait of the play, no! Palu locks it down, but Pasha has earned the lie down. More than enough has been done. 20 seconds here, three versus one. He's looking for a fight with two players tucked into that corner. One's low, one's high. He's got to make his way through. Can't find the first. What a round from Pasha. That was insane. It was all from the same, like, two square meters as well. He was just sitting there like, okay, one, step to the side, two, step to the side, and that's the third one to come through. And as he quickly checks the long hallway and comes back, oh, there's a fourth surprise waiting for him there, and he manages to just uh, shut them all down so uh, cleanly. Attackers have recovered. Definitely cutting the pie the right way there. No! <laughs> I don't know what they said, because I don't speak Russian, but I, it's, it's I, something, who is the, and I assume, like, boss or end. Who is the best? King or the best. Oh, it could be it, yeah. Oh, is that what he said? Who is the guy? Who's the guy? Yeah. He's the guy. He's the guy. He's the guy. I mean, what a first round there from VP, but we've seen them take the first three rounds and then not get much more than that. So, there's a full game. There's a full map. There's a full place to play ahead of them. Liquid here, a slight knock in this early lead-in. They got the first body and then got bodied for every other engagement, pretty much. Ten seconds left There's no other way to pull up. <laughs> it's, just, it's just what happened. They all tried to take out Five the same man, left. and they all just got given the exact same answer. This is an interesting point about this map, though, is when you talk about things Virtus Pro does, usually classic comes to mind. Yeah. This isn't always the second pick site nowadays. Usually you'll see teams sort of stretch themselves over towards bathroom. There's a big preference onto it instead. However, once upon a time it was yeah. armory, it was vents, and it was struggle for the third site. Yeah, but with the rework, they really made the, the bathroom uh, tellers site to become actually viable. And, and then as a result, we see it quite a lot right now. Virtus Pro, you know, still living back in the day in, in terms of the site selection, not wanting to go for what is hot and new right now, but that's true and tested. Of course, they'll go there, most likely as a, the third side. I don't expect them to uh, to take the other option, which is customs, of course. A splash bangs and an E on the pop. It is just there to allow Liquid to take some ground over this ground floor. Look at and this. hey, Nesk is in the site. Hey, man. Nesk inside the site. Lagonis also inside the site, going for the plant. Virtus Pro, you're about to get a very terrifying wake-up call now. Yeah, you got the one player, but it's a post-plant. Suddenly, there's only 40 seconds left. The Solus is lost. They want to take the drop onto this. They can see the grid locks. They know it's being watched. It's resets with the lockdown. Resets gets joystick from the verticality. Lagonis gets another. In fact, there it is. The two for Lagonis. As well as getting the plant down, he's sort of dictated this round. They had a return to form and force. Volps gets one, always gets one right back. 20 seconds. They still got to go for the retake on their own site. And it's always, always in this position here. One versus three. Not enough time to get to the kid at this point. So the round's already lost, but he can at least get a body or two on his way through. This one that's about to be on his left-hand side. But he won't even see them. Great response from Liquid. A yeah, good read again to come through. It's not the first one that we've seen from them in the matchup against uh, Virtus Pro here, but they realized this is just safe. Like we can we can move through, enter from passport, get themselves inside, and go for the plant. And you see Nesk, he's holding off for that verticality. He's trying to make sure no one was going for the actual uh, diffuser planter at that moment in time. And as they found Nesk, <laughs> no one thought to realize that. Oh, maybe the plant's going down and we need to go back towards the site until three seconds after when that time started ticking. And 
this is kind of what we expect in a map like Border. It is good gunplay to come through, but also quick rounds with these kind of reads to come in. I mean, we, we had the team inside of Europe at Wild. They really love to do like just plants and rush those plants. Like they needed only two, three things. They took those and they went for the plant. Boom, round over in a minute. And it just kept doing that. It got really good at that. So it is definitely possible on this map. As we now head towards the bathroom and tell us to uh, find a tertiary site. Ten seconds left. Okay. Five seconds Back and remaining. forth on a third map on border with players showing up. Beautiful. Attackers are moving to defuse the bomb. I love a little bit of engagement, a little bit of explosiveness. This is the perfect time for it. That's a way to uh, to end it as well, just with that explosion after that. And go on to uh, to rest for the rest of the day and prepare yourself for your matchup tomorrow. Both these teams, of course, want to get that victory, want to get that one up over one another, as it is. I mean, we mentioned it before. It doesn't like mean you are out of the group if you lose this one. And both these teams should have enough caliber where they could stay into their group without, you know, too much of a trouble. That they should be able to win at least one of those games. But winning this one early on takes out so much of the pressure already, especially because they both see each other as, as huge competitors. I like that. After having Flores removed from a couple of maps, more than happy to bring some of the demolition of those drones. It's a lot of soft on this map. There's a lot of walls that can be yep. cracked for even longer angles, and we know they can be ferocious with the right guns in the right positions. They had the bite straight through onto the site itself. Bathroom will take a little bit more work as they steady their way through. Joystick on the second story is watching. Might be about to find a Nesk fight. There's a bit of a dance outside the door in that second and caught just in the corridor. Always in 90, but may as well have been Narnia. For how much attention they were paying towards that approach. Maybe lost by the cover of this. The very noisy gridlocks as Palu gets Pasha. We find ourselves careening towards a body advantage for Liquid. Phone call going off right now as well. Dan, very vulnerable in his current position. Some of the actual tracks are being shot out. So uh, Reset sees that happen, but doesn't really have the opportunity to respond because he's very focused on that one player up above. He heard the phone go off. Cannot really uh, try and put his attention elsewhere now because Dan is in a prime position to actually try and make sure that that top floor stays in control off the side of Virtus Pro or comes back into control of Virtus Pro. Now resets as he finds himself, just holding off the angles, just making sure that no one is going to be using that hatch against them. That's his sole goal here. He doesn't need to clear out Dan as long as he makes sure that Dan doesn't have the opportunity to play the hatch out there. And as Dan is slowly starting to come around, he will find a kill into Ness. Does he know about the second? No, he does not. The kill starts to come through, but Whoa. we find ourselves in a two and two situation kill. out of nowhere. I was wondering what happened in that engagement, and I think so is unfortunately liquid, but at least. They had the wherewithal to keep themselves in a bit of calm there. They were tucked in. It's the danger of this map. You're sort of slowly skirting around corners, trying to get that first foot into the fight. Two rounds in a row, two to one. And I think it might be the first time we've had a back and forth in the opening rounds. Uh, I mean, Oregon was also 1-0, one, 1-1, one, 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 two feet right. So it's, it's, it's the same, just different team right now. That's happening. So, as we get underway back to Armory, we are most likely headed towards the round that first pro was able to win. But it wasn't just the setup that worked really well. It wasn't just the team play that worked really well. It was Pasha. Two square meters, finding four kills and dealing loads of damage to the last player, allowing for an easy cleanup for the rest of his team. I think that's the sort of moment here right now. You can feel an intensity in the approaches of Liquid that we didn't have on Oregon. Yeah. They, I, well, okay. One player had it on Oregon, which was Nesk for my money, kept on stepping back in, kept on getting himself into the engagement. This time, all five of them there. All five of them are more than happy to play that role. And when you have that, you have this. You have responses that are multifaceted. You have multiple bodies swinging into the engagement. 
line of success. You are rubbing your hands together. Yeah, we have an Amaru. Oh. Now, where is that going to be used? <laughs> That's a, like, sneaky, sneaky <laughs> Amaru. But where is it going to be used? Is, is it going to be, like, through the sandwich window? Is it going to be through the hatch up? Uh, I love the hatch up. Somewhere? Give me the hatch up with the cover if you try and take control of office. Does mean you have E1Ds as well? Like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Just, that is the bit of, you hey, know, distraction you talked about Oh, earlier. I talked about that. It's nice when things come together. This is what I love. Okay, so the hatch that we've just seen Parley roll and run past there. If you can cause a bit of destruction and chaos, especially if you can get some coverage of smokes, which they don't have, but they have, oh, every single flash in existence, you might be able to cause some destruction. The other way is get aggro up into the small box. Draw some attention elsewhere. See if you can put the fight in. They might even use it here for the first take no onto way. the back of CC. You should be going up this one. This is so open. As soon as that hatch breaks, there's just going to be one or two people that... Oh, he's going to do it anyway. He's going to go up the hatch. This one is quite risky. He needs to check his drone first. There's no one checking him close. But what about the hallway as the E1D pops? Phelps is soon going afterwards. Is someone watching him? Yes, they are. And Phelps loses his life. Oh, there's at least the bite back. They're keeping things even. Nask swings around with Pasha getting one of his own. Lagonis is knocked right back out the door. Resets. Needs to offer some support. But all of them seem to have a goop mine in their foot. All the health on the side of Vardas Pro right now. All the players have that support and structure. Another single goo mine would be a bit deadly and always is about to tick to having one more. Pasha is ready to clip a wing of a player as well. It will just take a breeze from that DMR to lock out any of the remaining Liquid players here. They've got themselves tucked right close to see if they can get a bit of a snappy shot onto the first engagement. The swing is a bit wide, but as I said, it'll just take a sliver of damage. Dan has gone for walkabouts with resets paying a bit of attention. The spray through the soft almost downs resets because of how low his health is. Now he's just sitting on even less, but he has gone aggressively background, leaving Ness alone inside the site in what is now a two versus one as resets wins out on the backside of the fight, but there's 20 seconds. No kit, it is just a bloodbath right now. They had to go back for it. They couldn't get the end of it. Pasha still driving Virtus Pro. Again, I, I, I understand what they wanted to do. They wanted to take control of CCTV and break room with like some quick fashion out there. And of course, the goal was to get the Amaru up there and challenge the person on that door, but also have the insane, like instant kind of locking from the opposite side. But it, it just kind of didn't really work out. Everything was just a, a slightly off the mark, slightly off the tempo, and they find themselves basically with three 10 HP members, with just a single shot being enough to get that kill. And Pasha just locking it off with the pistol in the end there. I was almost gonna say, it's like having a DMR right now is kind of a disadvantage when you're playing against players that have such low HP, because all you need is one bullet. All you need is one bullet. On the fire rate at that point, doesn't matter where you hit them. If they're far away, great. You can hit yeah, through exactly. soft, the, and it's like, ah, oh, my arm, I'm dead. Um, which you can't really do with uh, a quick fire SMG. However, if they are four feet away, yeah, sort of, sort of less. If you challenge them on the breach as well, yeah, if you challenge them on the breach, angle. which is entirely what Liquid did, they got themselves close. They knew what they were up against, but they also knew what they had to do to try and find some success. Winning the fight on the back end was a great bit of motion, but Ness was in a position where he couldn't pull back. He's in a two versus one, and then they decided to go and get the kit back as well, rather than try and go for the two versus two fight. I mean, those are the calls and the plays. It's very easy for me to sit here and sort of say this is the ways that they could win, this is the ways that they yeah. could lose. They are in the intense position of playing the game. We also have the all-seeing eye, right? Yeah. It's, it's always the... We have every single bit of information you could possibly want, except for the calls from the players. Whereas the players, they have the calls from the players in their own drones, but they lack the oversight that we yeah. have. So it's always a bit of that balance that we need to find. 2-2, two, two, though. Virtus Pro able to win the, the Armory twice. Still yet to find that round on the opposite side of things. This one was a quick rush last time around from Liquid. They spotted an opportunity, they went for it, they took the ground, they go for the plant. No one of Virtus Pro even knew that that was happening at that point. We're in a completely different round already though because of the fact that there's only a single Liquid player inside the building and of course he's holding off a great angle as then our resets both go quite low in a bit of a skirmish. But we don't really see the same amount of pressure from Liquid early on inside. Oh, resets goes down, but Ness gets 
Dan. I'm not entirely sure what got Reese this down. I think there might have been a goo mine in the window frame. Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it was a gentle downing. It wasn't the sound of no a shots, bullet no that traces. led to it. No shots, no nothing. It was a uh, ow, and he went down. Stubbed his toe. Stubbed his toe. Now always is in this fountain position where we've seen huge plays before, but remember where the site is and remember how quick this round was last time. Vox is going to see if he can try and get some replication of that. Does the drone say, yep, you're free to swing around this corner. However, the verticality has been well cleared a little bit. We saw them force the player out of the position. That's the important motion that allows them to do this. As soon as that fountain player is gone, as soon as they have some eyes elsewhere, they can move in, tuck the corner, go for the call and force the player into a position where nobody can watch cams or drones either. That dead player of Dan isn't going to do anything apart from say, uh-oh. They go for the swing. Palu gets one. There's the drop in the fight back end as Pasha does find Volps, but they're concerned about the swing elsewhere. They don't have vertical. You know where the kit is, but as soon as they get caught out from the one tuck player, they can at least get revenge. A three versus one. That ends just as quick. Liquid keep the advantage in their favor. Three to two. VP seem unable to win a site outside of Armory right now. And whilst we saw a different kind of game from Liquid, right? Like they wanted to take that top floor control, but it didn't really have the opportunity to take it. So where did that lead them? Back to a direct horizontal take and a plant in the same corner they did before. And it worked out for them. VP unable to find a good, solid response to that. And now back to bathroom tellers. Again, also won by Liquid when they were attacking this. But VP really looking to make this a 3-3 scoreline to really put themselves in the best opportunity for the second half. You're sort of looking at attack onto border. You're looking at yourself where you have that momentum working yeah. for you. You're looking at... It's not the easiest to defend. It's paper thin. Like It's paper thin. I've, you only need one or I've two positions it, and you cut the map in half. Said it as many times as you could make a paper thick book. I think one of the things that might cause some concern is... Virtus Pro can be slower to set up and take than what we're seeing from Liquid. They can be a little bit more predictable. Yeah. And we've seen Liquid respond quite well to that on previous maps. We've seen them swing into the approach. We've seen them try and sort of lock it down and, and cause problems here. The thing is, if slow uh, comes with clinical, you are not going to be surprised by any of like these jump outs that are usually quite prevalent in border and, and, and do disrupt your attacks quite a bit. So that's kind of the question then. If Virtus Pro is going to be slower under attacks, are they at least going to be clinical and, and, and surgical? If they can care of oh. these players, Pasha loses his life. And that is going to be the armory basically under control of Liquid already. That's something he'll probably be beating himself up for here. I mean, he's defined two rounds that were won and he's been locked out just from getting caught on a rotate. Nask able to sort of just swing up and say, how you doing? Sit out the rest of this round, mate. Always uh, one of those uh, members currently holding off two crucial positions, the metal stairs, but also the rotation into the armory. But they also realize, like, I cannot really stay here and put myself in this dangerous position because I cannot watch both angles at the same time. And whilst it's great to have both of them under control, you're going to have to make those choices. And you know, the drones are currently flooding into the side are going to be telling them, OK, armory is clear. And it looks like Archives is clear as well. So let's just take that crown and let's start preparing for what we actually need, which is going to be the office as always rotates back into CCTV, takes a little bit of damage as it goes back towards 90. Might actually be picked up Ooh. as he tries to get himself to office. Volps finds that kill and brings it to a two minute advantage. I mean, you talk about clinical, that was surgical. Just down the line of catching the player as they try to get themselves to a bit of safety. Dan has stepped in at the top of the meta. Stairs, at least the stairs. The Shepherd is the one that's just creeping their way around the bottom of the metal. Hit the beepers. They are steadily being pushed further and further back. I'm not sure if Lagonis has been able to get the control of the cameras for the approaching team, but we saw a default that was up at the top of those stairs. There it is the slow read through the approach to close down. There's 50 seconds all the time for them to put the advantage on this and get themselves to 4-2 half. 
They're ready to go for an execute, or at least they're getting themselves ready. Some people above the hatch. We have players outside the window. They're just looking to isolate one of these players and really Call collapse together. The phone calls go off. That usually means it's go time. And as Nest goes through, he misses the opportunity to neutralize Dan. If he would have found that kill, it could have been game over for the side of Furtis Pro in this half. Flash brings now coming through to try and guide in their player. But Ooh. another one goes down by the side of Dan, and he rotates all the way around. But that means that he's being spotted because the player is DBNO. Lugonis is going to see if he can try and stick the plan in the meantime. They know that there's the pressure, but the pressure is on this to swing around. The cover comes against them. Volps gets there. The player stepped into the window protection point. And Palu finds the remaining couple of kills. Liquid. They knew some of that was going away from them, but they had themselves that adaptation, that rotation, and that response towards just where things had gone wrong. And you could see Dan was so stuck in the decision they wanted to make, the one that they needed to make. Yeah. And it left them, well, here, 4-2-2, two, two, Liquid are in an advantageous position. However, they are on defense. So if they can't quite find the way to shut down some of the approaches as we had on Oregon, which was a, a good start that got a little bit away from them. Yeah, for sure. And then, then it is going to be quite problematic. And just think back about Dan there, like, he gets the injury on the window. I mean, the player is not going to be able to fight back. However, it's a living drone at that point. It's going to be giving away the information. The players in the bathroom know exactly when he's going to be trying to go for the jump through that wall. So don't really have to worry about it until you're told to worry about it. So that's why you saw him hesitate there, because if I go, I'm probably dead. If I don't go, I can live to fight for like a little bit later in this round. As long as that player is up there, you're not going to be able to, to find yourself on the top of that. So, Liquid, they win that first half, put themselves up 4-2 to two on their attack. VP now need to equalize that score or improve it if they want to find themselves with that first victory. The first start is not actually against the site that they led through. We're not finding ourselves into the opening of Armory instead down inside a site that became a big problem for them. The pace in the plant play against the vents hold that they had wasn't quite anything that led to some success here, whether it's the shake that saw us with the shotgun. It's going to make things very awkward. You have to clear out this vertical position. Otherwise, well, you're probably just going to get executed. I mean, it's not just that. They've also set themselves up in the bathroom. There, there's a couple of barricades. Sure, they're easy to take down, but just the threat of the player being out there uh -huh. basically makes it impossible to just waltz in and try and get that plant down because they can just look in from one of the angles they've made. Oh, default plant swap. Let's take them down. So that's off the cards right now. That means they need to take out vertical control first and to clear out the bathroom if they want to go for a plant inside of the workshop there. So that really leaves it up to ventilation. But that's a window hopping. It's also not really ideal. Reload. They're trying to find this first pick. They're trying to find this first player. As I said, the concern of the sort of slow setup might be something that gets punished out. by what is a very mobile team. There's the, the low run and the roots coming to their favor. Nesk entirely blinded, but there are players around Fountain and around the swing to offer any support. So he's not entirely lost. The E1D catch in the middle and there's the reveal of the player in what was once upon a time a very easily grenaded position. Always oh, does get Parley was the first take though. So as this is slowly being surrounded, Parley was playing the verticality. We had that of Solus inside office. There's the swing and the pressure further, but they don't quite pay attention towards the motion of Volps. Saves what is steadily becoming a pro an improbable position. And they actually just pull out. Now they've got the drop on the hatch. They've got the escape. They've said, we're just going to die if we stay here. So why not leave? They always have the opportunity to come back up, right? So they can just leave. There's multiple staircases, especially as soon as a plant starts to go down. The attacking team is going to be split, and that is the perfect opportunity to come back up the metal stairs or to go back up on those uh, those E staircases and try and find yourself in the right and best way to do so. Shepard finds the kill into Volks, and that is an opening onto the direct side. It's done by the way of the Boogie, who opened up the floor earlier, so definitely using that verticality out here, which is basically flooding the remaining defenders out of the site, which means they need to hold off angles if they want to hold it. Shepard is just being 
harassed by that drone, being hit multiple times. The Gumai now as well. A lot of damage taken, but he finds himself in the sight and can go for a plant. Gonna see if he can just get the stick quick. And there's resets that says no. They had the position. They had barely any time. The drop on the hatch is easily picked up by resets. And even if you still have two remaining players, we find ourselves back on Clubhouse spiritually. Well, they had all the players still standing and they just did not have that execute. And that is that cause for concern right now, because if we're getting the clubhouse attacks, well, then we're not getting any Virtus Pro attacks. I am baffled by how that round played out. There was no, there was no pressure coming back up top from the side off liquid, as, as far as I could see at least. The complete flooring was opened up. If you plant in that position, there's only two doors that you need to hold off and that one rotation. If anything, that rotation might be more important because that gives a direct line of sight. The door is, is a bit of a closer swing that needs to happen. It's not a tight angle as this. This should have been watched from above, especially because you still had three players left. Why wasn't everybody watching a flank or making sure that they couldn't be pushed from that position? Again, great clutch, by the way. Great clutch. Nothing to say about that because managed to sneak by at the right moment, realized if I'm not going to do anything, the plan goes down. They have vertical control. They can just look down upon us and make sure that we can never get the counter defuse in. And that's kind of the thing. You just have to throw your body at it at that point and hope that it solves the issue. It solved the issue in this case. You can see some frustration there, obviously, from Dan and you sort of look at the frustrating thing right now is Dan and Joystick cannot quite get into the gun game here. It's not entirely their responsibility. It's as it never is. But as I sort of highlighted on Volps, who had a great first map and a quiet second map, if you have that bounce back and forth, you'll find yourself become arguably even more frustrated when things aren't quite connecting to that level. And we know what these two are capable of on that entry roll, on that sort of fragging roll that they sit in. If those two players aren't getting the connection, well, then who is? And it becomes that worrisome step up 5-2. They still have the breath of fresh air that they can try and utilize and see if they can put some damage in. Hey, to be fair, they were only able to win one site on their defense and then they lost the others. It's still all to play for, even if it is that dire. It definitely is. And, and you know, at some point you would say there's no reason to panic yet. However, you're two rounds away from losing the matchup in its hole, so it's a slight reason to panic at this moment, especially if this round will go Liquid's way, because that will be four opportunities to lock out one of the two sides that have already won before. But that is something you uh, you don't really want to go up against at that point. Openings will be made, though. Shepard taking small amounts of damage. Palu does realize there's a player that was about to be entering right through that. Whoa. Trying to go for the fight there. <laughs> the rate of fire will win from Joystick against the uh, DMR that was trying to put some accurate shots out. But Joystick instantly will go down himself afterwards, as I believe that was Volps getting out some good shots. I don't know. I think it might have been resets Could've that been. gets the fight. Volps did get the kill onto Dan at the same second as the swing coming elsewhere. Again, this is Liquid, what they do very well here against Virtus Pro throughout this series. So far, been step into the approach. They seem to know and habitually have a method of going, okay, well, they're going for this, so here's the fight. We, in fact, saw Palu lean into the fight of the verticality, even though he lost it, but he had the support elsewhere. A minute left on the clock, Emmy. What do they have control of? The opposite side of the map. There is nothing there that gives them an opportunity to try and go for this plant safely. Verticality are in the hands of Liquid. Horizontally, they're nowhere there either. Oh, Nest oh, finds no. always who opens up a door. Didn't even know the player was out there. Pasha now on the hunt. What are you doing, Virtus Pro? You do not have the time to go hunt these players down. You need to get a plant down, and it is bathroom tellers. This is just a little bit tragic now. You can see they're a bit in their own heads. The pings come through. He's hot pinged. He knows they're aware of it. So he still goes for the pressure on the fight and takes it. There's only so many places the player could be. But Ness, as you said, just wasted an extra 30 seconds. And there's only 10 left in the round. I said it was a problem in club. It was a problem in the last round. They're still just caught out by Lagonis and Virtus Pro. They don't just sit on series point. They've got the 6-2 to go with it. I don't know what Virtus Pro was doing. I mean, I, I understand they started top floor, but I would have expected them to push towards the office quicker. 
rather than just play around CCTV the entire time, not trying to put any pressure down horizontally, losing a lot of your members, and then deciding with 30 seconds left, let's hunt the person who's quite literally as far away from the site as you can possibly be inside the building. It just, it doesn't help. And it puts them in a very dire position right now where they are four match points against them with two sides that Liquid have won so far. And of course, this next one, they haven't played yet. So they might take that. But after that, they have an opportunity to keep repeating. Virtus Pro, obviously, as you can see on the screen, are taking their time out, which is about to come to an end. They had no other choice, really. Let's be real, 6-2-2, two, two, and things have definitely fallen out of favor as we have seen four rounds in a row now tied either side of the half by a liquid that seems so re-energized into this engagement and into everything that is ahead of them. There is also that memory of, well, that's pretty much how many they tied together the last time round. So at this point, will they make it the same five? Will they go from what was a two to four to a seven to four, but even more depressing? VP, you need to show up now. It's not the way you want to go out of this game. Of course, we said it before, only first match of their groups. First match of the group. Still three more best of threes to go after this to decide if they are going upper bracket with a bye, just normal upper bracket, lower bracket, or if they get eliminated and sent home. So plenty of time to, to look back at your mistakes and see what went wrong and see what you need to improve on. But you want to start it off with a win. You just want to start it off being on top of that group at the end of the day. The external barbed wire. I mean, if anything shows how aggressive this map can be. Is it, that. External barbed wire is uh, always a fun one. Dan is going to see if they can try and get the Osta. It, it's a pretty known plant and idea. You do have to get some of the vertical control to ensure you don't get c forward from underneath or a Solus if they're on the board, but they are obviously not. You can also be c forward from over the top as well. So you got to have someone pitch perfect and ready for it. Volps and Joystick trade a little bit of bullets in an engagement over the top of Square. Nobody is quite able to get the lock out. There's the Osta just utilizing that shield to open it and wants to bait. The first C4 that's already ripped in the hands of well, actually two players. Uh, now just one. I think Palu might have been ready as well. Yeah. I mean, there's three in total, so there, there's plenty of opportunity to try for the deny. And if Dan decides that after the first one pops, it's safe now. Not the case. So he's really going to have to think about that. Now, what if that just blew up? That might actually bait him back into trying to go for a plant or trying to set up that Oster Shield. But also the verticality below has been open up right now and Laguna is sitting in this corner. He's not going to be making any noise. He's nope. just going to sit there. He's not going to move. He's not going to move his mouse with the finger on the G button. And he's just going to wait until he hears the plan go down and then he releases it. And he's got that arc. We know it's a team that practices lineups because we've seen it demonstrated throughout the series before. 6-2, Nesk is still waiting for somebody to make an appearance here, but... I mean, think about it. Two minutes has passed. What has Virtus Pro got control of here? Well, tell us now. All right. <laughs> they just got that. But as the phone calls go off, they need to get a little bit more. They spot out the player that is playing in one of those sandwich positions. Dan is now trying to find one as well. We'll find Paolo. That's a great pick. That actually opens up an opportunity, but he needs to rotate around as he's the shield carrier as the reset strikes back. Yeah, strikes back, gets control there onto Joystick. This player's still running out. Shepard hitting and punching bullet holes and always getting underneath and trying to remove the players from those C4 watch positions. But plan A, they're still trying to get the structure behind it. Pasha, he's up here to offer some support. There's one C4 still in the pocket of Volps. They seem to have gone with a quick plan B, which is let's get control of Office. The mirror window at the far end on CC. Towards the back of the hatch, the grenade forces the motion, but the blind gets the end of the kill. Dan, 30 seconds though, and that's the important part to pay attention to. Nesk, where are you going? Probably to cause some trouble as we've got a single player pushing up in the core, the middle of the site. It's always is the buck underneath, trying to force some attention away, but as Lagonis is tucked on the corner, ready to rock and roll, and Volps still has a C4. Dan is finally going to go for the deploy and the follow through because, well, he has nothing else he can do. Lagonis tucked and rocks the first kill. There's that C4, no shield. On. The players dropped underneath. They've got themselves into a position. It's Lagonis spraying up. They can't get the plot. No, no, the shotgun wins the game. And we have a liquid locking it down. Virtus Pro cannot.
find that momentum on border. There was such a painful last couple of seconds to watch in the eyes of Furtis Pro. Right now we can go for the plant. Oh no, we can't. The C4 comes through. They go again. A person down below. They try to dig in deeper afterwards, but the shotgun carries the diffuser carrier and takes them down in liquid with a very, very convincing 7-2 on border. What a return to form after that middle map. It's sort of a sandwich of greatness in the bread and a little bit of missing in the filling but that's your opponent's map and that's the sort of swing that we need to see i guess come from the teams as they grow and we talk about map pool we talk about places they can go to i love the energy that liquid is bringing to bring themselves back into these fights it's definitely been a bit of a back and forth in in, in some parts of this map but in general liquid able to just bring it home after they you know finished up that defensive half it was smooth sailing for them They've sort of made a bit of a statement here. As I said, from their region, because of how good their region has been, they aren't the favorites. There's a lot of con sort of conversations around where they would be, but they're probably still in the top three, the top four, because of the fantastic run they had before. Here, a very strong start, and we'll see what our desk, who are blind, deaf, and dumb, got you manic, we'll say. Yeah, look, fair enough. I'll take that one, Emmy. But we do have someone very important here right now. Palu with a massive victory there. 7-2 win on border. How does it feel to, to bag this one in the first day of SI? Yeah, it's amazing. Like, we are at our home country. There's nothing we can... How can I say? It's the best place you can be, right? <laughs> There's no, no other thing I can say. And we are doing everything we can. Like, we struggle a little bit on the Aragon. But I think, like, I did, don't even know the last time that VP played Barter. I really, like, mm. have no idea. And we got, like, a little surprise. But, yeah, it's a strong map for us, and that's it. Well, that was going to be my question to you is like, <laughs> obviously they haven't played border. So whatever intel that you might have would have been from, you know, I don't even know how long <laughs> ago. So what was the prep going into border, knowing that if you did get to the last map, like what were you guys expecting or what was like kind of the idea? Yeah, actually, we weren't expecting to play the third map because our one is also like one of the, our best yeah. maps. We struggle a little bit in some communication and stuff like that. And that's why I think we lost a couple of defense. And going to the third map, like we talked and we reset our mindsets and basically we play like uh, as a screen, let's say, because we didn't have much intel, we have to adapt the middle game and was basically that. Well, I do have one more question. Okay, okay. So Jesse called you guys frauds because of your guys' performance throughout 2023. I, on the other hand, backed you guys up and said that I have full confidence that it was just a fluke, that, you know, obviously you have bumps in the roads, trying to figure out what you need to do, but coming into SI, you guys were going to be prepared. What was the prep that went from 2023 leading into SI? Actually, last year we had, like, some issues outside the game. It was, like, some... A lot of discussions and stuff like that, yeah. and we kind of lost ourselves in through the year, you know. Right. We're like couldn't like do a screen and finish the whole day like being okay. We always like we're having a lot of discussions. Yeah. Let's say little fights, <laughs> not in the way that you think. No, but, yeah, yeah. I trust me. I know what it's like. Yeah, I, know yeah, what, I know exactly what you're talking about. But I'm and, glad you guys are able to. Yeah, do that. and like the most. The past weeks, and especially when we didn't classify to the major, mm -hmm. we focus on that. And I think like right now we are so much stronger. We are, like we really build a bond, you know, yeah. between us. And that's I think it's the big, the most important thing in a team. Definitely. If you don't have that, everything is Falls going apart. to be. <laughs> yeah. Paulo, the most important question I actually have has nothing to do with this game. It's got to do with SI itself. Obviously, this is a massive event, as yeah. you said, in your home country. This is this is your soil. How does it feel to, to be here and, and to be kicking it off in this fashion? You know, do, does it fill you with a, a sense of pride? Yes, of course. Uh, me and Nesk are like playing together for a while mm. and we haven't played any events here in Brazil. All the time, like the Sao Paulo Pro League, we classified to it, but it hasn't happened. So like we lost all the chances. And right now, like we are here and there is no one who can stop us, you know? I really, I mean, that's probably actually a good question. Who do you see as the biggest contender? Do you feel like you guys are coming into this as the number one? I can say that, like, mm -hmm. W7N won the last two majors. The focus on that is on them. Yeah. We are doing 
just ours, you know? Yeah, no, yeah. Of I course. Mean, that's, you worry that's about you, right? Like, yeah, if you worry about you, that's all you can focus on. Absolutely. Parley, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. Do you have anything you'd like to say to the audience before we let you go? No, I just I would like to thank everyone that's tuned for us and keep you. What about your team scan? Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you know, uh, go by. <laughs> 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 oh, that finally. Is, guys. We thank will you. be doing our best in the next matches. Yes, thank you very much, mate. We hope to see you when you get to the main stage. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, what a massive performance for Liquid now. They yeah. move forward, uh, you know, with this under their belt. I think, uh, w you know, we could um and ah as much as we want about Oregon, you know, uh, maybe a, a less convincing match for them. But to come back straight on border and, and like you said, you know, he... They don't even, they were not expecting. Ball. No, and I've said it. They're a dominant team. It goes to show why this team should not be slept on, even if they didn't have the great performance that we've been, you know, used to seeing Liquid. I know you got this face going on, right, Jesse? I know you guys can't see it. He's a little disappointed in, you know, the state <laughs> he made earlier. But no, to give it back to Liquid, I mean, these guys know what it takes. They have what it takes. Even if they lose that map, they did already have their map won. So you shake it off, you reset, you get into the last map, and you play it out the best of your ability. Like they said, they had no clue what they were going to do. They were just going to figure out, and they figured out exactly what VP setups were and took full advantage of that game. Well, it's time to have a look at uh, the highlight of that game that we're now talking about. Let's go ahead and have a look at the Intel play of the game. I think that, you know, contextual... I, I, there's no question that this was going to happen, right? It was a 4K in the very first round of Border. I thought that this was going to set us off on a different tone. Yeah, I think that, I mean, obviously this was a great map overall for Liquid, but I'm happy to uh, sound off about VP, and especially Pasha here. Yeah. I think this guy is absolutely incredible. Those four kills, they all swing into him one at a time, but he lines it up perfectly, right? Yeah. Those are not easy frags to get back to back to back to back. Four kills, playing that anchor spot. I really think Pasha is one of those players who is really slept on, one of the most talented players in all of Siege right now. Very, very impressed by him. Obviously couldn't get the dub today, but I really do think he's a, a, a fantastic player for Virtus Pro and one that is slept on way too hard. I've got to ask you as well, what does it feel like to be thrown under the bus by your... Uh, your that was colleague? a little rough. That was a little rough. But you know what? I said what I said and uh, I was wrong today. I mean, Liquid, they're not frauds. They played very well today and... That was a good game. Uh, a good game. <laughs> How about we just leave it there? How about we leave it on the handshake? As you can see, the players are now starting to join us behind the desk, so that means that we're going to start to prepare for a break. We're going to go, I would say, I think it's about 30 minutes, so feel free to take your time, but you do not want to miss this. I'm telling you right now, this is the team that everyone's been talking about all year. This is the match that will set the tone for the rest of SI. It is M80 taking on W7M. レイヤーネームは すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、すごい、
思いますで次にお魚好き選手っていうすごい頭のいい選手でその想像力が豊かだから相手が何をしてくるかっていうその余地とかもできてて自分たちのチームの中で一番頭が冴えてる選手だと思います。えー、最後にレック選手かなりそのスカーズといえばみたいなところで次に作戦がすごいっていうのとレックの打ち合いが強いって言われるぐらい世界からもすごい注目されてるエントリークラッカーみたいなので取り上げられてるぐらい、えー、世界に通用する日本の一番強い打ち合いプレイヤーだと思います。シックスインビテーショナルは知事年1回にしかない知事の一番大きな大会でそこで勝つっていうのは本当にその年に一番輝いたチームっていう証明なのでそこで勝つってことは歴史に知事の歴史に残る名誉あることだと思います自分たちは作戦がすごい意識してる重要視してるチームなので作戦対作戦になったら絶対に負けませんゴーゴーゴー I'm Lycris, playing for Fury. My role is to play a hard visual on attack and on defense. I try to play any ops that can make a rotate inside. Coming to SI, of course, is like nervous and excited at the same time. I don't think much about like how we face our opponent in our group. I believe we all coach like, have like high chance to go into the next phase because of we are, we are not in the group of dead. We're playing against Falcon on the first day. We never played with them before, but just from looking at them, they're like a dangerous team, I think. We didn't think much about it. We just practice and play our games, focus on each match. So I would say we didn't prepare anything special for all the team. We just prepare the same for every team on each match. Hey Falcon, see you there. Let's have some fun. I'm Susan, I play for Sonics and I'm a flex. Past year as a team looks good, but like it could be way better. Obviously last invite wasn't too good for us, but got top four of the majors, so hopefully like if we can find our way of playing and play together and play right, we should go far in this tournament. Well we're in group D, so we've got like three APAC teams and then playing low would be good because they got top four of the last major, but also I like to play like W7 and G2 because I feel like it'll be a fun game to play. Yeah, so we play Scars, so I think to expect is just a crazy match because they're crazy people, so we just gotta expect the unexpected and come prepared for it. Scars, we beat you before. We're ready again, we're ready for your craziness. So watch out, we've got Ambi now. He's a bit stupid, a bit more stupid than Gunnar, but he's also smart with the plays that he does. Be prepared, you're not ready for him. My name is David Iconic Ifedon. I play for M80 and I'm the IGL Flex. I feel like the, one of the biggest events for the fans was in Brazil. So, you know, to have the biggest tournament here with probably like one of the best fan bases in Siege is really amazing. So, just getting the opportunity to come here and compete with, you know, just a community and culture that really loves Siege is just, it's amazing. I want to play all the teams. I feel like we have a really good group. So, you know, I love playing just the best teams. You know, I feel like it's always the funnest matchup playing against the best players in the world. 
and it's just going to be a battle, so I'm excited to take some souls. We played W7M first, you know, they're an extremely talented team, so you know we're going to prep them hard and we're going to come ready to play. W7M, I feel like talk is cheap, so you know, I'm going to show up on the game day, I'm going to be talking to you guys, so it's going to be a fun match, so I hope you guys come prepared. Um, I'm Foltz, I'm a player for Space Station Gaming, and my role is Hard Breach slash Flex. So after last Invitational, we did a big revamp of our, our roster and kind of switched our identity and a lot of players and even coaches around. Through Copenhagen and Atlanta and now here, um, we've gotten better and kind of built those blocks up uh, to kind of get to the, the point we're at now. And I think this is the best form we've been in and um, I'm excited to, to play. I don't think there's any specific team I really want to play. Um, one thing I will say is the last time we played Wolves, we didn't play the best, but we've made, like I said, a lot of adjustments and we've changed a lot since then and learned a lot and um, I think this time is going to be much, much different. Now we're here at SI and uh, we are no longer friends, we are enemies. I'm uh, in D plus gear and I'm playing with Yasu and I'm playing with Flex. The biggest event of the year is Brazil San Paolo Invitation. I'm happy to be able to play the event in the end of the event. 일단 첫 경기 상대가 웨이즈고 그다음 뭐뭐 뭐 SSG나 울브즈, 블리스 이렇게 있는데 어 저희가 뭐 미니 게임만 잘 이긴다면은 충분히 할수 있는 상대라고 생각을 합니다. 일단 첫 경기는 페이즈인데 일단 페이즈가 브라질 팀이라서 뭐 손싸움 같은 걸좀 잘하는 편이라서 그거를 이기기 위한 조금 같이 팀, 팀적으로 움직이는 그런 움직임을 좀 많이 하려고 연습을 하고 있습니다. 베이지 긴장해라. 저번에는 졌었는데, 아, 저번에는 아쉽게 졌는데, 이번에는 이겨본다. <웃음> I got problems on problems on problems on problems on problems on problems I solve them. I run through the money, the press will be calling. Left on my blessings, I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage, I'm going through something, that's why I ain't calling. Phone and progression, it's all that I wanted. The phone and affection, I summon and dub it. Cause I got problems on problems on problems on problems on problems on problems I solve them. I run through the money, the press will be calling. Left on my blessings, I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage, I'm going through something, that's why I ain't calling. Phone and progression, it's all that I wanted. The phone and affection, I summon and dub it. Why you be all in my line about nothing why won't you go get you a dollar or something don't hang with it who line for nothing i see that we different you riding i double my don't do discussions on bragging about hundreds don't go to your places i know that they sunk and don't call me your brother i barely could trust it i talk to a shorty she bagging the bugging and i'ma need all of my dollars on corporate so hand me the money i divvy the pie i'ma give all of my people a portion to build them a fortune on flipping the ride i can't be mixy when iffy the vibe and 40 on 50 is really the time why are you all on my phone like you want me like you wasn't pushing the kids to the side i'ma run through the money the press will be calling left on my Blessings, I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage. I'm going through something. That's why I ain't calling. Meu nome é Jaime Pereira Ramos Jr., mais conhecido como Cyber dentro do, do jogo Rainbow Six. Jogo pela FaZe Clan. Now, what is the idea for FaZe to try and mix things up? Oh, what a shot there from Cyber! Major Suécia, eu quebrei, meu, quebrei o recorde né, de kills que teve em campeonato de Major. O próximo campeonato que a gente jogou, que foi o Major Berlin, a gente, eu quebrei de novamente meu recorde, mas não fui campeão. O estilo de jogo é muito agressivo, então eu sou um jogador que pensa em muitas possibilidades ao momento. Tem o Vita King, né, que é o nosso IGL, ele é um jogador que é, direciona a gente onde ele precisa. Essa parte assim ele faz muito bem, então acho que ele meio que nasceu para essa parte de fazer essa parte de GL assim. Tem um Souls né, que tá há muito tempo comigo, é um jogador que é muito calmo. Ele consegue pensar muito sobre o jogo também, ele consegue trazer muitos rounds importantes pra gente, que a gente tá perdendo. Ele é um jogador muito habilidoso nessa parte. O KDS é uma pessoa que fica, fica parado, não faz muita coisa assim fora do, do comum. KDS is looking for him and the opening kill is for FaZe. Acho que essa parte sim é uma parte mais forte dele, assim, de ser um jogador também que pensa bastante dentro do jogo e sabe a hora de executar alguma coisa. 
O Range é um jogador que é muito bom também. Ele tem uma parte de skill muito boa também. Eu acho que todo jogador nosso time é muito bom em questão de skill. Ele consegue fazer bastante round que a gente está perdendo ali de uma forma é, drástica. Acho que o Sig Invitation, todos os jogadores querem ganhar, né? Acho que cada um quer se provar ali dentro do, do campeonato. E eu acho que todos os jogadores pensam assim que é o maior campeonato assim, para si, né? Que é, é, o, é o troféu mais antigo que tem no jogo, então acho que é o que todo mundo quer ganhar. O time, esse é o time que ainda não que eu tenho que é mais unido dentro de jogo e fora. É um time muito agressivo quando precisa. Sabe que o nosso estilo de jogo é totalmente diferente do que eles jogam contra. Então acho que a galera assim, tem um pouco de medo de jogar contra a gente nessa parte. Eu PXS에서 entry flagger을 담당하고 있는 린 장병욱입니다. 어, 일단은 다크 코치가 합류하면서 해외 팀을 상대로 대응할 수 있는 대응법이나 여러 전략들이 있기 때문에 컨디션도 좋고 좋은 상태를 유지하고 있습니다. 저희는 일단 A 그룹에 속해 있고요. 개인적으로 가장 경계되는 팀은 GK e스포츠가 제일 경계되는 것 같습니다. 저희 첫 번째, 첫 번째 상대는 G2 e스포츠고요. G2 e스포츠 같은 경우에는 과거에 이겨본 전적이 있기 때문에 이번에도 충분히 이겨볼 수 있을 거라 생각합니다. 오랜만이야 G2. 이번에도 과거의 기억이 나도록 한번더 이겨줄게. My name is Joystick and I'm playing for Virtus Pro on Open Fire Road. Our goal is to go here for the stage and like show everyone what we can do as a team. Our group is uh, Group C. We were playing versus Liquid, W7M, M80 and Bleed. Our first match will be versus Liquid. We have uh, a lot of like matches before. We didn't win them any time, so it will be a crazy matchup because they are Brazilian teams. We are like a Europe team. We are playing so slow, they're playing so aggressive. So it will be some crazy stuff, different play styles, different like countries. It, it will be amazing in my opinion. Hey Liquid, you know that we are never trash talking to the other teams, so just have fun and I think we have a good match. Hey guys, I'm Iconic, I'm IGL for M80. M80 decide it's go time, Iconic for a double. I'm just kind of the guy that just takes the gaps and just puts people on the same page. Sport, he's our entry fighter. I mean, he's a wonder boy from Europe. Seeing him inside the server, he just takes your breath away. The shots he hits. There is nothing that they can do. How does he keep fighting these? Five seconds as he forces it down. Spike to clutch. He has like that willingness just to like get better. Gomez, another entry frag for us. We call him the boss man. As Gomez finally gets the first kill of the round for M80. But inside the lobby, he's like my secondary IPL too. So he helps me see things that I can't see inside the game because he knows M80 system extremely well too. He's a dog, he doesn't give up, he wants to win, and it's what we need on the team. Last but not least, Diaz. We call him the Punisher. If you're being too aggressive, you know Diaz will be good, so he'll catch you. He's also mechanically gifted, he's nasty at the game. Some stuff he does is just like, wow, to me. As he picks Gomez back up, quick thinking, Hoffman looks for it, but Diaz says not twice. My name is Takes Invitation, I mean, that'll be a dream, you know, I've dreamed of lifting that hammer multiple times. All I do is make dreams come true, so we'll see. It's like just a perfect blend of personality and characters, you know, so that what other people don't have, other people have, and other people have, some people don't have, so it's just, it's a good mix of people to be around.
Well, it's time. Many questions now get to be answered. We get to see the big dogs take on M80. And this one is, I think this is an important game just to kickstart SI. I think that it's important to give context. It's important to see where W7M are at and what their claim for the title is going to be. Because that's been the big question ever since Atlanta. What are they going to do when they get to SI? I mean, when there's no real introduction that needs to be made in terms of W7M. They are by far looking like the best team in the world, regardless of not having that world championship title. But in terms of their placings, I mean, they've just in their entire 2023, they haven't placed outside of third. <sighs> and they've won the past two majors back to back. I mean, this is a roster, a five man roster that is phenomenal on all fronts. W7M is not a team that we're talking about. Are they the best in the world or are they not? W7M are the team that we're talking about. Are they the best of all time or are or not, are they not? Mm. This is the stakes we're dealing with W7M. There's no question they are better, at least on paper, than every other team in this event. Will they show up? Will they prove that? Will they play to the, how they've played at previous events? Well, yet to be seen. But W7M are the heavy favorites coming into this. They will be against M80. They will be against any team they go against. Absolutely. Back to back major champions has never been done until they did it in Atlanta. And now they're looking to go for the three. -time. Well, that's just it, right? Like, it's never been done until it's been done. And. That's the beauty of this. And it's and it's a story. It's a yeah. last dance. It's, yeah. This is W7M as the org, their last time being in Rainbow Six after this event. I mean, if they can just run this whole entire 2023 into 2024, ending it on a note of winning SI as well, I mean, that's already history in and itself. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point because they've already tweeted, they've said that the organization and the players are going to be going different directions. Yep. After this tournament, players are going to be looking for some... Uh, some other way to play together. We don't know the details, um, but all in all, I mean, this is kind of the final moment we're going to see these players represented by this org. So it's a big moment. It's kind of make or break for the dynasty, for the legacy. Yeah, Absolutely. it really is the last dance. It's just the perfect way of framing it. And I, I don't think that we should frame it in any other light. No. But we do have to frame a different team in maybe a different light. M80, where, where are you sitting with M80 this year? So as much as, you know, I'm an NA guy, right? Yeah. Obviously. But really? Couldn't tell. This team specifically, on paper, this team is disgusting. Yeah. They they run the North American League in a dominant fashion. We've seen how strong they are, but in international play, we have not seen that same performance that we've seen in the NAL stage. I mean, just looking into their NAL stage in general for at least Copenhagen, they placed 12th through 14th, and then in most recently Atlanta, they placed 15th through 16th and were worse than what they were in Copenhagen. We have to see the M80 that we see in the North American League internationally. M80, they're getting very loud behind <laughs> yeah, us. I, mean, I did not hear a single <laughs> you have said that. I'm sure it was profound. Yeah, they they're getting loud. That's the energy they're going to need coming into this because their two majors thus far this uh, this year have not been up to snuff. Mm. They got a single map win in Copenhagen. They got zero map wins when it came down to Atlanta. So they have started. Now I will say, outside of majors, Gamers 8 was their tournament. They popped off. They beat W7M in the semifinals to make it as far as they did in that tournament. So they have history against this organization. Whilst everybody is going to still consider W7M to be the favorites, M80 have a history of getting the upset against this they team. They do. And there is something to note. They did replace Kino with Yaga. Yaga is a former player yeah. that was originally on their roster or also on the OXG roster back in the days with myself and Kino. So they are bringing someone who does do extremely well. I believe Yago had the best stats statistically in the NAL stage recently. Yep. So him coming back, already having LAN experience, already having SI experience, and to my knowledge, in his SI experiences, he's played extremely well and has always been one of the top players for his teams. So they definitely have another juggernaut on the team. But again, me personally, I don't think this comes down to one player fixing this team. I think it comes down to the team dynamic and the leadership and the coaching staff around it. Kind of feels like, you know, the conversation of like the weakest link, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. where that's where you're always, you can only be as strong as your weakest link. But when you look at the two different teams, yeah. W7M versus M80, is there a clear divide? Is there a distinct difference? There's a massive difference? divide. Yes, of course there's a massive divide, right? I mean, you just have to look at the stats from Atlanta. W7M, the best defensive team in the world, 71%. One of the best attacking teams in the world, 47%. For M80, you're looking at 43 on defense, 32 on attack. That's about half of what we saw from W7M when you're looking just at the raw uh, win rates. And I think the point that Loxie made is important. Yaga coming in should be a boost to this team. Yaga had an exceptional stage two, Absolutely. the highest kill death ratio of any North American player through the entirety of the second stage. That's nothing to laugh at. And of course, he's got that history with this team. He's going to be a great asset to jump on in. Yep. But is it enough for W7M? 
Probably not. Yeah. As much as I am NA, I, I can't I can't go against W7M. I yeah. just simply cannot. Yeah. Well, look, you've got to draw a line in the sand somewhere, and if that's where it's drawn, that's where it's drawn. They're up against the greatest team that we've. They are, seen and I think a it's a time. great challenge. Yeah, and I will say there is something to be said about going up against your toughest opponent first. Yes. Yeah. In the Atlanta Major, the first opponents that W7M played were GK. Yep. You know what? They lost. Yeah. Whether that was because, you know, I think it was both in part of GK playing that game well, but also because W7M went off to a bit of a slow start. M80 could be trying to replicate that magic. It's a best of three now. It was a best of one back then. That's a big difference. But I do think that coming in, this is maybe the best chance you have of W7M being a little bit cold, a little bit off their game. The off season over the winter was long. So there is a world where W7M come in, underestimate, they're a little sleepy. Maybe this is an easier game for M80 than some of the other group opponents will have against W7M. Yeah. Right. One thing I want to note, the stream could hear that because I stopped I mean, specifically for that. Incredible. I'm looking at you right now and I see your mouth moving. I have no idea what was said. It doesn't matter, does it? It's just the beautiful <laughs> noise of the background. Well, we will go to the map video. It's probably the more important part of this conversation. Clubhouse is where we kick off on Jesse. Yeah, nothing crazy with the clubhouse pick coming through from uh, from M80. Chalet from W7M, I actually think is quite spicy. W7M are a great chalet pick. It's not a shock that they've picked it, but it is a shock that they picked it against this team. M80 are the only team all season long to have beaten W7M on Chalet. They overall have a 5-1 record this season. So the fact that they decided to pick this, they're almost saying to the world, they're like, listen, one team gave us a blip on this map. We're going to make sure that blip goes away. That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, you got to you got to really be confident and already be in W7M. That speaks for itself. But going against Chalet, where a team did beat you in, I mean, it's definitely like you were saying. They see it as like a blip and not really an issue whatsoever. So they're going to go in gung-ho and not even try to get to Skyscraper. The Skyscraper actually surprised me, to be honest. I didn't mm. know if it was going to end on Skyscraper or more of a little simpler default map. So seeing that happen, be the, that being the decider, I mean, if we get there, I am curious to see what M80 is going to bring to that table because M80 wasn't looking super strong on Skyscraper by any means. Mm. So I do want to see if we do get to that third map, how that's going to pan out. But I do think in terms of map pool and these two maps that are starting, I think it does heavily favor W7M. I will also say I like the clubhouse pick coming in quite a bit sure. um, for M80. That'll be our first map. And I do think that that's the map that W7M looked the weakest on in Atlanta. It's a map they lost twice, both times to GK. It's a map that we did see them look vulnerable on. There's a lot of footage on W7M, assuming they haven't changed much, which maybe they have. But all in all, I do think that for M80, this is a smart pick. It's a map that they definitely um, should have some intel on. They should feel confident on. Uh, question is, of course, performance on the game day, but I do like that pick from M80. I'm just, uh, I'm listening to, to all the chatter. Um, it's quite entertaining uh -huh. watching these two. You've got nearly polar opposites in M80 making as much noise as humanly possible. When they're in their huddle, all you could hear was some humbug going on. Mm -hmm. Looked across at the W7M, and they're just having a little chuckle to themselves. You know, they're they're in, they're ready. They know what's going I on. I think they aren't gonna let the mental warfare of M80 yelling God. and screaming at them really gonna affect them. They know what they got. They know That's what they it. bring to the table. They've already proved many times what they have. So I don't, yeah. if I think if you're a W7M, you aren't worried. Well, this this just has to be routine now, right? Like mm -hmm. this, just, this just has to click into a different gear, regardless of all the conversation leading up to this, no matter what happens, even in this first game, no matter what happens in this first game, this is business as usual now for this team. The W7M, this is their chance to leave a mark on, on Rainbow Six that we haven't seen in years. Yeah, I mean, when you're the best too, everybody's swinging for you, everybody's eager to take you on. I'm sure W7M are used to that. They maybe thrive in that a little bit too. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is the best team in the world with the best players in the world. I'm really excited to see what Herds can do. I don't think there's been a player like Herds in Rainbow Six for a very long time. Mm. Yes, maybe Sploit won the Jinxy 1v1 tournament, but I still <laughs> think Herds is the better player overall. And I think he's gonna make a very difficult challenge for M80. You snuck it in there, didn't you? you just <laughs> He's had definitely to. snuck that. You just had to. Well, guess what? It is time for us to get underway, and the only people that would be suited to cast the goats are the goats themselves. That's very heartwarming. You know, we I just met him for the first time ever yesterday, despite being in this ecosystem for years, and despite the fact that he's a little bit under the weather, because, you know, yeah, it happens. I gotta say, you're doing a fantastic job. The other two on the desk, They're okay. whatever, whatever, spare parts, if you want to yeah. call them now. M80 versus W7M, the best team in the world, and then a team of five Brazilians going up against each other. <laughs> it's classic misdirect here. Wow. He's classic misdirect here. W7M have looked absolutely indomitable over the last 
Yeah, full count a year. 11 months? Yeah. I mean, technically, you could say 12 months if you want to go back to SI last year, but they weren't unstoppable because G2 stopped them. Yeah, somehow, some way. And this is the thing, like, the star really is basically the best team to ever do it besides Prime Pages G2 versus a Medu who's got everything going for them besides results. You know, they bring in big names like Spot Iconic, they build the roster, they got the finances, they got great media content going, etc. But they have not really achieved anything in this like calendar year in Rainbow Six Siege. Yeah, they get grouped, well, they get grouped every single time. So internationally they flop, but domestically typically plays in between first or third place. So we know they can do it, they just can't really seem to do it when it matters the most. Clubhouse, no easy place to go first, but it's the first map of the series. Maverick being banned immediately, so this is gonna ask the question, will Tuburu, will Kaid stay open? What's gonna happen with that wall deny? Ka or sorry, Ying follows through as well, a classic basement execute operator with those candelas. And w M will ban the first defender, and they choose Tuburu! If you're on the base teams in the world, it would make things, uh, sorry, it would make sense to keep things the same, right? Because you excel in the, you know, three months ago meta, so why not just force that same meta again by banning the new operator? Makes sense to me, and honestly, from the match that you and I casted earlier in the day, I didn't really see much that made me think the Tubaru play was oh. incredibly important, but now Bandit is also banned out, so. I mean, this is a classic, you know, clubhouse band scenario. You you play around the heart breaching. Way back in the day when, you know, Thatcher and Maverick were the only two reloads to deal with walls, you'd often see one team ban the Thatcher, and the other team is like, should we should we also ban the Maverick and make a tagging absolutely miserable? And with Tuberu being introduced to Siege, being like another kind of like a, like a mute who can stall out a wall, well, we are now back in this kind of era of Siege where you have to problem solve the heart breach. We haven't seen that for quite some time. Um, besides, you know, impact tricking, etc. inside the building. So I personally am a big fan of an operator like Tuburu on a map like Clubhouse, where this has been a thing in the past. Hope you're enjoying the music. Oh, I am. I'm vibing here. <laughs> do, do. The Yog Dog returns. Oh, yeah. Loaned, as far as we're aware, from OSG. We played, uh, of course, stage two with OXG, played incredibly well. I think the highest rated player. Then played LCQ with OXG, where things didn't go so well for that team. And Yawk himself had a pretty, like, mediocre performance, so to speak. The whole team kind of, you know, blew up, so to speak. So Yawk has it in him, but of course, fitting into a new roster, you know, off the rip with little practice, it's, it's always difficult, despite him, of course, having experience with these players in the past. With certain commentators in the scene who have referred to M80 as the best hope for North America. I mean, let's be frank, North America's not exactly had the best year when it comes to Rainbow Six Siege. Oh, no, they haven't. There have been ebbs and flows with this region. There are times when NA looks terrible, and EU looks so dominant, and then it's Brazil's time to look dominant, and NA still looks terrible. Some APAC teams can make a deep run, but that was years ago, and then NA still looks terrible. But at the end of the day, you've got consistent forces here. SQ is currently in action on the other stream, playing against the Japanese team of Scars. You and I got to see the other NA team of DZ play earlier on. SSG played earlier today as, as well, so... All the NA teams. Today, all the NA teams, all the time. Yeah, in action. M80 have so many tools at their disposal, Nick. There really isn't anything that they lack individually. Now, you can have all the tools, but not know how to use them. And obviously, every team has those struggles. The team that has struggled the least with that is W7M. That's yeah. under the high water mark. Exactly. But W7M are a team that are very consistent, and you can prep for them, and it still doesn't mean a damn thing. <laughs> so how is M80 going to approach this? It's been a relatively slow round to start off with. Half of the round is already gone. Yeah, I do like that. I mean, w and them themselves, they're not going all that quickly. They got the Blitz. They could definitely go for a quicker roam clear, but they're taking things one step at a time here, and they've got a spot isolated. He will, of course, drop down, but will get trade in the process. And again, you can talk about w them. Why are they so good? Even in a spot like that, where they find the roamer, within a second, there's another person to trade. They don't go zero for one and spot gets away. No, no. They they trade one for one is an even outcome for them. It's a massive deal here. Going live. We'll talk about this in the next round because I have a feeling that things are going to get particularly <laughs> crazy. He's expecting the Blitz to play. Yeah, why, I love that's, this. That's why he's done it. It's just not that common to see, but I, I'm a fan, I will say. But Blitz and Bard, no one needs to near that area. 
So, you see JV bottom main stairs now, and they're still looking and fishing for a kill. There's pretty much only one reason why you barricade this, Nick, and what's that? Um, because you're afraid of someone walking down the staircase? Because <laughs> you're afraid of a rush. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Teams, especially NA teams, will barricade that off because they're afraid of a rush, and it'll slow you down, but also act as intel. You don't want to barricade, obviously, every single mm. door, but now, if you look, who's there? The Twitch of JV, and now they know that he's pressuring towards the bomb site. Same with Velipox, who stopped for a second as that goo mine hits his foot. Down goes Herds. Only 10 seconds left. W7M have three players to go. Velipox rushing in, and it's over. That's it. M80. Ice in their veins. It was just a bit too slow for W7M, and it was a stalwart defense from M80. Might have been a W7M expected a more aggressive side from the defense there, but that didn't happen. I mean, it was a very laid back, kind of conservative play style from M80, where the only real roamer, only real aggressor in that round was Sport, who died trying to get back to the bomb side. The Blitz was excellent in theory because they could go quickly, they could get into the building, etc. But that's not really what played out in that particular round. Now, mind you, this is day one of the six invitationals, the first match of both of these teams on LAN, besides, you know, scrimming, etc. So they're, you have to kind of get in gear, get into that game my mindset, feel out the server, etc. Just get comfortable on LAN. It was not a great round for WCM per se, but also a team kill happened actually in the, in the chaos of that previous round. <laughs> I mean, imagine being spot, right? You get your one kill early on, you sit there for a full minute watching your team, but okay, 4v4, you guys got this. He has no default cams to watch, no camera, like, camera operators. He had no impact in the round after he died, but at least he got his one. And now I got Iconic playing Solis with a shotgun primary, of all things. A lot of shotguns today. Hibana, Amaru, Solis now throughout these matches. I think there's a reason for that. Shotguns, much like DMRs, they go kind of hard on land. They really shred through people. And you can force positions like, for example, Dirt Tunnel on an anti roam because who's going to challenge a shotgun operator in Dirt? You're forcing the close quarter fight. You know, it's really funny because there was a period of time where if you were bringing any shotgun other than the SAS shotgun, you were kind of trolling. That's true. I mean, other than maybe the skeleton key on Buck and then the sidearm on Mira and Jackal. But now you've got Amaru and Echo who can do it in certain regions, like APAC, for example. You can even run Hibana with that shotgun. So there are options at your disposal. First casualty is Herds. Jackal down below, who often has a secondary as a shotgun. Runs right into Iconic, playing at this position. Oh, nice. <laughs> Read through the wall. And down goes Iconic. Felipox punishing him. Bottom floor control now in the grasps of W7M while the breach in the CCTV has also been opened. So just because W7M's focus was downstairs mm. does not mean they weren't splitting their focus elsewhere. No, they certainly did two things at once. And again, they get that trade, not immediately, but again, they don't let Iconic get a kill and get away. So they trade one for one again, equalizing to a 4v4. And it's a bit puzzling that Hertz died the way he did because he is the Jackal. He was right by Iconic where he could scan the, the footsteps. But maybe a miscalculation or a missed call from a drone or something like that. We never know. Gomez now is the main man in this round. Playing the Catwalk Rafters. Keep it barriers to protect him. And a teammate by the the main breach, so to speak. But he is pretty much on his own. And now you can only put the grenades. It's up to Nade on the Caps of Fire arrows to clear out that position. Gotta give some credit here to, to M80 for how much they're slow Going down this match, W7M have no real answer to get in the building. And again, the time is working against them. This round is a bit more of a frenzy than what we saw before, but not in the way that M W7M wants. They've only got KZ and Felipox still up. On striking distance of the site, particularly Felipox now. Huh. I mean, planning here is difficult. You want to get a pick if possible. They still got what, two Toxic Babes. That one just went out to one spare and his C4 as well. This should be a relatively easy kill for KZ, oh. which will immediately swing things back. Oh. oh boy, he almost gets all three. A Nitro Cell tossed out to secure the kill. It's good enough. And now it's Spoit, the star player from Europe, imported from M80. A nade goes out. We don't see much of those anymore. Can't cook him. So plenty of time for Spoit to reposition. Now encroaching upon the position of Felipox, who, the biggest chat, decides to stick to Diffuser. Spoit position inside of Cash. He's got the right idea. The Sledge is gonna continue to shoot away. Spoit vaulting on over, looking for the kill, doing some serious damage. 
getting the kill in the clutch as well. Bodega very happy about that one. M80 <laughs> off to the races. Two rounds in a row to start this match. Very close call. Phenomenal attempt there from Casey to open things up, but it's part in the one one who reigns supreme and gets that W. Note that there were no Valkyrie cameras left up for the defending side because WCNM they took care of all three of those earlier on. It was a pure 1v1 with no outside intel, and both players sat back waiting for the opponent to make the first move, playing off the in-game sound. But also, Spot had a little bit more HP to work with. The new Felipox relative low and of course that's going to give you a whole lot more confidence goes to those pre-fires if a few of those shots they hit you're going to either injure your opponent or just outright kill them but w7m they're definitely getting quote unquote outplayed here they're not expecting what m80 are going to be doing first round they were super passive only spot was roaming second round we see gomez on cattle grafters just vaulting on over getting basically two kills for his life yawk peeking the breach getting a nasty shot with his ism 11 from a long range and I gotta say, Yogg might have been new to this roster, so to speak, coming from OXG, but he's had a phenomenal first two rounds, getting both impact value and kills. Ah! It's William! <laughs> last uh, last major, I actually was in the... I was in the same row as Sport on the plane home, and, you know, Emi didn't have the greatest performance and whatnot, and... Uh, yeah, just sat down and spot spot like, yo, like, what's what's life like for you, you know? Like, Swedish kid now, you know, going to America, playing for NA Org, etc. And not really doing as good as as a team as people thought, and he was pretty chill about it. William, aka Spot, been a pretty, like, optimistic guy. Pretty good head on his shoulders. Of course, Spot is technically still, like, a, a young player, but he did win the Berlin Major with the former Rogue, now Koi, Org slash roster. He's got a championship under his belt already in terms of a major. Nothing for WCM though. Back to back major champions. Seemingly unstoppable for an entire year. Not the start they wanted, but the breach does get opened up. The Ox Impact was not entirely successful. No, it was that one. I was going to say, I don't think that second one hit at all. <laughs> no, it, it did not. Impact's tricky. Well, that was impact tricking. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> Very good. A failed one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Snap. See, it means one thing, but it also means something else. That's yeah, it does. I believe we call that a double entendre. Ugh. That's French for those of you that don't speak. Right? Very fancy. Herd's getting a good read oh. on the yellow ping. They knew Gomez was positioned inside of that bathroom, and finishing him off means that, for the moment, it's an uncontested first kill for W7M. Was well, the first one of the series, I would argue, get the like, seeing as like, sure, Iconic got the kill last, but got straight back relatively quickly. Waiting for the races. More damage being done now. It's Diaz dropped. Still retrievable. Iconic is coming in to assist. I don't know if they're waiting for an audio call. He's seen the shoulder. Iconic with a pick, but elsewhere. M80 is being pulverized. No time to get Diaz Lucas back up. So instead, Iconic will get the pick and reset. Just narrowly avoiding the bees. Now it's Hurts. Ooh. He was very briefly nearsighted, but manages to get the pick before his sight completely disappears. W7M, get on the board. And this is the thing, like, sure, W7M, they've lost the first two rounds and then a clean third round here, but no matter what, you look at how quickly they trade one another when somebody dies, or whenever they make a play somewhere on the map, there's always someone else following up. We saw it in that round. One person dropped down the office hatch, another person on the breach outside construction. In the second, the hatch guy goes down, construction guy swings in. They guarantee a two versus one gunfight in a dangerous area in case an enemy would be there. Turns out there wasn't, so instead, one guy covers, one guy pushes past the bedroom, they get bombsite control. But the fundamentals of W7M is why they are currently the best team in the world. They have so few gaps in their team play, and they basically don't look like they have any real weaknesses over like a like a long period of time where you say, okay, they always struggle with flank watching, or they always struggle with breaching open walls. I cannot mention a category like that where I'm thinking, you know what? They could be a lot better here. It's like they are really good at a lot of things and they are still good at everything else. 
So even when they're losing rounds, things are going quite well for them. Here, yellow ping intel box below, perfect utility usage. Secondly, let's look at this. Office hash drop, one guy's on the window, one guy's covering construction, free side entry, gets one pick, gets a second pick. That's the round done right there. That's it, it's that simple. And that's because they got everything locked out. They can pretty much say, hey, this area is clear, this area is clear, and this area is clear. You only have to worry about bathroom and maybe gym if you see a person. That's it. it like, the team play makes everything in that round. It's also a round where, in terms of timing and confidence, that first pick and then taking early control of that exterior by Jacuzzi was huge, really, for the program some would even say. And of course, it's the tertiary bomb site where things go south yeah. for the defenders. And if we know anything about Clubhouse, it's that that tertiary site is usually the one that they lose. Now, depending on the team, you approach this map with different tertiary sites. That's a good point, yeah. Bar and stage can be a tertiary site for some of these teams. Very normal rotation for M80, and for the fourth round, they'll go back downstairs to church, the bomb site where they started this map. I'm not surprised, you know, when you got mirror open especially, you can just like make things very comfortable. You don't necessarily have that many options on, as to where to put the mirror windows. Typically, you do two walls reinforced on church, mirror window on it, third wall is off, and of course, the blue mirror window leading from third box into blue. But I do believe that they, they actually opted for a triple church reinforcement, so they have changed some things around to go from a passive approach. And the difference is, though, W7M much, much quicker this time around. <laughs> Often forget how loud Stokes is, by the way. I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if the uh, I don't know if it's bleeding through from the other stream or not. But let me tell you, there is a here happening. Yeah. There certainly is. Yeah. Ambi making his uh, pro play debut. Also true. I remember when Ambi first started on the scene ages ago. And he was like 13 or something, like 13, 14. There was a period of time where when Yaga was like underage and people were talking about him coming to play pro, I was like, oh, I'm not going to be casting great yeah. when Yaga becomes a pro. <laughs> and now, back. well, here he is, literally on the left side of your screen. Oh, boy. And I would have said the same thing about Ambi. Like, by the time this kid hits 18 and starts to play, there's no way I'm going to be casting this game, right? <laughs> well, here we are. And it's still just as fun as it was the first day that I sat down in Poland to do it. Now, we talk about the speed of these rounds, Nick. And this is a church take. Usually, unless you go for a fast pick, and then a fast push. It's going to take until the final 30 or 40 seconds. Both of these Osa shields are in pocket for nade. I'm going to drop with it. That's it. You need to cover. No Blitz, no Monty. This is the way. No damage being done. Gomez in bad position. Cut off by Herds. Down goes Spoid as well. An answer back for Yaga. Talon shield deployed. Yaga on the board for three picks. Sacrificing some of his HP in the process. Ooh. Diaz taking out nade. And now it's Velipox to drop. Iconic getting in on that. A three-piece from Yaga, loaned over from OXG. That's nasty. That'll lock the church bomb site for the remainder of this first half. Two for two on this part of the map for M80. It also guarantees that M80 cannot lose this first half, so they've picked up three rounds. It's a good point. And I mean, Yogg is putting in work right now, single-handedly winning that round for his team. And I will say strategically, I feel like WSMM, they had other options in that round. Instead of backing off a little bit, putting down the Osa shield, the Talon shield, and trying to go for a plant, knowing that there might be an impact player on that AK's position, which there was, you could arguably drop with the shield to cover you from the bullets, walk a little bit left to the default plant position, and while yes, you are vulnerable to a C4, that wasn't really the threat. The mirror, who you would assume is a C4 player, was playing inside a dirt tunnel. He basically had blue control, smoke is playing dirt box. It's one of those, okay, maybe smoke will get it, but look what Yark is doing. He is so distracted by the push inside of blue that there is no plant denial for the default position. You can also, of course, argue if one gunfight goes a different way and Yawk doesn't get that 3k, w would be perfectly fine. But the point is, something could have been a little bit better there from the attack inside. But sometimes all you need is a hero. And right now, they've had two of those on from M80. One's on Spart, and now one's on Yawk as well. Six and two playing Smoke, and you might be thinking, you know, Smoke plays far back on side, holds boring angles, doesn't get a lot of kills. Well, you'd be wrong. Smoke is a top gunner its entire server so far from both sides. 
really good stuff from y'all. Okay. Well, this is certainly the start that M80 wanted. This is their map pick, of course, so. You want to start off strong, and the oh. expectation is that you will play up to that potential. Though it's not always a given. I mean, if there's a big imbalance between teams, two O's will occur. We have seen two O's today. So we have. not every single best of three has gone the full distance. Nice play by Iconic as Herds walks up the stairs. They thought they had something with Iconic because of Dokubi's logic bombs, but Herds is betrayed by his own gadgetry. The SMG Lemons here, they're doing so much work. Both Iconic and Yawk finding one apiece. I mean, didn't they nerf that thing? Wasn't that, <laughs> wasn't the argument that the SMG 11 would be completely useless oh, at this point? no. Seems to be doing pretty well so far. I would have to agree. Iconic shooting completely blind. It's technically Spoit who gets the pick. Another versus Spoit as well. I don't really know what's going on because it looked like Iconic got the first one. Now it's Nade to walk in. Over by Jim. Lots of heavy lifting to be done. Woo! Swung on by Iconic. Spoit's not going to get all the kills, but all the kills in that round go to M80. Flawlessly done. 4 1 first half as Iconic speaks his mind to W7M. <laughs> Impressive start for the North American team. I mean, if you want to take down W7M in a best of three, this is how you want to do it. Start off really strong in the first map, get in their head a little bit, make them feel uneasy in the server, and then you go to Shelley, which is where maybe beat them the last time around. So the only teams in the world. Oh, Eric, keep throwing it, keep doing it. Yep, there it is. But yeah, these gunfights are so one-sided, and normally we don't tend to say, oh, W7M, they're outgunned, they're outmatched one-to-one. -one. We always say they can go up against any team one-to-one -one in terms of raw fracking capabilities. That is not the case right now. They are not hitting their shots. No, not at all. And when Sao Paulo, what's the excuse here? Jet lag? No, they probably drove here. That's a lie, it's a massive city, but... <laughs> Just for perspective, it's one of the biggest cities on the planet. Yep. It's something like fourth or fifth or third largest city on the planet. Not just in terms of population, but also just in terms of size. You don't really get a good appreciation for how big Sao Paulo is. When you look up something and you say, oh, that looks cool, how far are we? And then you look it up, it's an hour and a half drive, and there's virtually no traffic. It's just so far from each other. Yep. It reminds me a lot of LA. The only big difference there is LA has a lot of traffic, which yeah. makes it miserable. <laughs> Opportunity by Spoit as he goes for the run out in the garage, but Herds is already sunk down. Can't be spotted as a CCTV cache breach gets opened up. Cache, not where the bomb site is. Sell them out. Yeah, just that extension. I gotta say, like, what Spoil is doing right now with that run is a little bit of, like, disrespect, if you will, but it's exactly what you can do when you're up four to one in terms of round count. You can take those big gambles where, okay, if Spoil died there, you're playing 4v5. It's not the end of the world. You got a big round lead, but you are keeping your opponent on their toes. Iconic now, next in the line of fire, taking a bunch of damage. Not a great start here for a matey, but they got this extension, scan cash with soft walls, by the way, and the fire will finish off Iconic with 20 health left to his name. I've actually seen a lot of Capitao today, but I haven't Tons. really noticed a lot of direct impact from having the Capitao. Obviously, we've seen diffusers get planted, but the smokes from Capitao aren't necessarily all that important. The fire has been used to dislodge and deny area, and there's the last one that's gonna go out from Felipox. Allows Gomez time to get over towards construction. Look out the window. I don't think Spoid is aware of how close these players are to him. But using those Kiva barriers has oh. completely removed any possible rotation. Gomez picking off KZ and Felipox. Spoit still on the top of red. No push that can come in through CCTV. Not just hitting their shots, but also the strategy behind M80 so far in their defenses has been quite good. Yeah, I mean, they got the setup, they got the fall, but they got two shields in the same location right on the bomb side. I mean, and again, Spoik gets out alive. That is vital. And they don't know this. JV respecting the possibility of him sticking around, but he's long gone. He's like bottom main stairs right now. And W7M, they're locked out at the bomb side, mostly even outside the building. Herds will have to vault in at some point. As Nade looks through the jacuzzi breach, but he can't get there. Nade will die without a single kill on the first half. Zero and five is not the scoreline that you want from any of the players on any team, but especially not the most dominant team that we've watched over the last year. JV92 also only has a single kill. KZ, two kills. 
strategy or not, you're engaging in these heads up gunfights and you're not winning them. JV finds a second kill in this first half. It's on the sport. You'll play around the Kiba barriers. But look at that. Through the deployable shield, M80 will be granted a narrow window. Nice shot from JV through the wall. Pulls out the pistol sidearm, but it's Diaz to jump up and shut him down. I don't know about you, but I did not have M80 winning the first half 5-1 on my bingo card. <laughs> but things are not going particularly well for W7M at the moment. No one is like, even when things do go in the way of W7M to start things off, there's always that quote-unquote hero play that equalizes or gets M80 back into the lead or advantageous position. In that previous round, you know, W7M to get a pick onto Iconic with their capital fire, Sport is less than half HP. Gomez then jumps out a window, shoots the Claymore, and gets two kills. And all of a sudden, the round gets completely flipped. And you see it right here. Claymore, bang. And he catches it on the repel animation. And Casey was afraid of team killing Felly Pox, so he didn't shoot instantaneously. I mean, there's a bit of timing into that, of course. But Gomez probably played on that window, listened for a sound cue, and knew the Claymore was there as well. It was beautiful. It seemed very, very calculated, and there wasn't a whole lot of risk. And, well, for one of the first times ever in this key, in this year, I will say that it looks like W7M, when they lose a member or two, they, they're a bit stunned. It's like they need four or five players to do their execute. At least that's what it appears like as a spectator right now. But we know that's not typically the trend for them. They got backup plan after backup plan. They'll frag it out. They'll do a hero player of their own. They'll get a crazy interkill. They'll find the gap. You name it. But they have lost one or two members in quick like succession. And all of a sudden, it's like, okay, what do we do now, boys? This is like, look for a kill. Okay, we lost the gun. Okay, it's over. So, very, very stunned here. Sidesmo, of course, comes through. Now, M80 get to attack, and no surprise, they'll also start attacking that basement bomb site. The, the favorable bomb site by most teams, I would say, in the current meta of things, it has been for a very long time. No timeout's been burned by W7M either. And I think for good reason. I mean, unless you thought that, the, you thought that, that first half was going to be somehow swung by it, you might as well save it, and if things go bad here, then pull it out for the second half. The issue Going is that back. if things go bad here in this round, yeah. you pull your time out, staring down map point, in which case you now need to go perfect for the remainder of this second half. You have to question the value of that timeout, right? Because let's say M80 wins here, you're calling your timeout, and the best that you can do is go 5-0. <laughs> you lose a single round, it's, it's curtains. You got a chalet on your second map, which should be more favorable for W7M, but... Yeah, you'd think that... Well, we've got to see some life here. The hope, all. obviously, that W7M has is that they win this <laughs> round. You know, they, they're like, okay, we've got the favorable side, we'll get it done. Well, yeah. we'll see. They, uh, they don't up for the mirror, which is surprising. Usually, if it's available, most teams will pick her up. Instead, the Fenrir. Felipox went to deny certain areas like blue, bottom main stairs, etc. And of course, the good old impact trigger rules happening. A perfect C4. This, that was quite nice. To go for the impact trick, Bok then moves up to destroy the soft floor to stop the impact trick, but gets met by a C4. And again, those small things, they're like, oh, that's very simple. It's very obvious. No, most teams don't have that kind of coordination pre planned where it's that clean. Gets in that kill, Gomez off the board, now in a favorable position, they can sit back. And they got problems, or sorry, solutions to the problems, right? Plank goes down, 1c4 from Nade. And he's heart breaching left, 2 impacts from Hertz. Same thing goes with that and Osha shield. So now I made, they got a problem solved with a man down on a main blue take here, and things start off quite well for them. There's Diaz on the board, Nade killing iconic spoits. Still unable to see much more than a foot or two in front of his face. The B is working wonders, but a nice crossfire established. It's all up to Spoit now inside of blue, but JV92 perched up on top. Right by the gun rack, AK as it's often called. And using those Kiba barriers so effectively. It might only be one round, but both teams showing why a zombie's ban rate is mm. so strong and so high. Yeah, that's the thing with Tuber being implemented as well. You're in this kind of awkward position where 
there are basically four really heavy meta operators in play right now on defense. Tuburu, Solis, Asami, and Fenrir. And you can only ban one of them yourself. And if the opponent bans one of the other three, there's still two open. And pretty much no matter what team you are right now, you will have to play at least one of those three that will be open every single round because they are so valuable to any bomb site, basically. So it's no surprise to see them being picked, you know, multiple of those in most rounds. I will say this again, I wish I spoke Portuguese. Just to hear what they think. Of course, I, I remember a tweet of yours from back in like 2017, 2018, where yeah. I can't remember if it was Portuguese or French, but you're getting a lot of hate on Twitter and you're like, I just wish the people who were smack talking me spoke my language. <laughs> and now I want to speak that. So I could smack talk them back. Oh boy. Yeah, that was uh, there was a Twitter like hashtag going on back when Bristol first uh, joined the international scene. It was uh, it was a good time. Yep, got a lot of DMs that day. It was very popular for all the wrong reasons. Now we don't see a whole lot of clash these days. It is quite rare. And the thing is, typically when you play on CCTV bombsite, you'll be met with a Capital, just like what M when MAT themselves were the um, defending team. So playing the uh, the Clash and Catwalk a bit dangerous. The fire goes out, you're gonna get your feet burned to a crisp, but let's see what they can do here. Breach gets open, of course, because Kai gets countered by the Thatcher EMPs. So now it's a question of whether it may will attack the garage catwalk rafters where three members are currently roaming about or if they say this is too much to handle, let's go for a construction master bedroom take instead. Those are your two options on the attack right now. This is quite interesting that JV92 who started off cold and has now picked up an impressive tally of kills is the one who goes on to shield duty. So something that actually we've talked about with M80 as well, and back on, I think it was the old Astralis squad, when Iconic was having a really bad game, they put him on support. You had obviously Kino playing, he would play so well, and they'd stick him on Monty, which obviously mm. we've talked about to death, I know we joke about it as well, but in all honesty, when you've got somebody who's capable of shooting well, you have to wonder why you're putting them on a shield operator. That said, who's the bad shot on W7 exactly. now? Exactly. Who are you putting on Monty or Blitz? or Clash when you've got these caliber of players. That's a good point. Right now it's Nate, but of course someone has to play Kaid as well. But yeah, it may do the two fingers too much though to handle. They go master bedroom construction instead. They're gonna try and offer that plant on the wall from construction into the bomb site itself. But the thing is time is running relatively low. And with Clash being available, you know, you can just walk around, give some intel, zap them down. You can't just plant in the face of Clash. So it might be a big trick in this round. Attack it's not a usual scenario that you scream up practice for. Ooh. Oh, no. Wow. That's a huge, huge oversight it is from M80. Yeah. They don't see that Herds is down below on stage. The hatch opened up. No hard breach will be done on construction wall. M80 suffering two swift blows. First to Diaz Lucas and then to Spoit. W7M are crushing. There's no way to put it. No, I mean, not just, it's not them crushing M80. It's like them making massive mistakes here. It is not okay to not even check or drone out bar when you've got control of the rest of the map. Iconic oh with a single kill, largely impactless. Might have gotten a second, but the down doesn't come in at all. Nate actually survives with a sliver of HP. W7M starting to heat up. It is very apparent through the eight rounds of action that we've seen here on Clubhouse, that this is a defender-sided map. Only a single round won by the attackers so far. That's a tough look. And again, it's not because of Tubru. That operator is not in play. It is banned out in this matchup by W7M. So it's the same old, same old. Getting comfy on defense. Now, I don't know if you saw Parker, but I joined Jesse's fantasy draft league thing that he did. I have JV on my team. So I would very much like for him to do a little bit better. You know, he's five and six, and if I want to win the Fantasy League, then I need him to, like, step up a little bit here. But pretty much all of the five players of w 7 they went in the first round of that Fantasy Draft League, which is really no surprise. I think, actually, JV was the most commonly picked from what Jesse told us, so there it is. Him and Casey, of course. This is a great story. Thank you. And thank Jesse for it. He kind of made it a reality, you know? Ten seconds remaining. He did all the work. We just showed up. 
And then we had Lynx, like, on his phone, his car, with terrible quads. You'd be like, just screaming at his phone, you know? Attackers are moving out it was a good time. A bomb and I don't know any of this. I don't know any of this would happen. Really? You missed all that? It was streamed on his, on his Twitch channel. You don't support Jesse? As a fellow colleague? I was actually talking to Fabian about this earlier today. I genuinely think I've watched less... I mean, obviously, let's exclude the fact that I work on these esports. Yeah, of course. Excluding Rainbow Six esports, I've probably watched less than 10 hours of Twitch in the last year. You're becoming a boomer. No, I am so successfully decoupling myself from social media because it rots my brain. That sounds so much better than being a boomer. I mean, I'm also becoming a boomer. But you're also you're disappointing your entire fan base by not streaming, so you're also disappointing a lot of people. No offense, but you know. Dozens and dozens of people were <laughs> devastated. <laughs> okay. Dozens and dozens. But no, I didn't. I didn't watch any of it. Obviously, support Jesse, of course. And I think the idea behind fantasy is is great. I mean, yeah. there's a reason why fantasy sports leagues are literally a tradition for people across the world. God, people take off time for work, take time off work in America to do like NFL fantasy leagues. So why not do it for Rainbow Six? That's a good point. Those impacts, man, they're not hitting their mark today. This time for a different team, though. Gomez got a jacuzzi wall opened up. Of course, that second layer of the bathroom wall will be opened up shortly after, but that surely will be denied. It's a very, very slow round for maybe. They, they've, you know, they've had some issues in the last one by having oversights. Right now, they're trying to fill in all those gaps, I imagine, but it's costing them a lot of time in this round. So when it's time to go, they really got to just hit that speed and go as fast as they can. One coffin took a bit left from Iconic, ready on that office hatch. DS Lucas rotating to the main breach. He's done breaching his thermite as well. They're setting up for their initial 3, 2, 1, go countdown. And they're almost ready. Question is, who's going to lead the charge? Initial kill, very important in this 5v5 to get that man advantage. Or if the opposing team can equalize to a 4v4. Hmm. Down goes Diaz Lucas. KZ gets the first pick, comes a little bit late into the round. Iconic is gone too. Gomez has managed to find a blind spot and walks right into the site. He knows somebody's on the flank, but it's a crossfire established again. The hallmark of this W7M team is how good they are at trading off. Can they trade off Spoit? No! He picks up both kills and will now be circled by Nade over toward Lodgy. And Nade wins it. Spoit cannot get the job done. One round behind M80 now. W7M is streaking. That was a huge 1v1. If Spite wins that, he puts his team to, to map point. And he won it last time against Philly Pox. A close round that shouldn't have gone the distance necessarily, but all of a sudden, I think maybe they can feel the pressure coming because they are not looking good in these rounds. They look completely locked out with no foothold anywhere in the map. They drop, they die, they push the staircase, they die. They're on the breach of Pelling, holding a very passive angle. They die. Impact grenades run out from strip, just simply took DS Lucas out of the equation way too early in that round. And sure, Spark gets this two for one trade, or sorry, two kills single handedly rather, but it wasn't enough. I saw a shadow. That's not fair. So, territory bomb site has been achieved. And they're not gonna go for all four. They're gonna be boring, boo, and go back downstairs. Yeah, a stronger bomb set, arguably, one could say. But this time, they will bring out the mirror. So the one upgrade that they're missing from last time, that was pretty crucial, or might have been crucial, is the Fenrir. Most of the rest stays the same. Of course, Warden, a stable down here. Smoke for some teams is as well for Plant Deny. But you want to be able to see through those smokes and flashbangs once the bombs and execute comes through. But it's not just five guys downstairs. There is a bit of roaming presence. Reload. One main stairs, one inside the strip. Klopp is kind of waiting around his hurts. And the thing is, with no jack on the board, it can be tricky to figure this out. Most teams don't tend to spend that much time droning the entire map because it takes so much time. And what? Despite the skeleton key point blank, he loses the gunfight. They have nerfed that shotgun a couple times, but uh, that's just bad. Opening picks so heavily in favor of the defending team. W7M, of course, being the defending team at the moment. You held map control off-site. You killed a minute at a time, and now you get back into the site itself. That's excellent timing. I feel bad for Gomez. I mean, he had, a, he had two drones, a person in the window. He walks in, red ping, point-blank shotgun, and dies. 
It's one of those, like, he did the right thing, and he got punished for it. I mean, you could just say, you know, hit the head first and you win the gunfight, sure, but... I feel for the man right now. I would feel kind of cheated out of that situation if I was him. But life goes on, and so does Philip Box with 20 HP. <laughs> so there's two C4s you can do here. One, we see right now, goes into the motor door when you have to wrap down the hatch. If you go to the table on his left-hand side, you can do the same C4 over the wall to bottom main stairs. Both quite lethal C4s in crucial positions. Spoiled bottom main stairs, holding an angle, waiting for movement, but he's been spotted out. There's the adrenal surge to go on and give some more sustain to this M80 team as they begin their assault, or at least sure look like they might. Spoy throws out that grenade, but backs off. I don't know about you, I don't I don't have a dog in the fight when it comes to these grenade changes, but they certainly don't seem anywhere near as impactful as they used to. I like that, I like changes, because dying to an eighth of the floor wasn't very fun. That's correct. The bees that were shot out from Yaga in Kitchen don't exactly do the job that they wanted to. It looked like you actually missed it. And there were some bees flying inside of the kitchen, which isn't ideal. Last one goes out and they know exactly where he is, but KZ swings them. They're all swinging. M80 look completely <laughs> lifeless. A flawless round to answer M80's flawless round in the first half. And now we have a tie game. All the momentum goes in favor of the defense. And we head into round 11 with, yes, still only a single round breaking in favor of the attackers. If you showed me, you know, the second half of this game and just told me it was the first half, I believe you, because then W7 then we up 5-0, but because that first weird half of them where they absolutely could not attack for the life of them, it's a tight series 5-5. And things are starting to get really awkward if you're on the attack and end of things, because things are just not working out for either team. And here we see it. Bonk. One shot headshot. To yeah, yeah, frustration. I get you. I fully get you there. To make things worse, it may be getting a little bottom bit sloppy. Bottom Didn't bottom kill the default cam bottom main staircase. Not that it mattered because every single defender was actively on the guns, not watching cameras. But just to make a point out of it, they didn't shoot the default cam. And those are small things that should not be happening right now that are indeed happening from the attack inside. Five seconds to go. Unless I'm blind here, no timeouts have been called either. Nope, they're just going for it. And uh, with how these rounds are being played out, I, I don't I don't blame them because, especially as a coach, you look at this like, what do you break down? Things go badly, you make a mistake, sure, but if you call a technical time like now as a matey, you're also giving W7M time to breathe and talk to their coaching staff. It's a lose lose or a win win. Attackers dropped the diffuser. Attackers recovered the bomb oh. diffuser. Uh, he's waiting on a call, <laughs> I think. I think so, yeah. Can impact trick through this. That's technically why most teams they do it. So now you gotta actually hold the angles and neither those impacts, but there they go. Not much boy could do there other than fall off of that position. Now a daunting task to get this opened up. Three impact grenades remaining in the hands of W7M. Two thermite charges for Diaz Lucas. One Selma charge remains for Spoit. And one of those secondary hard breaches for Yaga. So, gotta use those impacts tastefully, one could say. The breach has been opened up, so I don't know if it was a deliberate decision or not by W7M to withhold those impacts. But you've given a greater avenue into the site now for M80. I mean, yeah, the breach is open, but it's a vault approach. So, yeah, you can hold the angle, but it's not an injured path necessarily. But it does appear like they want to clear out JV92 on the catwalk rafters. If that is their goal, this round will be won or lost most likely in the garage side of the map. Maybe they're just playing this nice and slow, buying the time, droning out the basement, securing spots location. He's gonna hold down lounge for his team. And then three members, they wanna work the rafters. Fire goes out and DS Lucas just like that, clears JV off the catwalk rafters. That is a phenomenal attacking approach. Now, as an attacking team, you got everything you can possibly want. Garage control, main bridge center, two kills to your name, and Spoit stays alive as well. All they gotta do is walk up catwalk rafters and they have to worry about the two C4s from Mira and the Kaid. And if they can do that successfully, they can just pipe the bomb. Again, you just see things plodding along, but 
W7M won a single round on attack. M80 yet to do that, but they are the closest they've been so far in the second half, Nick. There's still a lot of utility for W7M. Two nitro cells, two impacts, goo mines, but the guns for M80 are working quite well. A flawless round denied by KZ down below. Searching desperately for where that diffuser is being planted by Diaz Lucas. KZ won't find any success whatsoever, but he's given his position down below away. Spoiled the only one dead from M80. He'll watch the drones if they happen to be up. Iconic drops through the hatch in construction and through the kill holes at the bottom of stage. Get the final kill. M80 moves to map point. Excellent round there from M80. Like, everything from beginning to end, I think, was pretty like, flawless. They get the main bridge opened up, the spy being impact tricked against. Excellent. They take out what Raptor is, with just two capital fire arrows. No one even takes damage. Excellent. And then they see the bomb side is there. Five versus two because that aroma inside a bar. They flush out the bombs. They run all the way through. They clear out the members. They don't have to worry about the C4s or the verticality or the flank because they push all the way through and it just guarantees in the round. If you try and go for a plant, one C4 goes out, kills your planter. You try again, second C4 goes out, kills another planter. It's three versus three. It's not great. So I love the fact they say, okay, problem solving time. Let's just run in the bomb site and take the kills. Can I request uh, to get the players mic'd up for technical timeouts? Yeah, the, one of the best things about last year's SI was the fact that we got to listen in. Yeah, I fully agree with that. And I obviously do not have any technical expertise, but one of the best parts of LAN is hearing the teams get to discuss comms and strategy because we don't get to do that in any of the leagues. Something that would be a really nice feature here in Brazil. I don't know if it's possible. I mean, I know that teams are gonna say, "Oh, we you know we don't want to give away tactical stuff, etc." But here's what they think. Think, think of the I don't care the value it brings to the broadcast. You know, think about our feelings, the fans' feelings. But look at this. Yeah, the flood was perfect. Left, right, and center. Yeah, nice boys. So now. M80, they are on match point on Clubhouse of all things, and there it is. The good old bar stage bomb set yeah, that has gone left, through. Well, this is the third iteration that has gone through because uh, left, it had three. original state, then uh, Clubhouse of the map got a, like a full rework basically, but then bar got another individual rework to make the bomb set more playable. So, arguably, I think statistically correctly, the most changed bomb set of all. I think. Entirely possible. I think so. What a showdown this will be in the final round of regulation. M80 goes out 7-5 over W7M, or we have overtime in front of us. Either way, all four bomb sites now showing up. So this bomb site is quite unique how it plays out because the bomb site itself is arguably quite weak. So you gotta extend around the entirety of the map. You're gonna play top floor for a bit, fall back, stall time, play inside a strip, kitchen, hallway, etc. Because the site itself is super vulnerable to verticality. If the attackers take top floor control, you play a bunch of like intel on site, the Valkyrie cameras, the Maestro evil eyes, etc. And you play off the intel and off the clock. It's very important that you buy as much time as possible and shut down those Brava cams. JV92 gets picked number one, so bar stage for this brief moment. Looking like a genius idea. Yep. Still over inside a strip, and also, I think this might be the first observation blocker that you and I have seen so far today. They're quite rare. You see them brought when a Jaeger is in play, but Jaeger's pick rate is not very low. Yeah. JV92 with another nade gutting down Iconic. And the timeout that was taken seems to not be working for M80, who can talk during the timeout, whether they call it or W7M calls it. Yaga staring at the breach in the strip club. He and Gomez have so much work to do. They managed to push JV92 off of this position, which is a good start. So much more to come. And the thing is, it's only gonna get worse because next up is Hertz. The fire rate on that Roni is really something. It's got the 1.5. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Long range. Herds with the final two kills. We're going overtime. One of the downsides to attack a bombsite like Bar is that you don't have the most amount of experience. Now, you might think all oh, pro players, pro teams, they know every attack and every variation for every single bomb site. No, they don't really. 
If you scrim clubhouse a hundred times, you may or may not, depending on who your scrim partners are, only attack bar gaming or bar stage rather a handful of those out of a hundred times. So maybe hundred rounds, five times bar, it's not a whole lot. And then the enemies that use scrim might not play the same that WCMM they are, for example, or Brazilis region are, for example. So it's really hard to master and practice every single aspect because you can't just tell your opponent, hey, can you play this bombsite for us? We need practice. Because they're gonna go like, yeah, and, and so what, you know? Fun fact, actually, speaking of that, back in like 2018 or 19, we scrimmed Fnatic as Pentair G2 at an international event, and we tried to make bar stage work on the old clubhouse. We played this custom game where you played like 20 rounds. And we only played, so we had like no locked bomb sites. We played bar 10 to 12 rounds in a row against Fnatic to try and figure out a way how to make it defendable. And we lost like 11 out of 12 rounds every time we tried it. It was undefendable. And that's one of the reasons why I got reworked because it just did not work whatsoever. But we did try that once actually. Sometimes you can ask your opponent, hey, scrim this with us, please. I miss Fnatic. You know, the APAC team, the OG roster, making every event, beating out someone like EG with a coach standing. What an absolutely Ooh. unbelievable game. What happened here in Brazil? Yeah, yeah. It was in yeah. Rio. Yeah, it was in Rio, yeah. Magnet's appendix ruptured, and <laughs> Fnatic was unable to field a full five-player roster. So Dizzle, who was a pro on console, but years prior, yep. ended up playing, and we got... I would argue the wildest match of professional Rainbow Six, and not necessarily for good reasons. <laughs> but it sure was so chaotic. And uh, the Brazilian crowd absolutely loved it. And I was there in the crowd, and I absolutely loved it as well. Uh, good old times. Now, Spark's dancing. We have a cat and mouse here. But the same thing as the very first round that we witnessed in this matchup, they will fall back. This time, Spudge stays upright. It's not going to be a 4v4, but a 5v5 instead. Third tunnel has been taken by JB92, waiting patiently, holding a very small pixel angle. He needs the rest of his team to get inside the building, get to kitchen, open the soft floor, get those hatches breached open up, and assert their next following steps. Iconic, making a lot of noise here. Giving away his position, but he's not going to swing. Just sitting back and a certain dominance from afar. Not a surprise that almost every single round has been as... I don't want to say slow because it has obviously negative connotations to it, but there are certain maps that necessitate more drone work, yeah. more utility work. You, get, you have to bring usually more than one hard breach, as you can see on the lineup on the right side of your screen. It's a Thermite, it's a Hibana. Wouldn't be that unusual to also see a potential can opener get brought. But the defenders are just having such a good time. Yeah, they are. Both teams went 5-1 on their respective halves on defense. Only two of the 12 rounds broke in favor of the attackers. And what a bloody surprise. W7M on attack, early struggles, M80 using the favorable side of their advantage. Yeah, and Davey, I think he lost his patience. He swung way too early. His team is not ready whatsoever. Hibana, 12x cowers in pocket. They haven't even tried to breach open the church wall. I don't like this for w 7 m They gotta flash it. They gotta hop down. They gotta go right now. Iconic gets crushed by Felipox. KZ on the board. Diaz Lucas trying to put up some serious numbers, but what a mess that is. <laughs> Good news for M80 is they prevail in their very first defense and are now one round away again from potentially putting this one away. On map number one is that they get to defend a second time. Win or lose this round, M80 will go on to defense in round number 15. Well, I mean, I guess if they win this round, it's over, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and I mean, this is a great kind of situation for WCM to prove that they do have their stuff figured out because they only won a single attack in the first half and what a great way to end it by winning this upcoming well defense for them and then have to win that final attack around to make things work in their favor it will most likely come down to the final round the 15th we'll see of course no surprise we're gonna go back to basement again both teams prioritizing that heavily get the cuts yep so I can see the upper lineup. 
You guys cannot yet, but I do see... There it is. I see a little Blitzy Boy here from Iconic. <laughs> I do love me some Blitzy Boy. We've seen a... I would say a, a rather significant amount of shield play so far from like all teams in the first. So we've seen Monty, we've seen Blitz, we've seen Clash. And we've seen a lot of Clubhouse. I believe Clubhouse is the most played map by significant point. I think this is the fifth Clubhouse over all the games so far today. And I, I missed the Scar skin because we were casting here, so I'm not sure they also played over there. But uh, a lot of Clubhouse, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember what map they were playing on when we walked over. I can't quite recall. Excellent start, by the way, for the attacking team, which happens to Ooh, be M80. They get on the board first. M80 did look quite bad on attack. <laughs> so the fact that they were able to get a single pick is excellent. For the record, neither of these teams looked yeah. great on attack, and that's something that we need to specify here. But I will give credit to not necessarily M80's attack, but more so to W's, W7N's defense, yeah. which was very impressive. They weren't really as all over the place as they tend to be. You know, W7M were the team that arguably popularized the very aggressive, aggressive all over the map defense. They played a little bit more static when it comes to Clubhouse. Yeah, there was a brief sense. bit of aggression there from Hertz, but he's falling off. Also, like, worth noting, W7M, I believe, as of last major, is, like, the best defend defender side of team, like, in the world, as per JC stats. So they really are a phenomenal defending side team. That's C4 from Nade. It destroys the breach in charge. It tickles Sport, but that's it. And that bottom main staircase. Now, worth noting, it was Casey who got shut down early in that first plot, who's playing Warden. And you're up against a Blitz, who also has smokes and a Capital with those smoke arrows on top of it. So taking that Warden early has a potential massive consequence here for the defense. So I would say if Iconic can make that Blitz work, you can take Dirt for free. You can jump down the kitchen hatch. You have so many options here. The question is, what do you want to do if you're Iconic? Well, given the fact he's droning out the third tunnel, that might be where he will go. Yep. There it is. And against the Mira, not the easiest upgrade to work with here. Yeah, you have a C4, but you're very slow to the movement speed. Fire ready to go from Capital with a minute Sorry. left on the board. Never Force mind. Moves. Now the smoke squad. Well, Isolate Felipox playing over by Blue. Punching away at the mirror window. Nade and JV92 waiting for them to get in. Iconic pulling out the pistol. Down goes Herds. His position known. Diaz Lucas is not too far off. JV92 by the bomb chassis. Trying to get some licks in. Ultimately succeeding. But Diaz Lucas what? kills Iconic. How does that happen? I want a replay on that one. We're going to the round 15. Chaos. I know, I, I can see the vision there from Iconic. The smoke grenade to cut off the rotate to enable the plant to go down. But the smoke works both ways. Yeah, you know, they can see the guy who's planting, but you also cannot see them if they push through or advances near the smoke. So they push right in to shut down the plant cover. Diaz hops off the fuser and shoots the first thing he sees moving, which is iconic, and then Diaz dies shortly after. The pressure is on, the rounds are chaotic, and we will need all 15 rounds. And both teams will call their timeout first, of course, was M80. And now to finish things off, it will be W7M to talk things through and secure this final W. I would say for a tactical timeout, you probably get a bigger advantage on average by being the attacking team. Because you get to fully customize now a pocket strat, like something like a one-off you would not normally do. You get to talk about it as a coaching staff. Okay, if they take, you know, these operators for this bomb side, this could be a good weakness of theirs, etc. So you really get to apply your theory and your prep work right now. Whereas in defense, you get to talk about, okay guys, where do you want to go? What What is going to work against these guys? So I do feel like slight edge here to the attack, which is W7M. It's a great shot, Diaz, but it was on the wrong player. And that's always the case, I find. The nicest shots, always team kills. <laughs> nice shot, nice shot. <laughs> that's such like wholesome trash talk. Oh, okay, attacker we picks coming in. So thought process here. A whole lineup blown up. Yep, I mean, this is the thing, right? You talk about, okay, if they go Jim, we do this. If they go CC, we do this. If they go Bob, we do that. And the Monty pick is a, a good old El Clasico of CCTV attack. Because you can brute force the Catwalk Rafters 
much like a capital, just walk up the staircase, and gnaw the Asami player, or my player, whatever, and deal with them. But if you don't want to go for catwalk, Muncie works great from Master Bedroom side as well. Enables the plant because you have the shield for cover, you get smokes to secondary MPs, and Nade is a, one of those players that he thrives on the supportive roles. Kite on defense, Muncie on attack, etc. This is where he wants to be as an individual, and his team can very much play around that. You've seen the nades on attack go way down, but that sound of the Gone Six has been missing for actually quite a while. I don't hear Gone Sixes as much anymore. That's a good point. This is a small observation, but an excellent piece of utility for clearing out some of those harder to reach gadgets. Exothermic Charge goes off Selma's as well. Diaz Lucas eliminating KZ. There goes the buck. Flashbangs now to go in. Diaz Lucas in potential danger zone. They're in the midst of the bomb site for W7M. Felipox can attempt to plant with one minute off of the clock. Flashing out. Felipox will indeed start it. Yog and Spoit, last two left. Spoit on the run out. He won't be able to get to him in time. Felipox gets it. But the Nitro Cell at the last second works. Herds and JV against Spoit. M80 picked this map. They had a good idea of what to do. But even though you know what to do, it doesn't mean you can get it done. Oh. And they don't. It's W7M who does it. They rip M80's map away from them at the 11th hour. Eight to seven for the defending major champions. I love seeing Philly Parts on the Thermite, rushing in, getting kill after kill, and wanting more. I don't want to plan right now. I want to get more kills. And then he just barely gets off that plan before it goes down. Toxic Babe, C4 is flying, shots from everywhere. And it's W7M who gets the dub, but it wasn't easy. A very, very close match. And honestly, I like that there aren't long faces on m 80 side of things. I think you could be rightfully peeved. Yeah after how heartbreaking that is. But at the end of the day, you gotta keep your head in it. You just gotta prepare for the next, and that's Chalet. W7M will go to their map, up one nothing. They've won it all, except for the six Invitational. They're already off to a hot start. We'll be back in just a couple minutes with map two.
Well, if that wasn't a scarily close map for W7M, I don't know what is. That could not have been any closer. M80, push them to their limits. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy that M80 came here and came out the gate swinging. I mean, that's not what we were seeing in Atlanta, so I'm glad they used the three months. They brought Yogg in, and it looks like an entirely different team. Well, I don't want to say entirely different team, but it looks like the team that we saw throughout the NAL stage. Yeah, I mean, M80 came out with energy. They came Absolutely. out swinging. They came out willing to take a lot of really aggressive gunfights there on the defense. It, it worked quite well for them to start racking up those rounds early on. And then we saw W7M once they swapped the defense, do their own little thing. And I think it's fitting that it came down to can W7M win a single attacking round in the final round of the game, round 15, and they got it done. They did. Were you worried when we went to, uh, you know, W... You seven M's. I don't know why that tripped me over then. When uh -huh. we went to their defense, did you start to get worried for M80? The ball started rolling for, for W7M, and, and you could see in the player camps, M80 started to die down a little. Yeah, I think yes and no. Yes, because this is M80's map pick. You've yep. got to assume that they are somewhat comfortable on attack, so that 5 one half, you've got to be feeling nervous for W7M. But at the same time, this is an extremely defender-sided map, and I think the bands kind of tell a tale for that. Sure. We've talked about how Tuberau has influenced this tournament to be more defender-sided than any other map, and maybe you're thinking, but Tuberau banned, so this should be a less defender side of map than what we've seen previously at the tournament. But the thing is, Tuberau is banned, as is Bandit. We have Solus up, Fenrir up, Azami up, Valkyrie up, the four power operators that in previous tournaments have been always one or two banned. All four were on the board. Throughout this tournament, they've made up 83% of the defensive bans. Just those four plus Tuberau makes five. And the fact that four of them were let through in this game, I think is the reason why we saw so many defensive rounds go successfully. Well, and the beautiful thing about the defense round like that you were saying, an interesting key note here is that both teams, their opening kills success rate came from defenses. So obviously W7M went down. All those opening kills were going to M80 and then vice versa, switching back around. Then the opening kills were coming on W7M in those defense rounds just goes to show the attacking half was not the strongest side here. What the scoreboard shows me is that that was a slog first. Oh, That's all absolutely. I gotta say. Like that was back and forth. Every round that you saw, I mean, you, you see it very clearly. That picture there just shows a full story of what this game ended up looking like. I mean, everyone individually on each team stepped up, played where they needed to, got the engagements that they needed to get, won the gunfights they needed to. It just came down to the end and the nitty gritty of who was gonna actually figure out the piece of that puzzle to really close out these rounds and close out the match overall. I mean, the player that stuck out to me the most on the scoreboard had to be JV92. Yeah. Cause you saw in those attacking rounds, he started really struggling. He was not finding very many kills, ended up really dying a lot in those early rounds. And then he finishes the top performing player for W7M. And I think that's a testament to how good this guy is on the defense. In my opinion, JV92 is the best anchor player in the world. For I don't think there's any other person. You put him in a site, they're going to be as consistent as JV92. So huge props to him. Bit of slow start for him. Didn't really get to find that scoreboard. He eventually did. I mean, I do want to touch on Herds as well. I mean, Herds uh -huh. had that huge play being below, killing that Thermite. I believe it was round eight, I believe. Not yeah, I, yeah, round eight. Yeah, he gets that Thermite kill, and that completely won them that round. It's little plays like that in yeah. Siege that can make or break a round. And that's, again, that's the beautiful thing about Siege is you can have everything be perfectly successful, but you mess up that one small detail, and the entire round falls apart. Now, speaking of a whole round falling apart, sometimes it just takes an individual player, Jesse, doesn't it? Yeah, I really got to give some props to Yaga. I felt like he, maybe when Kino moved off the team and Yaga came in, he got some of that smoke SMG 11 magic because Yaga was on merchant with that SMG 11. We'll see the clips coming through here. The way he's able to utilize it, I've got two separate rounds to show you. The first is round number two. It's a nasty shot. We didn't catch it on stream, so I want to show it again. Note the three ping. That's iconic. Giving intel to Yaga. It's a brilliant shot. And then this is round number four. He's on Bs. He trades his teammate, quickly reloads with the SMG 11. He's got the mirror window. One, two, insanity coming through from Yaga. That is not the easiest gun in the game to utilize, but he makes it look so, so simple. So really impressed by that. I think with him coming on to M80, obviously played for Oxygen for most of this year, it felt like they wanted to keep him on similar defensive roles. On OXG Stage 2, he mostly played Azami and Smoke. This game, Azami and Smoke, we saw a lot of that from him, and it looked very, very clean. I've got to say, it's, it's quite funny coming into this. I'm pretty sure everyone would be uh, thinking that the SMG may not be what it used to be, but... <laughs> 
that, that SMG, as long as it keeps the fire rate and has the bullet count in it, it doesn't matter. As long as you're hitting a headshot, that's all you need. That's all I was hearing coming into this is people like, oh, the SMG 11, it's dirt now. And I'm like, I don't know, I've watched like seven plays that tell me otherwise. That's what people said when ACOG got removed a long time ago. As long as that gun keeps the fire rate and a one shot headshot stays in the game, yeah. that gun is going to forever be a strong gun. Now, this is just a, probably a more broader question. Uh, and Jesse, I'll go to you on this one. Sure. You can bounce if you want to. But do you think that that map in particular is quite indicative of where the meta is at, at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think the meta, as it often does, will shift based on op bands, right? And this is almost going back to like the previous uh, meta because we had two brow band, yep. but it's not quite the other meta because typically in a tournament, you'd expect some of those defensive operators to be banned out. I do think we're going to start seeing more of these tournaments go more and more defensive uh, on a broad meta point. I think um, something Bibu said that was really interesting earlier on in the show was you expect Tuber out to come in and maybe you expect things to slow down a little bit, but what it actually causes is teams speed up mm. because they don't want to get to those yeah. last 30 seconds and have be faced with three Zoto canisters. So we're starting to see like things really rotate around. There are those slow rounds where teams do maybe fumble a bit in the early round they do end up against three Zoto cancers and it's just ggs mm -hmm. um but i think there's still a lot of variation in what we're seeing on defense we're still seeing a lot of those aggressive moves coming through when operators like valkyrie and souls are on the board um so there's different ways for the defense to win but it does seem like the defense is often coming away with the dubs yeah and i think both teams are both beautifully displaying the abuse that they can use from those operators if they aren't being banned, that they can really use that into their play and really showcase it and why teams have banned it in the past and how much or how detrimental it can be to a setup or a take that you're trying to, you know, get in there and, you know, you got the Azami barricades blocking you, like you're saying, like just everything as a whole. It just, it's, it's beautifully done, both these teams you know, should be proud in terms of that result. I don't think anyone's going into this next game with down the, you know, down on their luck by any means. This was yep. a back and forth. I think it's just going to matter who's going to come out swinging once again. <laughs> We, we know who's going to come out swinging. And to be honest, it's actually <laughs> both of them. Yeah, I'm, not even, I'm not even going to lie. Like, M80 really took some... I'm going to say some haymakers at the start of that game. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I do want to say about W7M too, like they went down. Like it's very rare you see W7M yeah. in that situation. But like, again, it shows the tenacity that this team has that they do not give up. They didn't care about the chirping that M80 was doing. They didn't care about the, the spawn peaks or the aggressive plays that M80 was running at him. They immediately just bounced back. They hit the reset. They knew what they needed to do. Yep. And then you just saw them claw right back into it. And then it came down to the last round. Well, the last round's done. The last map's done. We now move over to Chalet. That's the important part. I'd love to ask you more questions, but unfortunately we don't have time. We're going to go ahead and throw it across to the incredible casters. I think it's Millhouse and uh, Sideshow Bob. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's actually excellent. No, it means the Bart the for the Simpsons. You see, I'm too young. I'm Sideshow Bob. I'm too house. young for this. This is before my time. He does kind of look like Millhouse, but he has a much deeper voice. That's true. W7M are the defending major champions. Their road to one thing they haven't done, the only thing they haven't done, which is win the Six Invitational, begins in this matchup. They already prevailed on map number I'm one. Millhouse? I just Googled it. That's an insult, no? Come on, man. Wait, who are you? I'm going to look my up My ankles you. are soaking wet, but my calves are bone dry. Everything's coming up, Millhouse. Who are you again? I'm gonna look you up too. Sideshow Bob. You're. It's uncanny. Okay, you're Sideshow Bob for sure. I mean, you're Millhouse <laughs> as well. You don't get to say. No, come you don't on. get to. You don't get to say. No. No. Oh man. You don't get to call me Sideshow Bob and not also <sighs> accept that you are Millhouse. Excellent reference, though. Man. Yeah. I wish I understood it because it was pretty cool. Go back. And rewatch, I think it's on Disney Plus. The first five, six, maybe, maybe seven seasons is when the quality starts to drop off of The Simpsons. Fair. One of, at the time, the smartest and most sharp shows on television. Excellent show. Wow. Good Obviously, grace. it is a shell of its former <clears throat> self, but if you ever go back and look at the people who used to write for The Simpsons, you'd be stumped. So do that. Okay. Go ahead and do it. I'll do my homework. Very smart people. Either way. Whether you watch it or not, we have a match to talk about. W7M, their road to winning the Six Invitational began today, just like every team. 20 teams, all with relatively even shots of winning. There have been losers today. Seven losers, actually, so far. <laughs> An eighth team will lose. It'll be W7M or M80. 
This is obviously W7M's map, so I don't want to talk about them so much. I want to talk about the team who could potentially lose here, M80. Yeah. What's the win condition on Chalet for M80? Or win conditions if there's more. I mean, to simplify this, the win condition is very simple. Do better on attack, right? Winning like a single or if you W7M, them, two attack rounds on Clubhouse is not good enough. That's the bottom line. But for M80, I think just a little bit more consistency, if you will. They, are, they have rounds where they are popping off and they had rounds where they got absolutely demolished. And you'll find that middle ground where things are usually gonna be all right with the occasional pop-off, you know, like once in a while, like Usok Gomez, jumping out construction window, getting a 2k, etc. That's the kind of thing that I love to see from M80. But then like the team kill and the chaos and off smoke in the wrong positions, hate to see those, for example. Now, Shelly and Clubhouse, they play out very differently. Sh you know, Clubhouse being very breach oriented and plant and execute oriented. Shelly is a lot more about the early game, the roam clear, the map control, and then you come down to a little bit of like a mini execute. For example, on a bar defense, if you're actually at the top floor, you gotta deal with that mezzanine top blue stairs position. That's gonna be a lot of utility. Flashbangs, grenades, destroy a shield, or one, two, three, go for those gunfights. But the rest of the map, it really comes down to moving around it correctly and at the right time. And you said earlier, Parker, that WCM, one of the teams that kind of innovated how you can play this, this game so aggressively and so coordinated but they actually back in their you know early days the map they changed the most was chalet the current way that we see teams play this map was originally from w7m's playbook and every other team has since then copied it made you know some versions of their own etc but these were the founders of this new chalet so to speak so if a team can win out here it's w7m M80 opting to start on attack on Chalet. Not all that ordinary. Not all that unordinary. You and I, in our matchup of DZ versus GK earlier, talked about how, for most teams, they prefer to start on attack on this map. Yeah. It has always been a friendly map for the attackers. Just because you're not really boxed out. You look at a map like Clubhouse, there's a lot of ways that you can get inside using hard breach, but the defenders, likewise, can block you out. Yeah. On this map, the only real time that you need hard breach to enter is that garage panel. And outside of that, you've got doors, you've got windows, there's lots of soft destruction. The moment that you vault on in, it plays very differently. It's also a map with a lot more openness. So Chalet and Clubhouse, not kindred spirits whatsoever. The attackers are able to maneuver effectively and then of course, there's that giant main lobby area that benefits whoever holds on to it. If you have the right tools as attackers to flush the defenders out of that spot, there's a lot of power that you can exhibit onto or all the other sites on the map, including downstairs. And that main lobby seems to be the main focus right now for M80. Yeah, this is like the first, you know, difficult areas in the tagging team. Clearing out Hurts and picking out this position. Hurts makes it look so easy. Swings up, one bullet, bang. Spots down for the count. 4v5 now from M80. But yeah, this is the where most teams get stuck. They cannot play this position, but they do it for a two-for-one trade. Maybe 7 m Rolling pretty for now, only losing Hurts, but... Two kills and dying, I'll take that. Especially on Castle, who's likely already put down all of his utility. All you're really losing is a UMP. Uh, oh. JV92, that was uncharacteristically poor of him to miss those shots. Unnecessary swing as well. I mean, you got the advantage now, you don't any longer. Time is running out very quickly for M80. But numbers are equalized. JV92 is still bleeding out, so technically the advantage is in M80's favor. They secure the kill, but oh my goodness, Nade inside the site prevents the diffuser from going down. A three-piece in the first round, W7M. There's a reason why they are the team who is feared the most by all here. They start off their own map with a round win. That's gonna sting if you're M80. I mean, first you struggle in that first, you know, difficult position of the shield top loose stairs, and then you take the bomb side with three versus one, and you lose every single engagement. This is this area of Chalet, though. It's pretty hard in some areas of the map, and other areas are relatively easy. Like you said, getting into the building, usually. Not met with much, con much of the contest, but getting to the bombs at that mid stage, very, very difficult, especially on bar. I think personally, from my side, you know, in ranked and competitive, I find bar on Chalet one of the hardest bomb sites to IGL and to attack as an individual player. 
I just, I feel like it's difficult because that top blue portion, like we just witnessed, comes down to like a raw gunfight or really good utility usage on a very small part of the map where you don't have a lot of ways to work with it. Not a long line of sight, so it's just double door to piano. That's really it. Ten seconds left. And things will stay this way. W7M, they will keep reshaping the bomb site, reshaping the map, whether it's mirror or castle or just a bunch of different shotgun tools and mirror window, etc. They will bring it because the way that Chalet is built by default is not necessarily ideal. A break a wall over here, put down a mirror window there, castle up this double door to the hallway, and all of a sudden you have a fortress of a bomb site. And you will see here that W7M are not necessarily doing like the conventional setups. These are pretty artistic, so to speak. There are castling of doors that we don't get to see very often. Mirror windows, yeah, relatively standard. But those castle barricades in the shield positions, that's something you don't see every day. I think it's the same map that we saw Zofia. Oh no, it was Night Haven maps that we saw the Zofia on. Yeah, it? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like a single around. But there's been a big meta shift since the last time we saw a competitive siege. The frag grenade changes are humongous. That might be the single biggest change, but mm. also tomorrow coming in has slowed down this game. And there's been some talk amongst pros and other teams that we are not necessarily back in that 20 second meta, but we are potentially on the precipice of diving into it. I will say this, with the exception of the clubhouse match that you and I just casted, the attacking team has been pretty okay when it comes to speed. So yeah. I don't know if we can say, oh, it's really slowed things down. There's been a lot of unpredictability. And so far through day one, teams have taken chances by getting aggressive early and it's worked out. Yeah, I would say it's not matter of like, if you wanted to as a team, you now have more tools to slow the game down. For example, Tuburu, Goyo, Smoke, etc. If you wanted to, but teams like Casey right now will also take the occasional swing on the windows and take those risks. This time though, it's not rewarded, it is punished as two members fall before Hurt straight back onto Spoil. <laughs> Good spot to be in if you're M80 right now, but... Presume that there are still some Yokai's up for Nade as he sits on that mirror window. And there you go. The Yokai's are indeed still in play. They got need. They got top floor control. They got Intel on side. If Yogg, who has the fuser, by the way, so Yogg, this is problematic. Yogg is a top floor watcher, but also the fuser carrier. So he has to either leave the top floor entirely and give that up, or they can't plant the diffuser. Found the Yokai though. Still one in pocket. Or actually pre-placed already, should I say? Mm -hmm. M80 seems to think one player might lurk down below. Iconic picking off Nade. Another as well, but it's Gomez who seems to get the pick. No, it's another player entirely. Herds left all alone with his toys upstairs. He's not going to be able to do too much here. Diffuser going down. M80. 30 seconds left to just hang on and keep this close. Iconic wants the fight. He takes it. He wins it. M80 answers back. I usually love the vertical play from teams, but it was a little bit too sim simplistic from W7M. It's okay, we have Yoka Joe, they're not gonna find it right. We're just gonna figure out where they plant, yellow ping them, shoot them to the floor. Okay. Yoga Jones dies immediately after, and all three defenders are upstairs. What now? What then? And they made it again. Good problem solving. They plant in the corner of the room. Iconic holds the ankle, the only side in the floor that was broken, and they get a kill from it. 1-1. One, one. It's tied up, but it's early days here for Shelley. A lot can change. We get small little listen-ins in between the rounds, so. A little bit here, a little bit there. Heard a maestro being mentioned. Yeah, I was gonna say, always nice to just sit and listen to the team speak. W7M have really not been doing a lot of talking at all no. in this matchup. I don't no. know if you've noticed that. I would say, like, during the uh, like the pre-game, like, when teams are getting ready, they were definitely allowed, like, their chance, etc. But since the game started, even when they won on Clubhouse, like, not a lot really happened from their side, verbally speaking. Even when uh, the team could happen, they're like, oh, nice shot, nice shot. It's like, it's not really all that. 
but again, you know, you let your performance do the talking, I suppose. Maestro is indeed picked up by Nate, that support effect we spoke of earlier. The Maestro, the Kai, the Monty, the Castle, of course, the Sable, Frost not being seen in action from JB92. It's gonna limit those jump in from the attack inside and also gives you a bit of intel. If you're somebody shoot like three, four, five bullets, they probably turned in a window and shut that frost mat. It's good to have. I love this mice. We saw it earlier as well from from DC, I believe, where they used it to deny the wall breach. And same thing here. In Solarium, there's an evil eye. If you try and open up the Solarium wall from the repel, you can evil eye sap them off instead. No risk needed, no impacts needed either. It's very safe and risk free. Already a round, or already a minute gone into the round. The chalet doesn't seem to have that same breakneck pace that we've seen from this map before. Could be unfamiliarity that the attacking team of M80 has, and Bomb Gomez dying early to JB92 might show us that that's correct. Could also be thoroughness. M80 is relatively, a, you know, relatively thorough. Oh yeah. But they can also be very quick and aggressive, so it just leaves us to speculate right now. Exothermic charge goes off, and there's utility tossed out. Reloaded. Yeah, I mean, Pyro's <laughs> picked off of the wall. This reminds me of Cafe. It is hell in a cell. Look, you're in library across the map. You, and you're fighting like this. Like, hello? Against shield, softballs opened up, long lands of sight, and then evil eyes deny any wall breach so that they don't even get to risk their positions to deny the breach. It's perfect. Again, innovation, so to speak, at its finest. Small micro changes that hard count to your opponent. M80, they are completely locked out of this round. They have no way in this bomb side. It's beautiful. Nice kill from Diaz to try to keep the numbers as close as to humanly possible, but he's got so much to do as it's him in a 1v4. One minute since the first kill came in, and that's all it takes. Looked like half of M80 couldn't even get into the building. W7M, as dominant as ever. I mean, that's, that's just tough. You're tagging that up. That is no. That is no fun, no bueno. That is difficult. Like, usually attackers, what they'll do is they'll get into the first initial, you know, part of the map, library in this case, that's their, their foothold. They're gonna be safe in there, they join a bar, no C4s below, they can relax, they can drone, they can breach, etc. Then they go for that bombsite plant, for example. But the way W7M do it, is the second they go into library, they have to fight every single second of the round. Nowhere is safe to drone, they gotta worry about the flanks from C4s below still, and they don't have anywhere else on the map in their control. Fireplace wasn't the attackers, library was barely even the attackers, and they didn't have blue stairs either. It's such an early timeout, Nick. It is. Three rounds in, you're already calling the timeout. So, hmm. going back to something I said in the previous round was, they can be a thorough team, but is there sluggishness because of their own strategy? Or is there sluggishness because they're not comfortable with either the map or the way that W7M are playing? And I would say probably both. Yeah. You're not calling a timeout three rounds in unless you see something or somebody on your team sees something that you were deeply unhappy about. Yeah, so I heard a little bit from Bodega there, and he seemed a little bit frustrated about the fact that it seemed like the team was like loosened to things that they already knew from like prep work. He said, they will keep doing these same kinds of things, stop falling for it. Something along those lines. And it's true, like, the, uh, the defensive setups that we've seen from WCM, they are very, like, when you think of WCM, that's exactly what they would do usually. So it shouldn't be a surprise for Macy. Of course, it's hard to deal with, Problem solving it, very difficult, but they shouldn't lose where they have been. Like, oh my god, what are they doing? Surprise facts. I've never seen this before in my life. You, know, you have seen it, just not that often. So the prep work here from the day could be like, guys, you know what they're gonna do. Like, we prep this, wake up kind of scenario. And maybe a more like methodical approach here. More soft breach, more util, get that IQ to deny the intel as well, because W7M, like most teams, they love making conscious decisions based on solid intel. That's what Valkyrie gives you, that's what Maestro gives you. So now, if you're Gomez, get that scanner out, figure out where those pieces of like intels they are, shut them down, or avoid those errors at all costs. There it is. Immediately, we're seeing changes come out. 
Valkyrie's been banned a lot, but we also haven't really been seeing a lot of Valkyrie play across the board. I mean, it's, with so many good defenders, it's kind of hard to fit her in the line of these things, to be honest with you. Yeah. The good benefit, though, is that if you bring out the Valkyrie, you kind of start forcing out the IQ, and IQ and attack is not that good besides countering Valkyrie specifically, or Echo, for example. So kind of a low-value pick, if you will. I mean, you talked about this in the previous map. There are so many good defenders right now. You kind of have to pick your poison with Operator bans and who you're going to run up against, right? You don't ban Lamai, you don't ban Valkyrie, you don't ban Azami, you're going to see them usually quite often. Solus is going to show up, Tubaro could show up. You're going to have some kind of denial. There's going to be a Mute, a Bandit, or a Kaid, or maybe two of those present at all times. You've really got your pick of the litter when it comes to playing on defense. The attackers are strapped in quite a lot, but the one benefit they do have is Attacker Reaper. They can gain information on which defenders are present, and yeah. then customize your lineup, even if your lineup does look similar to what we tend to see quite frequently. Also, I saw less as you could ban, because now you can use your drones in that drone phase, but a blind side here, the flank is left open somehow. Hello? Nobody home? It's not supposed to happen like this. Come on. Two picks from W7M. Oh, what? They, oh my. Suddenly, everybody is dead. Half of the server dies in the blink of an eye. The advantage for W7M continues to grow. Is Lucas trying, but ultimately in vain. And <laughs> I think Herds just tilted his monitor over to say, hey, take a look. Why don't you play off of both of these pieces of information? 3-1 uh, for W7M. I always see the replay there of Gomez's, you know, shotguns. I think it was like a snap, one tap, and then fade away. It was beautiful. But what a messy, messy round. I mean, Philippox flanks with like 60 seconds left on the clock, and no one's watching the cameras, and I know North America in the past, especially like Thinking Nate, for example, being like, okay, there's a dedicated flank watch role in North America, which never really happened or existed much in Europe or Brazil necessarily. And that role is kind of gone these days with the meta changes. But someone, regardless of who has the role, has to watch those flank cameras. If there aren't any, a gun will do. If you do have cameras for three players, which there are four left alive, we can see top left hand side uh, from M80, someone should be covering that. We have two members in the piano hallway of Ivy. There is no reason that both members look in the same direction and the flank is left open. <laughs> he is pointing and explaining with his finger. <laughs> That's perfect. And it's not cheating, by the way, in case you're curious on how land works. That is allowed. It is a different environment to play on land. Just like technically speaking, if you, back when you could cook a grenade, you could look at the floor, cook the grenade. If the crowd starts cheering, for example, you're probably going to have to want to cook that longer and throw it. Or is the crowd is completely dead silent? Odds are, no one is where you're aiming that grenade. Small tricks like that are completely allowed on LAN, and players across all games, they will take advantage and adapt their playstyle in some ways to those changes. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> no reinforcements allowed anymore. Shoot them all. Breach opened up and, oh, I mean, Nade pulling out the sidearm. All right. Thorn, shotgun, shield, mm -hmm. middle of the bomb side. Thorns, default plans. I mean, this is still his w covering all their bases. Do you see the Razor Bloom on top of the Goyo canister yep. as well? Yep. You're not surviving that at all. First Thorn that we've seen so far in this matchup. Fuse as well on the board, but... It will be an experiment, not for that long. Mm -hmm. This fuse is removed in the first minute. As the Lamai goes as well, both of these teams suffering blows. Hmm. The way in here for the attack inside seems kind of difficult, but they're slowly forcing back towards the bomb side. It's just, well, he's dead as well. Davey was left standing on the roam, but he too will fall. So you trade a Guyan Womai, mostly passive utility, besides those discs, of course, in Womai, versus the active gadget of Fuse. No buck, no sledge, so the bomb set itself, vertically speaking, will be relatively safe here. I don't think this 3v4 is too bad for W7M, especially considering that they got Kiba Barriers, a good LMG and Maestro with three evil eyes, and this shotgun on Nate on the blue staircase can most likely just completely lock the attackers out of that portion of the map. We got Plant Deny, etc. So now for maybe problem-solving time, where do they want to go and how do they want to do it? 
They have one exothermic charge, two Hibana pellets, smokes and flashbangs, and even EMP EMPs if they need it. So they got all the tools of the job. The question now is, by gelling wise, leadership wise, what is the plan? Well, time's running out if you're M80. Yeah. Most towards the backside now. Mm -hmm. One guy on the flank on lobby hatch. Herds, as well as Felipox, back to back. That's a bad position for Felipox to wander on over. Herds missing the opportunity at the start. He'll die. No, he tries. And he fails. He hoped that Nade would have something over towards that wine door. And man, what a messy finish that was. A second round on the board now for M80. They need that. I mean, Chalet attack, typically the favorite side, but I really don't want to sit any longer because defense is so strong at the six Sensationals so far in day number one. Three, three, half, excellent for both sides, of course, though. So now we get that final attempt. Will WCM take the lead for two? Or will MAT equalize on what will be the final attack, at least for now? Hasn't been looking too bad, though. Mid run adaptation. A little bit lagged, that's a little bit slow, but the early game, quick to the punch, and late game, they can get the job done on the side, execute sometimes. So a six pick coming in there. Glass was hovered, but for a second. Saw Glass earlier today. We did. Big Glass enjoyer. I am Doc shows up in the hands of JV92. Hmm. <laughs> You have immediate thoughts. I Five mean, whenever left. someone picks, I mean, this is like the the 92 Dream Team throwback, you know? The dog promotion, like, this is going to be, JV wants to get active here. Herds should be promoted to dog, though, not JV92. Yeah, he's a top gunner, you're right. But but who doesn't want to play Asami Parker? Come on. Asami is, like, the queen on defense here. True. You're, I mean, you're absolutely right. The key barriers might be the biggest change to see since, like, mirror windows of out cameras in so many aspects, at least. It's pretty wild. <laughs> they seem to be a little surprised by the repel of Yaga, but Spoit figures it out. Already inside a mudroom. Oh, and he sees that balloon-sized head of Jaeger. Tries to do some damage to Nade, doesn't pull it off. Instead, Spoit has to burn an adrenal surge immediately in response to that duel. The rest of his team will be above full HP. For Spoit, it doesn't even come really back to full HP. Still... 90 HP, give or take. There's like a classic like phantom pressure round from M80. They're opening up every window, every door, and they're rotating around and keeping W7M guessing as to what exactly is going on. And the thing is, no one from defense is checking the cameras right now, so they're only working off what they can see with their player point of view. So the lack of intel here is kind of crucial for defense, but they got their stable two areas. The bomb side and like top library, top boosters. So that's what they care about the most. It's like the shields are, the keep bearers, the Jaeger ADSs, etc. And it's no surprise that, well, maybe they will come and meet them from last bedroom, like last time. KZ greets Yaga. Goodbye to the Thatcher. No secondary EMPs beyond. Let me say that. No, two for Iconic. But I don't know if Hard Breach is the play here because there's no bona fide Hard Breacher. Yeah. So you're using those EMPs to disable gadgetry, not to gain you access into a certain Ooh. part of the site. Hertz, as I said, was the one who should be promoted to dock. He's playing a zombie. Kill on a trophy window. Or top of the library stairs window, rather. Spoit the very first pick for M80. Down goes Felipox. Spoit falls almost immediately after that at the hands of KZ. Chimney was held by W7M, but has now been freed up by Iconic, who wants to assert himself over towards the library. Diaz Lucas has his teammates back. We'll pick up Iconic. Because of that, it will be even numbers. A dock on the board. JV92 will get Nade back to full HP, and two stim pistols still remain for JV92. Is Rotero drone to go? And well, both players from M80 will drop, and ultimately, an anticlimactic end. This W7M takes the first half 4 2. That's what I mean. Like, attacking top blue is so difficult. Like, the, the mental toll on a player in that round alone 
it's gonna eat you really quickly because you're met with so many problems utility-wise, crossfires, long lines of sight, oh, they might be flanking us, etc. as well. There are so many things you have to account for and make so many small correct calculations and decisions in the moment. And ultimately, it comes down to winning your gunfights as well because M80, they do gain control over the top four, but it comes at a massive price. You lose one body, two bodies, almost a third, and one person gets injured later on. It's messy. And then it goes down to like a 2v2 or a 3v3 like, like in this round as well. And defenders are still heavily favored because what can you do? Either you drop one of the two side hatches, which we saw, not ideal, you die midair, or you walk down either fireplace staircase or blue staircase, which also is not ideal. So, roam clearing is hard, the mid round execute is difficult, and the late round bomb side 2v2, 3v3 scenario is heavily against you as well. Everything's just working against you in that round, it is difficult. Now, WCN, they will start things off in a very different kind of way, because they're showing us Blitz, Tokimi, Thermite, Thatcher, Ace. This setup is great for every single bombs that attack, but especially the basement where Blitz can shine. Get on in quickly, establish a plant, or isolate a roamer if you find somebody somewhere else on the map if you do the drone work first. So the first question is, roam clear or not roam clear? Well, right now some pressure is applied upstairs by JB92 on the Dokkabi, just opening up some windows. While that's happening, Nate and Ace open up the main breach on the primary wall. Iconic team kills Yaga somewhere on the map. Uh, he's smiling and laughing. <laughs> I'm not was Iconic not team killed back in map number one? Yeah, he was. A bit of retribution, I suppose. I suppose, but I mean, Yawk Dog is he's the new guy here. He's one in five right now, having a tough map, and to be honest, so is most of the maybe, and this is where the bits will shine. Just rush on in. Telepox charging on in. Top floor control is no not theirs, but it doesn't matter. Diffuser is also in the midst of the bomb site. Spoit will retake from main stairs. Wasn't much a nade left, but he's as good as gone. Two in a row from W7M. All smiles on the face of Iconic, which you wouldn't know that M80 is getting blown out of the water on W7M's map. 5-2 yeah. for the defending champs. I think you just don't count that round if you're a right? That, that, is, that round did not happen. It did not exist because everything went wrong. You lose a member early, another team call, etc. But I want to talk about the efficiency of W7M, which also can be correlated to the fact that M80 didn't make anything difficult for them. They had JV, like, solo roam clearing, applying pressure as Dokkabi. Then they had the Ace opening up the primary beach outside. And then they had... <laughs> He, he flicked off sound, I assume, there. Then you had Casey and Felly Pox and Hertz hit the back of the bomb side at the same time. Yeah, I said it's my bad. So they were doing three different things at once. Same at room clear pressure, rain beach open, backside bombs at rush. They didn't even check dining kitchen out if it was open or closed because, because they had the blitz. They just rush on in. They can lose a body. And the second blitz went in, he got shot from the hatch. Nate walks in behind him, shoots the guy on the hatch. It's very simple, clean siege. But what I mean is, it maybe could do more as well. They could play the Tuburu, they could play a Mute, they could play a Kaid, they could play a Bandit. They can slow things down and put up problems in WCM's way. But in that previous round, there was no util to stop them. There are just five guns walking around. Whereas if you go back and watch W7M defending, they had all the deployable shields, the thorn gadget, the Goyo canisters, the long lines of sight, the dynamic setups, etc. It's a very different bulk in here between Team A and Team B. Swapping. Entirely correct. Spoit gets first blood though. Drawing it from Herds, who's been statistically the best player so far from W7M. Rough to lose your Nomad early on. That's a flank watch that will now need to be done manually. Or maybe you use the gridlock, or maybe you use the zero. I suppose. <laughs> I suppose not all not all hope is lost entirely. I do think zero is a bit underrated, to be honest. It's like you have so much util, it's like four cameras, you can sap something, etc. You know, deny a wall deny. It sounds so awkward to say deny wall deny. Destroy wall deny. You see it here. In case there was a jammer or a kite claw, it would be dealt with. And now that there isn't, they still have the intel from the zero cam, the Argus camera, to see where the players might be inside of office or flank game later on in the round. So it's good stuff here.